What is up, YouTube? Welcome in to another edition of Bucky and BK, live on Texas Sports Unfiltered and on the free Texas Sports Unfiltered app. Today is Thursday, March 14th, 2024, and the Buck and I are with you for the next two hours on today's show. Texas basketball collapses in Kansas City. What does it mean for the Longhorns' chances in the real tournament? Plus, the Dallas Cowboys have actually signed a free agent. Yes, believe it or not, a sign of the apocalypse. The Cowboys have made their first real move of the NFL offseason. We'll talk about that. We got some other NFL free agency to discuss. The Players' Championship in golf gets going this weekend. Lifetime Longhorn Scotty Scheffler, a huge favorite there. Of course, we've got another classic TBT video because it is Thursday after all, and plenty more to get into over the next couple of hours on a Buck On and Buck Off Thursday. What's going on this morning, Buck? Another day in paradise, brother. That's all it is. Got a little bit better sleep last night, but still, I need that golf sleep this afternoon. I need a golf nap. While the players is going on, I'll be falling asleep on the couch. So other than that, it is go another gorgeous day. I don't quite see any rain in sight, but looks like it's going to be a nice day today. And, you know, we got to prepare because it could get some, some wet weather come Friday and Saturday of this week. So it uh, should be okay today. Do the things you need to do today. And you know, i got a lot of stuff to do. But I am still, once again, BK, I don't know what this hour, this thing has never bothered me before. But this change, it's taken me a full week and a half to get over. I, I don't, and, and that's just weird. Maybe old, maybe it happens to old people. You know, you lose that hour. So it really, it's, it's just bugging the hell out of me for some reason. But I got golf. I got the players this weekend. So that means a lot of sleep. That's I pretend I'm watching and then I'm just dozing off. That's good sleep. Golf sleep is good sleep. Yeah. So I'm, and I'm, and I'm looking forward to next week. You know, we got to get ready for NASCAR, some big events happening out at Coda. Uh, we've got something this Sunday. We've got something going on. Selection Sunday is coming up. So there's a, there's a lot happening. So I need to get some rest here somehow, some way. Yeah, March is one of the best sports months of the year. Now, most yeah. of it has to do with the NCAA tournament. But, of course, the golf season is in full swing. Major League Baseball will get going before this month is over. NFL free agency is alive and well. And, yeah, NASCAR coming to COTA next wow. weekend. We might be doing a couple of live shows out there at the circuit next week. So stay That's tuned awesome. for that. And hey, early shout out to CentexTickets.com if you want to get your tickets to either of the races going out to Coda next weekend. Thankfully, it's not this weekend because the rain would be a factor. Hopefully next weekend it's cleared up. But if you want to get those tickets to be at Circuit of the Americas when NASCAR comes to town, there's only one place to get them. That is CentexTickets.com. Good morning to the soldiers at Fort Cavazos, Texas, the soldiers in the state of Texas, and all those that fight for us each and every day. They don't care if it rains, sunshine, it doesn't really matter, snow. They are there for us, and thank you so very much for what you do for us. We do appreciate it, and do be safe out there. I keep checking the code at text line, 512-222-9328, to see uh, if anybody heard me freak out. I had a minor freak out while the intro was playing. And if you're watching on YouTube, there's no way you heard it. But if you're listening on the app, I forgot to mute my uh, microphone right while the intro was going off. Did and you lick, lick the plant that I gave you yesterday, the one that can make you loco? No, but I did put the plant up, and I did water the plants. It looks like it liked that water, did it? needed it. I think so. I, I don't know anything about plants and except for the ones that I smoke. So I don't know what it looked like or not, but you told me I should water it. So I did water yeah, it. That's good. And you don't have to mess with it for another two weeks now. Now, now I'm worried with the rain coming that it's going to be, be over. Fine. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. It'll, it'll, that thing's a cactus, almost cactus family. It'll suck it up really well. Mm -hmm. So I don't even know if you know this, but maybe you see on the screen that right after I fire off that 30 second intro video that we play at the start of every show, uh, I go leave for a few seconds and then I come yeah. back. Right. But what I'm doing is I run to my other computer. I got a second laptop that runs the podcast so we can get the podcast up before the end of the day. 
and it just it crapped out on me in that 30 second run when i ran over to the other room to go oh, mess no. with the other computer to start the podcast it just froze up on me so i was dropping like five to ten f-bombs and <laughs> then i come back in here and i'm like oh shoot i didn't mute myself so wow if you're tuned in on the free texas sports unfiltered app you might have gotten a, a minor meltdown from me well, the kids aren't in the car line so it's all good yeah. they're on vacation that's true. Spring break this morning. So I hope everyone's having a great spring break. Hope everyone's having a great week to this point. And it is March 14th, Buck. This is a national holiday. You know, February 14th is Valentine's Day. Yes. Everybody knows about that one. But today is a national holiday that not as many folks know about. You know, Valentine's Day is more for the ladies nowadays, yes, right? Yes, it is. It is. Well, March 14th, a month later, is known as Steak and Watch BJ Upton highlights day. What and what's that court TV day? By that I mean it is steak and BJ day today. Really? Yeah, this is uh, something that was created by men, presumably, a few of years ago to have their own Valentine's Day. So hope everyone gets to uh, celebrate steak and watch BJ Upton a highlight. Day, yeah, day. Upton, very nice. Yes, yeah, there you go. I'll have, give, I'll have to give out an invite for that. That's for sure. Oh, to who? Yeah. Kim Mulkey? No, no. My partner at the house. I, I have to give invites. You know, yeah. Don't just surprise them anymore. <laughs> Good luck to all the men who try yeah. that today. See if that works for you. All right, Buck. Uh, not a lot hey, of celebrating. Of all, I gotta get my big buck on. Big buck on to Texas women's basketball Big Twelve championship. Big buck on to the ladies. Congratulations and buck on to all of you. Good job. Well, there's a buck on. I got a hunch your first buck off is going to the men's team. Yes, that that was brutal last night. We got um, Weaver, Hunter, Shedrick, Cunningham giving me a total of 10 points in the game. Way to contribute, guys. And for Hunter, that was that's, that's the typical. Have a game, and now will he disappear? Well, he's got some time now. He can go rest. So he can give us a, get us back and at least give us some teens or at least 10 points, double figures. And how about a steal here or there, or maybe a free throw, or maybe some defense even. That, that You don't come off of a game like he had and come back with that. That's awful. Yeah, that's kind of the Tyrese Hunter experience in a yes, nutshell, it is. right, these last two games. I mean, he played his best game, maybe of his Texas career, this past Saturday against Oklahoma. He scored 30. He was just – electric on both ends of the floor he did everything right for the longhorns and he was a huge part hell he was the biggest part of why texas ran away from ou in the second half of the red river shootout in the regular season finale and then three days later buck it's amazing how much of a 180 a guy can take in that amount of time literally three days later against kansas state last night he goes over from the floor and puts up three points in 28 minutes and he took a couple of his teammates with him that's what scares me yeah i mean it, the annoying part is look after that game on saturday uh, tyrese hunter got to speak with the media because when you play that well you get the chance sure. to talk about how well you played and his whole shtick was this is march i've got to step up now this is the most important time of the year i gotta bring it and i'm going to bring it because this is march and that's the type of player that i am and then it's still the month of March, if I'm not mistaken. And last night was, you know, more important because last night was a postseason game. And the first postseason game for Texas here in the month of March, Tyrese Hunter was an absolute non-factor. You that's just the, that's don't the know. That you that's the player that we've known you to be. Yeah, you just don't know what you're going to get from him. You're right. I mean, sadly, what we do know from Tyrese Hunter is that we don't know what to expect from him on any given night. Yeah, you don't, like you said, you don't come off of three days and what you just did and come out like that and just give you three points and nothing more than that. It just, that's, that's not consistent enough. That, no. that, that's, that's a bad bit right there. And as I said, not only did he bring himself down, he pulled a bunch of guys with him, which was very disappointing last night. I thought, they know I, it's, it's all right to lose a game because you're going to the big dance and then sometimes it's better to go get that rest, but for guys to just completely, no show. I mean, that that was that was a brutal. That was about three or four of those guys. Guys have been playing well. Cunningham has been playing well enough. Shedrick has been playing well enough. Those guys, I mean, a combination of those guys for Weaver has been Weaver has been playing. Yeah. I mean, 
a total of 10 points between all four of them. I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah, Texas got next to nothing from its bench last night. And of those four, I mean, Tyrese Hunter is the most frustrating because he is a starter sure. and he is supposed to be one of your best players. But you're right, you can't have four guys that – uh, can occasionally bring something to the table, bring absolutely nothing to the table yes. against a desperate team. We touched on it yesterday, right? right? Kansas State needed that game. Now, they probably need at least one or two more to punch their ticket to the NCAA tournament. But if they lost last night, there was a 0% chance they were getting in. That's right. They were going to play with desperation. Obviously, the game was in Kansas City, so you knew it would be more of a K-State crowd. And in the second half, they looked like the more desperate team last night. They out-rebounded Texas. They out-muscled Texas. They got to lose balls quicker than Texas. They just – the Texas could not match that intensity, which was crazy because in the first half, Texas brought it. Texas played one of its better halves of the year in the first half last night. And they had a 10-point lead going into the locker room. They shot 57% from the floor in the first 20 minutes. Like, just about everything went right in the first 20. And then – Au contraire, just about everything went wrong in the second 20. It looked like a team that wanted to go and have some time off. Time to just roll it and go back home. Let's go home and get some rest, hang out, wait for, you know, selection Sunday, and then let's have some tough practices and go because, boy, this group needs another another tough practice, you know, of diving on the floor, getting to loose balls because, you know, one and done from here on, it's yeah. it, it's it's sad. That's That's not the way you come off of a nice win against your rival that's 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 not that you're supposed to pound that team into the ground you had them down by 10 you're supposed to beat them by 20 last yeah. night and cruise to victory yeah texas was a five to five and a half point favorite last night and once again they only lost by four but at one point they were down by 10 in the second half so there was a 20 point swing over the yep. course of the second half or once again texas led by 10 at the break and then they were down by 10 they did come back and make it interesting towards the end there was a garbage intentional foul call on oh, yeah. Kendall Weaver which really was the dagger for Texas I mean that was absolute bullshit right there Kendall Weaver you know, he was trying to foul Texas was down by two with about 22 seconds to go but he tripped and fell into uh the K-State guard Tyler Perry and in a sense tackled him because he lost his balance he stumbled into Perry and he brought Perry to the ground with him and Doug Sermons you know we got to have a ref show and yes, it, of course. It, it's very annoying when you know the names of the refs because that means they suck. And Doug Sermons somehow grades out as one of the better college basketball refs. But if you're a college basketball junkie like myself, you know that name because he's pissed your team off and he's pissed you off a number of times over the course of his officiating career. He's got to be a hero. And he's thinking, oh, yeah, clearly Kendall Weaver would not just try to accidentally foul in this spot. He wanted to actually tackle the player to prove a point. So I got to call an intentional foul, which gives K-State two free throws and the ball back. So it should have been, yeah, can't, uh, Texas should have had an opportunity uh, to get the ball after two K-State free throws. And instead, uh, K-State gets the ball after those two free throws. They score on the ensuing inbounds play, and they push the lead to six. And in a sense, that was the ball game right there. That was quite annoying. Yeah, I mean, that's, did, did the commissioner get to him before or, yeah, or halftime of the game when they were down by 10 saying, hey, you guys got to start calling some fouls here? Yeah, well, the officiating did change again in the second yeah. half, and that keeps happening for Texas. But, you know, I'd love to just sit here and chalk this up to Big 12 refs being Big 12 no, refs. Yeah. But this has been an issue for Texas all year long. They have struggled to defend without fouling, uh, especially away from home. And some people might hear that and say, well, it's their last year in the Big 12. So maybe that's the reason. Well, I go back and look at Texas's last two tournament losses, and they got hosed by the refs. Like, sometimes it happens. You don't ever want to leave the game in the hands right. of the officials. And Texas was playing well enough in the first half to where the refs weren't going to be a factor. Right, but and they shouldn't the have second, been a factor. Yeah, in the second half, Texas shot 29% from the floor. They kept turning the ball over on offense and then they got lazy at times defensively and all of that in conjunction with the officials just blowing the whistle more than I would have liked that allowed K-State to get back into the game but it's been a repeated issue for Texas their inability to defend without fouling and I am worried that that is one of the things that's going to plague them whenever they do bow out of the real tournament well they're one of the best teams in the nation don't ever forget that yeah well, let's the hear most from inconsistent teams in the nation that's what they are 
They are indeed. Let's hear from uh, the guy who said that, right? Rodney Terry. That was after the Baylor game where he talked about Texas being one of the best teams in the country. Here's what he had to say last night after the loss in the second round of the Big 12 Conference Tournament. I mean, you, we want to win a conference. Do we want to win this tournament? Absolutely. We came here to win this game, you know, but, you know, we've done enough work right now to put ourselves in position to be in the tournament. We're going to be excited about competing, the, you know, this time of year. And, uh, you know, uh, would it have been great to win this tournament? Yes. But at the end of the day, you know, we're trying to play for the whole thing. So, you know, we got to get back. Be excited about continuing to compete and uh, continue to work on our bodies and put ourselves in the best best position to be ready to play at a high level. So, you know, at the end of the day, that's what you have to do this time of year. Yeah, what that comes across is we didn't really give a shit about that game to me. Sorry, I sorry I see it that way. That's kind of dumb on my part, maybe as a coach, but that that doesn't have enough fire in it for me. No, we play like crap. Yeah, we're gonna go home and get some rest, but that was a shitty game by us. We didn't do well. We didn't. We didn't play in the second half. We had a 10-point lead. That's how I'd be telling it. I wouldn't be saying, like, you know, we still just, you know, we're, 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 you know, we wanted to win. No, it didn't sound like you wanted to win to me. It sounded like you were pretty satisfied of going home and getting some rest and then getting back to it. Now, if you do that, that's going to be fine. But I don't trust that they didn't do that. No, I don't either, right? And I said it yesterday. Like, if Texas loses in the first round of the actual NCAA tournament, I wouldn't be surprised. And if Texas puts it together for a couple of games and makes it to the second weekend of the tournament, I wouldn't be that surprised. You just never know. It's a mystery box every time Texas basketball takes the floor. You just never know what you're going to get from this team. And, hell, it's it's not even game by game, as we found out last night. It's half by yeah. half. Hell, we saw that in Waco a couple of weeks ago, right? Texas was dominating the first half against Baylor. And then things fell apart in the second half of that game. Like this team, it's just on any given night or on any given right. half, you're not sure what to expect. And yeah, I, I didn't love that answer from Rodney Terry. He just went low hanging fruit. Like, like I, I think Texas wanted to be there last night. I think Texas wanted to win that game last night, but they didn't. And then you just say, oh, now nah, we're more focused on the NCAA tournament. That's an easy thing to do. Sure. But really, I wanted to hear and For some now. people, I and, and for some teams, I understand – that's what they, you know, Bill Self could care less. You know, he's won it so many times, but he knows what the big picture is. You know what I mean? He, 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 he's kind of that way. Sometimes it's better to go get some rest. But, hell, that guy's found a way to win so many of those championships. They get there, and it really means something. This group gets there, and that, that just didn't seem like it meant very much to me. Well, it's, you know, you look, at, you look at Kansas, right? Kansas got blown out by Cincinnati last yes, night did. in the game after the Texas one. And Kansas didn't have its two best players. Was it still a good performance by Kansas? No, but like Kansas, okay, they've got the excuse. Like if Texas didn't have the Sioux or Ace Miss last night and they lost, oh, then, yeah. all right, that's why you lost. You didn't have your two best players. You'll get them back for the tournament, so you expect things to be a little bit different. Uh, look at Oklahoma. Oklahoma lost to TCU, and TCU kind of stomped on them yesterday. Well, Oklahoma didn't have its two best players in the game yesterday. So they could sit here and say, well, yeah, that's kind of why we lost. We wanted to rest up and get our guys right, right for the real tournament. Texas had everybody last night. That was a game Texas was trying to win. And you see some of what happened in the second half, and you might question that. But no, Texas wanted to win that game. I mean, Rodney Terry, think about last year. And there's always the debate, Buck, what's better? Like, do you want to make a deep run in your conference tournament? Right. So you're playing well going into the big dance, or would you rather lose early so you get that extra rest to get everybody right? I'd rather be about, playing well. Think about, right? yeah, last year. Like, Texas won the Big 12 tournament, and it sparked a run to the Elite Eight. So I, I think that's what they wanted to do this time around. They wanted to get that win last night. And then they wanted to beat Iowa State today and see how far they could go in the tournament, but they didn't. They didn't play well enough. And now I'm sitting here yesterday saying, hey, Texas might be playing its best basketball of the season right now to here we go again. I don't know what the hell we should expect yeah. whenever Texas takes the floor next Thursday or Friday for their first round game. Yeah, it made it easy enough to say, no, we're, we're, you know, we're ready to go. We're going to be in the big dance. You know, yeah, we wanted to win, but since we didn't, guess where we're going? We have, we have our sights set on something else. Well, we'll see. Uh, obviously, we'll just see. How that carries over, but I'd like to be playing my best basketball. I would, I would, I would like to not give up a ten. You know, I want, I'm up by ten at half to a team that's fighting for their lives. Yeah, they're going to fight hard, but I'm going to stomp them. If I'm up by ten, I need to win by twenty. And I've got all my guys playing coming off of that Oklahoma game. That that's I'm not letting down. This isn't this couldn't be a letdown because we're automatically in. This should be 
No, we're firing on all cylinders. Everybody, you know, Hunter needs to stay hot. These other guys need to play, you know, aggressive basketball. Not that that stuff we got in the second half of last night's game. That's just – that doesn't – you can go get all the rest you want. That doesn't make me think that you're going to be ex- excited and ready to go, you know, in a, in a week or so. I mean, it just – it just doesn't – it's a bad look. I'll just say that. It's a bad look. Yeah. You may think they wanted to win that and all that stuff, but it's a bad look to me. It is. Oh, I'm with you 100%. And, look, losing to K-State, there's not a ton of shame in that. Once again, K-State, a bubble team fighting for, their, twice. fighting for their tournament lives. Right? No, no. Texas won the first Texas game. Texas won by four in the last time. That's right. It was a, they, they scrambled to win that game. Yeah. They won by six, but it was ugly. It wasn't a great showing. Your point yeah. stands. But, look, there's there's not a ton of shame to losing to K-State in Kansas City. The shameful part is you blew a double-digit lead. Like, that. that's the problem right there. Like, okay, if you just lost the game, you're not happy about it. We're still sitting here wondering what the deal is with this Texas basketball team. But it's more embarrassing to lose in the fashion that Texas lost in last night to where it felt yes. like they had that game in control. They led for, like, 25 minutes, and then they just completely collapsed. Well, I just don't like the fact that the guys who have been playing well – didn't play, you know, they were okay in the first half, and then all of a sudden they just weren't. Kendall Weevil's been playing really good basketball. He didn't give you very much of any. He gave, well, he gave you nothing offensively, scored zero points. Yeah. But, I mean, they just didn't defend well. Like you said, they just looked like, you know, when it was time to really play some defense and to, you know, they're still in the game. They're always in the game against K-State. I mean, it's a nasty-looking game, but they just – I just didn't see anything from them that just tells me they'll be prepared and ready to go. Well, the reason they lost, and this is the scary thing for Texas, like the blueprint is out on how to beat Texas. If you get Dylan to sue in foul trouble, Texas is in trouble, right? That's, I mean, we saw what happened in Waco when Dylan to sue had to leave the game. Texas completely fell apart. And then last night, oh my God, the refs were horrible in this game. And that was a huge turning point, right? Dylan to sue had just one foul in the first half, but in the first like two minutes of the second half, he picked up two offensive fouls. One of them was a good call, but the second offensive foul and DeSue's third foul of the game was a horrible call. And DeSue had to go back to the bench because he had yeah. three fouls early in the second half, and that allowed K-State to go on a little bit of a run. And then DeSue comes back into the game, and then they call a fourth foul on him for diving for a loose ball. It was a bullshit. Like, if you want to call conspiracy theory and say Brett Yormark made some sort of call – to the refs that at halftime. Huh? That was the one. Like the way Dylan DeSue was officiated in the second half of that game was atrocious. And because he was in foul trouble, he only got to play 23 minutes. Texas looks lost without him. He couldn't get into a rhythm because he just could play in three minute spurts before he picked up another garbage foul and had to go sit on the bench for a long stretch. Like that, that's it. If Dylan DeSue gets into foul trouble, this team is done. Right. So they've got a shot to hang with some good teams, I think, if the Sioux is on his game, because there's enough talent on this team to, once again, they can run with some quality competition across the country. I think we've seen that this year. But I'll tell you what, man, if Dylan the Sioux gets into foul trouble next week, then it's over. I don't care who Texas is You're playing against. Right. A nine seed in round one, a one seed in round two, whatever. If, uh, yeah, the Sioux's going to have a stat line like he did last night. You know, you can't beat K-State. There's no way you're going to beat teams that are actually in the real oh, no. tournament field. Yeah, that was that was that's too much of a struggle after being up by that many points at halftime. It's just they shouldn't have had to struggle last night. Those guys should have played better than that. Yeah, and you need more than Max Aismas. Aismas was great. Now, not his best shooting day in the world, but he had 26 points, four assists, four rebounds, just one turnover. Uh, he did his thing. It Horton. You hate to waste a good It Horton performance because you don't sorry, have absolutely. You don't have too many of those. He was a, a very nice six of nine from the floor. Had fourteen oh, points. Yeah. Dylan Mitchell was great in the first half. Didn't do much in the second half, but you know he was six of six from the floor. It's amazing that that guy just can't make a free throw. Like do, work on your free throws, man. You're a sophomore in college. You've been playing basketball forever. You're gonna go one of five from the free throw line in a postseason game. Like that's, I mean, if I'm if I'm Rodney Terry, I'm putting Dylan Mitchell on the free throw line at the end of every practice for like an hour between now and the actual tournament, and just hoping that he can find something there because that might be part of why Dylan Mitchell is so passive at times on offense. He's worried if he gets fouled, he's gonna have oh, to shoot free throws. Free throws, huh? He can't make shit at the line. 
Uh, it's it, it was frustrating, man. Just all in all, a frustrating game. Bad officiating, bad basketball. Texas was 6 of 23 from deep. The Sioux wasn't good enough. He shouldered a lot of the blame after the game last night. And once again, the officiating didn't do him any favors, but he knows he's got to be better. And, yeah, Texas needs more from Brock Cunningham. They sure as hell need more from Tyrese Hunter. Otherwise, it will be a very short-lived stay in March Madness. Yeah, and and Weaver cannot all of a sudden go blank either. I mean, we need steals yeah. from him. We need defense from him. We need him to give you six points. Give me six because he's he's aggressive enough to get tips and everything else. He can't go. He can't go blank. His his point sheet can't be zero. Now he know? was trying. He was trying too hard. You know, Weaver's always aggressive. He's always going to be like Energizer Bunny level juice every time he's on the floor, but. For a guy his age and with his lack of experience, he generally does a good job of kind of letting the game come to him. He's not trying to do too much. He was trying a little bit too hard last night. Oh, he was taking those jumpers when he should have given it up. Yeah. Again. Yeah. And yeah ball up. Fouls, just over aggressive on defense. Yeah. And uh yeah. Your, I mean, mark, your mark was not gonna let you be aggressive last night. He didn't want you bumping guys. No, congrats to Brett Yormark, by the way, because Texas and Oklahoma both lost. So you know, he's had to present a lot of conference championship yes, trophies to both of those schools this year, and he might have to present a few more before it's all said and done. Uh, congrats to him. He got his wish because, you know, he already had to give the women the trophy two days ago. He was really hoping to avoid giving one to the men, and well, he doesn't have to come close to worrying about no. that. Uh, we'll see. Selection Sunday is, of course, this Sunday. Three days from now, Texas is in the tournament field. We know this. No need to fret about that. Uh, I think Texas is an eight or a nine. If I had to pick right now, I would say that will be an eight seed in the tournament. There's no real difference between an eight and a nine. It's just the number that's by your name, and it's also the color jersey that you wear in the first round. But uh, that would be my guess. The highest Texas could be is a seven. The lowest they could be, I guess, is a ten. But once again, I I feel you don't, like you, know, you don't see him put about an eight or a nine, eight or a nine, right? Yeah, yeah. Like I think seven is more likely than ten, sure. if we're being perfectly honest. But once again, I think eight is uh, eight is what most of the brackets out there are saying right now. And even though last night was disappointing, I don't expect that to change very much, unless you have a bunch of bid stealers over the next couple of days. But most of the smaller tournaments are over, so uh, yeah, I, I expect to see Texas. Uh, once again, called as an eight nine, and they'll, they'll hear their name pretty early because they always start with one. They go one sixteen and an eight nine. So whatever region Texas is in, I think we'll find out pretty early on Sunday what uh, what their run looks like. All right, we'll get okay. back. Thanks to the folks at Sue Patrick yesterday. What a good time that was again. Yes. How about always that fun yesterday? Oh man, always a great time on uh, QVC. <laughs> when we're modeling all the great gear that they've got at Sue Patrick. Yeah, I'm fantastic out bags of stuff. I got bags of stuff walking out of there. Dude, I had to help you carry stuff to your car wow. yesterday. I didn't even ask. What did you buy? I bought a bunch of stuff for the golf tournament. I mean, there, you know, when, when Jay and those guys put stuff up that normally is like 60, 70 bucks and I can buy it for $14, I'm getting that. That's stuff people will love at the golf tournament. You know, I, I generally, the the word is buck we don't need your popcorn makers this year we've had two years of popcorn makers i think we all have one now guys are like give us some give us some stuff and yesterday there was stuff there like cool stuff and i can't wait to make the gift baskets and boy did sue patrick help me out big time jay and the gang over there and sue and that staff helped me out yesterday i loaded up bags of stuff which i'm not done because they've got great sales and even when they don't have great sales They've got great, great pricing. They really, really do. You know, the old bucket hat for nineteen dollars. You kidding me? I love great it. I, I, I love going into that place. And that's not just a Bucky price. That's an everybody price. They've yes. got that badass Nike on field Texas bucket hat on sale right now for nineteen ninety five. Yeah. Over at Sue Patrick, the best selection of Longhorn gear in town. They also have all of the great ladies' clothing, tons of great trinkets as well. They got tons of cool Longhorn accessories, too. I was walking around the store. They got shot glasses. They got head covers for your yes. golf clubs. They got cool belts with Longhorn logos on them. They got steering wheel covers. They got seat covers. I mean, anything. I walked out with those head covers yesterday. There you go. You're wearing a condom? 
<laughs> yeah, I need to cover up. I got them. There I you go. Them. Yep. SuePatrick.com is the website. You can buy everything online or check the store out in person. 5222 Burnett Road, the iconic Sue Patrick. Yeah, fun show there yesterday. Uh, Tanner asked, how many Big 12 teams make the dance? Nine? Yeah, I think it'll be nine Big 12 yep. teams in the tournament. Curious to see what happens to Oklahoma. Uh, they'll be in. I think there's a slim chance that they have to go to Dayton and play in the first four just because of the way they struggled down the stretch. But my guess is there will probably be a 10 seed, so they'll avoid that. But yeah, I think we'll get nine Big 12 teams in the tournament. K-State has a chance. I think they need two more wins. Uh, Cincinnati has a chance. That they might need two, if not three more wins, but I think more than likely – when the bracket comes out on Sunday, there will be nine Big 12 teams in the dance, and that will oh, lead. Kansas needs to a team that needs some rest to get their guys healthy. Wow. Oh, Kansas is screwed. Like, Kansas will be probably a four. They could be a three. You could make a strong case they could be a three just because of what they did early in the season, but uh, what they did late, they could probably be like a six or a seven. Yeah. Um, they'll be a popular upset pick in the first round. I assume they'll beat the 13 or the 14 that they play, but – in the second round, if they're going up against a five seed or a six sure. seed, I have zero faith in KU right now. Even when they get McCuller and Dickinson back, like that team just – they have struggled mightily in conference play this year. and they I don't have much faith. As great of a coach Bill Self is and as much talent as there is at the top of that roster, uh, yeah, this this is not one of those years where you should expect those two KU guys are at the, and the, Those two dudes are at the top of their roster too, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they just – they haven't – they haven't gotten enough from anybody else, and uh, it's been a, it's been a frustrating college basketball season for BK this year. I can tell you that much because Texas has been as up and down as you could possibly be, and uh, Kansas. And I'm so used to Kansas being one of the best teams in the country, and they are clearly not that right now. So, uh, yeah, March Madness, can't wait. The best. All right, we'll take your thoughts. The code of text line, 512-222-9328. YouTube comment line is open as well. We will talk more Longhorn sports. But, Buck, how about uh, another sponsor shout-out here? Say our good friends over at Relax the Back. As I said you know, yesterday, I did not bring my road chair with me. What the heck's wrong with me? I didn't bring the roadie. You never bring the roadie. I have a roadie, though. I'll take a picture of it and show it to you today. It's in between the cars in the garage, so I park, you know. I'm going to put that thing just a little heavy for me, you know, to, to, to take on the road. And you see my Subaru is packed with all kinds of shit. It's kind of hard to get hard, hard to get that chair in there. But, yeah, but when we get our bands, that's right. When we get our Texas Sports Unfiltered bands, that's when we'll have that baby. Oh, we're going to yeah, have, we, like, wrapped vans driving around yeah, the man. city? Yes. We already have a duck boat wrapped, so might as well have some vans wrapped, too. But uh, relax the back, folks, are absolutely the very best. I'm in my comfortable chair right now, which I need to watch golf in today. Even if I have to fall asleep in this chair, it's better than falling asleep over there in that ice cream sandwich, as I, as I call it. Once I get in the inside of those uh, pads over there, I just sink into it like the vanilla ice cream in an ice cream sandwich that melts. So relax the back is everything that you're, that you're looking for. 35 years of proven expertise, folks. And my back couldn't be happier. If you have thoracic problems, lumbar area problems, or if you got shoulder problems, you need to get over to relax the back and check out the select massage chairs that they have and or get fitted for the right size pillow. I didn't realize you had to get fitted for a pillow that's really going to help you. Now, lately, my right arm has been falling asleep at night. I don't know what that is. Bad circulation, just getting old. You know what I mean? As long as my legs don't fall asleep and then I got to get up in the middle of the night, use the bathroom and fall on the floor. Other than that, they have everything. Select, as I said, select massage chillers, get the, fit, the fitted pillow folks for sure. They've got it all. Sleep reimagined, recover overnight, and restorative sleep you can get at Relax Back. Now, they've got two locations, one in Bee Caves at the Hill Country Gallery across from Whole Foods. And, of course, up north where we were yesterday in Austin at the Gateway Shopping Center across from the container store. Live pain-free like the buck at Relax the Back. Yes, indeed. And shout-out to one of our newest sponsors, the Autograph app if you want to get yeah. rewarded for listening to us our friends at autograph co-founded by tom brady yes that tom brady are redefining the fan experience by letting users earn points for the acts of fandom they take every day just like listening to us the autograph app gives you access to your favorite longhorn content all in one place 
and it offers rewards like tickets, exclusive merchandise, and more. You're already listening to us all day long, at least hopefully you are. Now you can earn points and get rewarded for being a TSU fan. Just head over to the App Store and search for Autograph. Download it for free, completely free. Make sure you use the referral code TSU. If you're watching on YouTube, there's also a link in the video description below. But once again, the name of the app is called Autograph. Fandom rewarded. You should be able to just search autograph and it will pop up. You download it for free. You type in the promo code TSU. Once again, you're going to get hooked up literally just by consuming your favorite Longhorn content. It's a cool concept. Tom Brady is a big part of this thing and uh, you're going to love it. So check it out. The autograph app. Once again, free in the app store and Google play. Yeah. And if you're not quite sure if your heating system or your air conditioning is going to work, Get with the folks at Woods Comfort Systems. Believe me, my wife came up this morning. She said, it's a little warm in here, isn't it? I'm like, I'm good. She goes, but it'll be warmer upstairs because heat rises. She flipped on that air conditioner a little bit, BK, and bang, my room right now is as comfortable as it can get. Yeah, that's right. Heat rises. Did you get that from science class? No? I don't I don't believe in science. Oh, I forgot about that. There's stuff you don't believe in. You don't believe in outer space. You don't believe in science. Yeah, I, I, be, I believe in outer space. I just think it's yeah. a huge waste of time. Yeah. I'm not like Tyler Owens, the former Texas safety who transferred to Texas Tech. Remember we showed that quote at the combine? Oh, yeah. He's like, I don't believe in space. Like, no, nah, I believe in space. I just think it's a massive waste of resources and time. You know, just going up there to see what's going on is a waste of millions, millions and millions of dollars. Who gives a shit, man? You're, like, you're not going, are you? How many times do we have to go to Mars before we can figure out if we can live there or not? I mean, what are we doing? What do, we the moon? what do we need to do with the moon? All right, we already know what the moon is about. Why do we have to keep going there? Plus, we got all the cheese in the world. If the moon is made out of cheese, what do we need? Do we need more cheese? Yeah, just go to the Antonellis. I see those MFers on my TV <laughs> 40 times a week. <laughs> all right. I'm glad Woods Comfort Systems, folks, just to make sure 68 years of service, they're absolutely the very best. Saw their trucks out yesterday. So somebody was trying to click on that air conditioner. It was warm yesterday. It yeah. said 77, but it felt like Oh, why don't I ask Dee Dee what the temperature was? Oh, oh, I can't ask her. She's on spring break. Where is Dee Dee? How does a meteorologist go on spring break? Will you tell me that? They don't get spring break. We don't get off. Do I take spring break when I'm forecasting rain tomorrow? No, I don't get it. No, it will rain tomorrow, folks. Dee Dee's done. BK's starting to lose faith in Dee Dee unless she shows up today. Uh -huh. But you know what? She's probably got the kids on spring break, BK. She can't do weather when she's vacationing. Hey, weather guessers take days off. They don't work seven days a week. What? They've got backup weather guessers. So if you want to be the backup weather guesser while Dee Dee's on vacation, then oh. all right, I will give you the honors. Well, she but did say it would rain today. You're not Thursday. Zach Shields, all right? You're not like the number one weather guy. That's not you. You're not that guy, pal. Folks. Have a good day today because you're going to get rained on tomorrow. That's so cool. enjoy your day. While Dee Dee's on vacation enjoying her day, since there's not going to be any rain, mm -hmm. I'm going to enjoy my day today. And then tomorrow, here comes the rain. That's right. It's coming. That's, that's not the song. How about raindrops keep falling on my head? Is that the song? That one works. Okay. The other one was here comes the sun, isn't it? Yeah. I was going to say, it's literally the opposite of what you're forecasting. Yes, but... Uh, why don't we get Doc Trey a shot at the weather sometime? No, I'm good on that. <laughs> we don't we don't want snow. No, we don't, don't need snow in March. Uh, I barely trust Trey as a doctor. I'm not going to let him be a doctor and a meteorologist. There's wow. no chance that that happens. Are you a little surprised that Dee Dee has disappeared, though? I wouldn't say surprised. I'm disappointed. I did not expect her to go full John Elway and just retire on top. Like I figured she would want to defend her title as TSU's official weather person, but she apparently is falling off into the abyss. She is riding off into the sunset after last week's strong performance. She's a part of the membership yet, too. She's gone. Yeah. yeah but even, not even on the app. She doesn't even – there's no nothing to us. People need to know about the weather. As Jason says. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's entered the listener portal. That's great. I don't know what we did. We gave her a lot of love, and she decided to leave? 
more than she deserved. I'll tell you that right now. I don't know, man. I was proud of her and her performance last week, but well, the day's not up, so I better be careful with that. She's got she's got till ten o'clock today to uh, to come on and say hello and give a weather prediction. Otherwise, we might need a different weather guesser. I'm not going back to you. What you've got to earn my trust and the people's trust again. When it rains tomorrow, I guarantee you they'll all be back. They all come back eventually. It's not enough. I mean, you can't just get one. I'm like the Cowboys. They say they'll leave, but they'll always come back. Every year, their fans are back. Everything. Every year, they're paying $75 for pizza slices up there. You know, they're paying $200 to park their cars. They always come back. They continue to give me their faith like they do with Jerry Jones. It should should just go to 7-Eleven. You can get two slices and a drink for like three fifty on that 7-Eleven app, baby. Yes, you can. That's where you should be getting your pizza. Don't waste it at Jerry World. Yeah, stop supporting the Cowboys, please. Cowboys Support Seven Eleven. Yeah, yeah. Until we get a Seven Eleven inside there, we need. We, that's right. We don't need to be eating their pizzas. What a disaster! Hey, the Cowboys did sign a free agent yesterday. Linebacker Eric Kendricks, who had Eric actually, Kendricks from the Temptations, keep on trucking, baby. Right, I'm sorry? Eddie Kendricks from the Temptations is now playing for the Cowboys. Did you say? I don't think it's Eddie Kendricks, but I do wish it would rain. <laughs> <laughs> so, who is it? Eddie Hendricks? No, Eric Kendricks. Oh, Eric Kendricks. He's been a linebacker in this league for a long time. He spent most of his career in Minnesota with new Cowboys defensive coordinator Mike Zimmer. So you obviously have that built-in relationship there. Yeah, Kendricks had reportedly agreed to a deal with the 49ers yesterday. And And they said, we don't want you. Well, I think he reneged. I think it was him. He changed his mind and decided to sign a one-year deal with the Cowboys. So I don't think we have the financial details yet, but it is a one-year contract for Eric Kendricks. He plays linebacker. That it was a serious position of need for Dallas. I would argue it is still a serious position of need for <laughs> Dallas. Not getting him, yes. But I feel better about the linebacker room today than I did at this time yesterday. So, hey, Jerry Jones is awake, unfortunately, and the Cowboys are on the board. They were the last team to sign an external free agent in this free agency period. And well, now they have finally. I love the way you said that they needed a linebacker yesterday. They signed one and they still need a linebacker. Now they do. I mean, I I really like Edron Cooper, the Aggie who is the top rated linebacker in the class, in the draft class, according to most prognosticators out there. Like for some folks taking an off ball linebacker in the first round is a little rich, but I say at pick 24 where the Cowboys are drafting, I would be perfectly fine with Edge Cooper being that pick. He does so many things right. He's incredibly fast. He's good against the run. He's good in space. He's an instinctual player like that. That, to me, would make sense. Unless the Cowboys plan on signing another linebacker in free agency, which, well, the Cowboys signed one player. What, do you want them to sign two, BK? I mean, how how greedy can you be? That's pretty Uh, greedy on your part, I would say. Yeah, I guess so, even though every other team is signing, like, you know, four, five, six, seven players. Uh, for me to expect Dallas to bring in two feels ridiculous. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, but, yeah, unless they plan on bringing in a linebacker in free agency, if Edge Cooper makes sense, or at least a premium draft pick, one of the first three-round picks for the Cowboys, I think, needs to be a linebacker to help try to stop the run because that is what plagued the Cowboys really all season long. But, obviously, in that playoff beatdown against Green Bay, they just had nothing up the middle. They had no oh. answers against the run because they were playing safeties there, Buck. Well, I know. They're playing guys, they're playing guys 205 trying to trying to take the run on these big guys, these these guards and tackles coming out on them. Yeah, they, they thought they – and you know what? They've got really good safeties too, the Cowboys. They're physical, but they can't play linebacker. They're not linebacker physical. They're no. good. They're good covering the tight end and, and making plays against the run down the field, but not at the point of attack. That's no. not what they do. And it's not like you had Earl Thomas and Cam Chancellor no. as those safeties playing linebackers, right? No. Like maybe maybe some guys that size you could get away with playing linebacker, but those dudes were all pro caliber players who were incredibly physical and played downhill. Uh, the guys the Cowboys were throwing out there last year, I would not use any of those descriptors to uh, describe their game. So. Eric Kendricks, he's 32, uh, 
went to UCLA, was a second-round pick back in 2015, played with the Chargers last year, but spent the first eight years of his career in Minnesota, been a pro bowler. He was a first-team All-Pro in 2019. Now, last year he graded out as a slightly above-average linebacker, so yep. he's not he's not All-Pro level anymore, but he's very smart. Uh, I think he could be a good teacher to a guy like DeMarvion Overshone, who, of course, sure. the Cowboys drafted last year, who is expected, I think, to be a big part of Dallas's defense this coming season. So, yeah, I mean, it's a smart player, uh, probably the smartest linebacker the Cowboys have had since Sean Lee retired a few years ago, but sort of towards the end of his career. I like it. Low-risk move at a position of need. Yes. Once again, I still feel like Dallas needs some more help at that spot. There's no doubt about that. They need, you know, they've got, they, they, you know, they got Van Der Esch, which you think may retire, and they've got um, – kid out of Texas who's coming off a knee. So that's that's not enough assurance that everybody's going to be okay there. Yeah. Like you said, they got one, they picked up one, but now they need still another one or two. They've got to fix that too against, against the run game. Right. I mean, they still need a running back. They still need a defensive tackle. They still need an offensive lineman. I would love for them to re-sign Tyron Smith. He's still out there. He's probably the best free agent at any position still available right now. You know, that would yeah, be nice. Yeah. What kind of deal is he going to want? He's going to want three more years because he's not getting, and they, he can't ask for five. He could, but he could ask for two or three. I'm sure he's going to ask for three, but realistically, I think it is a two year deal that sure. Tyron Smith signs. I'm sure there are teams who are scared to even give him two, but I, I think yeah. he's worthy of two. I mean, when he plays, like he's going to miss a couple of games a year. You yeah. just have to yes. know that when you're signing him. You just hope that it's just, all right, two or three games versus 13 or 14 games. Right. He, he's had a couple of those years, too. But when he played, I mean, he's one of the best left tackles in football still. Like, I hear people say, like, oh, he's done, he's washed. It's like, you're not watching, and you're not reading the grades. Like, this guy is still an elite left tackle. He is a top five left tackle in football when he's on the field. Now, yes. at some point, Father Time's going to catch up, and it won't just be injuries. Like, he will – have a drop in production because everybody does, but no, this, this guy, like the Cowboys are a win now type of team. They, sh they're not rebuilding right now. Tyron Smith is a win now type of player. You bring him back for two more years. I'm perfectly fine with it. Well, all you had to hear is we're all in. <laughs> yeah. I'm seeing something in the, and I'm suddenly seeing something in the players. I don't know which players they are that you're seeing something in, but Hey, we're all in. So mm -hmm. go out and go ahead and, Sign that running back that you need to sign. Quit messing around. Get the offensive line. Resign Smith again and get yourself some linebackers. Let's go. Make the people really believe that you're all in, you know? I just say it. Yeah. Well, you, say, you, you didn't tell me you're all in if you got that, if you still got the same coach. At this you know point. Robert F. Kennedy Jr., he's all in with Aaron Rodgers. It looks like it's going to be. It looks like <laughs> it may be Aaron Rodgers. Is that guy going to try to play football too and be the VP? I mean, really? How does that work? I dude, mean, that dude is a moonshot. He's I mean, just really? gonna, like, I mean, what? The election is in November, right? So, what is Aaron Rodgers going to miss the first two months of the season and just come back? He's going to trail and help, doesn't he? Right. You would think. Or is he just going to play football on Sundays and miss practice all week to travel the country to go campaign? Talk about how the Sandy Hook shooting never happened? And all the other conspiracy theories that he believes in? I don't know how he's going to do that. That That is going to be – dude, he's not playing football anymore. I told you. He's not. He's getting closer and closer to not doing that. Dude, he, he has to be the most narcissistic athlete of all time. And I realize how strong of a claim that is. Because there's a lot of them out there. Oh, my God, throughout the course of time, right? Some call them divas. I'll call them narcissists. There are a ton of them. It's not just a sports thing. It's uh, People in general are like that, but famous people especially, they take it to another level. I, I can't think of another athlete who is willing to do this much to be talked about, like Aaron Rodgers. And they, the guy is willing to literally run for vice president of the United States just so people talk about him more. That shit is next level. I'll give him credit. Not all, he, not all he goes to the like top, that. though. He goes deep. Yeah, I mean, he just anything he could possibly think of to get people talking about him, he does. And it is impressive because it works. Everyone complains about it. I complain about it. But here I am talking about it. He's getting what he wants by throwing his name out into the limelight as often as he does.
going to run for VP of the United States of America. Holy shit. Yeah, that's that's not going to happen. He's <laughs> he may choose him too. It sounds like it's 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 a two person race for the VP. Yeah, between him and Ace Ventura. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> how about that? From one knucklehead that the Minnesota chose as their governor for a year, and they blasted. They couldn't wait to get rid of that dude. That's yeah. right, Minnesota Joe. Minnesota. Uh. Hey, former wrestlers, you're telling me Robert F. John Kennedy, whatever the hell his name is, is between a former wrestler and a current football player as his vice president? Yeah, that's how he is now. I mean, what is going on? I didn't think uh, politics could get any weirder, but... Oh, here we go. I, I found odds. I was like, I feel like I got an email about this yesterday. Why am I getting emails with this shit? Robert F. Kennedy Jr., vice presidential nominee. You want to hear the odds? Oh, boy. Aaron Rodgers is the current favorite at minus 110, followed by Jesse Ventura right behind him at plus 110. So those are your two top guys right now. Marianne oh, Williamson is 14 to 1. I'm looking for Rand Paul to make his move. I don't see him on there. Andrew Yang is 25 to 1. Here's where it gets even weirder. Kanye West is 33 to 1. Matthew McConaughey is at 40 to 1. Tulsi Gabbard is 40 to 1. I don't know who that is. I'll just go to the people I know. Jessica Beale, 75 to 1. Jessica Beale? Now, hold on. That's a ticket I can get behind. There you go. There's a couple other things she's got I can get behind, too. Rob Schneider? Deuce Bigelow, European Gigolo, a <laughs> hundred to one. Oh, where's is, where is Ace Ventura? You're right. Rand Paul, there he is one twenty five to one. There's the guy. Alex Jones, one fifty to one. Man. And then how about a two hundred to one? Nicki Minaj and Charlie Sheen. Oh goodness. What are we doing? You can actually bet on this right now. Any of those names to be the vice president of the United States. Actually, that's just to get the nominee. That's obviously not to win. You could bet on any of those folks to be in the running for the vice president of the U.S. Don't do it. Aaron Rodgers, let him, let him, let this happen, please. You would so love I to can... see it. So your prediction would be right. Well, it's going to happen. He's not, he's not playing football anyway. His first week of practice that his old body is going to be, he's like, I'm not, I can't do this anymore. Y'all. I'm just going to run for vice president. Will that make you happy? I'll give you something to talk about. You want to talk about me? Because you have to I, talk about me. I, I would love I would love for Aaron Rodgers to run for vice president so he can just get his ass kicked. I hate that guy. So, yeah, he's done playing football. Great. I'm tired of watching him beat my favorite team all the time. So you used to just want to see him just lose everything now. I just, yeah, I mean, look, I'd rather him go 0-17 for the Jets next year. That's my preference. Uh, but yeah, if Aaron Rodgers wants to be done with football, because I watch football, I don't watch politics. So yeah, Aaron Rodgers will still find his way onto my Twitter timeline, I'm sure. But I think I'll be able to avoid it more if he's in politics than I will if he's well, in football. Well, I don't know. Yeah, I guess you can be the vice president and do the Hiawatha stuff, you know. I guess it, you know, not I in public. Not. Not in public. Yeah, you know, it's illegal. That's why not. Well, you have to service around you. Just hover them around you. Right. Ayahuasca might actually be legal. I'm not sure if it's illegal or legal, but some of what Aaron Rodgers does is definitely illegal. So uh, that's probably why he can't do that as the VP of the... When he team. speaks, it's illegal. It's just weird. He's a weird guy. He is a weird guy. Uh, one more thought on the Cowboys. Look, this this free agency period is, is it's going to go down as a dud for Dallas. I think regardless of what ends up happening, but they can salvage this thing a little bit. Like, here's what I'd like to see the Cowboys do. I'd love for them to re-sign Tyron Smith. I would love for them to re-sign Stephon Gilmore, and I want them to bring in a running back, like maybe an AJ Dillon. And I would have preferred somebody a little better than A.J. Dillon. Once again, I didn't want them in the Saquon or Derrick Henry sweepstakes. I wanted them to get kind of a mid-tier running back that they could sign for like five to six million dollars a year on a short-term deal. Sounds like Dillon. 
It feels like most of those guys are done. Yeah, Dylan may be a little cheaper than that. Uh, you know, just bring in a running back because you got nobody right now. And then just focus on the draft. Like you bring in a running back, you bring in a corner, you bring in an offensive lineman, then sure. okay, that's fine. Once again, still an underwhelming free agency for Jerry and Steven Jones and company. And the Cowboys will be considered one of the biggest offseason losers for that. But despite the inactivity that we've seen, they can still find a way to make this a half decent. Yeah, this has got to be all Dak's fault, though. Oh, it's always Dak's fault. This is this has got to be. I mean, C.D. Lamb's mom has got to be pissed at Dak for the fact that they're not doing anything in free agency. Well, someone's going to blame Dak because of his contract situation, and, and it really is holding the Cowboys a little bit hostage. Now they have more yes. money to spend than they have, but if the Cowboys wanted to open up the pocketbooks and really give themselves some financial freedom, they would just extend Dak and restructure his deal. But they don't want to do that, it seems. So because of that, as of right now, they've got a $60 million cap hit for Dak Prescott this coming league year, and they have and why to does account. I believe that he's, not, he's going to be a no-show at a bunch of stuff this year and not be that guy that, oh, I'm a team guy. I love my mattress. You know what I'm saying? You know, I my sleep number mattress, I'm having some good night's sleep. I've uh -huh. got to show up to camp. Why do I think he's just going to be a little bit of a pain in the ass? Like a lot of guys are when you're when you're when things are going the way they're going for them. Yeah, well, that's why. I mean, like every quarterback, I shouldn't say every, but a, a lot of quarterbacks, hell, a lot of players do that. When they want a new sure. deal, they hold out. And guys are going into the last year of their contract and they know that they're right. really good and they know that they're really important to the success of their team. They will hold out. Some guys just do it at the start of training camp. Some guys will take it into the preseason. Some guys will take it into the regular season. And yep. that, Dak Prescott has the leverage here. Uh, I keep reminding people, like, I know what the Cowboys would like to do. They would love to just say, Dak, you got to prove it. You get one more year. If you can lead us to the NFC Championship That's game, right. we'll, be, we'll make you the highest paid quarterback in the league, and it'll be all good. But that's that's not how it works. Like, Dak can say, no, I'm not playing on the last year of this deal. I want that long-term financial flexibility because, you know, if I get hurt this year, then I'm not going to get paid. So I want to make sure that I'm taken care of for the future. That's that's not a Dak thing. People will criticize Dak for doing it, but we've seen it a million times. Yes, we've seen it an awful lot. You're right. So and the Dak guy had a the fantastic leverage. year last year. I, let's, let's not forget that part, again, that people tend to forget that, wait a minute, Dak didn't get it done. He had an unbelievable season last year. He was the runner-up for league MVP, and he should have been the league MVP. I know what happened in the playoffs. Let's not forget it's a regular season award. Look at his numbers compared to Lamar Jackson's numbers. Yep. And, like, the Ravens won more games than the Cowboys. You know, the Cowboys had 12 wins last year. Again. Yeah, they lost five times. Like, you, you can't say, like, our record is why Dak didn't. No, the Cowboys were great. They were the two seed. They were one of the best teams in football during the regular season, and Dak was the biggest reason why. Guys should have been MVP. So, I get it. I say it all the time, Buck your legacy as a quarterback in the NFL is defined by what you do in the playoffs. Yes. And, and Dak is two and five in the playoffs. So he could be the most, I mean, look at Eli Manning. Like Dak Prescott is a better regular season quarterback than Eli Manning. Oh, Eli Manning won two Super Bowls and won two Super Bowl MVPs. He's a hall of yes. famer and people love him because of that. Like all that matters is what you do in the postseason. And You're Dak right. has not done enough yet. So the criticism won't go away until really until he wins the Super Bowl, but especially it'll be there until they get yeah, to I the heard, NFC yeah, title. Yeah, it's not enough to to do these MVP things with him. You're right until they win a Super Bowl again. If he's as long as he's the quarterback, it'll be about winning the Super Bowls. Now he'll make a he'll take a step up, but it'll be like people will still say we need another quarterback. We need a better quarterback. He'll always be not good enough. You know. Yep. You're right. You are right. So yeah, how about a great season? How about this text on the code of text line, Buck? By the way, 512-222-9328. If you're tuned in on the TSU app and you want to be a part of the show, I'll tell you how awesome 7-Eleven is. Had hand surgery two weeks ago. The lady saw me struggling trying to get coffee with one hand, so she came over and made my coffee for me. Effing awesome. There Not you go. Much. That's the people there. That's the people that work at 7 Eleven. They'll do, they'll do, they'll do just about anything for you. Yeah. Talk they'll make sure that, that that bathroom down where she is working 
So when I need to use that thing, it doesn't have an out of order sign on it. I need that working. My age is always needs to be working. That's yeah. a priority thing. Okay. I'm worried it won't be working after you're done in there. <laughs> no. That's a priority deal. Yep. They take care of their shops. Love our friends. At I do love seven. the pizza there. They do a good job with the pizza there. And you, you like the rollers. Man, I love that pizza there. Can't do yeah. pizza. Had pizza yesterday. Can't, can't double up on it. Had cake yesterday at the birthday party, grandson's birthday party. Oh, no. I was allowed to have some cake. And then I started <sighs> nibbling on other people's cake. You know what I mean? A little crumbs on the side. Nibbling on other people's cake? Yeah, I had a little. At a, I, at a family birthday party? That is gross. <laughs> I'm like, do you want to take some cake home? I'm looking over at my wife, and I'm like thinking, Oh, hell yeah, I want to take some of this cake home. I got a one in the freezer at home right now. It's still there? Stop. Yeah, it's still in there. Why didn't you bring it to the party yesterday? Can't bring more cake. They had a cake for the kid. You can't, four-year-old, you can't bring another cake to a four-year-old's party. They'll get pissed. It's one cake. It's about them. It's not about me. Yeah, here's extra cake for the kids, you know? There's a second piece. No, no. How many, how many parties do you think a four-year-old will have? Six? Probably one. Yeah, probably three or four different parties. Oh, no, there'll be another party. You think so? Oh, yeah. I mean, one with the friends, one with the family. Those are the two separate ones. There's more than oh, that. You got to have some school schoolmates give you a little something. You know, they're oh. on spring break when you get back. Hey, got to have another one, don't you? Were there any friends at the party yesterday? No, just family. Oh, poor no, kid. No, no, no. That's torture. No. Kid got a bike yesterday. What do you mean torture? Nice. Sweet looking bike, too. Oh, he would have loved to have bragged to his friends about the bike, but I would love to take the training wheels off and go on down the street in that bad boy. Oh, you would have gone on a kid's bike? <laughs> I think he's looking good, brother. <laughs> love to see that. Oh man. Oh, shout out to some of our great sponsors. How about a word from Tom McKay? He texted in yeah. earlier. The Texas Stars, nice win over Rockford last night at the HEB Center at Cedar Park. Of course, Tom McKay, very involved with the Texas Stars and the Texas Stars Foundation. Make sure you all uh, get out to the HEB Center at Cedar Park. Running out of games this season, although the Stars will probably make the playoffs. So you'll get playoffs. To, Heck yeah, man. Let's see some playoff hockey up there in Cedar Park. How about a word, though, from our man, Tom McKay, over at AV Consultations? <laughs> Hi, this is Tom McKay with Audiovisual Consultations. Today's home electronics can be a bit daunting. My company has spent the last 36 years making sure they are not. For those of you who have not experienced our services yet, we'd like to invite you to give us a try for all your home electronics needs. We carry all the major brands of televisions and stereo equipment at prices you can't find in stores. And we come to you. There's no need to leave your home to find great pricing and incomparable service. No traffic and experienced sales geeks or pushy showroom tactics. We believe in having some fun and dreaming big. Do you have a dream for your home entertainment? Let us know. We can make it come true. And we are always there to help after the job is done. We cultivate clients for a lifetime by treating everyone like their family. No, not those family members. I'm talking about the ones you actually like. So relax, hug your kids, make love to your wife, and smile. Then, when you have a moment, give us a call at 255-8678. It's 512-255-8678 or online at avconsultations.com. And folks, if you need that specialized patient-focused orthopedic care, our friends at Texas Orthopedics, that's where you want to go. Their physicians offer comprehensive surgical and non-surgical orthopedic care for children and adults. You got that bad ankle, that bad wheel that's bugging you. Go see Dr. Christopher Danny or, of course, Dr. Stockton over there. They are dedicated orthopedic surgeons, and their goal is to get you back into good health and give you that great quality of life that you definitely deserve. Visit TXOrtho.com for more information. Texas Orthopedics is the largest independent orthopedic practice in the state of Texas. Once again, for more information, go to TXOrtho.com. Absolutely. Love all of our great sponsors here on Texas Sports Unfiltered. And we thank them for their continued support. We used that Olipop yesterday. You know how warm it was yesterday? For some odd reason, it just said 77 degrees. Please tell me it was in the 80s yesterday because that felt hot and humid yesterday. Something must have been going 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 on with my Subaru uh, climate control, BK, because it felt, you know, inside it said 76, 77. I'm like, it's got to be 80 degrees yesterday. That sun was hot. Is it all the incense and candles you had in there? <laughs> Burning that Hiawatha in there. A lot of tarot cards. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. I know what you're getting at. 
Mo, well, by the way, I haven't paid for my uh, ticket yet. I haven't gone over there physically and, and limped in there. Today is the day. I'm going in, folks. No way. I'm going in to the municipality that is Lakeway. I'm going right to the right after the show. I'm headed that way. I'm going in there with ticket in hand and checkbook. And I'm going to, in my mind, bringing ring. I, I'm thinking about putting on the championship ring from the high school. Yeah, no, you I'm, should. You think so? You should. I don't know if it will do anything at this point, but maybe the judge or whoever the hell you're going to meet with is like, oh, what is that? I think they have what they have. I think they have magistrates in that courtroom in the municipality. What the is hell is that? that? They have the guys with the white wigs and stuff like in England. I they think have they the constitutional those. convention over there? <laughs> I <laughs> think that's, that's where I'm walking into. Powdered so I, wigs, I, wooden teeth. I better have my shit together when I go in here. I better not go in here just knocking rings on, tapping rings on things. I better know what the Constitution is about over there at the municipality. Well, shit, yes. you better bring a gun just in case a duel breaks out. If <laughs> that's what's going on over there. Yeah, but that's all I need to do is walk into there with a gun in my hand. It would hey. be over. Open carry, isn't it? Well, whatever it is, I don't think I can stroll over to the municipality. I think it'll be shoot first, ask that black man questions later. Uh, that's usually how yeah. it works. Uh, I think I'll, yeah, that, I'm not going in there with a gun. That's, <laughs> that's what I'm going to see when I walk <laughs> in the municipality. I just that's did not a Officer Peacock. I just did a Google image search for magistrate, and this is one of the first things that popped <laughs> up. Oh, man. Good luck today. So what was it, 275? 274. Why not 275? What is 274? You'd rather 275. pay the extra dollar? That's a roller at 7 Eleven. 274. Man. For going 44 miles per hour. In a 30. In a 30. Downhill. When Peacock yeah. says, I know that you weren't on the gas. I know because I can see the flag. You were flashing the, you know, the brake lights as you're coming down the hill. Gaining speed down that soapbox derby hill that they have back there, mm -hmm. you know. But it's those, you know what? It's those kids that have been going down there 50. That's the problem. Hey, tell Officer Craven Moorhead to <laughs> give it a rest. All right. <laughs> He's still hiding behind the trees with his scooter. I mean, he was hiding behind a tree. Come on, Buck. How does this happen? Hmm. 274. I, you know what? I got information for Tom McKay. Get it over with. Pay it. It's not going to do anything to your insurance. Just get it over with. You don't need anybody. Just go do it. Yeah. I heard the magistrate magistrate's name is Jack Golf. Do I have that right? <laughs> no. A long lost oh. cousin of Jared Golf. Jack Golf. Man. Incredible. All right. Did so you're going to pay it? Are you going to stumble in? Are you going to act old and decrepit? Like with a walking cane, or maybe you got your wife pushing you in there with the wheelchair. What's your bit here? No, I was thinking about cane and glad dark glasses, but I said, no, that's not going to work. That did work for me on a trolley once, but I'm not doing that now. I was young and silly when I did that and it worked. Are you trying to get a senior discount or something? No, I got a blind person's discount going up to oh. friends, helping me up college buddies going to the back with the dark glasses on. Didn't have to pay the trolley fare. That wasn't funny, but I got wow. away with it. At the That's, time, it seemed funny. You and Stevie Wonder, black yeah. guys who are faking being blind. Wait a minute. That's not true there, Elling. Okay? Nah, That's not it's true. true. It's not. He did not grab for the microphone. Yeah, he did. Off. He knew it was falling. Come on, man. And there's no. that, I got to cut this up. There's that. I think it's Shaquille O'Neal who told the story that Stevie Wonder was coming over to his place one time to hang out. And when he, drove over, he drove over. Yeah, he saw Stevie Wonder like parking his car in front of his place. Like, how the hell can you do that if you can't see? First of all, who fakes blind for all this time? Nobody in their right mind. Yes, he's made a lot of money. He can sing. He's very entertaining. But no, nobody's faking that. That's a bad bit right there. I don't. Yeah, he he's definitely visually impaired, but I I don't think he's full blind. I think he's got the ability to see oh, there's a very, there. very little. You literally type in Stevie Wonder on YouTube, and the first thing that comes up is Stevie Wonder not blind. 
No, it doesn't say that. Not not any of the great music that he's made. The guy might be my favorite musician of all time. That's not what comes up. It's Stevie Wonder, not blind. Wow. I remember yeah. Trey giving me that bit a couple of years ago where, have you ever seen when the microphone falls and he grabs it real quick? I'm like, yeah. no, dude. That's just, I mean, people have reactions to things. You know, it makes their sensitivity to hearing things that are about to move or about to fall. And they reach and grab it, you know, mm -hmm. like cat. Like I mean, I can I can think that it's not because he saw the damn thing. What do you see? The shadow of the microphone going down or something? Yeah, he saw that he ran into it, <laughs> and he caught it, just like what any of else would do. Oh, we see that we run into something. Something's falling. Oh God, let me try to catch it. And he just happened to grab it. Just happened to grab it. Yeah, perfectly. Wow, what are the odds? A blind yeah. guy you could perfectly catch it. Bad bit. Was, Bad bit. We, Nobody plays that bit for life. Do we know if he He's has ever climbed? Old. Has he ever climbed Mount Everest before? No, I don't think so. No, dude, that's a that would be a bad bit for life. Even though you could get rich on it somehow. No thanks. You remember I'm not this playing one? That bit. You remember this one? Right after the break, we're going to interview Eric Weihenmayer, who climbed the highest mountain in the world, Mount Everest. But he's gay. I mean, he's gay. Excuse me, he's blind. So we'll hear about that coming okay. up. Okay, as we had. <laughs> no, I was the first. No, he's what? He's gay. Yeah, that used to be a draw back at the old place. He's gay and you, blind. You've never seen that? Yeah, this guy climbed Mount Everest, but here's the kicker: he's gay. I mean, <laughs> sorry. He's... Right after the break, we're going to interview Eric Weihenmayer, who climbed the highest mountain in the world, Mount Everest, but. He's gay. I mean, he's gay. Excuse me. He's blind. So we'll hear about that. Oh, we're, we're going to hear about that. Excuse <laughs> me. Excuse me. <laughs> Way to go, Cynthia. Nice job there. Hey, Cynthia, we too low. That's, Come on now. that's a great story. A gay guy climbed to the top of Mount Everest. That is horrible. He scaled that mountain. That, that was hard to get over right there. She may not have been fired, but she may be fired herself after that. How does yeah. she come back the next day on that? We too low? We too <laughs> low. Something was definitely wrong with Cynthia That, that is definitely still the very best. The only thing better than that is your guy from Houston. <laughs> your guy from Houston with the bugs and the bees. Uh, you want to watch that, is, that again? Dude, that is the best. We I'm going to have to say, that's better than we too low. We've got it another is. TVT video that we will show later today, but since we're on the topic right now and we're having it's some fun, best. I'll show you the uh, yeah Isaiah Carey news clip that you're talking about. What really happened on that Thursday here at Augusta High School that led to Chris Wood's death? Hold on. NSFW. You oh, got yes. Kids in the car. There's your gotcha. earmuffs warning. All right, here we go. What really happened on that Thursday here at Augusta High School that led to Chris Wood's death? The fuck is that? Shit! Oh. I'm dying in this fucking country ass fucked up town. <laughs> Shit flying in my mouth. The fuck? I can't see pilot. Let's get the fuck out of this country, motherfucker. I can't even see me. Okay. <laughs> oh my, bring him back live. Oh my goodness, that is too much. That poor guy, what is it, just a swarm of bees got him or flies? June bugs got him. I think it was just one bug that flew oh. into his mouth and that was enough for that reaction right there. Oh. I'm going to say he overreacted there. Just a little bit, huh? Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. I mean, That's went, better. That's the best. He went from he professional. He Did he? So he still was in TV for a while after that? He's still in TV. He's in Houston. He works for the Fox affiliate down there. Does a great job. He's got his own show, Isaiah Carey Uncensored. After that, yes, Uncensored for sure. Yeah. Nah, he, Man. he does great work. He's a good dude. Like, that was early in his TV career when he was in Louisiana. It's funny. Man. He's like, oh, this guy must be from the city. Like, he was just working in some small-ass town that he had never oh, been to. Man. No, he's from Louisiana. Like, he's from small-town Louisiana. So he's, I he's guess. He's from piss on the floor of Louisiana. 
Yeah, I guess so. I can't remember exactly where he's from. Well, everywhere is piss on the floor, Louisiana. <laughs> he's from Baton Rouge, funny enough. Oh, that's for sure, piss on the floor. And he went to Southern. Yes, he, nice, very nice. Which is also near Baton Rouge. So he spent piss a lot of time in Louisiana. That's he's, it. He spent most, if not all, of his life in the South, where, yeah, you get some big ass bugs down here. Yes, you do. And he got caught off guard by one of them, and he got a little taste. He tasted one went down his throat. That was too much. That is great. That's one of the all-time greats. You've been hiding that for years. I can't believe you kept that under wraps for years. Well, I've known you for years, and I, that's the first time this, before you know, in August, that's the first time that has ever come up. You kept that to yourself in your vault of all well, these great ones. At the old place, we – we're only on radio, so we didn't have oh, the video right. to show. Not, yeah, and we couldn't say we couldn't get that off, right? Yeah, and there's a lot of cuss words in that clip. So if we had to follow the FCC rules, half of that would be beeped out, and it wouldn't be nearly as funny. Well, so, the old plays, if they followed most of the FCC rules, they wouldn't be in business. Yeah. What about my tickets? Coke Fest tickets? Yeah, I found out. I talked to somebody yesterday. She hadn't got hers yet either. Got them for her sons and oh. her refund has not come back she had to yet. tell the kids that the concert had been canceled well i mean it didn't get canceled until like the week of the concert kind of hard to cancel people then was but kid, no kid's she said, birthday I, gift? I didn't get my refund back i brought those for my kids mm. i said they're gonna they're they're coming easter it's in one of the easter egg hunts you'll find your ticket refunds oh you think so I'm probably not going to find them there either. They're just going to go around Central Texas to all of these Easter egg hunts and just drop money. <laughs> Refunds. No, I'm probably thinking it's not going to happen there. Um, I no? So. I don't think you're going to see that money. I don't think she's going to see that money. And Gosh. I think their kid's birthday was ruined because the gift their mom got them. Yes. Was all for not. It was a oh, gift, gift of love from the mom. And now she's trying to get them something else. And guess what? You can't afford it. Fixed income. Tough. Like me, fixed income uh, municipality. I'm going to fix income and you're going to take 270 Come on. That's the word. It's fixed income when I walk in there today. Is that going to work? No. You're driving, no. Around, you're driving around Lakeway. Ain't a lot of fixed income in that part of the city. Yeah, but I'm, on, I'm just I'm coming up in the Subaru outback. It's true. That's right. Little yeah. tassels, tassels on the mirror. Hell yeah. Yeah, congratulations. Your carpet munching car, I think, is not going to help you out too much here. It's got to. Sorry about that, guy. No. Oh, man. All right. Um, before we get to today's TBT video, because we do have another one, and this is another really, really good one, and it has to do with St. Patty's Day, which, of course, is coming up on Sunday. So I've saved this for a while just waiting for St. Patrick's Day to be upon us. And because it is, we will show the video for you today. Uh, how about the players, Buck? One of the biggest oh, yeah. tournaments of the year in the PGA Tour is underway. Rory McIlroy, four under par through six holes. He is your sole leader right now. Very early stages of the yes. opening round, of course, of this four-day tournament. Uh, Scotty Scheffler was the favorite, a huge favorite. He was plus 525. Rory McIlroy was the second biggest Vegas favorite. He was at plus 1,400. So Scotty Scheffler was damn near three times as big of a favorite as anybody else playing in this event this weekend. Scotty hasn't teed off yet. His, uh, he will begin his round at about 1140 Central Time. But Scotty won this event last year. He, of course, won the Arnold Palmer last week. He's the number one player in the world. But God, plus 525, like, I love Scotty. And of course, he's got a shot. He's in the mix every single week, it feels God, like. On that the that's horrible. Like, that's not even worth it, is it? That's too bad of odds. No, I don't I wouldn't mess with that one. No. You know who's winning? Jordan Spieth's getting. Jordan Spieth is back. I'm going to give him a shot at it this week. Okay. He's on the course right now. He is one under through six. I'm going to him give him a shot this week. Tied for 13th right now. Uh, yeah, he's been in 
the running in a few of these tournaments thus far in the early going, but he God, disappears after Friday. Yeah. Even, even he's made it through Saturday in some of these events, like late last season and early this season, but just on Sunday, he screws up enough to where he doesn't completely fall out of it, but he's not, you know, he's not in the mix at the very end. So I'd love for you to be right. I mean, it feels like Spieth has turned a little bit of a corner, but uh, he's still not the guy that he was in the first few years of his career. When Sheffler, that's was, too much money. Wow. Get, getting those Tiger Woods comparisons. But yeah, insane. I, I couldn't tell you the last time I've seen odds like that for a PGA Tour event ever. And this is a loaded field, too. Once again, it's one of the more important and more uh, participated in tournaments of the year. Yes. And for Scotty to be that big of a favorite. I mean, look. We touched on it last week after he won the, or I guess on Monday at the start of this week after he won the Arnold Palmer. If he figures out the flat stick, yes, he's going to be unbeatable. Like he's the number one player in the world and he hasn't been able to putt these last couple of years. And he got a new putter and he was electric on the greens last week. He damn near couldn't miss. I don't think he did miss inside of 15 feet. Yeah, for the whole tournament, that's incredible. Incredible. So if he's putting like that, then yeah, I mean, he, He's got a chance to literally win every single tournament he participates in. And you said he's four under already? No, Rory is four under already. Scotty, Scotty, Scotty not taken, he hasn't taken, he's not on the course yet. He's not on the course yet. No. Uh, 11 yeah, he'll be taking the course about the time I start falling asleep. 1140? <laughs> Probably, yes. Yeah. Exactly. After, I come from, after I come from seeing the, the guy over the municipality. Are you going right after the show for that? I think you got to go when you're fresh. Okay. When your excuses are, are still fresh in your mind. Do you need help from the people? Should we ask our listeners and viewers to come up with excuses for you to somehow get out of this ticket that you already have not gotten out of? I'm thinking the fixed income thing is going to do it. 915 number says, just tell the magistrate that you're the big man. Too bad you're not the big man anymore. You're the scarecrow. What if the dude says, hey, back up, scarecrow? Ooh, what if he says, you go in there and say, I'm a scarecrow. I can't pay. I'm just Ooh. trying to stand in my yard and scare birds all day. And I was just going to pick up something going down the hill in my lesbian car. <laughs> just say you had the wrong, you got the wrong guy. It wasn't me. I'm a scarecrow. This is the first time I've left my yard in years. <laughs> Don't ask those people anything. They're not going to give me anything good. Mm -hmm. I'll ask DD. Oh, she hasn't showed up again. Yeah, we'll give her time, but. She's running out of it. 36 minutes till 10 o'clock. I, I can no longer trust her if she isn't willing to show up today. Because if it does rain, her forecast is would be still good. I need those. I need weekend weather. I don't care too much about weekday weather, right? Because whatever. But weekends, I'm trying to go out. I'm trying to do stuff. We're trying to have a show at Crown and Anchor on Sunday for Selection Ooh. Sunday. Yeah, and that only, hap that only happens if it doesn't rain. So we're hoping it doesn't rain for a million different reasons, but that is one of them. So, so you may have to lean on me for that. Uh, well, I almost hope you do say it's raining because then I'll assume it's not going to rain. Wow. So that might be what I hope this for. This doesn't seem right. No. Any other thoughts on uh, on golf? Who's your pick? You said Jordan Spieth is your, uh, your pick this week. What about can't play? Uh, Patrick can't play is two under through five. He's off to a good start. There you go. You got Shoffley at two under. You got Fleetwood at two under. Jason Day at two under. Pretty loaded leaderboard in the early on. Speed yeah, to one gonna, under. I'm going to stick with Jordan Speed for this. I mean, I haven't chosen that guy in quite a while because he has not played well in quite a while. So I'm thinking this may be the week for him to break out. It'd be nice to do that at, at the players. That would be nice indeed. All right. Before we get to our TBT video of the day, get another sponsor shout out for the people, Buck. Say hello to our good friends over at Leaf. That's right, Leaf Supplies. I, I, I went I went over again yesterday for a brief amount of time after I was chasing the dog all over the place. But the folks over at Leaf now they've got two great locations, folks. They got one uh, south out there at Monterey Oaks, offer two ninety. Go there, ask for Jeff, and have Jeff. Walk you around the facility there. He'll show you all the bushes, all the plants, all the roses, all the trees. Red oaks are out there, magnolias. You know, I've got a, I, I've got a magnolia tree that I got from Leaf a couple of years ago, and it looks beautiful. I did that was my self planting. BK dug the hole myself, put in a nice magnolia tree, 
Some of the other trees that I've tried before out in this area didn't work, but the magnolias out here in Dripping Springs are lovely. They've got a they got the location down here in Monterey Oaks South and of course up north at Pond Springs. But anything that you need when it comes to landscaping, as I said, they'll find a contractor for you if you want to do it yourself. Just give them the lay of the land, show them what you're trying to do around what areas of your home, which side, you know, north, south, where the sun rises, where the sun sets. They can they can help you with that. Uh, shaded areas, sunny areas, but they do it all at LEAF, all the different fertilizers that you need. I love those folks over there. I've been going there for damn near 30 years. When I first got here, I was a gardener from the beginning. I'm still a gardener right now uh, since I started, you know, from coaching on. I, I love to do stuff. I love to be outside. And LEAF Landscaping is the place that you want to go for all that great stuff. Tell them you can, you've heard it right here, too. Yep. Hopefully they'll have that deal for you. Texas Sports Unfiltered, just mention my name, mention BK's, and let Brad know that you're coming because you heard it right here for sure. I think they will hook you up. I was talking with Brad over at Leaf Landscapes, sure. and they're working on some sort of discount for our listeners and viewers. So, yeah, get you some plants, indoor plants, outdoor plants. Uh, I'm a plant guy now. Yeah, now that you have your one single killer plant that's out there, so, you know, you know what they say. Once you go one plant, you can't stop. We'll so, see. I'm about to have a full garden on my balcony here, my apartment complex. And then I'm going to start planting stuff in the common area. See how long. Oh, yeah. See how that goes. Yeah. Stop planting weed in the common area. Stop, see how that works. <laughs> that will be great. Love our friends at Leaf Landscape Supply. Also love our friends at Jack Allen's kitchen yes it could be a jack allen's weekend hell it could be a jack allen's lunch day for me today fantastic food it's southern comfort food with a tex-mex twist it's done right they've got the great enchiladas the tacos the fish dishes the burgers the salads i mean something for everybody in the family something for everybody at the office more importantly something for yourself you, you can go to jack allen's kitchen every day for three months and not get the same thing twice and this is not a jack of all trades master of none situation Tom Herman. This is uh, everything on their menu is fantastic. I love it. And you're going to love it too. Full bar TV. So you can watch the golf today. Um, they can watch the college basketball, of course, too. Great food, great service. Seriously, everything you want in a phenomenal dining experience. You are going to find at any of the five Austin area Jack Allen's kitchen locations. Go Say a little Brad up there in Anderson Lane. Yep. Our boy B Rad over on Anderson Lane runs a tight ship there. Great people. Um, yeah, he will take care of you. And seriously, everybody at Jack Allen's will take care of you every time you go in there. Love those folks. Yes, me too. All right, Buck. It's time for this week's TBT video. Okay. We go to Crichton, Alabama. It's a suburb of Mobile, Alabama. This is one of my favorite news clips of all time. This thing's about 20. You say Crichton, but you said Crichton. Creighton? No, not like the college in Omaha. Okay. I believe it's Crichton is the pronunciation of – I've never been. I'm just going off of uh, this news clip that we're about okay. to play. This thing's about a minute and a half long. The whole video was like 220, but I trimmed it down to a minute and a half. And Well, it's a local news clip. you got some man-on-the-street interviews going on with some of the locals in Crichton. And nice. they're talking about St. Patrick's Day and – a mysterious leprechaun that apparently has been running through the streets of this little small town. Check it out. Curiosity leads to large crowds in Mobile's Crichton community. Many of you bring binoculars, camcorders, even camera phones to take pictures. To me, it looked like a leprechaun to me. I got to do a look up in the tree. Who else in the leprechaun say yeah? Yeah! yeah! Eyewitnesses say the leprechaun only comes out at night. If you shine a light in its direction, it suddenly disappears. This amateur sketch resembles what many of you say the leprechaun looks like. Others find it hard to believe and have come up with their own theories and explanations for the image. My theory is it's casting a shadow from the other limb. Could be a crackhead that got hold to the wrong stuff and it told him to get up in a tree and play a leprechaun. We're going to get down to the bottom of this. Yes, yeah, still on there, guy. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, man. This guy, helping to direct traffic, says he's prepared for his encounter with the leprechaun. He's suited up from head to toe. This water's all smells right here. 
This is a special leprechaun flute, which has been passed down from thousands of years ago from my great-great-grandfather, who was Irish. I just came to help out. Others just came to get lucky in hopes a pot of gold may be buried under this tree. I'm going to run a backhoe and uproot that tree. I want to know where the gold is. I want the gold. Give me the gold. I want the gold. This is Brian Johnson, NBC 15 News. Damn. <laughs> Dude, how great is that? There is so much in there. Oh, that is a beautiful thing. This flute that was handed down to me many generations ago is one of the best. How about the amateur sketch? Someone Remember that like, other sketch we saw? These people aren't very good. They're not very some, artsy. Oh, yeah, like a police sketch here from somebody in Mobile who claims that they've seen the leprechaun, and this is the picture, and they showed this on the news. Look, there's no mouth. There's no nose. It's just two eyes and an Irish hat. Is that a beard? Is that a little fuzzy thing supposed to be a beard? I don't know what that is. I don't think so. Remember the last time we had the amateur sketch from the news people trying yeah. to find? Oh, my. This is, this is even worse. I mean, no nose, is, no mouth. No. And then the crackhead lady might be oh, my that's, favorite. That's the best. The crackhead who just got a hold of the wrong stuff. Come on, man. Oh, my God. That is That was classic. I'm showing it one more time here. It is a little long, but I think it's worth, That's classic. worth playing. Curiosity again. leads to large crowds in Mobile's Crichton community. Many of you bring binoculars, camcorders, even camera phones to take pictures. To me, it looked like a leprechaun to me. All you got to do is look up in the tree. Who else in the leprechaun say yeah? yeah! yeah! Eyewitnesses say the leprechaun only comes out at night. If you shine a light in its direction, it suddenly disappears. This amateur sketch resembles what many of you say the leprechaun looks like. Others find it hard to believe and have come up with their own theories and explanations for the image. My theory is it's casting a shadow from the other limb. Could be a crackhead that got hold to the wrong stuff and it told him to get up in a tree and play a leprechaun. We're going to get down to the bottom of this. Yeah, still on there, guy. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, man. This guy helping to direct traffic says he's prepared for his encounter with the leprechaun. He's suited up from head to toe. This wars all spells right here. This is a special leprechaun flute, which has been passed down from thousands of years ago from my great-great-grandfather, who was Irish. I just came to help out. Others just came to get lucky in hopes a pot of gold may be buried under this tree. I'm going to run a backhoe and uproot that tree. I want to know where the gold is. I want to go. <laughs> Give me the go. I want to go. This is Brian Johnson. Let me help you. Son. Let me help you, son. If you believe in leprechauns, <laughs> I guarantee in that neighborhood that tree ain't there anymore. That tree's been gone. There, there is so much going on there. Yeah, the guy says he's going to uproot that tree. That tree would have been gone that night. He's going to uproot that tree. It might have been gone that night. If he's true to his word, he went after that tree. If he believes there's gold on that tree, that tree's gone. Yeah, and then you've got Burned the guy. Down, with, chopped down and dug up. The guy with the skin flute <laughs> to scare scary. the leprechaun away. What, is he wearing a bulletproof vest, and he's like, this wards off spells? What was he wearing there? Dude, the one guy who was trying to be serious said, it's cast a shadow from limb to limb. I'm like, he really believes he saw something. What is he, Tarzan? He's swinging through trees? He believes he really saw some. That is so funny. Uh, it could be a crackhead. Oh, Got a hold of the wrong stuff. Yeah, that one dude needs to see Dr. Ecker and get them teeth. Get them teeth is picked up. Uh, yeah, the first guy. Y'all see the leprechaun say, yeah. <laughs> no, get them teeth is fixed up. Oh, my God. Let me see if I can find a picture of that guy's teeth. This is a tough. Yeah, here we go. So we bring out the screen share feature once again today. I mean, that's hilarious. Also, the camcorders and camera phones. That just shows you how old that clip is. Yeah, there's the guy. There's the pot of gold in his mouth. Yeah, it might be there. You don't need to uproot a tree. Just go find this guy. Oh, my goodness. He needs to go see our buddy, Dr. Eckert, like you said. Oh, sure. How's he need leprechaun say, yeah. That is too much. That is an old one, too. That's I remember that one. Oh, my God. Oh, you'd seen that before? 
I've seen that one before. Yes. I still can't get over the sketch. And then the reporter is like, many of the locals say this is what he looks like. That, like that alien, that Martian. Some guy drew this on a sheet of notebook paper. And then other people are that's like, yep, that's it. That's, that's it. our guy. Put it on the news. That's our guy. That's who we're trying to find right here. Got no mouth and got no nose, but put him on there. Oh my God, dude. That's that's special. I don't know it if is. they ever found the leprechaun. I never saw an update from that, but I mean there are shirts that you can buy to like commemorate that. I mean, look, I'm on I'm on Amazon right now. They don't have that picture of that leprechaun on there, do they? Look. Who all seen a leprechaun say, yeah, it's a oh, shirt right. with the police sketch of the Come leprechaun. On. You can buy that for like 20 bucks right now. 20? Come on. I'd buy it for 12. Well, you think they got it at Sue Patrick? Let's talk to Jay. Oh we need to talk God. to Jay about making some of those. Too late. St. Patty's Day is this weekend. We need to get that before. Next year we'll have some made up. Anybody seen a leprechaun? Say yay. Say yeah. Come on, man. Who be a crackhead that's got a hold of the wrong stuff? Oh, man. That's why he lost his nose in his mouth. It was a crackhead who got a hold of the wrong stuff. That's some bad stuff, yes. So he looks like that police sketch instead. Yeah, yeah the people that's... with their police sketches, they're not very good at that. Let me see if I can find that other police sketch <laughs> remember that face yeah well that one actually ended up looking kind of like the criminal itself believe it or not all right one more what was that criminal here. what was he what was that about oh that was another tbt oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that was the other police sketch oh, in a tbt God. video that we showed a few weeks ago speaking of my four-year-old grandson it looked like some no he could do better than that yeah I mean, this one's a little better than the leprechaun, but this oh, one is still... got a nose and a mouth. This oh. one was a legit police sketch. The leprechaun one was just some person who just drew a sketch on a sheet of paper. Yeah, like, this is done by a professional here. I, th I think this was a professional who did this. Man. Oh, my God. So there you go. There's your throwback Thursday. Very nice. Viral clip for the people. Happy early St. Patrick's sure. Day. I mean, it's, it's as good as it gets right there, isn't it? I don't know what I'm doing for St. Patty's Day. Am I wearing green? I do wear a little I wear a little tint of green, yes. I think you have to, right? Supposed to, I guess. Can people, can people still pinch you if you're not wearing green? Yeah. You consider it a shot nowadays? Head. I feel like yeah. you can get canceled. Yeah, you don't go around pinching people anymore. I mean, all Zeke was trying to do is just pinch, pinch a nipple, and he got in trouble for it. You know, maybe i just go ahead and give me one of them flutes. From back in the day, when the leprechaun flutes to and scare plays. off the leprechaun, <laughs> do you scare them off or do you try to bring them down from the tree? I love how that car drives by and he's like, Don't be afraid, don't yeah. be afraid. <laughs> I, would, I would turn that car as soon as that guy started that, I would have turned that car around so quick. Oh. Er, I'd have been speeding out of there, got pulled over again, 270. Yeah. Yeah. You, gotta, you gotta rock the green on Sunday, right? Yeah, I got some greens. If you're going out in public, you know, just celebrate a little bit. That's like an easy dress up holiday. Dude, I used to, I used to rock the craziness when I lived in Boston. Now, Bean Town is a crazy town oh. on St. Patty's Day. I used to, when I was hammering them down, I used to hammer down that green beer, hammer down that green Jack Daniels, Everclear. It didn't matter. It was all green going down. Mm. Green coming up too, man. Gross. Yeah. I yep. used to get, I had I had me some St. Patty's Day. The green beer, that's still a thing that a lot of places do. Oh, yeah. Oh, Chicago, Boston. There's they some try stuff. that shit in Philly, but nobody buys into Irish in Philadelphia. Quit yeah. trying that. I guarantee you there are a few bars that will sell green beer this weekend. Maybe Kelly's Irish Pub. I know they've got a bunch oh, of cool yeah. stuff going on for St. Patty's Day this weekend. They also have Old Stad beer. They always have Old Stad go. beer. But I bet they'll have some green beer, and they'll have Irish coffee, and they'll have the all the Irish whiskeys that you can get. There are a few places around the city that uh, will go all out 
this weekend. And it's cool that it's on a weekend, right? Yes. We we are hoping to be at Crown and Anchor on Sunday. Weather permitting, we'll be doing a little selection Sunday special, Sunday afternoon from four to six. Uh, but yeah, it'll be it's cool for the people who do like to indulge a little bit and celebrate this holiday that it falls on a weekend this year. But you get get ready to get your ass up on Monday. Uh, yeah, there will be a lot of folks calling in sick <laughs> on Monday, I think. Oh, man. All right, uh, some football here. A couple of other free agency moves that we have not talked about. We did mention that the Cowboys signed Eric Kendricks to a one-year deal. The Cowboys were the last team to sign any free agent, and they finally agreed to terms on a deal last night. Um, Joe Flacco is going to the Colts. It a great year with Cleveland. He was named comeback player of the year for the Browns, who ended up making the playoffs. And then they're they expecting Lamar to go down again they got since he made it through the year. Uh, Colts, Anthony Richardson. Oh, Anthony. Oh, well, they're definitely expecting that dude to go down. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Richardson got hurt. Hell, he got concussed in his first game, then came back and then yep. messed up his shoulder and had to miss the entirety of his rookie season. So, uh, yeah. Gardner Minshew is a free agent. He signed with Vegas, I think. Uh, So the Colts needed a good backup, and they're going with Joe Flacco, who once again is coming off of a comeback player of the year award. I wonder if Joe Uh, got really paid for that move. What if he got paid some good coin? Joe Flacco? Yeah. It wasn't much. It was one year, maybe seven or eight million. So yeah, it's it's backup money. Like okay. as good as good as Flacco was, you know, the Browns obviously have way too much invested into Deshaun Watson to not at least try him as the starting quarterback. Oh, he's coming back again, huh? Deshaun Watson. He'll be back next season. Yep. Uh well, we have yeah. one year deal up to eight point seven mil, but only four and a half mil guaranteed for Flacco. So, you know, there's a lot of people out there that that the karma doesn't get to or the mojo doesn't get to. Deshaun Watson. It's all over that dude. Seems like it's, it's getting to it's him. It's like from head to toe, isn't it? Yeah. Well, he's really struggled. Uh, obviously, got that long suspension from the league for the alleged sexual misconduct. And then, yeah, came back, was horrible in 2022 in the last yep. five or six games that he did play. Uh, the hope for Browns fans was that, yeah, okay, you know, he's got a full offseason to figure some things out and get back in shape, and he'll have a full offseason with us, so we'll get to learn the offense, and then he'll be ready to go from week one. But it was a very up-and-down 2023, honestly more down than up for DW4. So Yeah, I, I, I just I didn't think the karma could get to somebody as bad as it did him. I just didn't think he could be that bad. He has yeah. not been good. It's just – and I'm just wondering if that's all karma. That's all over him. That's that's. I, I did you ever think he'd be that bad after you know, watching him play? I was doing radio in Houston when the trade went down, and we were all talking about. I mean, that was the biggest story in Houston for months, right? Where's Deshaun going to go, sure. and what are the Texans going to get in exchange for Deshaun? And I was always nervous that you know uh, this is just the Texans' luck, right? Texans felt like a cursed franchise for a while. They finally felt like they had their franchise quarterback, and then he requests a trade, and then, oh, sorry, you can't trade him because he's got 60-plus women alleging sexual assault against him. So you got to pay him for a year, and his value might drop because of that. And they were just being held hostage by that guy after thinking they finally figured out the answer at right. QB. I was like, he's going to get traded to another team, and then he's going to go win a Super Bowl somewhere else, and the Texans are still going to be searching for a quarterback. But my saving grace, and this is not hindsight, I was saying this on the time, when he got traded to Cleveland, I was like, oh, thank God, it's Cleveland. Yeah, because you know what happens. Yeah, it's like if he ended up in Atlanta or, you know, I'm trying to think who else was in the mix. Carolina, I think the Saints were in the running. Like, Could he have made, could he have made Chicago better? No. The, the Bears would have been the same thing for me. Like, there are some franchises, it's like, oh, if Deshaun got traded there, I just know it's not going to work because it never works for those teams. So when it was Cleveland, I'm like, Oh yeah. Now I don't feel too bad about this. Like, obviously there's a chance Deshaun goes back to being a top five QB in this league, but I felt pretty good about the chances of it completely falling apart. And at this point, yeah, it is blown up in Cleveland's face. So I hope that continues because screw that guy. Uh, If he's guilty of a 10th of the stuff that he's been accused of doing, then guy should be in jail. Forget, how he plays as a quarterback 
But yeah, karma, karma seemingly catching up to Deshaun. And I don't think anybody outside of Cleveland. Hell, I think some Browns fans, like it's, it's tough for the Browns. It's like, uh, you got to root for your team, but I feel like a lot of fans are like, we don't want this guy. No. And they've got to defend him. Like when Deshaun was in Houston, every time they talked about Deshaun, it said Houston Texans quarterback, Deshaun Watson. And it's like, you've got to answer for that guy, even though you don't really want him on your team. No. That's what's happening with Cleveland right now. So yeah, their ownership and GM, they took a chance. And once again, right now it has uh, not worked to say the least. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. It's a mess. DJ, former Browns. Former Browns fan. I stopped. Uh, I stopped because of him. Yeah, I bet there are some people who are like, as long as he's on the team, I will not be rooting for this team. And they might come back after he's gone. But yeah, that guy is a, a pos. Once again, if the allegations are true, uh, Calvin Ridley signed a big deal with Tennessee, big money contract with the Titans. Uh, former Jacksonville Jaguar, former Atlanta Falcon, got upwards of ninety million dollars. So Tennessee had some money to spend. They're trying to find some weapons for their young quarterback, Will Levis. I don't know who was the Vegas favorite. I don't know if Calvin Ridley bet on which team he was going to sign with. Uh, but he is uh, he is with Tennessee. Does that do anything for you? Yeah, I mean he's a good player. I mean it's just that's an awful. That's I mean and you know that that signing that they need now they still got to find a running back, correct? Oh, oh that's well, they, right. no, they signed Tony Pollard. Tony, well. Nah. Now they still need a running back, as I yeah. said. Well, they might draft somebody, but they spent eight mil a year on Pollard, so he's he's going to be their starter. Yeah, I See, mean they've had Henry for so long, and is Derrick Henry still out there, just kind of hanging no. out there? Baltimore. He that's where he went. Derrick Henry ended up with Baltimore. Yeah, that's kind of scary. Yeah, I can't remember if we talked about it. There's been so many moves. No, happening. We, didn't, no we didn't. We never got to that one. But he was with Baltimore. That's scary to me. Yeah, it's a great pickup by the Ravens. Yeah, two-year deal, about sixteen million dollars. But once again, that's that's some of snake bitten. That looks like a, a great place for running backs to go to die, or at least get hurt before the season starts. You know, they've had that, they've had that a lot, right? And they've still had one of the best rushing offenses in football the yes. last few years, despite the running back injuries. Yeah, because they're going to have a running back room full of beat up, limped guys that you know they just kind of trade them in, bring them in. They last for two games bringing the next guy limping in there. They just don't stay healthy in that group. Yeah. You know? I think it was it was more just J.K. Dobbins than anything. I mean, they well, tried. They spent a second-round pick on him. He got he missed two full seasons, basically, with injuries. So I think he's been hurt since high school. Yeah. Yeah, it's not like they have just completely neglected the position. Like, they, they tried to invest in, in that spot, but the guy that they invested in just, yeah, couldn't stay on the field. So – uh, Derek Henry has been very healthy, even though he's yes. on the wrong side of 30. Now he's been very durable over his career at some point. Yeah. Father time might get to him, but two year contract for a contending team. I think that's absolutely worth the risk. Wow. For Baltimore. Yeah. Lamar chat. I mean, I mentioned this yesterday, maybe with Trey or Z I was on every show yesterday. I think sorry to everybody who had to deal with me all day. Um, like Derek Henry was the focal point for that Titans offense for years. Because yes. Ryan Tannehill, who's average, it's Malik Willis, it's Will Levis. I mean, the quarterback play was very pedestrian. And despite every defense focusing on stopping him, he was still able to put up ridiculously gaudy numbers year in and year out. That's how Jim Brown think. played, BK. Yeah. Everybody was all geared up to one guy. They didn't care, they could care less about anything to do with anybody else on the offensive side of the ball for the Cleveland Browns forever. They just had to focus on it, and they still couldn't stop that dude. Yeah, and the women couldn't stop him either off the field. No. Yeah, that guy sucked. Uh, but, yeah, now with Lamar Jackson, two-time MVP, like maybe the biggest threat in the NFL when he has the ball in his hands. Dude. I know he... that's that's threatening, but you still couldn't have seen that big dude with Cowboys. You could have seen – you would have not been really down as down as you thought about having him there. Not for, not for big money, but – well, he's probably getting big money. He, it's eight, he's, eight mil a year over. T uh, I think you could have done that. You could have done that. I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have done it. But you know, I, I'd be intrigued. It'd be better than what the Cowboys have done this off season, yes. which is basically right. nothing. So yeah, like I wanted the Cowboys to get a running back. Um, I would once again prefer not to be Saquon or Derrick Henry, not because those guys aren't great, but I just don't like spending that type of money on that position. Uh, but yeah, no, for Baltimore, like it's a 14 win team. 
They don't have a lot of holes. They can almost uh, like sign for want right now, and that is a want, and that should make that offense even yes. better. So they are they are scary. They're going to be a force to be reckoned with again this coming season. Are oh, you talking about the run game? You're right. Yeah, both of those guys. What do you do when when they're running option with him? Who are you keeping your eye on? You better be keeping your eye on both those cats. Wow. Yep. Agreed. One hundred percent. Yeah. All right, we got about 10 minutes left in today's show. Any uh, sponsor shout-outs we haven't gotten to yet, Buck? Uh, of course, our good friends at Olipop, which today I'll be doing some yard work, so I'm going to need my Olipop because I'm going to need my soda taste, but I'm going to need all the ingredients that will help my digestive system. And Olipop is the way to go. Going with the creamsicle taste today. There you go. Got to have that. Got to have that, that little bit of orange taste in there. Uh, the sherbet taste of, of Olipop, it is absolutely delicious, folks. And it's good for you because that's better than pulling out a Coca-Cola or a Sprite or any of that other mess right now. I'm on that. You know, the big man, <clears throat> Scarecrow, is on, on the Olipop right now. So I'm good with that. Had a little slice of cake yesterday. Now I want some soda. There you go. That's the best soda out there, folks. And the best soda that's good for you, too. Yep. Hardly any sugar, very few yeah. calories, nine grams of fiber in every can. Pick some up at uh, HEB, Target, Walmart, Costco, Whole Foods, wherever you buy your groceries. You can find the Olipop. They also sell them online, drinkolipop.com. Nice. I think, our, I think we got a discount code. I think Texas 20 will get you a decent chunk off of your first purchase. There you go. If you buy online. So all I have to do is go to the grocery store, buy you, and you'll you'll find Olipop. But if you would rather get it shipped and get uh, that discount for buying in bulk, drinkolipop.com is the website. And I'm I got to verify this, but I'm 90% sure Texas 20 is the code that you can type in for uh, that discount right there. And Sounds good to me, brother. And also, did you talk about Big Hat yet today? Oh, no, I'm now the big hats for the weekend. You know, while you're slamming down your Allstat mm -hmm. with, with alcohol in it, I'll be having that big hat mocktail. You know what I'm saying? The margarita mocktail, delicious. Over ice, I'll be having that. You know, you'll be hanging out there, big mugs, spilling beer all over the place. But my mocktail, I'm not going to spill a drop of that stuff right there. It is delicious. The ginger taste is fabulous. And, folks, you can get that at HEB. They have, they have got all the displays of Big Hat and the mocktail there. So if you enjoy a fantastic drink with a, with a wonderful taste there without, without the alcohol taste, they don't even pretend there's an alcohol taste in it. You're going to love the ginger, the lemon, the lime, the orange flavor. You're going to love every bit of that mocktail. And you can get it, as I said, and HEB is the big spot that they're having. Now, I know some of the HEB, uh, I, some of our 7-Elevens are trying to try to get that in there too, BK. There you go. Awesome. Love so, that. They've got it. You want it? They've got it for you. Love the folks at Big Hat. Yes, indeed. All right, some Texas basketball conversation to end today's show. We spent uh, a lot of the first hour talking about the disappointment in Kansas City last night, the Longhorns losing their first game of yeah. the Big 12 Conference Tournament, 78-74, to 74, the final score. Texas led by 10 at halftime, but they were outscored 49-35 to 35 in the second half. Uh, they got into some foul trouble, Dylan DeSue especially. He had to spend a lot of the second half on the bench and just too many no-shows for Texas last night. And once again, the Longhorns are good. They're going to make it to the NCAA tournament, but it would have been nice for Texas to continue what they started towards the end of the regular season where it did look like they were playing some quality basketball and they were giving some Longhorn fans hope that, okay, maybe they can make another deep tournament run. But I feel like a lot of folks are back to – the pessimistic side of things for this team after what we saw last night. Yeah. I, I just, you know, I don't like the way, I don't like the way they're in and out. I would rather end on high notes and everybody playing well, too many guys disappeared in the second half of that basketball game. You know, it just, it left that, that feeling to me that now nah, it wasn't all that important. And you want to be really playing your best basketball because we thought they were playing their best basketball until they showed up last night in the second half and decided to just kind of give in. I mean, that was almost like just giving in. Okay, we got them, but we're not going to sustain this lead. We're just going to kind of cruise around here, and then we're going to lose the game. I'm like, no, dude, you want to be playing your best, and it means something to win that basketball game. Now, Rodney Terry talks about how we're looking forward to more important things. 
I mean, I don't like the message, but it's over with. The game is over with. What other message can you give? I yeah. mean, he, he, the message that he gave after the, the post-game interview was a message of, you know what, there's bigger fish to fry, but you know what I'm saying? I mean, it, it, was it good for him? No, I don't think so. Too many key guys disappeared last night. Therese Hunter is like, I mean, that's what I – I saw the same guy that I've seen most of his career again last night. That's not playing – I mean, three days ago, he was the best Therese Hunter. Now, all of a sudden, we get him, and Ty is gone Yeah. again. So what he do was, we expect? I don't know. It was literally one of the best games of his career on Saturday and one of the worst games of his career last night. Yeah. I mean, he scored 30 on Saturday. He scored three last night. He didn't make a shot last night. And, I mean, that's just inexcusable for a third-year player, a guy who's supposed to be one of the best players on this team, for him to no-show in a postseason game. And yes, of course, the NC2A tournament is more important than the Big 12 right. tournament. But for him to just no-show like that, like you said, how can you feel confident in Tyrese Hunter? Like, after what he did on Saturday, and he talked about how, oh, it's March. It's March. This is my time. I need to step up. The team needs to step up. This is what we've got to do to win games in March. Well, the next game Tyrese Hunter played in March, he did that last night. So, yeah, I mean, too many inconsistent players. It's been what's plagued this team all year. Usually you can count on Acemas and DeSue to get it done. It's mm-hmm. again, not a, not a great game for DeSue last night. Foul trouble was a huge reason why, but not enough from the other players. And you got to have team basketball to, to be able to beat good teams in this month at this time of the year. So, yeah, that type of performance, I mean, he couldn't beat a team that's probably not going to make the dance. It's going to be tough to beat teams that will be in the field of 68 if you play like the Longhorns did in the second half. Yeah, that was that was that was not reaching that crescendo. That thing took you backwards a little bit. Now you got people wondering what's going on. Now, if they play and win a couple games in the tournament, people will say maybe that's what they needed. Maybe they needed the rest. Maybe this is a group that's played in the toughest conference in basketball that needed the rest. But you can't have that many no shows. Yeah. I mean, you can have well, Tyrese Hunter can be the no show because I'm expecting that almost that he's going to be. You know, who knows what he's going to do, but you can't have Weaver all of a sudden who's been playing really well, Cunningham that's been playing okay, you know, Shedrick who's been playing pretty good. You can't have four guys have 10 points, yeah. 10 points between the four guys. You can't have that. I, I have to double check and make sure that this stat is still true, but I knew it was true for a long time. There's never been a team win the national championship after losing its first game in the conference tournament. I don't think anybody ever expected Texas to win the national title this year. No. That's the goal. That's what Rodney Terry talked about in his post-game press conference is now we're in the tournament that allows us to win a national championship. I don't think there's ever been a team, even like ones or two seeds in the right. big that has lost their first game of the conference tournament and gone on to win the national title. So once again, I, I, people are like, why are you even saying that, BK, when talking about Texas? This team never had a shot. Even if they did win last night, they didn't have any shot to win the whole thing. But I'm just I'm letting you know right now that uh, history is not on Texas's side if you were hoping for something really, really special in a couple of weeks. And I'm with you on RT's mindset, too. I wish, I wish he went to the podium last night and was like, we played like shit. If we play like that next week, we are losing in the first round and our season's over. I will make sure that we are more prepared yes. the next time we're on the floor. Yeah, I mean, I think that's just a part of coaching. I mean, that's you're not you're not lying to anybody. You're telling them what your feeling is. But that whole of just that whole facade of you know what our minds are set on the bigger bigger things. Well, it was obvious your mind wasn't set on winning that game in the second half. You should have cruised to that up by ten on that group right there. That group is fighting for their lives. They should have been the ones turning the ball over and struggling, not you. Yep. They should have been the ones that were pressing last night. You, I thought that team was trying to be on cruise control. Uh, that's not the way to go into this deal, I don't believe. I'm with you, man. Shot now, just but others would say, hey, they need the rest. To sue and the rest of them still need the rest. I, 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 just, I just think when you take the court, that's no time to rest. I mean, okay, now if you if you told me you were playing just other dudes, and as you said, you got a good game out of Horton, you don't get that many out of that guy. Now, they could have won yesterday and lost today. Yeah. And, and I would have felt better about – where this team was. They still could have sure. gotten their rests and they would have had another nice win on the resume. And okay, well, you lose a close one to Iowa State in what basically is a road game because they call Kansas City Hilton South. 
then there's mm-hmm. not a lot of shame in that. Like if you beat K-State and you lose a close one to Iowa State, then you can still make the claim that, hey, you might be playing your best ball right now. Sure. But, yeah, to blow a double-digit halftime lead to that team, like you, you, you can no longer stake that claim. And once again, whenever Texas takes the court next week, I, I just do not know what to expect. Nothing would Absolutely. surprise me. If they won by 20, I wouldn't be shocked. If they lost by 20, I don't think I'd be shocked. I, I agree with you. That's Texas hoops in 2023 and 2024. And we'll uh, we'll save the bigger Rodney Terry discussions for after the season because, hey, he makes it to the second weekend. Anybody who says he needs to go, they're crazy. And if he loses in round one, he's not going to get fired after this year. I'm just letting you know right now. But It will get hot in the SEC year one. If he loses in round one, there will be uh, a lot of folks asking questions because they're all right now. I can tell you that much. So there you go. All right. I see one half of chaos theory. I did see the other half, but he just disappeared. We got double R in the building. What's up, What's up man? Man, I'm over here doing like, a, I'm like Shifty Schefter, you know, with uh, with NASCAR coming in next week, uh, working oh, on yeah. some stuff right now. Uh, BK, be checking your email. You've got stuff coming. So, um, yeah. 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 Send me some good stuff, Rodney. Send me stuff. Is, uh, is Coach Gibbs doing anything with NASCAR? Is he just a, uh, a, a guy that they lean on. I mean, no, all the different he teams. Is very involved. You will see him in Austin. I promise you. He, um, you, you know, with his Xfinity teams and and with the Cup teams, you know that he has. I mean, he is right there. I mean, he leads them in a prayer. You know, when they win, and, sure. and I mean, it is a uh, very faith based to see what what Coach Gibbs does. And, you know, like I've talked about with Toyota and Joe Gibbs, they have led the charge with NASCAR with the stuff that they have done. I mean, his his business prowess is just tremendous and people hate him for it. And it's like, come on. I mean, geez, it, it's he he was a game changer to this sport. Oh, he was a game changer in the sport of football. And he was he's oh, a, I remember. He was a game changer in the, in the world of public speaking. I went to see him. I went to a breakfast yeah. that he spoke at. And believe me, I was so impressed with him as a yeah. just a man and, and not not only his faith but just a just a straight up dude you know what i mean yeah he's a, he's a good dude he really is yeah. not many people say bad things about him i got to believe other coaches probably thinks he's a piece of shit you know when he when he's with the washington commanders or the redskins at that time yeah he's yeah. a huge racist let's not forget that because he was donning r word gear for years <laughs> <laughs> And, so. and let me t- let me tell you something about Coach Gibbs. So I think it was I don't know. It's probably been ten years ago at, at TMS. One of the first times that they let me go cover shit at TMS. Um, I walk <laughs> up and I walk up to Coach Gibbs. I introduce myself, and all I had is a little revved up podcast. I mean, nothing of relevance at the time. Introduced myself, told him where I was from, talked about you know a little bit of football and cowboy fandom. He pulled me aside. We talked for twenty minutes. And, and it's like, it's dudes like that, that give yeah. you hope that they're still good in sports. And, and there are a lot of good people in NASCAR. There are a lot of good people in NASCAR and, uh, hopefully we get to talk to a bunch of them. Awesome. It's going to be cool. Um, you're going to traffic court. Is that what I heard today? Yeah. Today's the day I'm, I'm getting ready to go rolling in there right now with my, uh, you know, co- collecting social security now. So I got, I, I may have to bring that paper in there. Uh, yes. the deferral, as somebody said, something, you know, you know, lay away, whatever I have to do, but the 270, 274 is a little steep. You know, I'm on That's a fixed smart. income. I'm working for BK. So I'm on a fixed income. You know, I'll let them know that I'm on a fixed income when I go in. First thing I'm saying, I am going to go change the ring and put on the big high school championship ring. Yeah. You know, calling yeah. games. BK, you think I should just go ahead and go with that? That's important. Put the ring on, I'm never going to wear it anywhere. Here's what you do. You tell them you're the voice of Lake Travis, and if you have to pay this entire fine, you're going to upcharge Lake Travis for the football broadcast that you do. And that's well, going to affect getting mine back somehow. Well, that's going to yeah. affect the kids. You got to pull the kids' card here. That's right. Now, now these kids, yeah. they're going to have to pay more money. They're going to have to suffer because Officer, I don't know, Phil McCracken Enos. is 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 messing Leaders. around. He's getting well, after me for nothing. Like you're going to take this out on the kids. Yeah. The and, price is going to go up at the stadium. And Lord knows they need something positive for the kids over there because they had that little incident or whatever. So they need something good. They need some good news for the kids, although they're playing baseball and they're good again. So that's I've been it. bringing sunshine to the community for years there. What, why don't you take Mark Honing with you? I mean, that would solve I'm it. Trying it would to get a, lot of, a lot of sunshine and all that skull of Mark's. 
<laughs> Here's yeah. Rags. Hey, guy. Can, I hope my audio is good. I'm, I apologize. Totally fine. Key Largo. The grounds crew just decided, you know, hey, Chaos Theory is about to go in the air. Let's make as much noise as possible and make, make, uh, make the internet connection as difficult as possible, too. I hope everything's okay, guys. You at the ballpark? Um, no, not the ballpark. I'm out on the islands. Give oh, us a view. Oh, show, oh, show us what oh, you're oh, seeing right now. The landscaping crew is up doing some stuff this morning. There it is. Now get yourself out of the view. Turn the phone yeah. around. I don't want to look at you. <laughs> well, the the ocean's over there. Yeah, There's we're literally we're on, going. we're on Key Largo. Can you hear the ground crew? If you can, yeah, I'll try so, and go in. Oh, yeah. I thought you were at the yeah. ballpark at one of the, the AAA clubs or something down there. Hell no. You're down there. Son, look at him. I like that. We're going to get a tan. <laughs> All right, well, if it's too loud, I'll go in. I'm going to go. I'm going to come inside here if it's too loud. All right, boys, I got to go pay my deal. Smash. Don't pay it. Don't pay it in full. My goodness, this guy. Negotiate. All right, fellas. You know, thank you, brother. Later, Have boys. Have a good show. Later, boys. Thank yeah. you. Well, welcome everybody from Chaos Theory. Uh, I am in Key Largo right now. I got my son actually sleeping in the bed across the room here, so I'm probably going to wake him up a little bit. Um, but yeah, it was either wake him up or deal with the grounds crew that's outside that just decided to come on here and make as much noise as possible as soon as wake we up, came Reed. on the air here, Rodney. <laughs> Get your ass up, Reed. <laughs> wake up, Reed. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, welcome to everybody on Chaos Theory on this wonderful Thursday morning here. Um, hopefully everybody's having a great time, a great day. Uh, we're on vacation, so um, we're going to do this thing for an hour and then going to go. I I'd like to drive down to Key West. It's still about two hours drive from here, but still, yep. man. I want to. I've never been out this far. There's something about Florida, Rodney, that's just intriguing that makes me want to move here. Might be the legalized weed. I'm not sure. Well, I got to tell you, man, th there there have been a lot of conversations in, in my family, and I'll talk lower because I know I'm loud. Uh, there, no, you're good. I got, of, I, got it. I got it. I got it. Earbuds in. Oh, okay. Uh, conversations in our family uh, about Florida because Florida is the hub of stock car racing, uh, short track stock car racing. And, and the wife and I have tossed that around. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, tomorrow at 4 o'clock, I'm flying into Panama City to drive over to op alabama which is about an hour away so we'll both be in florida uh for oh a nice time right there man. how about that man maybe florida will go under if both of us are here oh, yeah, there it is but so uh, we yeah. flew into miami miami wasn't that bad it was really it was only um the ease of access was pretty damn good with miami international and getting a rental card and everything honestly it was just rush hour traffic getting out of miami international and then in, in miami but uh <laughs> once you're once you're in it man you're good Cooter's got it, dude. Is that where you are? Yeah. Are yeah. you in Mar a Lago? Uh, no. I right now we. I don't even know what this place is. I don't even know what Mar a Lago is, dude. That, um, that's that's uh, Donnie Trump's little place over oh, there. No, does. I'm at a. I'm at the Reef House. As a matter nice. of fact, the Reefer House. The, the Reefer, Reefer House. house. Yeah, man. Ooh, yeah, man. That, now that's the way you do it, right there. Absolutely. Right? So that what's going on, everybody, with Chaos Theory? What's going on, Double R? How was your night last night? Oh, man, yeah. it was good. You know, when we watched the first half of uh, Texas basketball, got pretty excited there. A uh, 10-point lead going into the locker room, and then they found a way. And, and, and why are we even surprised? We knew I mean, it, yeah. Like, we, we knew it. You know, Wags, it's like being a Cowboy fan. Why do, why do you even still get pissed off? Why do you get disappointed when this shit happens? Because it's like, I mean, come on. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, isn't it crazy? It's like it's like being in a toxic relationship when it comes to this basketball team this year to where it's like one day you're like, oh, man, good run. We were talking yesterday, Sweet 16, maybe. Now I'm we like. Know, we were never. We, we might have flirted with the Sweet 16. We were never really full uh, full on board with the Sweet 16. It's, um, you know, it, it's kind of one of those things where, I mean, you out more and then you come out and get in the second half and get beat like that. I mean, it, it, where was Tyrese Hunter? What what have we been talking about? Where's Tyrese Hunter? A no show once again. He went from 30 points to three. Yeah. And that's the thing, like he, he's an anomaly, right? You can't you can't bet or you can't rely on uh, on Hunter giving you your 30 points per game or or even being the third the third cog or the third piece that we need to, to show up with yeah. Sue and Aceus. Hell it would have been even fantastic last night. Um Aceness was just off a little bit. The Sioux struggled mightily. Um, foul trouble as well. So, yep. uh, look, when and and that's our pieces, guys. When our two pieces can't hit and we don't have a third to step up, there's really no recipe for success there. Uh, yeah. And if you're struggling to beat a team that's hardly even going to get into March Madness, what are you going to do when you're in March Madness? 
Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. seriously, that's the reality that you got to take going into this thing. Yeah, and that's the way, I mean, it's a pretty easy blueprint uh, to scout how to beat Texas. I mean, you get to sue in foul trouble. I mean, early on in the second half, he's in foul trouble. What was like 10 minutes? I mean, it was really quick. It was really quick. He's in foul trouble. KSU goes on this crazy run, and then mm-hmm. boom, there it is. And then, you know, the lack of Tyrese Hunter. Um, it's, it's not just, it's not really the lack of Tyrese Hunter. It's the lack of the third guy, the third like, guy. That's, that, yeah. that's the thing. Like it, it's hard to sit here and put all the blame on Tyrese Hunter when you know that he, it, you know, he's capable of putting up 30 points. He's capable of getting you a double, double with 30, mm-hmm. uh, 30 point, double, double. Yeah. Um, it's just inconsistency, man. It's so we saw this much. We saw a lot of inconsistency or some inconsistency, I would say with car. Right. And then. You would also have car and you'd have hunter that could also be some of the engines be some of the facilitators right we only have one facilitator this this year or so it seems and it is tyrese hunter which is a really bad thing because the facilitator is just so inconsistent yeah hey uh bucky i know he's probably listening either on the um on the app or or maybe has youtube going i don't know bucky if you are essential youtube video check that out i think you'll find it interesting but uh longhorn from denton says uh bucky they're going to give you options cash check or card that's the only options you get at traffic court. <laughs> so, What's going on? Uh, so Bucky, Bucky's he's not disputing this thing. He's actually taking it right in. I, I think he said that he wants to go pay it. You know, two hundred and seventy-four simoleons That's down the No way, bro. You gotta you gotta dispute that. Especially if court costs are only like twenty-three bucks. Make them yeah, take the uh, take time out of their day. They ain't gonna show up. Yeah, well, actually, they probably will. That's they what I told will. him. I'm like, look, if you fight it and and the dude doesn't show up, you know, Cletus doesn't show up. Dude, you're out there. You're out there. Let me tell you something. Cletus is showing up because Cletus ain't got nothing better to do but go get donuts. Yeah, th- there ain't nothing else to do. So, yeah, he's definitely going to show up. But, y- you know, the, you know, I- I'm not going to look at that game last night. And the only disappointment to me is, the again, the manner that you lost. I mean, am I surprised that, that Texas lost? No. But it's like it just seemed like to me, Wags, it, it, once the second half started to where it was like, and I know that I'm wrong in saying this, but it was like uh, Rodney Terry and, and, and the Texas staff, they're like, okay, 10 point advantage. Look, look we're doing what we need to do. Yeah, let's yeah. just kind of pull it. Let's pull it back. It bit. seems like that's what it was, but that's kind of, that really isn't what it Texas, Texas got outplayed in the second half. Yeah. That's because that's, that's happened all year. You know, it, it would be one thing if Texas was just kind of cruising into this thing and, and then that shit happens and it's like, okay, that's what happened, but that's not what happened. And so looking this morning at Lenardi's uh, bracketology, that does indeed, like you talked about, it shakes everything up. Mm-hmm. Well, it doesn't shake it up that much, but it moves it moves Texas over. And again, this is all projections. Yeah, I figured moves, Texas would be over to the east now, right? Move, or moves to the them west. over to the east. Moves them over to the east. Um, and as a nine seed taking on number eight, Nebraska. And up on the top side of that, you would come out, you know, in the weekend, later in the weekend, if you're able to get by Nebraska and you would play UConn. So Shit. <laughs> yeah, I'd rather play Purdue, man. It's like, yeah, I'd rather play Purdue. Back, than UConn. Yeah. Can, can we go back the other way? So it's like, you, you know, the more that we thought it's like, oh yeah, yeah. Maybe we get through the weekend. When I look at that, I'm like, no, I'm not sure we not going to happen. Yeah, no, absolutely not. No, I think we, I, I'm. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty confident we can get past Nebraska. I, I am. Um, you, if you're, if you're a, if you're even a, a pedestrian team in the toughest conference in all of college basketball, you should not struggle with Nebraska. Like you, you no. really shouldn't. Um, here's the thing. Uh, it does suck because I did think that Purdue was a team that we could get past. Um, yeah, UConn <laughs> lights out, buddy. There's no chance in hell for that one, man. No. Just not going to happen. What's no. going on otherwise uh, on the forty acre front? What else uh, we like? Here's a great uh, here's a great uh, text on the code of text line two 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 nine three two eight to which it really does five one two nine five eight zero number reminds me of Texas football losing in the second half uh, a lot a couple of years ago. Uh, very much so. That that's what this feels like. But um, I mean, this is what you got. This is what you got. Um, 
when you talk about that, I mean, I think this is where you go back to the optimism there with the, with the ladies winning the Big 12 championship there and, and going to be a number two seed, I'm assuming, once all that lays itself out. It's it's kind of weird now that, that basketball is winding itself down because I think the basketball season is over within a week. <laughs> um, for, for, for what, for Texas men's or Texas, Texas, Texas ladies? Men. For okay. Texas men's, and now we can start focusing over to Texas baseball, and and I think we're going to be in the same predicament right there, Wags, to where it's like, okay, what are we going to get? What are we going to get there? So um, I don't know. Let it play itself out. I guess that's the main thing we need to let happen. Not jump to conclusions well, and not have knee jerk reactions. Maybe with baseball, don't jump to conclusions. But also, if you're on the ledge right now, talk yourself off the ledge. Come on back inside, buddy. It's not. A- it's not that big of a deal. We don't have to jump. You don't have to do a full gainer off this thing, man. We we get it. It was a disappointing basketball season. All right. We all knew that. We knew it was going to be a difficult year with all the roster turnover and uh, heading into Coach Terry's first, you know, full season, so so to speak. But yeah, man. Um, it, the the good thing, you know, take the optimist out of it. You know, take the optimistic stuff out of it. Uh, you you watched the Sioux grow into a NBA talent, a three level scorer, and it's going to be nice to see that guy in the association. That's for sure. Um, you got to see Aceness um, reach a milestone of three thousand points in scoring in his collegiate career. That's fantastic. It was awesome to have him be able to do it um, at the forty, even though most of his points came away from the forty. Um, it's still nice to have somebody on the 40 be able to, to capture that type of moment. Um, yeah. And, hey, you know, just, again, like, let's be real about it. It's probably going to be exit stage right first round of the tournament. So sure. it's just – or problem. I mean, you'll get past Nebraska. Hopefully, yeah. hope, hopefully you'll get past Nebraska. And, and speaking of Nebraska, we can talk about Nebraska here in a little bit because uh, kind of a shakeup there uh, with the Nebraska AD – making a move over to uh, little brother here uh, in in Texas, making a move over to the Aggies. We can talk about that in just a second. The hey, Aggies won last night? I think the Aggies won last night, though. I think the Aggie, the, and, and they need to win. They need to win a lot more because uh, they're kind of one of those teams to where they need to Yeah, they're to first win. out. They're, they're first four yeah. out, I think. Yeah, no doubt. Hey, guys, before we go any further, um, if you want to get rewarded for listening to Texas Sports Unfiltered, and we thank you all for for jumping on, all of our TSU agents, everyone that has become a part of this, whether on the app, whether on YouTube, TexasSportsUnfiltered.com, we thank you all for uh, helping make this such a great uh, launch that it's been. Our friends at Autograph, which is co-owned by Tom Brady, you guys know that. We, we call him Senator Tom Brady. Our redefining Congressman. Congressman. Uh, Congressman. Congressman. Uh, re- redefining Finding the fan experience by letting users earn uh, points for acts of fandom, which listening to TSU is one of those that can earn you points. The Autograph app gives you access to your favorite Longhorn content in one place and offers rewards like tickets, exclusive merchandise, and more. You're already listening to TSU. You might as well earn some points and get rewarded for it. Super cool uh, concept coming up uh, right there. Head over to the App Store and search for Autograph, just like uh, as you get an autograph. Autograph and download it for free today using the referral code TSU. Be sure and use TSU. Jesus, because if you listen here, that's how you get your points. A link can be found in the YouTube description as well. You're totally good, dude. That's one of those great things about when when you're traveling in a, in a hotel surrounding like that. I mean, you never know what's going to happen, and it's it's like, I, I think that I was doing, I was doing a racing show once and, and it was early and, and I'm sitting in there and I'm talking away and, and here comes housekeeping. And I'm like, oh. yeah, you like, got a sign on the fucking door too. I'm like, I'm like come like, on there's, in. There's a sign that says, don't, it says, don't interrupt me. Wags. I was, I was in Houston this past weekend for, for racing stuff. And, and I shit you not with the time change, with the time change. 745. And I'm like, uh no. <laughs> I, I'm yeah, like, I was gonna ready to tell you guys how beautiful the weather is down here, but I can't even get past the damn the, the leaf blower that's been in the same spot for the past 45 minutes. I mean, literally blowing the same damn leaves out of the same spot. I think he's getting paid by the hour or something. Well, it's gotta Not be, doing it's anything. Gotta be. Got to be, you know how that goes. You just blow it all into one spot and just keep uh, turning it into a little, little whirly bird thing around there. But what I was talking about there, and I think we kind of touched on it just a little bit uh, yesterday, Trev Alberts, um, Nebraska alum, All-American, played football there for Nebraska. Uh, I think it's about 15 years there as the athletic director at Nebraska. 
now making the move. Uh, I, I, apparently, A and M has bought out their athletic director. Man, these guys got a lot of money. They're just like buying people out. Man, it's like the Russell Wilson effect going on in Aggie Land there with the fucking Aggies. So, Trev Alberts will come over as the athletic director here for Texas A and M as the SEC continues to get stronger and stronger and stronger. I mean, th this move right here for them. I, I don't know what this does. I know Trev Albert. I, I don't know how much of this. Is Trev Alberts just trying to get out of uh, away from Nebraska? I think he had a lawsuit pending against him at one point. But uh, the move right uh, there. Oh, what? Him, what was? What's Trev doing in in uh, uh, Omaha, Nebraska? Let, where let Lincoln, me find Nebraska? It, uh, right here. Uh, the, here it is. Last month, as a matter of fact. I'm glad you asked. Alberts was named in the lawsuit filed by former Nebraska women's basketball player Ashley Scoggin. In the lawsuit, Scoggin accused Coach Amy Williams and Alberts of failing to protect her from former assistant women's coaches, uh, coach Chuck Love. Love, according to the lawsuit, coerced Scoggins into a, a little bit too much of the wrong love. Yeah. Yeah. Not to you make know, light all, about that or a joke about that, but, you know, that's a serious all, matter. It's all that Nebraska stuff happening over there. I mean, that happens everywhere. But when you when you start having that kind of stuff right happen, uh, that stuff happening there, it's a black eye on the program. It's a black eye on everything right there at Nebraska. So they're probably like, dude, head on to Aggieland, man. Um, don't let the door hit you in the ass. Move yourself on. Aggieland oh, with you, as a matter of fact. Oh, there we go. Yep. No, they're they're saying no. <laughs> no, I'm I'm taking my microphone off mute and on mute. Just okay. because of the, the settings in the environment right now. Man. Okay. It's a little okay. bit too loud. Okay, I got you. So that was the news right there. Um, it, it was hinted on yesterday, so I uh, just wanted to mention that right there when it comes to things. Texas a and I don't know if that's going to help them in any way. I, I mean, maybe it does. I, I mean, he's 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 done a lot of good things at Nebraska as the athletic director, and, and now with Texas coming over, uh, I mean, you need you need something to kind of energize the fan base here for Texas A&M. They're going to be rabid, but now it's like, okay, here comes Texas back. So I, I, I think it's a good move. I think it's a good move for A&M. Not with you there. Pretty de pretty decent. I mean, if uh, if you're looking to upgrade your or, or bolster your program a little bit, I think it's a pretty decent move for you here. It's, you know, I'd like to have the allegations dropped for this guy if he's going to a new facility or a new um, institution of some sort. You got to kind of want to have a clean slate, right? You don't want to have that mess following you. Mm -hmm. Kind of questioning the Aggies for. Um, you know, interviewing this guy if he's got so much you know stuff on his plate or whatnot. So, sorry, guys, I'm a little bit distracted. Well, he he, he did some – I mean, he hired Matt Rule. I mean, he brought Matt Rule in there at uh, at Nebraska, and, and, and obviously that that was a great thing there. He did uh, he did some really good thing. Um, he did some really good things with with volleyball and negotiating different deals there for the university. So I, I think that's something. Even though you know the Texas A and M apparently has a lot of money to be buying people out. I mean, I think that's something where you bring a business guy in like that. That's only going to help the program. I mean, you look at what happened here. You know, with with Chris Del Conte when he came in to, to Texas. I mean that that was that was a shot of energy from the athletic director that, that I think turned a lot of different things around. Um, I mean, you've still got hires that weren't his or whatever the case is, but he brought the fan base back in and he did very fan centric things. And I think that's super important right now, especially in this day of, of NIL to where it's like players are moving around and coaches are bolting, for, you know, for whatever reason. I mean, I think that's something that you have to have and, and a very energetic athletic director is something that, that that's not going to hurt you right now in this very, uh, business driven, um, college athletic environment that we want to call it no i'm with you man sorry i kind of missed all that there rodney i'm trying to, to tune in and listen to you buddy but it's, no, it's I, I got i got tweedledee and tweedledum here just trying to blow leaves around the same damn yeah. spot started this yeah. shit except i called you at 7 a.m or I, or I think i called you at 7 a.m 8 a.m saying that this was going to be a rough spot That's can't fine. find so when I go to the car, I don't get any internet service. And when I come here, I hear nothing but noise. So no, it's all good. It's all good, my man. We we got you. If it gets too loud, uh, don't worry about it. This is chaos. Appreciate theory. it. There's yeah. supposed to be chaos loud, theory for a reason. Yeah. A lot of noise. Um, before we go any further, um, how about a word from? You want to do Tom McKay? I can play a Tom. Yeah, McKay I'll do. Part. Yeah, let me do audio visual consultations real yeah. quick while I got a little bit of uh, yeah, some yeah. quiet. Down here, whether you're in Key Largo or whether you're up in the 40 acres, it doesn't matter. You got to have audiovisual consultation. They probably can't do anything for you in Key Largo, but you can give them a call to suit your uh, to suit your your home up 
in your own right, man. Uh, 512-255-8678. That's avconsultations.com. Whether you want a two-screen setup or a four-screen setup like BK has, it's all deadly, man. You got to do it. Ask them for that Sonos surround sound system as well. You got NHL playoffs coming up. You got the NBA playoffs coming up. Um, March Madness right around the corner. And you also got NFL free agency. You stay, you stay all apprised with audiovisual consultations. 512-255-8678. That's avconsultations.com. That's right. Great folks right there. And of course, uh, we will hear from our friends at Covert BK. The other day I did a uh, live Covert read and I got two messages on X that said, we want to see Hayden. We don't want to see you or hear you. So here are our friends from Covert BK. Hi, I'm Dan Covert with my wife, Hayden. Welcome to Covert BK. Our newest location in the gorgeous hill country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Covert, born and raised in Austin. Since 1909, serving generations of Central Texas, Texans and beyond, it is the Covert family. Wags, NFL free agency just keeps on rolling, man. I guess yesterday would have been day number three uh, when you can actually start signing contracts. So now we get stuff done. And finally, finally, the Dallas so Cowboys make day a number Day number two, right? Day number two officially, right? Like if, well, if you uh, consider free agency on Wednesday, starting off on the 13th. I think it's actually day number one where they can sign because mm-hmm. I think right. that, uh, yeah. Uh, did you hear this? Did you hear this? And it affects it affects our NFC East that there were some reports that possibly Philadelphia was having some conversations with Howie Roseman, having some conversations Ooh. with Saquon Barkley before you could tamper. Before you, yeah, could tamper. yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not. I ain't gonna sit here and sit, say that I'm shocked. I mean, where everybody knows where Saquon Barkley's from. You know what I mean? Like, there's. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, this was one of this was one of the scariest things for me in this offseason was having Saquon Barkley just just the hint or a notion of him being able to be a Philadelphia Eagle. And if you're a Giants fan, you just didn't want to see it happen. Hell, if you're a Cowboys fan, you kind of knew that this was in the air too, right? Um, Saquon's from that area. Uh, he was highly recruited. I mean, Penn State loved this dude. You know, one hell of a runner out of the Philadelphia area. So this guy going back there just kind of makes all the all the just makes sense. It just does. Um, to hear that he was flirted with before, you know, before uh, the windows open, that's not really too surprising or too shocking. Too shocking. It is Philadelphia, anyways. So I'm telling you, man, it, it's like I'm sure that happens a hell of a lot more than than you know. You're going to hear isolated incidents like that. I mean, but it, you know, it's something that goes on, right? It, just like everything else in the world. I mean, it just, you know, you hear of certain ones, but the Cowboys go and they get Eric Kendricks. And Eric Kendricks, uh, you know. That's 30, a good, good little linebacker, nice little linebacker, for a ab- solid core for that linebacker. Absolutely. absolutely. And, I, and I think what happens right there is you've had LVE, you know, Leighton Van Der Esch, I mean, all the years, all the injuries and so forth. I think this is now finally the time to be like, all right, go. But I, I think the biggest part right here for the Cowboys is with that signing, and thank goodness they made a signing. And, um, right. uh, you know, I, I don't know exactly what the terms of that deal are other than uh, I think a two-year deal. Oh, no, no, actually, I do know. It's a two-year, $16 million deal, which takes me back to why didn't you go chase a running back? But, you know, what? whatever. I mean, I guess you're going to it's. I think it's pretty clear at this point that the Dallas Cowboys are trying to supplement or or find their their running back piece through the draft. Um, that's kind of, I mean, maybe you're right. Maybe they had been bitten in the bitten in the ass the wrong way when they gave Zeke that that big paycheck, right? Maybe they just don't want to put that much money into that position. We kind of talked a little bit about this yesterday and the day before, but still, um, yeah, I don't, I don't. There's just a little bit. Of, there's some reluctancy there to put you know a whole bunch of money in in terms of uh, the guy that's going to pound the rock and get you, you know, your most, um, oh, pro- probably the most wear and tear on the damn team, right? We kind of talked a little bit about that yesterday too. But the problem is, is that with that wear and tear, you know, you're going to be replacing that premium running back or, you know, the scarcity of a running back um, probably every three years or whatnot. So you're not going to want to put tie all your money in that way. Um, here's the problem with the Dallas Cowboys. They hadn't been active at all in the, in the running back uh, race or, or whatnot, you know, they're just letting everybody kind of fall, fall to the wayside with it. Um, and who's to say that, 
you know, you're going to, you know, have all your stuff or who's to say that you're going to have, you know, the cream of the crop running back come right out of the, you know, right out of the damn draft. I think Bucky Urban is probably my, my favorite running back coming out of uh, college from Oregon there. I, you know, I, I was a big Oregon Ducks fan. Um, I loved what Bo Nix was able to do. And I love, you know, I thought the fact that he had a really decent running back like Bucky Urban coming out of the back that looked like he was a pro back in a pro style already. Um, I, you know, it, it just it spoke volumes for Bo Nix. I can only imagine if they if the Cowboys are able to pick up a, a Bucky Irving in this draft and you know maybe add him to that backfield there for for Dak Prescott. I can't imagine how much impact he's going to have as a rookie, but I mm-hmm. think maybe within one to two years, you know, and as Bucky Irving being your your solidified bell cow running back, I think it's going to pay dividends for Dallas if that actually happens. Yeah, well, and Longhorn Bear right here, uh, there's an LOL there, but uh, A.J. Dillon is the name that keeps popping up for the Cowboys. And, and, and what I like what, what what I like about the A.J. Dillon signing. That does fit is, Dallas. That's that's just what Dallas would do. Dallas takes like – Dallas is almost like like the uh, the Baltimore Ravens now, right? Yeah. It's where they're just taking, you know, running back by committee. Yeah. However you can supplement that backfield. Yeah, you, you just have a fill-in piece right there. It's like it's like one of those uh, caps you get put on your tooth where, okay, I'm going to put this in here for two years till it falls off, and then I'll replace it. Um, I like the A.J. Dillon get simply, and, and here's the other part of this, and I was talking about this yesterday. Jonathan Brooks keeps coming up in Dallas Cowboy conversations. Um, if he's there, you got to think that, that Dallas is going to take Jonathan Brooks, right? Man, I, I really think that, it, that if you go but- with – Buck Irving's probably going to be gone in the first. He's going to be like, gone. I'm, yeah, he'll oh, yeah. be gone. Yeah, he'll be gone. I mean, but I think if you pair A.J. Dillon with Jonathan Brooks, with a little bit of a mix of, of Deuce Vaughn, and it may be more Deuce Vaughn to start off because we don't exactly know how well John Brooks is at this point. But this is kind of where you go back to, and again, I know this is the, the, the new Mike McCarthy offense, but this is where you have that running back option, what worked well for the Cowboys a couple of years ago where you had Zeke and Tony Pollard, where you had kind of the thunder and lightning. And I think that's what you get right there if you pair Dylan with Jonathan Brooks. And and I, I really do like the, that. If you go with the thunder and lightning, are you taking away from Dak's aerial attack? <sighs> well, so, Cause, sometimes Because McCarthy's like, offense is predicated off the run. Like, he throws it, predicated it really off the run. He's always, he always has. Well, I, I think what happens – if you even flirt with going with thunder and lightning is at least uh, maybe that opens up a little bit of the aerial attack to where, I mean, if they, if they hit the field tomorrow, you are, you are aerial. That is all you got. I mean, that is your only thing right now. I think if you have a running back, or if you have a running attack that kind of does you afford the opportunity, well, d- depending what, where did the Cowboys struggle a lot in the red zone? I mean, if you get a running attack where you can be red zone efficient, I think that fixes a lot of problems, but the other part of it is I can sit here and song and uh, give you a song and dance and talk about bringing in AJ Dillon and, and John Brooks and all this other stuff. You still got to fix the offensive line. Right. And, right. And, and, and that's the other part. And that's where it goes back to Dak, where you want to talk about Dak. What, what happens to Dak when he gets under pressure? If he can't do that three-step drop and pop, he's probably going to throw a pick. So where would you, where in all, in all seriousness, I know we, we, we had Dak, you know, up at the, you know, the high end, the top tier of the MVP race, where would you put Dak as a, as a rated quarterback in all of the landscape for the NFL right now? Is, is Dak still your guy? Cause I see people, so many people sitting there saying that Dak isn't the right for Dallas. I think you're absolutely, I think everybody that's saying that you're absolutely nuts. Take a look at the quarterback carousel that's going around with the NFL right now. Look at all the franchises right now that can't find a quarterback. You have some salt, uh, uh, continuity and solidarity in your quarterback room right now, and you you're sitting here. You want to give that up? People yeah. would love to have a Dak Prescott. The John, I would I would kill for a Dak Prescott right now. I think there are so many different places, Wags, where Dak Prescott could go and just be tremendous. He's tremendous in Dallas, but who who I, I think Jeff and I were talking about this yesterday to where. At some point, and I think he may be there, where Dak may be like, look, I'm tired of this shit. I'm tired of all this bullshit. I'm tired of of all the, I mean, it, it seems like a lot of times the organization doesn't have his back. You've got all these family members that are all pissed off and, you know, all this stupid shit that happens that, that comes in with being the quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, you can you can go down there, look at every NFL franchise that you talk about, that, that we have, the other 31. Look at them. And and find the ones that have a, a quarterback problem. Plug in Dak Prescott, and a well, lot it seems of people, like a lot of people got a quarterback problem. You know, they <laughs> exactly. really do. 
and they do and and wags when Gardner Minshew and Joe Flacco and Mason Rudolph and these guys are are, are getting signed in free agency that tells you how many franchises have they're the bridges problems. right like they're these, these these guys are the bridges for the next uh you know uh, I guess succession plan for the quarterback room hey do you see how Cam Newton is so pissed off that Kirk Dude. Cousins is getting Ooh. some getting some bag and getting some uh getting some money he's like who the hell is your agent like well, like what the you know WTF? But like, first off, Cam, you played your way out of the league, man. I don't know if you can still. I don't know if you can still throw with that shoulder being as, as jacked up as you are. But look, if you could still play, get your ass on a roster and try out for a team. And if somebody thinks that you can play, they'll put you on a they'll put you on a squad, man. It's that easy. That dude right there is just calling everybody out. And, and I mean, the, the comments upset. right there. That's a man that's upset that he's not being able to, being able to play. That's all. Mm -hmm. That that's what it is. That 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 dude is butt hurt. His ass is raw. He's so pissed off. But, you know, the more the more that you look at the Kirk Cousins thing, and it's like, again, it's situational. And, and it seemed like he was in a really good situation there with Minnesota. And, and I mean, he was. He was kind of the cog that drove the Minnesota wheel right there. He goes down, and they kind of, kind of fall apart. But, I mean. No, I mean, I'm loud. That's hilarious. That's hilarious. Dude, I, did I tell you the story? So, I, I was I was on a race trip, and, and you and I were Somebody doing our show. I was loud. You and I were you and I were doing our show, and and I went walking out of the hotel room because it was one of those things where we were on at ten central, and and I had to check out at eleven. So we're sitting there going on and on. Um, it was during NFL season. It, it was towards the end of the regular season, and we're sitting there cussing and bitching and going back and forth about whatever it was that day. I go walking. Were you out. in public? Were you in public doing? No, that? I was in the I was in the room. I was in my room. I go walking out and. Um, the lady's standing there with the, you know, the cart thing to clean the room. And she's like, is everything okay? I'm like, yeah, everything's fine. Yeah, you know? good, well, have a good day or whatever. <laughs> and, and I, and I turned to go down the hall and she's like, where's the other guy? <laughs> I said, he was in the computer. And she said, Oh, I thought you guys were going to like fight each other. No, no. Um, Usually no. we just have passionate conversations, passionate yeah. conversations on text, Texas sports unfiltered. Yeah, that's what we do. Yeah. So with with NFL, I mean NFL winding down and or uh, with free agency winding, which is funny because it just kind of officially got started here. Um, uh, am I shocked to to see Dallas, you know, be non basically non-existent in in making moves? No, because this is kind of what Dallas has done do. the past couple of years, right? Like all season, they've just been quiet. It feels like they've been able to draft, get what they need uh, out of the draft. It's kind of I don't want to give them this much credit, but they've kind of been doing it like the like the Pittsburgh Steelers, where the Pittsburgh Steelers have just been knocking the shit out of their draft picks, right? Ravens usually hit well with their draft picks. Uh, these three teams, like Dallas, Baltimore, and um, and the Steelers, usually knock it out of the park with their draft picks here, man. Um, I, and maybe that's that's taken over a little bit more for Dallas since uh, uh, since Jerry's son's been in there. Uh, who's it, Steve? Yeah. Steven, yeah. since Steven's been at the helm, you know, making all the draft picks there. Uh, but but since then, you know, you, you take the caveat to that. Has It's it's kind of been a little bit quiet on the offseason there, right? Because they've had so much success in the draft room. Yeah. And, and, and the whole thing about it is, I mean, say what you want to say about the Cowboys organization. And Lord knows I beat them up more than anyone else, you know. In, in and, I beat the, and I beat the Giants up. That's yeah, how you're supposed yeah. to do. You're not it's supposed to great. come here and say, say shiny, happy, you know, radio and shit. Right. Yeah. You know it's mean? It's like people are like, you're not really a not Cowboys fan. Chamber. Yeah, people tell me you're not really a Cowboys fan. I'm like, come look at my fucking closet. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd actually argue that I'm more of a fan because I'm that critical. On the exactly. Cowboys. Like, I, I want I want perfection. Every Is it too much to ask for perfection? It's not. Right. It, it, or, or consistency. But, the, right. it, but that's where Dallas has been consistent. I mean, you look at the 12-win seasons, and what Dallas has done is they have done a really good job of building through the draft. And, and, and with – with folks saying that, that they're not being active in free agency, well, this, is, this isn't anything new. They never are. I mean, um, what tends to happen, it seems like, with the Cowboys is they build really well through the draft, and then once you get those young dudes that have the opportunity to fly off, they fly off and go make money. So, so Dallas is really good at, at, at uh, developing players. And, you know, kind of talking back, back here to Dak, Dak, I mean, no, he's not the Superman. He's Superman during the regular season, it seems like. And, you know, even in the bad years, when you see what Dak does, a lot of times Dak puts up tremendous numbers because he's playing from behind. Felt uh, like Tony Romo was doing that too, right? Like Tony Romo yeah. was Superman in the regular season too, but couldn't win in the postseason. Maybe that's really just was. a Dallas thing. 
It, it, well, and, and speaking of a Dallas thing, I mean, look at the two guys you just talked about. When when people talk about you know the Cowboys quarterback position or whatever, you've got an undrafted Tony Romo, you got a fourth round Dak Prescott, and those have been your guys. And when you want when you want to lump all wait, the, Tony Romo was undrafted. I thought he was actually drafted from like Western Illinois or Eastern I, Illinois. Or I, I don't think that dude was drafted, if I'm not mistaken. If he was, it was way late. But I, I thought he was undrafted. I thought he was free agent. I may be wrong. I may totally be wrong. But somebody in the chat, give us that stat, please. Yeah, yeah. So somebody will, will clear that up for me. But I mean, you go back and you look, and that's the funny thing when 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 people go back and they talk about great cowboy quarterbacks. You know, it's like Don Meredith and Roger Staubach, and and you got to put Craig Morton in there. You know, the good runs that he had in the seventies, and then you start getting into Staubach, and you add Danny White in there and Troy Aikman, and then since then it's been a shit show. And you you happen to have hit on two guys. You happen to have hit on two guys, and that's that's just kind of – that's what the Cowboys do. And I know they're going to continue to try to build through the draft. I, I do hope that running back scenario that I'm throwing out works because I think that will help them. But, God damn, sorry. Fix the no, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's the one thing that I, I try not to say is the Lord's name in vain. Yeah, that sorry. is the one thing yeah. that I try not yeah. to do. Yeah, we start talking Cowboys and those GDs drop off. He time. was undrafted. Okay. Yeah. Very, yeah. I thought uh, maybe, but he, uh, he obviously played – like in hey, Eastern it, Illinois or some shit like that. And and it's a great story. I mean, both of those guys. And, and Dak Prescott is a great dude. But, but I mean, you need to figure it out. And I, and I think we can kind of close the Cowboy thing on this. Otherwise, I'm just going to get pissed off. And I'm no, That's all right, man. You've been all – hey, you've been all you want, buddy. I'm in paradise. You're I'm going to have to start drinking whiskey here early in the morning if we keep on and on and on. But, you know, you got to figure out with, with Dak Prescott, with Zach Martin, um, C.D. Lamb, Micah Parsons. I mean, I think a lot of this is some of the hesitancy in free agency, and they are already hesitant. Is that you got to figure out what you're going to be doing moving forward with those guys because their contracts are going to be up at the end of the year. And yeah. and I think where a lot of folks aren't thinking about when Jerry Jones says that he's going all in, I think what Jerry Jones may actually be referring to is that they're going to be going all in to keep those guys long term. And I think that that's something that folks need to think about because Dallas never makes a splash. They never do. Never Is do. AJ Dillon the best running back that's out there that's still available right now? Dude, I think that's about. I, I mean, I think that's about as good as you're going to get at this point. I, I mean, and no offense to him. I, I no, mean, no, I spoke, no. Somebody, seriously. Yeah, he, somebody. I thought he did pretty there. damn well for the Packers in spell of of Jones being out all last year. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and I saw somebody posted, you know, he's 25 years old. I mean, tw- a 25-year-old running back, if you can get him on a 2 to $3 million, one- to two-year deal, I mean, I think you're doing something well there. Hey, hey look, it, it worked out pretty damn well for Houston uh, with with Singletary, right? Devin Singletary coming up from, from Buffalo. Not many, too, not many people thought that that was a, you know, a big hit, you know, bringing him or adding him to the to the roster or whatnot. But hell, that turned into a one hell of a one-two, not even a one-two punch, just a one punch, uh, you know, a lights out punch with Devin Singletary because Damian Pierce was pretty much hurt almost all year long for the Houston Texans. So if I'm uh, if I'm the Cowboys, man, you know, you're taking your your last little rain and maybe you throw a little bag of tricks out there for AJ Dillon. Hopefully he does come into your ball club, man, and and uh starts toting a rock for you because he look he did pretty he did pretty damn good yesterday or last year in spell of uh well you can't even really call him in spell of eight of of jones right because he and jones were a uh were a one two punch yeah Yeah. he and jones were one two punch now jones was probably getting 65 35 snap ratio but still aj Dillon was was a good little spell back for him um i think aj I, i i don't know if he's a bell cow so to speak i don't know too many running backs that are bell cows outside of derrick henry um, anymore. Hell, even Saquon Barkley needs a little bit of a payload um, reprieve, so to speak. But yeah, I think AJ Dillon's a pretty decent move if you want to bring that guy in there, sure up a little bit of your of your uh, your backfield, and then maybe you know maybe you draft a Jonathan Brooks like you were talking about because he will be a bit he should be available uh, for Dallas in the second round there. Yeah, and, and I think that's really the the best case scenario at this point. I mean, for a lot of reasons, financial being one of them, is where you do go to an established veteran that 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 maybe isn't going to be your Zeke Elliott, like I was talking about. I want him to be Zeke Elliott at the end of Zeke Elliott. So Zeke's he, staying in New England, huh? 
I, I haven't seen any projected moves for him at all. I mean, I mean, and I, I got to tell you with, you know, as much as I've been going on and on about wanting Zeke back, I mean, that that's just nostalgia and that's just a fan in me. And I know they called him piece of shit Zeke or whatever on the text line the other day. But I mean, the whole thing is give me AJ Dillon. I mean, that that's longevity. Right you there. guys would take Ezekiel Elliott back in that locker room in a heartbeat. <laughs> you to, well, to hell, he, especially now with, uh, you know, with, all the, you know, um, uncertainty looming at, at the uh, running back position. So don't tell me that you guys wouldn't take Zeke Elliott. I'd take Zeke Elliott in New York. So, yeah, you know, I don't know. Uh, but, but how about Calvin Ridley, huh? How about dude, Calvin? Like you and I just talked about how quiet it's been for Calvin Ridley. No, you know, no news notes or nuggets on Calvin Ridley yesterday. And then, hell, within three hours of getting off the air, sign sealed, sealed delivered. delivered. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With, with Hop- Tennessee, baby. Tennessee. With- with Hopkins on the other side. So, you know, you know I, that- I don't know how much Hopkins, how much nuke is left in nuke. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Uh, look, he made, he made some decent plays last year. And I think when, I think when Levis is in there, obviously his, his targets go up. Well, hell, it's not going right. to be Tannehill throwing the Dan Rock there anyways. Um, but when his tar- like when Levis was in there, um, Nuke's top targets were were up, you know, drastically or drastically, uh, considerably. So for me, I think if Levis is going to be at the helm, and now you're adding in, you know, another quarterback or another wide receiver uh, like Calvin Ridley that can stretch and get vertical, and now you have Nuke Hopkins that isn't going to be your guy that's going to get vertical anymore. He's going to yeah. get you the the hard yardage across mm-hmm. the field, like towards the hashes or whatnot. Yep. Uh, that could be that could be. A- that could be a decent offense. I would have loved to see what that offense was going to do, be more explosive with Derrick Henry. But, again, we'll see. Vrabel out, new coach in. So, um, uh, new things are about to happen there for Tennessee, man. That's well, for sure. And I like what they're doing right there, you know, because that that that's one of the quarterbacks that, that we've talked about is, you know, what are you going to get out of Will Levis? Well, shit, when you surround him with some pretty good pieces like that, I mean, when you add a Calvin Ridley, I, I heard somebody this morning on one of the national things talking about, well, you know, Ridley, I mean, that guy. I, Ridley was legit. Ridley's a, a top-tier wide receiver. He, that dude I mean, was totally legit. Coming he also off struggled – it, and he he's also got, struggled with Trevor Lawrence too. Like you would, you you could yeah. say, you know, one more year with Trevor Lawrence and Ridley would have been a top tier. I agree. Wide receiver. I, I agree. I think Jacksonville fucked up right there, letting that dude. One hundred percent. Yeah, one hundred percent. Because I think that was going to be something really big for those guys. But you talk about Ridley. I mean, what you look at Ridley's career? Shit, he's got a gap year in there, dude. He took a year off. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like it was, and it wasn't an injury year. It was a, it was a year that he had to actually take off because of gambling or whatnot. Um, right. Yeah, you know, not not like the dude was hurt, not like he was, uh, you know, resting or, re- or recuperating or whatnot, or he was actually just literally like putting his legs up there and just allowing him to to rest. And oh, I'm sure he was in the gym training and whatnot, so to speak. But yeah, not too much high intensity miles on those wheels. Well, he he might have been off placing some bets. He might have been calling his cousin uh, or Who something doesn't? during all that time. During all that Who time. doesn't call their cousin? I call my cousin all the time, man. Oh, shit. Who doesn't do that? I mean, that's a, that's a whole different. Hey, did, did you see that um, a couple of days ago? Um, I, have a, I have a lot of friends in North Carolina, you know, with, with racing circles. And they were blowing me up. I think it was on Monday because Monday. Oh, at blowing noon, you. Oh, blowing you up. Gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. I didn't. unfortunately. Unfortunately, not some of them. I wish some of them would have been. But oh so I think God. it was like Monday at noon, Wag, sports betting legalized, became legal in North Carolina. How about that? And, and, and dude, it, it was like I had I had NASCAR buddies calling me. It's like, dude, I just laid down, you know, talking about March Madness and all this different shit. And it's like, um, okay. It's like, welcome to the real world. That That's, that's what the rest of us do. That's what the I rest would- of us do. Do out in these parts. I'd probably never move from Texas in my life if they would change two things. If they would make two little changes. If you legalize gambling and you legalize marijuana, I'd probably never move away from Texas ever. You know, I, I really do think uh, we talked about this a co- it's probably been a couple of months ago. I think with that ownership change with the Mavericks, I think with that happening and the proposed um arena slash casino slash betting venue that they're looking to build i think in the old location the texas stadium right there off of 12 uh in irving that stuff goes down and it's going to happen the betting part 
the well, I mean, part. you want to talk about cleaning up your area or whatnot, you know, cleaning up, uh, you know, downtown and all that speed, you know, all, all the money, all the revenue that you could have just from, uh, you know, just from collecting off of bets and, and then the revenue that you would make off of legalizing weed, you could take all that stuff downtown and turn it into facilities and whatnot for, for, uh, for the homeless. Hell, look at what they did in Denver not too long ago, just off of it, man. I'm not sitting here trying to, you know, become a politician like Aaron Rodgers or Tom Brady here, but you know, when when you got some pretty decent ideas on how to make the system flow a little bit better, um, hell, why not? I'm, I'm a why not guy. I'm a why and, not guy. And, and the whole part about it is, uh, I mean, you see it. Uh, I mean, l- let's just hone in on the betting part. Uh, I mean, legalized yeah. gambling. I mean, legalized you, gambling, how, man. How much fucking money goes out of state? Why? It, why are you that don't make my money gonna tell me? how I can spend my money. Exactly. That is my exact point. And, and when you want to look at, I mean, there are so many different things like us when the, you're when, already taken away from my money with your taxes. Why are you going to tell me how to? Spend yes. It? Yes. I'm, I'm paying taxes on money that I make. How about you allow me to go out and, and make some other money. And at the same time, maybe help the state and maybe help the local uh, communities and maybe help all the dude. I, I don't get that. I don't get that. It, it's, um, well, let's not turn this into an NPR show like we oh, did. Here we go again. <laughs> Had to pull the finger out. No, <laughs> yeah, there we go. The finger. <laughs> my God. So I figured out why it was so loud here earlier. Yeah. Apparently, my room is above the gear shed for oh, all the maintenance. Man. Yeah. So, like, I see everybody bringing the rakes and the blowers and everything back underneath. And uh, that's the guy, that's the people that were saying that I was loud. So like you're loud. I'm like, oh, I'm loud. You you guys have been fucking doing this all morning. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's like I'm loud, and you're sitting over here doing all this shit. Um, I don't know. Hey, Wags, we touched on this uh, yesterday. Look, uh, what we got? We got about ten minutes. Yeah, we got. So we got, uh, let's hit on something. Yeah, right here, Garrett Cole out one to two months. We talked about how that was going to damage the Yankees. The results are back uh, of the MRI. That right elbow um, is a problem. So one to two months initially, initially. Okay. And so you got to think that will probably have a setback there. He probably won't even get back till about the all-star break. Honestly, yep. Like, honestly. Um, yep. or, or or that's probably worst case scenario. He doesn't get back. Nah, it ain't worst case scenario. Worst case scenario, he doesn't come back at all. Um, try an uh, optimal solution. Maybe he comes back before uh, the trade or um, the all-star game or whatnot. But, hell, you'd like to think that you, you're not going to roll him out there anytime sooner or, or, you know, try and, uh, you know, come up with any type of setback there for Garrett Cole. Uh, that's, that's your, that's the one certainty you had as an arm for, for the pinstripes there. And now you're going to tell me that he's, you know, up on the hook for, you know, at least two months. Sayonara Yankees. You guys are done. I thought that you guys would be able to make a, a surprise shock and, and push for this thing for the, uh, the AL East. It's not going to happen. You guys are going to be in the middle of the barrel, maybe at the bottom of hell. You guys got, could be below Boston. Yeah, that's right. And and it and it's it really is going to be an ongoing thing right here because the athletic reported that that the the look at the ligament in the elbow it it appears to still be intact. So you know the well, more it sounds like he's if, is he is he trying to get it you know surgically repaired anyways just to strengthen it because appear uh, uh, that's the way that people are going with Tommy John surgery as it is now. He doesn't need Tommy John. Yeah, yeah. This is his. This is what this is a rotator cuff, right? Or, uh, or what's what's the injury here? This is in the this is in the right elbow. This is in the throwing okay. elbow. Okay, so I mean, this watch, watch in a couple of weeks here. We're going to say, hey, you know, he might need Tommy John surgery. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's what's going to happen right here because I mean, every indication is it's it's not really clear. Has when, Garrett Cole had Tommy John's already? Uh, I don't don't think that he has. I don't think that he has. Let me look a little bit further. Because I mean, uh, you guys tell me if I'm wrong, but it yeah. seems like the past couple of seasons, it seems like pitchers have opted in for a Tommy John surgery, you know, preemptively, yeah, no. just to make your uh, your your elbow even stronger or to strengthen yeah. up your elbow. When yeah, you go no, through. I, uh, I don't uh, think he has rehabilitation. Yeah, I, I don't think he has. But I, I just really th- everything that I'm seeing that I'm reading about this, it's like okay, l- let's say one to two months, but gut feeling is it's going to be worse because it's just totally unclear and they're continuing to have to look it's like well here's what we're initially saying but we're going to do another mri and kind of see what we get from that point and Mm. 
and like we were talking about yesterday, Wags. I mean, for the AL East, I mean, for the Yankees, I mean, th- that is th- that that's your dude on the bump. That's the one blow that you did not need, man. That's um, right. You could deal with Aaron Judge uh, because you had more people in the lineups that could match or whatnot. Um, but if you lose Garrett Cole, that's just an arm that you can't afford to lose. Um, yeah, and how, like that, nobody can supplement that arm. You just can't. Like that's that is a top tier premium pitcher, man. Um, yeah. Yeah. What uh what other news do we have around ESPN? I don't have my computer on me or pulling up any headlines. What's what's some other headlines we have? Um, I'm here? just I'm just kind of trying to still follow free agent stuff, and I don't see anything that's really popping today that's uh that's going to give us any indication as to uh, you know whatever. Um, I did want to ask you. I don't know if you saw the other day, and I've got a very short sound clip wags, um, where uh Saban Nick Saban was. I don't know if it was on Capitol Hill. I don't know where the hell he was. I know Ted Cruz was sitting next to him. Nick Saban told. Talking about making a damn congressional push as We're, well, Rodney. Well, yeah, okay. governor of Alabama, fucker would win in a landslide. But uh, uh, one hundred percent, and I think there wouldn't need be anybody contested with me to take on that office. He was he was talking about, and this is a guy that you know, Hall of Famer, no doubt, greatest greatest coach ever, maybe in college football. This was him talking about the effects of uh, NIL on college football. Oh yeah, yeah, all these good. years. Okay. 50 years of coaching no longer exist in college athletics. So it's always was about developing players. It was always about uh, helping people be more successful in life doing this. And I said, what do you mean? She said, all they care about is how much you're going to pay them. They don't care about how you're going to develop them, which is all what we've always done. So why are we doing this? There you go. There's Nick. So how pissed. much uh, is he pissed? Or uh, it seems like to me, the the thing that Saban worked in building, like the establishment that Saban worked on building, was really tarnished with the whole NIL. And anybody that's yeah. heard Nick Saban talk the past couple of years, he's been upset with um, with NIL because it's really taken away from from the machine of what Alabama has been. Right? Like, so yeah. what are players coming here for Alabama in the first place? They're coming here for to Alabama because they know that it's the next machine to get them into the nfl basically right it's the prototype if you come to alabama we're going to get you into the nfl that's exactly that's our pitch right people that come to alabama they play in the nfl we just get you ready um it's a prototype right yeah. um and now you know you argue with nil money they're only coming to alabama and they're not worried about that that next step like all right well how do i get into the yeah. nfl i'm already making my money right well, like you're giving me um, now yeah, yeah exactly like what you know what, what have you done for me lately so to speak it's not like yeah. that it's not that Alabama is going to be able to, you know, give me reparations and, and pay, you know, make everything come to light within four years after I make it to the NFL. You know, that's that's kind of like the golden step or the stepping stone for Alabama. That's no longer there anymore. And I think that's why Nick Saban kind of went bye bye, guys. Yeah, and and, what, and and he said that that's one of the things. It's a real long cut where he's talking about it. And he said that's one of the things that he considered before he retired was just kind of the state of all of this right now. But but this is where you go back to exactly what you're saying right there. It's like when when kids before this, I mean, you look at wanting to go to Tuscaloosa and you and playing for Nick for 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 Nick Saban, and it's like I mean that's the draw right there, the opportunity to play for that dude. But now it's a totally different environment, and and I think let's 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 right. Just, that's not good enough anymore. Right? That's like, right. Now now I need a thousand. Now I need a hundred thousand dollars on that's top it. of beating Nick Saban that's and get me into the you know get me into the NFL. So I'll, I've I've seen Nick Saban catch a lot of a lot of heat for this, right? A lot of unfair takes. You know, well, Nick pay, Nick Saban don't want to relinquish the power. You know what I mean? That's that's a bullshit take. Um, that could be, you know, that that might have a little bit of validity to it uh, as well. But you know, take in, take in mind, take in consideration a guy that's put all of his life, all of his life's work into football, right? Not just football, into bettering men, making men better, not just at a sport, but at a lifestyle, right? And you take that away from Nick Saban, what else does he have? Like that was kind of basically the, you know, the underlying love for the game, so to speak, yeah. right? And yeah. you, you remove that, then you know what's his motivation? What's his purpose there? You know he's yeah. got he doesn't need that. And, you know, and if and if if kids and players don't want to, you know, receive his his coaching and his uh, you know, his his mentorship, then if they're just there half-assed, then what the hell is Nick Saban there for? I would, so you could argue that Nick Saban wasn't there for the money; he was there for the fucking kids. Yeah, I've said it. You know, Nick Saban is a fucking football coach. 
that's what that dude is. I mean, he's a football coach that likes to game plan and likes to make kids better. I mean, say what you want about him. Is he, he with the old ways? Absolutely, he's with the old yeah. ways. But, guys, there's not really that much bad with the old ways sometimes if you want to break it down. Tradition can't tr – tradition can be good sometimes, man. But but you know what, Wax? I think he did a – I think he did a admirable job working with NIL and all of that. I, I mean – I did too. I, he embraced it very well. What I was going to tell you, it's like, yeah, he's thinking that right now, but if, if he were in Southern California at USC, if he was at Oregon, if he was here at Texas or Texas A&M, would he have a different stance on that? Because you've got – I've been to Tuscaloosa. I know they don't have what these places do, but – right. Saban's right. just a football coach. That, that's what he does. And again, to 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 watch the way the sport has changed in all the years that he's done this. I mean, you can you can hate on him all you want, but the dude the dude is just a ball coach. And and to see the shift, I mean, he's a football coach, not a businessman. Well, he is right. a business, but he's not a business. In, he, he's football a business. acquiring players. Um, I think I think we'll probably see Nick Saban. Uh, I, I thought I already saw a little bit mentioned in this. I'm pretty sure he's game day. Yes, yeah, I think we'll see Nick Saban um, in the booth here shortly after game day too. I'd love to see Nick Saban call plays, man. I'd love to see him as an analyst, not just not just as a guy that's a spokesman uh, on some of the pregame shows, but I'd like to see him actually break down a game break while the game's going down, man. Dude, that would be so cool because it's not going to be that Tony Romo. You know, it's not going to be that zany clowny. No. Thing that we're seeing from him. It's just going to, you won't good. hear any, Ooh, ah, uh, you won't hear yeah. that at all. You'll yeah. be like, well, that, that quarterback shouldn't even be making a throw there. He just didn't have his reads. I can't, I don't have my Nick save. I don't have enough whiskey in me right now to get saving. Going. Well, I think what you get with saving, if he's breaking down games, you get to John Madden without the boom, you know, right. And boom. And then what do you have over yeah, here? Boom. Yeah. You, you get John Madden at a very low energy level, but the, the outtake that's where as a play by play guy, you're going to be like, just fucking let him talk. Right. It's just like, let him he, go. Wants, yep. he, he wants to break it down. You just do it. You just do it. I, I think that's uh really cool, really cool stuff there. So uh, yeah, that was, that was Saban's thought uh, on that. And I totally get it. I mean, I totally get his take right there. I don't think it's a bad take. I don't think it's a bad bit. I think he's just telling you what we probably all think if we followed college football for any length of time. And, of course, we, us being Longhorn folks, I mean, we love NIL. We got money. We got reasons to get people to Austin. But Sam, totally that's a good – I just saw what Sam's uh, comment there, Rodney. Um, Coach Stark said – or Coach came out and said, uh, you know, kids are looking for money. They are not here for us. And I agree with – I mean, that's – Clearly, I mean, if if you're if your first thing coming to the or coming to Texas or coming to any university is like, how much can you make me or how much can I make here, man? You, you probably got the wrong kid, honestly. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know, but um, it was interesting to hear that, and and I think the whole thing is a story that we're going to be watching here for the next probably month or so. Is is, is the whole fact with college football and college athletics and all this, uh, you know, being. Uh, with with Congress getting involved, I mean, you, you know, we see it when Congress gets involved. That's when everything gets real damn complicated. And um, you know, I don't think anything changes. This is college athletics today, but uh, really good take there from. Saban. Is Congress getting involved? Is Congress getting involved? I thought we were just saying that tongue in cheek. I didn't think Congress was actually getting involved. Are, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, he was. I, I think it's Congress, isn't it, Jeff? Jeff and Jordan checking in for it's only yeah. an hour. Hey, what's up, guys? Oh, there, there's something going on. Yesterday. Like just, uh, it wasn't any dialogue. It was just kind of one of those where somebody's doing a voiceover over some B-roll, and it was uh, it was Nick Saban sitting next to Ted Cruz. I'm like, you know what? Everything oh, facing our country right now. Oh, this, boy. This, this, is what those, this is what those fools on Capitol Hill choose to deal with. Right. Hey, right. man. Uh, all battles got to be fought, guys. All battles got to be fought. Yeah, That's the only of all, thing of all the problems, you want to try to fix this. We've been thank, we regular thank people. The NCAA been to... for absolving themselves from NIL uh, by basically their answer was it to sit back and do nothing. So these are the consequences. Yeah, right. That's what happens? Well, Jen, say, man, I'm going to take a stroll around Paradise. You all have a great day, and I'll uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow, man, on Texas Sports yep. Field. Y'all be good. Dude. Go have a cerveza. It's only an hour yeah. coming up with Jeff and Jordan. You guys have a great show. Chaos Theory back tomorrow, 10 to 11 a.m. right here. See y'all tomorrow. Man, uh, it's only an hour. It's Jeff. It's Jordan. I got to follow up with Grant on the on the chat. Grant, you talking about like like the hub, the hub that some people use to – some people need the, that to function on a day-to-day -day basis? Is that – 
Well, he answered somebody in the chat. Yeah, that is the hub. I didn't know the hub was blocked in the state of Texas. So interesting times we live in. Jordan Scruggs. Yep. Um, yeah. Oh, crap. I just realized I need to text Hank back. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's usually how it rolls, man. We, you know, I, I've been, I don't even think I've told you guys on the staff this. So my wife is out of the country this week. So I've been a, a single parent this week and having to shuttle my daughter around it. It's, it's an adventure. And I posted the insider this morning and was making, you know, I posted and then do some edits on the back end. And I was making some edits and probably like finally right around like 915. I kept falling asleep and catching myself. And I was like, you know what, man, I, I just need to pass out for like an hour. Woke up, woke up, showered and got a shower. So I guess somebody around here is working on the water lines because I had like it was a slow trickle coming out of the shower. But um, yeah, I needed I needed some I needed some rest, man. I'll be honest. I ain't gonna lie. I just needed to, to crash. I feel good now, though despite that slow trickle of a shower. So I'm good. But the point is like, yeah. we get so busy, man. It's like, you just kind of blurt things out spur of the moment. Oh, forgot to do that. So I'm probably going to send a newsletter, a horse 24 seven daily newsletter at some point during the show. So you're good. So anybody, new- my eyes wander. That's where they're wandering to. Yeah. It looks like you're in the same room, but new setup at all. Or Well, I, I, I uh, man, here's the thing, Jordan. I don't, I don't know what I want to do in here. That's the problem. Like, it's just the way this room is shaped. And like, I don't, I may need to have Tom McKay come in here and help me out and figure out the the best setup. Cause when I, when we moved into this house, we're, we're renting this house. This is not our house. I just kind of threw everything in here just so I could get my stuff set up real quick. And I don't know that I like the setup. So I may need to have Tom come in here and, pick this thing apart give me give me a good setup yeah i mean some simple's better in some cases in other cases uh i think it'd be great if we could <laughs> stop talking about the dark arts in the comments um but I mean, uh, hey to each their own man some people some people need that stuff to function some of some of us are more well-adjusted adults so <laughs> I guess so. You wanna you wanna talk Texas basketball and just rip the bandaid off? I only watched like the last you know what know, like four and a half minutes. Um, so I there's not much I can say, but you know, I guess I'll take the the side of people on Twitter saying that you know this was strategy by RT, so they get some extra rest for the tournament. <laughs> um, but outside of that, in the last four and a half minutes, uh, I really don't have much to say. Um. I, I, so the people who regularly watch the show, y'all know I'm a very casual Texas basketball watcher. Uh, so w- was a little surprised it got as close as it did there at the end when Max Abmus hit that three. Um, and then also when he almost banked that shit in <laughs> at the at the very, very end. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, nonetheless, uh, the, 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 v- the few, I guess, seeings or viewings I've gotten of the Texas basketball team it's always kind of been the same where it's like I'm watching a different team each time and Tyrese Hunter is a different Tyrese Hunter each time. Um, <laughs> Man, so it, it's that that's that's all I really have to say. I'm interested in your thoughts are. I'm assuming you watched the full 40 minute game. Uh, so I love I love Tyrese. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the story of his career. Like goes off for 30 against OU and last night. He has three points on 0 for 7 shooting. That's you, you don't what you're seeing right now is the lack of a reliable third scorer. Like Max A. Smith goes for 26 last night, and he shot the ball okay. It wasn't, I'm not gonna say he was terrible shooting the ball, but he wasn't great. He's nine for 20 from the field, three for 10 from three. But you know, Dylan DeSue is in foul trouble. D- Dylan DeSue uh, was only played 23 minutes because of foul trouble. So n- your number one scoring option isn't having a, a spectacular shooting night. Your number two option is on the – and as a matter of fact, in the second half – what was DeSue in the second half? Yeah, DeSue only played nine minutes in the second half because of foul trouble. So your number two option can't get on the floor because of fouls. And you don't have a third option. Like Dylan Mitchell had 13 last night. 
I think 10 of those or 11 of those were in the first half. Uh, IT Horton had 14. Uh, well, how many? Five of those in the second half. So you you just didn't have an option. And, and I know RT says it, and, and, and people can accuse it of being coach speak, and maybe it is, but I think there's a kernel of truth in there. This team for the whole year, Jordan, has let their defense or their offense affect their defense way too often. Like if they start missing shots, they'll just stop guarding people or have just these these lapses on defense that you're like, that's not the team I saw in the first half that was locking people down. Like they played a really and, and you look at when Texas has gotten these big leads, it's because they're locking people down and they're scoring off live ball turnovers. That's how they get their big leads. And when that stuff stops happening, usually there's a correlation to where all of a sudden they're not shooting the ball very well. It, it really, if you watched the Baylor game two weeks ago, it was, uh, Eric said in our, Eric Henry, our our, uh, our hoops beat writer at Horns 24-7, Eric said in our group text last night during the game, like it, it was a cob and carpy of the Baylor game, with the exception of neither one of your two options went down with a debilitating knee injury, potentially. But that's pretty much what it was. And K State started hitting some shots. And, and credit, I think you got to give K State credit because basically they're playing for their season last night. They needed that win, and there's still no guarantee. I think, as I checked this morning, Jerry Palm, our bracketologist at CBS, did not have them in the field. Jerry moved them up to the first four, the last team in the first four out. Is where he's got K State. So they they won yesterday, but they've still got work to do before they can even start feeling remotely good about getting into the tournament. So it, it was the same. The bottom line is it was the same. If you've seen, with the exception of like the Houston, the Houston game on the road, the Marquette game, a couple of games here and there, it was pretty much like any other loss Texas has had this year. They get a lead, and then at some point, the offense affects the defense, and then they're in a dogfight midway through the second half when it shouldn't be one. Well, uh, I mean, at least uh, the the basketball Longhorns got a dub on January 20th versus Baylor at the junior day. Cause, uh, <laughs> and it was a buzzer beat. It was a great game. A lot, a lot of kids are still talking about kind of that junior day experience just because schools don't really do that. Um, it's kind of rare that they'll line it up. And when they do bring visitors to basketball games, it's usually not, you know, over 100 kids. It's like 10. Um, but what was not this K State game, the game right before K State oh, in Austin? Did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I watched almost that full game and was like, okay, either Oklahoma really sucks, or like Texas truly is a 1000% different team each night. <laughs> this reminds me of Rick Barnes had a couple of teams like this. I think Chris Beard's first team was like this, where they're not uber talented, but there's enough talent to where if, if they're on, if they're on, if if they play their A game, they can beat just about anybody in the country on a given night. And I think we saw that with the Houston game at home mm -hmm. and how they competed. And you got to remember too, that's a team that gave UConn a game, you know, in the garden, which is basically for all intents and purposes, it might as well be a home game for UConn yeah. without DeSue and without Caden Shedrick. So basically they had no front court presence and put up a really good fight against UConn earlier in the year. So on a given night, we've seen this team where they can put it together and be really, really competitive. And they show you those flashes and it's just enough to piss you off because they're just way too inconsistent because they don't have a reliable third score. And again, just that letting their, their offense affect their defense way too much. They're just way too inconsistent, way too erratic that, you know, tech, could could this team make it to the Sweet 16? If they made the Sweet 16, would it shock me? No, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if they're in the second weekend. Because depending on matchups, man, if you get one of those nights where Ace Miss and DeSue combined for 40-plus, Dude, you can you can win a second round game against a a two seed or a one seed, depending yeah. on who that two seed or one seed is. But if you also told me Texas loses an eight nine game and they're one and done, that wouldn't surprise me either. There's just it, that's the thing with the erratic teams, man. There's there's no way you could convince me. As much as personally I like 
just about everybody I come in contact with in that program, coaches and players. So this is not a personal shot. It never is with me. I just feel like I always have to reiterate that. As much as I like people in that program, you, there's no way you could convince me to to take Texas very far in a bracket projection. There's no way. No, no way. So I, I have two questions for you. Um, and then, you know, or yeah, two questions for you. Dylan Mitchell. Um, big part of him coming back was to boost his draft stock. I have, again, y'all know I'm a very casual Texas basketball watcher. The times I've seen him in the game, nothing about his game screams NBA draft pick at all. Like, not even remotely close. Um, or, or when I say NBA draft pick, I'm talking like first round, not second round. Yeah. So, I don't know. Like, do you, uh, how do you think that's going to go this offseason? Do you think he could be a guy who goes in the portal? Do you think he could just say, F it, I'm going to the draft? Could he come back? What would you really expect to happen? And also, like, Again, I'm a very casual Texas basketball watcher. I don't know what it's looking like with how many guys they're they're going to lose to either attrition or the portal. Like, kind of, how aggressive yeah. do you think they'll be in the portal? What is what do you think that um, like? The the site I've gone to, Jordan, since I was in high school, I found them to be somewhat reliable. NBA Draft.net. <laughs> Their latest mock draft, which was published on when was the 11th? Was that Monday? Yeah, Monday. They've got Dylan Mitchell late to first round. Really? They're 60, or I'm sorry, late mid to late second round. There's 60 picks in the draft. They got him going 49 is where they have. And okay. honestly, I, I think he could take his chances in the draft because I, honestly, I, the, the portal might make sense. You know, mm -hmm. you think, does he go somewhere and, and change, you know, can, get with a different team. I, I don't know that he would find a better team to mix in with than last year's team that he was on, where he could be a rim runner and, and kind of do the things that he does. Is the jump shot going to improve enough to where it's worth him coming back? Because I always worry about guys that, in terms of just like their stock as first round guys. I worry mm -hmm. about guys that might stay in college a little too long because then you wonder, especially a five-star guy, do you get the stigma then, okay, what's wrong with him? Mm -hmm. Like if he's been in college this long, what's wrong with him? I do. I worry about guys getting that stigma. But for Dylan Mitchell, I think he's really got to sit down and evaluate it. Like you're probably not going to be a first-round pick. You might not even be a high enough second-round pick to where someone's going to put you on a two-way deal. But he might be enticing enough of an athlete to where he gets that kind of deal. Yeah, um, I mean, like it makes... I, I feel for whatever it's worth, I feel better about. And again, I'm not saying one is an all star or anything like that. I feel better right now about Dylan Mitchell's NBA prospects than I did about Greg Brown's NBA prospects when he came out after his freshman year. Like Greg, yeah. Greg Brown, Greg needed to come back. He needed oh, another yeah. year. And, uh, you know, Dylan, I think Dylan got better at some things. I think he's a better rebounder. I think he's because he's been able to rebound and do things that can keep him on the floor. I think we've seen him become more of a complete defender. But I just don't. There's nothing to your point. There's nothing. And I've said this since the kind of the start of the season. There's nothing in his game right now that screams that really translates to the NBA. Yeah, you know, I think his role in the NBA would be a guy that when he's on and when he's on an NBA roster would be, you know, ninth, 10th guy in the rotation that if you want to put a fast lineup on the floor, he could be like a small ball four to where he can rim run. But again, he doesn't rebound or protect the rim at a level to where he can play, you know, high leverage minutes. He can be a plus-plus a, a plus athlete rotational guy because he can defend well enough, just, just be an on-ball defender. Yeah. Um, yeah, it'll it'll be interesting to see kind of what happens with him. Um, <laughs> yeah, that is a fair but, point. Hey, well, I'm very well, casual no, basketball. Bodies, though. But, uh, uh, Jackson but with Wazzy said, I do kind of understand. Yeah, I, I get that, but Jackson Hayes is a – Jackson Hayes can protect the rim. Jackson Hayes will rebound. 
Jackson Hayes is not in the league because he's a scorer at all. Mm-hmm. He's 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 a bench guy. He basically, <clears throat> I think I told you this when I went to the Pelicans Lakers game in New Orleans. Like Jackson Hayes sat on the bench until Anthony Davis looked over at Darvin Ham and like put his hand on his chest, like, "Hey, I need a breather right here." And then Jackson Hayes went in and played like his six, seven, like not even that long, like probably four or five minutes. Let Anthony Davis get a shot of Gatorade, and then he's ready to go back in. Jackson Hayes is back on the bench. Shit, shit, I'll do that for a couple of M's a year. <laughs> yeah, hey, hey, yeah, 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 I got you. But Jackson Hayes, Jackson Hayes has a skill that keeps him in the league, which is he's a he's a seven foot, you know, plus plus athlete that can protect the rim. Mm-hmm. And what you said is a thousand percent true because he has some legal baggage and is still in the league. So yeah. that kind of proves you the, the type of player that the Jackson Hayes is. And then my, uh, my last question. Well, no, kid, you, I, you, cause you start talking about roster construction, right? Is that what you were going to ask me last? You just kind of go back to that or. I was going to ask you, I know it's impossible to predict, but I was going to ask you who you think, um, if you had a gun to your head, who do you pick to win March Madness? Because I watched the Kansas Houston game last, I think it was Saturday, Sunday, mm-hmm. Monday. I don't know. <laughs> um, and I mean, Houston beat them like a st- like a stepchild, yeah. right? And I know Kansas had injuries, and it was a home game for Houston and all that. But like the shit Houston routinely does to other <laughs> highly yeah. ranked teams is kind of scary, and I don't know if. I've never been a super big college basketball watcher, but I, in the the small amount of games I've ever seen in college basketball, I don't think I've ever seen be a team be as consistently dominant in one year. So that's yeah. who I would go with personally. I'm just curious who you would say. Yeah, remind me to come back to Texas roster reconstruction because I do I do want to mention something about that. But I, I almost want to take Houston just for a lack of better options. So Tennessee is a contender, right? Am I going to bet on Rick Barnes in March as much as I like Rick? No. Ain't no way I'm going to bet on a Rick Barnes coach team. In March. By the same token, am I going to put my eggs in the basket of a Matt Painter Purdue team? Not no, but hell no. I ain't touching Purdue with a 10-foot pole in my bracket just because that that's kind of what Matt Painter teams do. They they dominate the Big Ten, and you know once they get into the tournament, especially a team that's a bad matchup, they can kind of match their size with athleticism. Uh, it, it can make for a long night for Purdue. You know, Arizona is really intriguing for me, but they're kind of out of sight, out of mind playing in the Pac-12. And I, I don't know if Arizona is a team that I want to watch this weekend when they get into the Pac-12 tournament. That's, that's a team I want to take a look at. Uh, I've watched North Carolina a couple times, and that's a veteran team with a guy in R.J. Davis who's got to figure it out. R.J. Davis is their guy that he could go for. 20 25 points a night and lead them and, and and they hubert davis does a good enough job with what they've got carolina is going to be in that mix uh but yeah probably houston and uconn are the two most complete teams i saw all year good. by far i don't know I, I just i just i'm i'm kind of i feel like i've been burned by purdue too many times to to really think that highly of them you know, uh, Tennessee's got some good things going. They've, they've had a great year. But, again, it's it's a Rick Barnes team in March. I just can't – I don't want to put my eggs in that basket. And then when you look at other teams from the Big 12, man, if, if you're going to pick somebody from the Big 12, like I don't know. I don't know how much you can go with Kansas right now because how hurt are Hunter Dickinson and Kevin McCullough, like even when they get to next week, like you talk about a team that probably wants to be out quickly in Kansas City so they can rest up. Uh, it's probably Kansas. And like there's a reason why Bill Self told basically is holding those guys out of the Big 12 tournament. Like if they really needed to push it, if they were playing for like a one seed, then he might push one or both of those guys, but there's just no sense in doing it right now. And I don't even know if Dickinson could play to tell you the truth. And yeah, like but if you're, if you're looking, if you're looking for somebody other in the Big Twelve, man, I because Baylor's got a couple guys, you know, between Jacoby Walter and Jalen Bridges, that again could just I I just try to look for teams where do you have a couple guys that could go off for like a 25, 30, 35 point game. Baylor's got a couple of those guys, and with mm-hmm. you see, they got a guy who can protect the rim. Uh, they're they're 
they're I wouldn't say Baylor's a complete team, but they're more complete than some teams are going to be seated higher than them. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Um, as far as Kansas goes, what you're saying, like, that's the one school, and only for basketball, that I'll continue to root against um, once not alone. all Texas athletics are fully in the SEC. I just – and it's not even anything wrong with Kansas. Like, K.J. Adams, who's one of not their best player, like, I grew up playing AAU with him. We're the same age. Yeah. But Bill Self, I can't effing stand that dude. Um <laughs> I just can't stand them. And the Kansas fans are so goddamn annoying, <laughs> especially because they're just getting good at football. And, yeah. like, when y'all run into the big dogs, y'all are still – the same thing is still happening. So, yeah. it's like y'all are celebrating beating Iowa State now. It wow. Was, like, that Kansas team Texas beat was not a bad team. And, you know, Jalen Daniels plays. That game is closer. But – I think I told you this, man. I was I was sitting with somebody. The game in Lawrence at Texas one. What was that? Fifty five six or whatever. Fifty five fourteen. Texas just blew Kansas out. And I was sitting with somebody who got a call from everybody knows who my friends are. It ain't gonna take that hard. It ain't gonna be that hard to figure out who I was with. But I was sitting with somebody. They got a call from an, an assistant coach at Kansas, and a Kansas staffer was just beside himself at texas not that like hatred or anything this is like well what what was you know what what do you think about texas he's like look we play teams with size he said but they're at he said their offensive and defensive lines he says they're so effing big and they're so effing strong that we just can't compete with that and yep. you saw that in Lawrence two years ago, and you damn sure saw that in Austin back in late September. That's why I say, like, even if Jalen Daniels had played that game, dude, Texas still wins that game by two or three touchdowns just because they were – I mean, you talk about – I talked yesterday about we need to see the Texas offensive line roll some people off the ball. Dude, they was rolling Kansas off the ball. There was a play, There was a touchdown. I think Jonathan Brooks scored it in the red zone where it was a trap, and I, I hate. I hate, 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 loathe. Almost not quite as much as I hate the red zone fade, but I almost hate as much as when teams pull their guards in the red zone, especially down around the goal line. Like you're just you're inviting disaster. I feel like when you pull your guards. Okay, and, but there was a play where Hayden Connor pulls he pulls it leads up in the hole on a trap, and it's, he does like a little skip pull, and it was like the most beautifully executed, you know, goal line trap counterplay you'll ever see because Hayden Connor didn't have anybody to block because everybody on the pl- on the front side of the play like just rolled their dudes off the ball and that's so that was I know that was way off on a tangent but that's what the Kansas staff thought about Texas that they just couldn't compete with Texas because they were so big and so physical that they just didn't have they might have had a couple of frontline guys that could have matched up here or there but they they didn't have the depth that Texas had up front couldn't so have. so what what's with your hatred for the the red zone fade? It's it's the worst playing football. It's a low it's a low percentage throw. And unless you've got Randy Moss or Calvin Johnson or Larry Fitzgerald, somebody that can really go up and, and high point a football and come down with it, prime Des Bryant, something like that, dude, there's no sense in throwing it. There's no sense in throwing it. It's a low percentage throw. Chances are your your quarterback, even the best quarterbacks, are going to have to pinpoint that throw under pressure at an angle, kind of fade it to the to the flat, to the back pylon. And chances are it's more likely to go out of lead your guy. You're going to lead your guy out of bounds. You're going to throw it over his head. You're going to lead him. It's you're going to lead him too short to where he's probably got to go over the DB. It's going to be more of a your 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 receiver becomes more of a defensive back at that point because you're trying to avoid an interception. It's mm-hmm. just the the reward of either getting a touchdown or drawing a defensive pass interference to me is not worth the risk. I'm not even talking about the risk of a turnover. I'm talking about the risk of just wasting a down. It's a waste of a play unless you've got a dude that can just moss people in the end zone all right so i do kind of agree with you i think it's like all about just knowing your personnel um texas doesn't have a guy on their roster right now i'd be super comfortable with 
throwing like a jump ball up to. Exactly. And when Sark ran it, I wanted to like just punch something, just punch like the window in front of me in the press box. Like, <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah, so I was thinking about that play with AD because even last year's roster, like AD Mitchell, obviously we know him, like big as hell. I never viewed him as a like jump ball possession receiver kind of like that just because he didn't really move like one of those. Yeah, I would say like the type of receiver I'm describing is like kind of what Josh Doxson was at TCU where they were just throwing everything up to him and he's coming down with it. Yeah, that's kind of what I mean by jump ball receiver. But with AD and, and, and that right at the end, like it was kind of more of a comeback, right? Then I've only I only watched that game whenever it happened. I haven't gone back and watched it. But if I remember uh, correctly, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I'm, I'm watching that, it right now. Hold on, let me sync? turn the volume down. Sorry, everybody. Yeah, if you look at it, so it's they're throwing it. They're on the end of the boundary. It's it's a fade, but if you look at where Quinn throws that ball. That Quinn throws that ball exactly where that play that ball needs to be thrown. It needs to be more of a back shoulder throw mm -hmm. if your receiver has leverage than actually like a jump ball towards the end zone where your guy is fading. He's running the fade, fading towards the end zone. If you go back and watch that play, it actually ends up being more of a back shoulder throw where you see AD. It looks like he's just going to fade to the back pylon. And instead of the only difference was instead of stopping and breaking his route off and breaking to the front pylon for the back shoulder throw, he just jumps and kind of adjusts his body. And like I said, it ends up being kind of a uh, as best as I get, like kind of a hybrid back shoulder throw almost for lack of a better term. But yeah, Quinn, Quinn threw that ball exactly where you need to throw it if you're going to run that play. My The play I would rather run that I think is much more of a high percentage throw and, and not by much, but if you want to throw the ball, I, this is how I would do it. You go back to those at the 20, uh, the 20, so two years ago, the 2022 game when AM played Bama in Tuscaloosa. Mm -hmm. And they had that fourth down, basically, fourth down is the last play of the game. If they score, they win. If Bama <laughs> and, they, and, they, and they mugged Evan Stewart. Well, yeah, but Haynes King, Haynes King didn't have the arm to make. That's oh, yeah. like that was a hard ass throw for any quarterback to make. But you're asking Haynes King to throw it. And it's not a really disrespect to Haynes King, but it's like he's throwing there. The ball is lined up. He's throwing it to the field side and trying to throw that throw that back shoulder throw to the front pylon to Evan Stewart. I like that play much better because now if your receiver runs his route right now, you're it's more of a chance to where it's your guys either catching the ball or it's incomplete problem with that was they ran it on fourth down so it's it's your margin for error is non-existent but i yeah. like that play much more than i like the the fade yeah one thing um is for me thinking with texas like i remember the 2022 iowa state game where xavier worthy just destroyed that db on a whip route on like the one yard line mm -hmm. and i think it was third down no that was um, fourth down. or fourth down yeah. yeah i remember it was a pretty important part of the game and play um, and then he kind of ran – I don't even know what you want to call that route. He ran versus K-State in the back of the end zone where he caught it in the corner in 2022. Um, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I know exactly. Yeah, like, me, I'll pull that play. Why didn't they go back to that? Like, why were they not having – like, who the hell is guarding Xavier Worthy on a whip route? Nobody. Yeah, like, why was that not run in the sugar – you know what I mean? Like, they, I feel like they never really returned to that at, at the goal line, at least off the top of my head. I can't remember. Um, but I mean, if you're going to throw the ball on the one or two yard line, yeah, I don't know. Do that. Like they here's, should just, no one's going to guard this. Isaiah Bond doing it or Jonte. Just here's if you're going to throw the ball to the five yard line, run the whip. I would, mm. man, can I, can I share my screen? Mm. Let me see. I'm going to, well, I'm going to do something. I have no idea if it's going to work. Yeah. Right. You got to hit present and then there's a share screen. So, okay. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm not in the I'm not in the same browser. Okay, so hold on. Oh. Um. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Browser. Okay, I hit something wrong. Anyway, so I'm looking at this play. Right. Uh, looks like K State's in man coverage, or maybe they drop into a zone here. Hold on, let me see. He he literally runs like this and then catches it. It's basically like a he's basically running 
almost an out route to the back pylon. Like it's not really a fade. It's not, but you're not far away enough to where it's like kind of your, your little seven route. It's just like, he just drifts to the back pylon. And honestly, like, I don't know how the defender lost him. I don't know how you lose Xavier worthy that close to the goal line. Yeah. Like if, um, you're, if you're a defensive back, if you're, if the wide receiver is pushing vertical, right. And he's already in two steps and he's in the end zone. Realistically, like on the route tree, what does he have left to do? You know, like you have, I don't know, man. Sometimes defenders just like you get too locked into w- playing within the scheme that you just, you forget to use your instincts and just common sense. Sometimes it's like, all right, if he's pushing vertical, really, there's only like two or three things he can do. He can run a stop route. He can run a drag kind of towards the, the, the goal post on the end line, or he can run to the back pylon. That's pretty much it. That's pretty much like the three things he's going to do. Yeah. We had the dude, old boy from K-State, just stood there like a goof and just <laughs> let yeah. him Co- Coach Howe would never. Coach Howe would never. So, Kuda brought up a great point. He said, since we're down the rabbit hole talking about end zone plays, what do you actually like then? Well, what's your what's your very favorite? Give me your favorite for passing and your favorite for running. My my absolute favorite, my favorite play, period. Mm-hmm. It's kind of what Cooter said. Cooter said he likes the tight end in the flat. Mine is the the play action flat or kind of hard run action to the left and then come back to the fullback in the flat. When have you ever seen that play get run and it's covered? I'll tell you when never. Because nobody respects the fullback. I've seen Alex Delatore score on that. I've seen Andrew Beck score on that. That's a, a version of the play Byron Murphy scored on. Like that play always works because nobody ever covers the fullback. As yeah, and- far as the run play goes, man, anything where you're not pulling your guards is fine with me. It, it really almost has to be like duo or something like quick hitting. Because even if you're running zone, man, it's got to be tight zone. Because if you try to get too wide, the for me, just when I'm watching football, the 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 more you can have in your goal line short yardage red zone run game that can negate penetration, the better off you're going to be. Like if you run stretches, wide zones, you're inviting penetration. If you try to pull your guards or pull a tackle, you can. You can run some kind of – now, if you want to just give the defense some eye candy down there, I I like a a split zone, like split flow, which Texas runs a lot. They run a ton of split Mm -hmm. zone, where basically you're just just using the tight end to pull back. Sometimes the tight end doesn't even end up blocking anybody. It's just holding that linebacker for like that split second where you need to hold him to let that – to let your zone play open up. So I like that just kind of – I'm more of a low risk run call guy in the in the red zone. Like to me, man, if you want to be a really good running team, red zone, short yardage, goal line, you do that's that's just your offensive line just rolling people off the ball. Can your O line be more physical? You know, yeah. Maybe, like I said, maybe pull a tight end, run some split flow, but it's pretty. I think running the ball is pretty limited if you don't have the personnel to to be a really good short yardage running team. Yeah. So one of the plays. And you, you just kind of reminded me of this when you're bringing up the the fullback kind of into the flat play or whatever you were yeah. talking about. Yes, uh, Rick St. Charles, uh, Ahmad Hall scored in, in the AM game in 05 on one of those plays. And Rex, you can back me up. Who who was the closest guy to Ahmad Hall? Dude was like 10 yards away from him. Nobody respects the fullback. Yeah. Um, no, so that reminded me a lot of the play they would always run with Keelan Robinson, where he'd run an orbit route, mm-hmm. which is you know he'd come in and back out or whatever. That's a start. That's a start. Why didn't why one why wasn't that run more? And two, why didn't they create more variations of that where you would have a fullback going in and Keelan's the running back running in orbit, or you have a fullback running orbit? You know what I mean? Like it was, I felt like it was pretty successful most of the time they ran it. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, that might have been just because. Like I said, Sark didn't run it a ton. Um, yeah. And it, it, it wasn't necessarily that I wanted more plays drawn up for, for Keelan Robinson. That's not what I'm saying. I think Jaden Blue can can work that same role perfectly fine, running the orbit as well. 
or any of the other running backs. I just think it's it's a great scheme, and especially in the SEC. I know we talk about like how the SEC has better athletes and things like that, but also like the SEC sometimes will take a lot more of the old school box defenders than other power conferences are taking. You know what I mean? Where yeah, Keelan Robinson, you know, guys like him, guys like Jaden Blue, you know, whenever you play Alabama, it's not like you're going to run across many of those, but like uh, A&M, for example, this is one of my favorite kids I've ever covered, Tori and York. He was the first team, uh, all SEC freshman team or whatever. Mm-hmm. As a, as a fr- true freshman this past year, A&M is their Mike linebacker. And he barely played on third downs. And it's because yeah. he can't cover very well. And he's never really been able to cover. He's always been undersized, kind of underathletic, but he would always know exactly what was happening. And that's mm-hmm. still kind of the same thing with him. But, like, each team is still taking linebackers that if you have a guy like Keelan Robinson, a guy like Jaden Blue, you can pick on them on first and second down, yeah. like, relentlessly. Yeah. So I, I would yeah. really love to see more usage of the of the orbit. Not that it's like a regular play thing, but just like that works so well in the Big Twelve, where I feel mm-hmm. like those teams are more equipped to you know deal with uh, passing threat running backs or receiving threat running backs. So I'd love to see more usage of it in the SEC. Yeah. So here's we had a really in depth conversation about this on Longhorn Blitz. Not this recent episode, but the episode before. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think I've even mentioned this here. If I have, I apologize, but it's worth repeating because it's exactly what you're talking about, Jordan. When Texas goes to the SEC, the SEC hasn't had the the depth of defensive evolution that we've seen in the Big 12 Mm -hmm. because they haven't had to, right? You're you're getting NFL caliber athletes. When we kind of talked about the Texas schedule a little bit, we didn't go full schedule rundown yesterday for anybody that missed the show, but just kind of looking at it, like we even talked about like Kentucky, Florida, Mississippi State. There are going to be guys on defense at all three levels of those defenses that play in the NFL. That's just the type of athletes you're going to see in the SEC. But in the Big 12, Texas and Oklahoma really are the only two schools that have access to recruiting those kinds of athletes on a consistent basis. So you're at a talent disadvantage. So what do you need to do? You need to have some type of scheme that can make up for your disadvantage that you don't have an athleticism or playmaking ability. And that's not to say that like Iowa State or K-State or the teams that really like running that three safety defense that inverted Tampa two that they don't have guys that play in the NFL. Brazil, each one of those defenses that I just named has had a first round pick within the last two years. Will mm-hmm. McDonald at uh, Iowa State and uh, Felix Anaduke at Zoma at K State. But they had to adapt because, dude, you, like, you can't. You're Iowa State. How the Iowa State that defense that John Haycock invented that three safety defense. They they ran into it by accident playing Texas on a Thursday night in Ames. Uh, Tom Herman's first year where Texas got the ball on their opening possession and j- dude just ran. I mean, just went through them like, like crap through a goose, man. It, it and, and it's like, dude, Texas is going to blow them out. And then they basically took that three safety defense kind of was their third down package. And it started to work. And like Texas didn't prepare for it. They had, they weren't, they hadn't really seen it. And it worked so well that they were like, well, why don't we just make this our base defense? And John Haycock's evolved it from there. And there's a reason why, whether it's been Brent Venables or Jim Knowles, whoever, the Barry Odom runs that defense. If you want to, if you want to know how to really employ that defense and run it, you go to Ames, Iowa, and figure out how John Haycock does it. And people have kind of put their different spin on it, but We've seen the Big 12 with that three high defense. That that was the the adaptation to everybody running space and pace spreads. And just you know, that there's a reason why you don't see, you know, 50, 60 point games in the Big 12 on a regular basis anymore. It's because scheme on defense has leveled the playing field a little bit. Now, again, you see sometimes if you get an offense like Texas had last year, sometimes it might not matter what defense you run. And I think to a large extent the three safety defense didn't bother. Sorry. It's amazing. Once you, once you've got a quarterback with a little bit of experience, Jordan, you've got, you've got some receivers that can, you know, manipulate coverages. 
it, it's amazing how suddenly you don't have near as much of a problem with that that three high defense as you once did. But it's amazing as Sark's personnel's gotten better, how much how he's he's been able to handle that a lot better. But you don't see that much defensive adaptation in the SEC. Like that's why Texas had so much success against Alabama because dude, playing Alabama, it's a Nick Saban defense. It's gonna be pattern match cover four. Like you know, pretty much gonna be match quarters. You know what you're gonna see on defense. He's adapted it a little bit, but it's still the same Nick Saban defense, some version of it you've seen for the last 10 years. When you play LSU, you know that no matter who their defensive coordinator is, they're going to run 90% man coverage because they believe their guys are better than your guys. And that's just how that's just how you roll. That's how teams roll in the SEC. So I don't worry at all about Texas and those little advantages you're talking about, Jordan, like whether it's orbit motion or whatever. Somebody in the chat mentioned the throwback screen. I think Sark, Sark and Brian Harson are the two Texas offensive coordinators that I've seen in my lifetime that had the best feel for not just designing screens, but when to call screens. Because when's the last time you saw, other than the tight end screen, which sometimes that's the only one I'm like, so I think Sark leans on tight end screen too much. But when's the last time you saw Brian Harson or Steve Sarkeesian at Texas call a running back screen where it didn't get big yardage? Because they it's, like, it had a really good feel for dialing it up. Harson didn't start this. Yeah, no, great, great point about the running back screen. As far as receiver screen goes, like I wanted to throw my remote at the TV every time I saw a, sc- a screen get thrown to a receiver that wasn't Xavier Worthy because Xavier Worthy is like 160 pounds. He's not blocking jack shit. You know what I mean? Like it ju- <laughs> if you're going to run it with him on the field, throw it to the other side and put him on the other side. Yeah. It's just that would piss me off a lot. Um, but I did love the the throwback screen that they always use with Jay Brooks. Um, but what I, what I was going to say. And, and uh, another thing that I love too. Go ahead. The I don't even remember exact. I don't even remember exactly what happened in the play. Yeah. But the play versus K State at home this season, this most recent season, when I think it was like uh, third and one, maybe fourth and one, and CJ Baxter ended up taking it like fifty something yards. The oh yeah, or yeah, yeah, like that. yeah. That play where it was kind of the – wasn't it like a misdirection and a pitch maybe? Um, mm-hmm. I, I was in the stadium, and I haven't watched that game back, so I don't remember. But I remember in the game at Iowa State this season, they used a similar play, if not the same play, in like a similar situation where it was third and short or fourth and short. Um, but he didn't break it for 50. He broke it for like 20. Yeah, that you, was one of his first long runs of that night. I'm yeah, sure. they lined up like they were going to just have Malik Murphy – Bull forward and do a quarterback mm-hmm. sneak. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. That's what it was. Mm-hmm. Some trickery, but yeah, let me see. So that's I gotta go. There is hold on. Let me YouTube's the not good, cooperating with me here. Um, you're all yeah. good. The, the good thing is, uh, you know, watch, while I know one watch the play, yeah. So basically they line up, they crowd, they crowd it, and it looks like they're gonna run quarterback sneak with Malik and did he actually – I thought he kind of – I thought he might have leaned forward like to show sneak, but I think with, with the guys mm-hmm. inexperienced as Malik was, that probably was too high risk. But yeah, he just pitches it out to CJ. He makes one guy miss, and, dude, you, once he gets in the open field, you're not catching that guy. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so I'm I'm interested to, to see how they're going to use the screens in, in the SEC and – you know the different ways they get the different guys the ball. Um, I know Texas fans will miss Xavier Worthy. I'll I'll miss watching him in a Texas uniform too, but I won't miss the screens with him on the field. You know what I, I love? I feel about much this. better about Texas group of receivers and, and blocking some DBs uh, this year than I did Dude, last that, year. That that pissed you off something fierce because you you took my spot. At, I gave up my spot at the TCU game, so you go. Which, dude, I I've been to Fort Worth. I'm like. Jordan, you can go, man. I don't. He, you wanted to go to a game this year, and I'm like, I don't need to go back to Fort Worth. I'm, I'm good. I'll watch it on the couch. Yeah. But I remember, man, you were pissed off something fierce because they kept running. You and Chip both because they kept running that that screen expected X to block, and it kept getting yeah. blown up. Because uh, was it Jonte? Was it Jonte that got blown up because X swift on a block? I think like who didn't get blown up? That- <laughs> That's what I like. He's 160 pounds, and the same thing has happened for all three years he was at Texas when they tried to use him on screens. Like definition of insanity. Not taking away from X because he he did so many yeah. great things his last year, but but I, I guarantee you he's getting taken off the field in the NFL if a receiver screen is getting run run that isn't getting thrown to him. 
He's man, getting taken. I don't. I got a feeling whoever drafts him isn't drafting him, asking him to block a whole lot. And like that, the frustration with the common sense there is like the same like frustration I had where it's like, why is Keelan Ru- uh, Robinson returning kicks with a cast on his hand in the college football playoffs? Okay, that was the one. Yeah, I, I've been like, critical of Sark and I felt like at times I nitpicked, but that was the one that. Like, I get it's his last game. I get he's done a lot of good for the program. But, you know, if you want to put a running back back there to return kicks, Jaden Blue had two good hands. Yeah. And it's like you're out of your mind if you don't think the bar wasn't with this kicker. Like, it, kick it to that motherfucker. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, Kick it to the know. dude that doesn't have two functional hands right now. Yeah. But you really – you know – I don't know. That's not nitpicking. That's valid. But to to round out what you're saying about, you know, the different motions and shifts and things in Sark's offense, going to the SEC again, where you don't you haven't had to you haven't been forced to have defensive adaptation. We're starting to see it a little bit now in that league, but you're getting into it at a time where Sark has kind of figured out how to how to run handle that three safety defense, because that's all he saw pretty much in the Big 12 for the most part. All that stuff's gonna be gonna be magnified because it's going to be defenses that for Sark and by proxy Quinn and eventually Arch and so on down the line with your quarterbacks, it's gonna be easier for them to diagnose if it's not just a super complex defense that you're going against. Oh yeah. I mean the the biggest thing is I won't be anything Sark or you know the offensive staff hasn't seen at some point or another. It's just going to be about you're playing a higher caliber of athlete, you know? Yeah. And and obviously most of the time a higher caliber coach as well on the sideline. So I would, I would very much agree with your first point. I would disagree with your second point though. I think pound for pound, the big 12 has better head coaches than the sec. I think, I think between, Matt Campbell and John Haycock, what they've done on defense. Chris Kleiman, Lance Leipold, and Andy Kotelnicki, what they've done on offense. I think Mike Gundy, historically, he's not he's not on a Bill Snyder level, but does more with less than, than maybe just about anybody in my lifetime as a college football coach. Uh, you know that tech staff with Kitley. They they can be pre- they can be pretty innovative. I think Houston now with Willie Fritz. I I've wanted Willie Fritz to get a power five job for a long time just because I love what he did when he was back at Sam Houston. It, it ended up working at a high level at Tulane. And hell, I want to see what his stuff looks like at the power five level. Um I won't I won't I won't throw the Baylor staff in there when we're talking about innovation, even though I like Dave Aranda, but yeah, man, it's you've got some damn good coaches in the Big Twelve. Don't don't sell the Big Twelve short. You didn't even talk about who. Yeah, fuck it. I think he is the best one. Winningham, Utah. Well, yeah. Now you, you want to talk team. about doing more with less? You know what I mean? Yeah. And honestly, I know I know everyone who watches the show absolutely hates them, but like, I am a big fan of not. Texas Tech, but the Texas Tech football staff, because they're all former Texas high school football coaches, yeah. and they recruit pretty much 99.9% of the state of Texas. Yeah. And the way they recruit is really eye-opening. They kind of do like NFL front office where, you know, they're going to gamble on a lot of guys, but the guys they're gambling on are running 10-4s, 10-5s, or have like plus foot wingspan, like crazy shit like that. I think if they do it right, and are given enough time, which I think Joey McGuire and, and his staff will be given enough time, I think Texas Tech could legitimately potentially run the Big 12 just because the athletes that they have, the rest of the Big 12 doesn't have. They've signed the fastest class in the country the last three years, um, and that's like with advanced data context, a, a factoid. Yeah. Um, eventually, it's, it's going to – it's going to snowball into something. And I feel pretty good about that. Again, I know everyone who watched the show probably hates them, but I really do believe in that staff. I think they know what they're doing. Um, and I think if they're given enough time, 
they're going to turn it around because the model they're using is like identical to the Matt Rule model. It's literally identical to what Matt Rule did at Baylor and how he built that program back up again, hey, except me, they tweaked it a little. Let so, me ask you this. Hmm. A&M just hired Trev Alberts as their athletic director, <laughs> which it's one thing to hire. This is this has been my problem with A&M, and it's a lot of people's problem with A&M. You hired I mean, Trev Alberts. Did you need to make Trev Alberts the highest paid athletic director in the country? Oh, I mean, you, you had know, to get him from Nebraska in some way. You know who's you know who's really happy. You know who's really happy about that Trev Alberts contract, other than Trev Alberts and his family. CDC. E- every competent AD in the country who just realized they're about to get a nice big fat raise. Like you don't think you don't think CDC is counting on getting a big raise? Like you said, you don't think Kirby Hocutt is counting on getting a raise at this point? Like there's there's some ads that are about to cash in, but uh, you know. With with Trev Alberts leaving, like Matt Rule is one of those guys that hasn't stayed in the same play. I said this about uh, you say this about several different guys. Harbaugh is one of those guys. Mm-hmm. Some guys just don't stay. Urban Meyer was one of those guys. Some guys just don't stay in one place very long. They're kind of job hoppers, right? And Rule's one of those guys that how long was Rule at Temple? Five years, six years. He was at Baylor for three or four. Like, I know he got fired in the NFL. It wasn't his choice to leave Carolina, but I just wonder, man, how how long how long Matt Rule's gonna want to hang around in Nebraska. I, I, where I would think it's different. You've talked about this, man. Nebraska's got some, they've got money to throw around for NIL. It's just can they get players interested? The right kind of players interested. Yeah, so so my thing um with rule with Nebraska. Is all their because Trev Alberts is actually a pretty damn good AD. So you know the rare credit we do give to the Aggies, we got to give it to them now because that is probably the best hire I've seen them make. This, in my opinion, the best. You, you think so? I think it's a better hire than Elko. I think Elko and that staff will have more success than the Jimbo staff. But the way I think about things is like, look. So much of AM right now is trying to rebrand from the Jimbo Fisher Jimbo Fisher era, right? And be mm-hmm. like, oh, we're done just recruiting players off stars and talent. We're gonna be different. We're gonna do it the right way. We're gonna have culture. But it's like you went out and hired the dude who was the DC for the guy you're trying to like get rid of. You know what I mean? And I know it's gonna be a different Elko's a different guy. He goes about things differently, but there's still gonna be a lot of tendencies that are the same, I think. Um and with what AM needs to do to get that program where those fans uh, think it's supposed to be, tear the whole thing down. Tear the whole thing down. Anything left over from Jimbo Fisher's tenure has to be gone. You don't go and hire the dude who was his DC for the majority of his time at College Station and then expect things to be night and day difference. That's just not how it works. And so I thought basically with – the options they were given, Elko was the best option. A hell of a lot better than Mark Stoops, in my opinion. But I think Trev Alberts is a, a, a damn good AD, a decent AD. He got Matt Rule to F in Nebraska, which is the most juice that program's had in a long time. And it's the best I've ever felt about Nebraska being relevant again since Ndama King Sue. Dude, <laughs> I forget that Nebraska sucked for most of your lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> they, they they sucked. They got like the best they've ever been was in the Dominican suit that I can remember, and it's like they've been ass. And, and like they had that that was Sean Watson as their play caller. How far did anybody think Nebraska was really going to get with Sean Watson calling plays? Yeah, and and another thing with Matt Rule is like I don't know. You know, it is coach talk. Don't get me wrong; it's a thousand percent coach talk, and I'd be a dumbass to fall for it. But um. I think there is a part of Matt Rule that wants to try to kind of settle down somewhere. Um, I think so. Why? And uh, he, uh, again, like, if I got the Nebraska job, I'd be shouting it from the effing mountaintops. But, like, Matt Rule firmly believes Nebraska is still, you know, a premier program in college football, blue blood program, all that. And if he can get them back to relevancy, if anyone's going to be able to do it, it's Matt Rule with the way he scouts, the way he recruits. Uh, the way he goes about everything just from constructing his program top to bottom. If there's someone who's going to get Nebraska back to the podium, it's going to be him. But it's all about can he actually do it, which I think he could. 
I did find it funny though, um, how all the Nebraska fans are losing their shit because A and M stole their AD. When it's like, hey, uh, if Nebraska is over five hundred this year, like Matt Rule is the hottest name in the coaching carousel, you dummies. Like, yeah, think about that. But um, yeah, so I'll I'll answer Antoine's question as far as Jordan Washington redshirting. Um, I don't I know. Would think so just because of I, numbers. I would think so as well, but at the same time like uh Will Randall, I'm never expecting Will Randall to do much of anything at Texas with all due respect to him. Um Spencer Shannon is going to be a blocking inline type. Uh shit. How am I Gunner Helm? <laughs> like how am I forgetting his name? Gunner Helm is kind of your guy who can do it all. You know, he's solid blocker, solid receiver as well. Uh, Martin I Black, more of your receiving guy, not as great of a blocker. Basically what JT Sanders was where, you know, JT's a receiving guy, Gunner does it all. And then Spencer Shannon slash Ogbo, those are going to be kind of your inline types that are extensions of the offensive line. You got Juan Davis still on the depth chart too. I, I'll be completely serious. I forgot about him. Um, Jordan Washington, on the other hand, though, he definitely fits under the kind of receiving type. I think he's a – Similar body type to Martin Iblack. I'm not sure if their you know heights are the same, but Jordan Washington is a basketball kid with incredible bounce, incredible length. Uh, I believe he had like a plus seven and a half wingspan or something like that. Um, so I I always loved Jordan Washington. I tried to show as much love to him as I could once he committed, just because I was like, look, I know we have him rated as a three star, but this is what I think of him. Um, I think he'll have a very successful career at Texas, but as far as year one, I can't really give you a, a great read of how much he'll play until we can see practice availabilities next week and eventually the spring game. Mm -hmm. Just because I'm not entirely sure how comfortable they are with him in that offense as a freshman because I'm not entirely sure how comfortable they are with Amari Nye Black. I assume Nye Black will be just fine, good to go by the time fall rolls around. But, you know, We've seen Sart come up with different packages for different players off the bench. Is Jordan Washington one of those players? Don't think so. But, you know, he could maybe have a, a great spring. He hasn't had a true football offseason ever because he's been a basketball kid, a track kid as well. So this spring's really important for him and adding weight as well. Um, so could he redshirt? I, I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't. Uh, I wouldn't expect him to get snaps in every single game. But, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if he appears in seven or eight games. He he really – I could see him playing a bunch. I could see him playing a little. I think it's just going to be one of those wait-and-see things. He could be – depending on how you use him, you could use him on a return team. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think it was amazing how many people I heard this year refer to Jatavian Sanders as a redshirt sophomore. And I was like, no, he's a true junior. He played in every game as a freshman. He didn't play on offense. He was on the kick return team, but that was the only action he got. And I think that's why I think Jordan Washington is more likely to redshirt because Jeff Banks has redshirted pretty much with the exception of Gunnar Helm. They've redshirted. And they, they didn't redshirt Helm because they, they had to use him because they just didn't have tight ends. But Shannon, Randall, uh, Jeff, uh, you know, the they, guys that didn't redshirt played very little. And I think now you're in a position where you can redshirt Jordan Washington because you've got numbers. Jeff Banks likes to take those guys and basically make them projects year one. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break you down and build you back up as the most complete tight end I think you can be. Yeah. Um, and didn't JT rock three his freshman year, right? Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know. It's, it's going to be interesting to see where some of the freshmen end up, um, especially on special teams. Just because, like, I don't know, uh, regular fans are going to look at, like, okay, uh, Jelani McDonald. They had him as, I don't know, like third to the right on kickoff. The mm -hmm. LaFowl is in the middle. What does that tell you? That tells you Jelani McDonald is going to seal the F and edge. <laughs> it tells you Leona LaFowl doesn't care about his life because if you're in the middle, that means you're, you're going to go spear the shit out of someone, Dude. right? So that means in practice – Leonga LaFowle has been knocking heads, and, and yes. the staff likes that. So that's why I'm interested to see where these guys are on special teams because it does kind of tell you what yeah. is going on. So really interested to see if they're going to get any special teams work. 
at practice availabilities. Most of the time, they're just doing straight bullshit. So, you know. I can tell you we, this, man. We can't. I can tell you this. Je- Jeff Choate Jeff Chote had to take the Nevada job. He really wanted one year to where he could have Leonga LaFau and Anthony Hill be his starting linebackers. Oh yeah, he he was really excited about those guys, and man, I I was talking about it last year. Uh, Jordan, you weren't on staff, but I know you were getting the same buzz that that we were. Man, everybody, you know, through winter workouts and the other part of spring ball, everybody was excited about. Uh, everybody was excited about Anthony Hill, and even in the camp, everybody was excited about Anthony Hill. But man, all you kept hearing from behind the scenes is like, no, we felt we hit two home runs. We think Anthony Hill and Leung LaFowl are both home runs. That linebacker. Like that staff, that trust that staff feels just as good about LaFowl as they do about Hill. And we saw the impact Ant Hill had. They feel just as good about LaFowl. Yeah, and I mean they felt just as good about LaFowl since shit when he committed summer twenty two. Yeah. And you know, it, it's funny. I remember I have a really good memory with some particular things. And I remember in Mike's behind the scenes story for the 2023 class, he wrote about how Leonga LaFowl showed up, showed up to, <laughs> showed up to a, uh, a Texas camp. And the whole time it was the Texas elite camp, the one that they invite all the kids that they're actually looking at. The whole time he was eyeing up Anthony Hill and like sizing him up. Yeah. And he kept, apparently, he kept making sure he was going in the same drills as him at the same time because Leonga's mindset was this is the number one guy. I'm going to show everyone I'm just as good, if not better, than him by being in the same drills as him and doing just as well. He ended up getting offered by that. Texas was one of his first big offers because Jeff Choate was phenomenal at linebacker scouting and finding them early. Yeah. And that's what helped them down the road. Also, Jake Lange obviously was huge there as well. Um, but you know, the early belief Texas had in them and kind of that dog mentality that Leonga put on display for the Texas staff at that camp prior to them even offering him, like they fell in love with him right then. So can't wait to see what he does. Sad for Choke that he doesn't get to to, yeah. to coach him, but can't wait to see what those linebackers do this year. I, Jordan, I'm not gonna lie, I was paying attention to to what you were saying, but the fact that we started this week with joking about Trey marching on the Capitol. And here we are on Thursday. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, are you taking the – where is it? Who who threatened to storm the Capitol if they take away betting? Someone Actually, I don't know if Trey was storming the Capitol because BK, Trey, have you guys heard the, the big news that got brought up in the chat today? That uh, in the state of Texas, you know, you don't have – as of today, you don't have access to the hub. What? The hub. What do you mean? I was on it 20 minutes ago. To what hub? Mm, I don't think so, sir. You want to check my internet history? <laughs> Are, well, I, I look, I just did it for some research purposes, and apparently, like, it's a it's some kind of sign-in thing. You got some kind of, uh, no pun intended, like, backdoor login or something, BK? Yeah, I'm into the uh, backdoor stuff. Hey, I just, this is, like, shit that me and my buddies figured out in the sixth grade once all the Lake Travis independent schools started <laughs> – blocking like snapchat instagram like all social media on wi-fi private browser get a vpn yeah is it a texas thing or an american thing apparently it's texas and north carolina yeah just get a vpn that says you're anywhere else except those two states and you'd be good to do what you got to do i guess i don't know but yeah i remember us figuring that out in sixth grade after like the lake travis school district spent like thousands of dollars figuring out how to block those apps and yeah, a lot of disappointment from them. See, Trey, Trey dropped off because I figured now he's going to pick it uh, on the steps of the Capitol to see if he can get Pornhub reinstated. Man, that's, <laughs> if he that's comes back, of, he's holding up a sign. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the weird things about Trey that I'm not sure I believe or not, but he swears that he does not watch porn and like hasn't watched it in years. Like he swears by it too, and it's not just like the married guy trying to cover his backside. It's like no, he he legitimately has told me and everybody else for as long as I've known him that he does not participate in adult films. Well, I mean, participation in adult films is uh, to each their own. 
Yeah. I don't think you can do that in Texas, by the way. I don't know. There, just, there is a, there is some uh, rumor and innuendo, though, BK, that Texas State alum Alexis Texas did uh, film some scenes at various apartment complexes in and around San Marcos. Wow. I didn't realize she was a Texas State alumnus. Now, I have not gone on the tra that trail of tears, but apparently there is that trail of tears if you want to go down it. I, you know, I have people that allegedly know where the trail of tears goes. And I'm like, I, I don't have any interest in driving by an apartment complex. I'll, I'll be, a, I'm, I'll, I'll put my hand on a stack of Bibles and I'm 100% honest. I've never seen any of Alexis Texas's work. I'll, I've got a few links I can send your way after the show if you would I'm like. Good. I'm, I'm good. Uh, uh. I'm good. Not saying I'm not a. I'm not a. Not not. I'm not not a fan, but I have no opinion one way or the other. Oh man, well, I'll take your word for it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. That's uh, that's good to know. That the trail of tears. That's what comes to Zilker every December. Correct. Yes, I can stand its quality work. Thank you for letting me know that, Mike. Mm. Trey, I was expecting you to have a sign that said, like, for the hub or something, or you're fighting for TikTok or something while you're that close to the Capitol. Well, as I've embarrassingly admitted for many years now, I am the one adult male on the planet who doesn't watch porn. However, in a show of solidarity with all you sickos, a few minutes ago I was chanting, we want to come. We want to come. We want to come. Uh, just at random people. They, they did not take too kindly to that. I don't think they had anything to do with the law uh, or the uh, the ban on porn in this state. But uh, I tried for you guys. Like, I just want to know how the capital works. Like, can you go up there and be like, yeah, I'd like to request a meeting with my state representative. You like, can. Lake Grant, Lake Grant, you presence with a state with your local representative. Is this wind getting bad, guys? It's not. It's. I mean, I can hear it, but it's not. It's not distracting. It's not drowning out your voice or anything. All right, that's good. Can Can you request that? Yes. Will they give you one? Uh, depends. Are you having deja vu from January sixth, twenty twenty one, by chance? <laughs> Who me? Yeah, the guy who's at the Capitol right now. Oh. <laughs> There it is, right there. there. Is. Yeah, that was that wasn't my groove, that's for sure. I'm I'm a political <laughs> bastard. Yeah, I don't, all right. Uh, I, I don't uh, subscribe to any ideologues on one side or the other. I'm I'm kind of with you, Trey. I've got no use for either side on most well, days. Reality, Jeff, is that uh, presidential elections are uh, patriotism for people who are bad at math. Mm. Well, I'm voting for Aaron Rodgers, so screw you guys. Well. That makes a few of you. So, so Trey, basically, I could request a meeting with my representative. If I show up maybe like in a nice button-down shirt or a tailored suit, they might see fit to give me my meeting. Yeah. If I, if I show up wearing a Bugs Bunny costume, holding a steel dildo, probably not. It's very, very similar to hitchhiking. You're much more likely to hitchhike with that first scenario than you are the second. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Uh, Noted. All right. Well, I think we've had enough. Silly conversations. I'll, I don't know what you guys are talking about today, but you okay, BK? You good or? Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I I need this hour to end so I can double check and make sure the hub still works because otherwise I'm about to hit a panic here. <laughs> We're great. Uh, a site apparently BK. Somebody in the chat did this earlier. There's a site that uh, you know, might have the name of a house of a uh, domesticated pet in it. All right. <laughs> all right. I'll, I'll see y'all later. It Apparently, it, somebody I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. Working, so. Hamster tube? Hamster tube? Had iguana? Eh, something like that. Okay. I'll I'll find it. I got a few sites at my disposal, so we'll be okay. All right. You boys have a good show. Thank you, sir. Trey, try not to get accosted by security. Or oh, that. man. Just uh, one more day of this, and then I'm back in the home studio. All right. See you guys. Later, Later brother. Go. All right. Well, you're stationary. You're not driving. You're not in a car. Seems like you're at a good spot. That's 
out of the way of enough craziness going on down there? What, uh, what brings you to the capital today? It's just a peaceful place to hang out downtown, especially during South by Southwest. There are people walking by and you'll hear the occasional kids screaming because there's that big, beautiful lawn out in front of the state capitol and a bunch of statues around too. But it's just a cool place to come chill for a few minutes if you're ever downtown. I tell people this, and you and I have actually talked about this. I forget if this was on or off the air. Uh, I used to love to walk and sometimes run really drunkenly home from 6th Street and cut through the capitol in the process. It's a really cool slash creepy at night, but in the daytime, it's a chill spot too. I know that it's a very polarizing place for people for a variety of political reasons, but just to come here and, and relax, they, they did make it very accommodating. The aesthetic, the aesthetic is soothing, and assuming that the wind doesn't pick up too much, it's actually not a bad place to do a live show for an hour. No protesters out there right now? No. Okay. No, I see some people taking a picture in front of the Capitol. Typically, the protesters are closer to the street. Yeah. And I can kind of see... I can see to, a, what is that, 12th Street, 11th or 12th Street? I can see to the street right now, and actually I passed by that area too. I don't remember anybody holding any signs up. Certainly no, uh, no Alex Jones-led groups that are actually marching all the way to the Capitol. <laughs> I'm with you, though, on the whole walk from downtown back to West Campus bit. I probably did that five times in my college career. Yeah. Uh, but I always made sure to pass by the Capitol every time I did it. And then one of my buddies, I wasn't with him the night this happened, but thought it'd be a good idea to uh, pick up a traffic cone and throw it through one of the windows of the Capitol. And, well, That's a needless, bad idea. Needless to say, he did not wake up in his own bed that night <laughs> for the next morning. What did he get charged with? Did he get charged with insurrection? I think that's what it was. I can't oh, remember exactly shit. what it was. And he didn't spend that much time in jail. Like, I think he was bailed out the next day, so it wasn't too hefty of a charge. But he had to pay a little something, something. And, uh, yeah, he had to spend the night in the slammer. So, um, yeah, oh, I don't know if he was God. pissed because of something that happened on 6th. I can't remember if he was ticked because of some sort of political thing. My guess is it's more of the former, not the <laughs> latter. Yeah. But, yeah, he uh, thankfully that was not me who – was dumb enough or drunk enough to do that one night this just jogged a memory for me i have never been a fan of jogging like running long distances i just think it's a fucking pointless activity so as much as i can be uh, whatever about working out the running thing i've never gotten if that's how you like to get exercise good for you the exception though is sometimes when i was really drunk and i was tired of hanging out or waiting and I just wanted to go home, but my ride wasn't ready to go yet. I would just, I would just take off. I would run a couple of miles if that's what it took to get back home. I did that in Austin. I did it in Chicago a little bit. It wasn't like I was like tears running down my face crying because I'm upset because some girl broke my heart or something. It was just something exhilarating about being completely shit faced running through the city streets. Yeah, never had that happen. There might have been times where I was walking and I'm like, this sucks. I'm going to run to get home faster. And I'd probably run for 30 seconds. And I'm like, absolutely not. In jeans and cowboy boots more often than not when I was yeah. going out this dirty sixth in college. It's like not comfortable. But even if I was in comfortable clothes, even if I was sober, and running sucks. I'm not I'm not ever doing that unless I absolutely have to. All right. Well, Texas basketball, I know you've been doing South by stuff. I think you went to a Gary Clark Jr. concert last night, which I'm sure was exhilarating. Holy shit. We'll, we'll talk about this and where are we at, because I still do not have the ability to look at stories. So instead, I'll share my crazy musical day yesterday with you that did crescendo with the Gary Clark Jr. show. Looking forward to that. Well, last night, I mean, you were at a better place than the Longhorn fans who traveled to Kansas City to watch the Big 12 tournament, and you were at a better place than the Longhorn fans who just watched that Texas K-State game on TV last night. The Longhorns looked great in the first half. They carried a 10-point lead into the locker room, and then it all went downhill from there. They were outscored 49-35 to by Kansas State in the second half. And, well, now the Longhorns, once again, seemingly more questions than answers going into the real tournament that starts next week. A very disappointing one-and-done showing for the Horns up in Kansas City, Trey. 
Yeah, I'm a little bit concerned with Dessou at this point. Just wondering just how healthy he is right now. He was not nearly as effective as, we, as we've seen most of the season once he came off that off-season surgery. And uh, this Texas basketball team ha has shown guts throughout the course of this year in terms of uh, really coming back in games where they're down big at halftime. And unfortunately, they had that happen to them last night too on top of um, really, uh, Kansas State finally getting it to, its act together. I was watching the first half of that game wondering, like, how is this Kansas State team even won, what is it, eight regular season conference games on the year? Because for three straight halves, we saw a Kansas State basketball team that other than Tyler Perry just didn't give a shit. And they finally did get their act together, though. Um, Jerome Tang is obviously a really good coach, as evidenced by the run that they went on last year, too. And... Uh, they, they did a good job of uh, hanging in there, and, and they finally started making shots. And uh, Texas was making missing, missing some shots that they typically make, and, and Kansas State ultimately is, wins and keeps their tourney hopes alive too. And I don't want to pin this all on the refs because it starts with the team first and foremost, but it felt like one of, another one of those games where Texas was not only facing their actual competition, but the guys in stripes too. Yeah, it's another game where the game was officiated one way in the first half and then a completely different way in the second half, right? Not a lot of fouls, not a lot of free throws in the first 20 minutes. And then Kansas State was in the bonus like six minutes into the second half. Yeah. And the turning point, you talked about Dylan DeSue not looking himself. I mean, he couldn't get into a rhythm because the refs just kept calling random-ass fouls on him. Yeah. Like he only had one foul in the first half. And in the first two minutes of the second half, they called him for two offensive fouls. The first one was the right call. I didn't have a problem with that one. But the second one was garbage. And that yeah. was his third foul, so he had to go sit on the bench for a few minutes. And we saw what happened in Waco when Texas was playing without Dylan DeSue. Like, they can look lost without him because he is their best player after all. Then he comes back into the game, and then he's diving for a loose ball, and they call the fourth foul on Dylan DeSue. And it was a garbage call. It was almost like Brett Yormark made a call to the refs at halftime and was like, hey, DeSue, get the Sioux out of the game. Do whatever you have to do to get the Sioux out of the game because the mm -hmm. refs were, I mean, all the officiating was suspect in the second half, but especially on Dylan the Sioux, who we know is the most important player on this team. I mean, that guy was getting nickel and dimed like crazy last yeah. night. And it obviously wasn't just that that cost Texas the game, but I'm with you, man. Like that was, that was frustrating to watch. And then of course the flagrant slash intentional foul they called on Kendall Weaver in the last 20 seconds when he literally just tripped and fell into the defender. Like, you really think he's trying to tackle Tyler Perry there? Idiot. Like, he just fell, lost his balance, and he pulled the guy down accidentally. You cannot call that there. That was, in a sense, the game. Not that Texas had done enough to deserve the win, but that was basically the dagger there. Just annoying that, yeah, the officiating, once again, in a postseason game, Trey, is a huge topic of conversation when you're talking about Texas. Exactly. It is sad, and now Texas is uh, probably resigned to what, a, uh, an eight seed, a seven seed at absolute best? Yeah, I think so. I think eight, okay. nine is most likely. If you had to have me pick one, I would say eight. Uh, but you're right. Yeah, seven through ten would be the range, but eight, nine, the most likely within that range. I'm, I'm going to try and move real quick. It just got a lot windier here, so I'm going to hide behind a monument. So I, I'm listening to you, though. Um, and uh, yeah. It's. Uh, I guess I'm glad I, I was not more locked in on the game. I was watching it on my phone as uh, Justine and I were making our way through dinner and to an eventual concert. But I also, I don't know, we've heard national pundits talk about this Texas basketball team not being one that a one or two seed wants to face in the second round. And I could see that, but I also, I'm not buying that just yet. Yeah, well, for a variety of reasons. And look, the, you know, the fact that Texas isn't going to be having to deal with Big 12 officials, <laughs> I guess, in the uh, in the tournament is a big yeah. deal. That's a good starting point. But I, I also need to see this team playing more consistency, uh, consistently, excuse me, one through five and getting that third score, getting ace miss going consistently. And uh, you expect to sue to shake off one bad game, especially with some of the uh, the unfortunate stuff that really wasn't even his fault in terms of the foul trouble. Yeah, the sad thing is, look, I'd like to chalk this up to Big 12 refs, but look at Texas's last two NCAA tournament losses. They got hosed by the refs in both of those games, and those obviously weren't Big 12 refs. So, yeah, you uh, you always run a bit of a risk if you put the game into the hands of the officials. 
Texas up 10. They did enough in the first half to where the refs were not a factor. But uh, in the second half, look, some of this is on Texas. This team has struggled defending without fouling. It's not like every call that was made was bad last night. Yeah. Texas has had problems when they are struggling of keeping guys in front of them on the defensive end of the floor. So, uh, yeah, that's you'd like to think that, oh, you're leaving Big 12 refs. Things are going to be okay. But sadly, that's not uh, always the case. And like you said, I mean, look, Asmus was great, 26 points last night. Uh, I expect him and DeSue to show up. I know they haven't been amazing yeah. every game, but you brought it up. The third score, Tyrese Hunter. What the hell, dude? The guy goes for 30 on Saturday, maybe plays the best game of his career, and then he follows it up with what might have been the worst game of his career. And the annoying part is you know, Tyrese Hunter was interviewed after the game on Saturday, and he should have been because he was amazing, leading Texas to that win over OU. He's like talking about how, oh, now it's March. Like, now I realize how important these games are, and I got to turn it on, and I'm going to play my best because it's the month of March. Well, I just checked the calendar. It was still March yesterday, and Tyrese Hunter had three points on zero of seven shooting. I mean, that is his career in a nutshell right there. One game playing incredible, being a huge piece for Texas, and then the next game maybe being the biggest reason why Texas lost because you expect something out of them and you didn't get anywhere close to that. You know that I have been the biggest – leader in the uh, Tyrese Hunter fan club all season long I'm reluctant to say good things about him at this point because it's like I don't I don't want to jinx it and I know that has nothing to do with his inconsistent play but I I don't even want to start to believe that he can be that third guy with any sort of consistency because it's like he takes one big step forward like he had a couple of games ago against Oklahoma and then it's uh, another massive step back or another massive couple of steps back so I'm just that's part of the reason why I'm at a loss with this team right now and I have I mean, I could see them. I have a hard time seeing them making it to weekend two. I could see them winning that first round game and doing so convincingly and uh, having people believing that they can beat a one or two seed in the next round. But I could also see them losing in the rounds of 64 also. Or I could see them, they're not going to end up in that one of those first four matchups. But yeah, I I think the options right now are uh, Texas wins in the round of 64, loses in 32, or they just lose in that very first round. Either thing is uh, very much on the table right now. Yeah, I mean, they've been so inconsistent, right? At times, they've looked like a Sweet 16 team, but at times, they've looked like an NIT team. So yeah. uh, I- I'm 90% sure. Obviously, the brackets come out Sunday. I'll look at the matchup, but I'm 90% sure I'm going to pick Texas to win its first game against a likely nine seed. But yeah, after that, I mean, could they beat Tennessee? Sure. They get Rick Barnes at the tournament in round two. Yeah, that's possible. Uh, could they beat UConn? Probably not. They wouldn't have to play Houston because they're in the same conference, so they'd be separated. So you wouldn't have to worry about that as a one versus eight. Could they beat Purdue? Well, we saw Texas try to defend Zach Eady two years ago, and that guy lived at the free throw line. I'd say probably not. So I- I'm with you, man. Like this, this team feels like one win. Uh, if things go right, maybe they pull off a huge upset and make it to the Sweet 16, but I, I don't think too many people are going to predict that, and I don't know how you could be confident in predicting that at this point. Teams that are good down low are going to be a problem for Texas. Yeah. And that was the case last year, too, unfortunately. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And look, the the blueprint's out. This is obviously easier said than done, but, I mean, Texas has no chance if Dylan DeSue is in foul trouble. No, like we, we, we said at when he got hurt in the Baylor game, it's like, well, if he's out, the season's over. It's it's almost the same thing if he gets like two fouls in the first two minutes of a game. And if he can only play like 20 to 25 minutes because he's in foul trouble all night, then we're losing to a nine seed or a 10 seed or a seven seed, whoever we get in round one. Like we've got no chance without that guy. And yeah, I mean, you look at the last two losses for Texas, Baylor and Kansas State. A big part of why they came up short in both of those games was because DeSue just couldn't play. I, I will say that the silver lining for Texas losing last night is that DeSue isn't having to play games on consecutive days. Uh, and no. part of me is better with that than them playing games in three straight days and his knee needing more time to rest to be back to full capacity. Maybe if he does get this full week off or maybe a week and a day off now it does make a big difference in how he's able to move around because even though he he looked all right in that Oklahoma game talking to Jeff Barker about this on Monday Jeff was like no there were there were times where you could see him kind of laboring a little bit more with that knee when the TV cameras maybe weren't pointed at him and uh 
That was uh, that felt a little bit more evident last night, or maybe it was uh, maybe it was the bias of me having talked to Jeff about that. But uh, the more rest that guy has, the better off he's going to be when the games matter most. I know it mattered yesterday. Yeah. The games matter all season long. I get it. That's a bit of a cliche. But in terms of whether your season continues or not, they really start to matter next week. So getting Dylan DeSue at full capacity is the most important aspect in whether or not you're going to be able to win one or three games in the tourney. Yeah, yeah, it's winner go home starting next week. And uh, I think this stat still holds true. I need to verify it. But um, there's never been a team lose its first conference tournament game. It's gone on to win the national championship. So mm. uh, sorry to ruin any parade plans that any of you Texas basketball fans had. If you had those, you're an idiot. But Dude, dude you said uh, for any Longhorn fans who traveled up to Kansas City with this team, I hope nobody traveled up to Kansas City with this team other than like friends and family of guys on the team or people who are uh, responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of things because that is a poorly planned trip on your part yeah well maybe they were holdovers from the women's tournament right like Perhaps. that's the hope the women's final was tuesday night and then you just like ah shit texas men play on wednesday so we'll stay an extra night but you should you should have come home you should not have done that if yeah. that was your move so uh, tough one. Once again, brackets come out on Sunday. And like you said, that game last night didn't mean a lot. You know, it, it, Texas was basically playing for seeding. If they won that game and then beat Iowa State today, then they're probably a seven seed with a shot at maybe a six. Yeah. But the win slash loss last night, I don't think that was going to affect the seed line. So once again, I think uh, the reasonable expectation is for the Longhorns to be in that eight, nine game somewhere next week. And uh, yeah, well, We'll see how it goes, but just another example of this being a roller coaster year for Texas basketball. Very short lived stay after winning the Big 12 tournament last year with Rodney Terry. Uh, they uh, bowed out very quickly this year. All right, uh, before we shift gears, let's give some love to some of our sponsors. We will start first with a TV spot from our great friends over at Covert BK. Hi, I'm Dan Covert with my wife, Hayden. Welcome to Covert BK. Our newest location in the gorgeous hill country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Covert, born and raised in Austin. Yes, indeed. Love the Coverts. Also love our man Tom McKay of Audiovisual Consultations. Give him a call, 512-255-8678. If you're looking for the home TV setup of your dreams, hey, March Madness is basically here. Eh, maybe Texas won't make it deep, but you're still going to watch the tournament. So get your TV setup done by AV Consultations. Opening day is two weeks away. That's right. Major League Baseball is right around the corner. The Rangers, the defending world champs. The Astros, the champs two years ago. Some damn good baseball going to be played in the state of Texas. You want to watch your teams all year long. Make sure you hit up Audio Visual to get that TV set up done in the comfort of your own home. They've hooked Trey up. They've hooked Kevin up. They've hooked Bucky up. They've hooked Chip up. They've hooked like all of us up over the years, and they will do the same for you. 512-255-8678 or go online to avconsultations.com. And our man Tom McKay is listening. He said the Stars kicked ass last night. They did. They beat Rockford at the HEB Center at Cedar Park. Nice. If you get get out to a Texas Stars game, number one, you're going to have a great time. Number two, you'll probably run into our man Tom McKay. Great dude and a huge, huge hockey fan. What is the name on the back of his Texas Stars jersey? Ref, you suck. Yep, he's got a few, but that's uh, his most popular one. I can't remember if it's number 69. It should be number 69 if it's not. <laughs> It'd be a great one. But, yeah, I love our guy, Tom McKay. Uh, all right, Trey. Um, God, I'm, I'm hurting right here. What do, I, what do I do for this? You're the doctor, after all. Got this weird pain between my shoulder and neck. And I think it's mental because I was going to go lift after the show, and mm -hmm. I think I'm just talking myself into hurting, so I have an excuse to not go to the gym at my apartment complex. What do I, what do, I do here? Is there really some pain, or is it phantom limb pain? It There's some pain, but it's like only when I – turn and it gets sharper the more i turn a certain direction did you sleep with your neck a little bit crooked last night probably yeah so the thing that you need to do 
one, don't try and work out through that area. So I would choose, you could probably get away with doing like a, a straight bench press if you wanted to, but I would avoid doing anything that is like that upward pushing motion. So uh, military presses, I would probably avoid any uh, pull-ups or lat pull-down sorts of activities as well, especially because if your neck is not, or if your spine is not completely neutral, that can cause an even bigger issue for you if it is, if the issue is originating in the neck. And uh, ultimately, you need somebody who has strong hands. God, Kevin and I used to do this to one another all the time. Ew. And uh, that's not gay at all. That's uh, very heterosexual, what I'm telling you about right now. We would, uh, we would find that really sore, really hard spot on the neck and you just push in there and you deal with the pain for like five to ten, ten seconds and then you gradually start doing the shaking your head no motion and if you feel up boards you can do circles and sometimes there's some stuff going on in the shoulder blade too but yeah though that's probably a good starting point for you but as far as the working out goes today you can do like tricep push downs if you want to you could do curls if you'd like maybe today would be a good leg day so you are avoiding the upper half of that upper body altogether hmm. uh, you could do some air squats you could do some lunges some reverse lunges maybe some rdls if you have the proper weights to do rdls what now romanian deadlifts huh yeah i don't really f with the romanians very much not a big Romans guy. I don't think anybody does anymore because Romania is not even a thing. But they mm. uh, were really on top of working out back when they were a communist country. And so, yeah, all those things would be good options for you. I, I would say start with uh, do some core stuff or some lower body stuff and avoid doing too much with your upper body. Okay. Ah, shit. Uh, fine. I'll do leg day. I hate leg day. <laughs> Dude, nobody, at... nobody likes leg day. Spoiler alert. I fucking hate leg day, but you got to do it. Yeah, it is the worst. All right. I still need to send you that video of my gym and get you to comprise a workout plan for me because I just go in there and do random shit. It's definitely helping, but probably not as much as it should be. Or we could shoot a video where I come over and I go in and check the gym out first and brainstorm a little bit and I put you through a workout. Oh, God. That, the people would love that. Literally everybody except for me would love that, I think. It would be the worst day of my life right I there. sure as shit would love it. Oh, God. Yeah, the chest waxing is going to be bad enough. And now that on top of it. Mm. How is that growth coming, by the way? It's kind of hit a wall. Like, I thought it would keep going uh, and just look more unruly and ridiculous. But yeah. I feel like it's it's kind of stagnated. So. I don't know. We're at, we're at like 7,800 subscribers right now. When we get to 8K, that might be when we uh, when we get it planned. I think that's a good call. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. No, there's a, there's some pain that's going to be inflicted there. Yeah, definitely. Because I had less when I had to go through this a few years ago when I lost a bet to you, and yeah, it was mostly a patch, like between my nipples, and mm. that that was enough to hurt. That was enough to hurt. Do I like? What about the stomach area? Do I need to yes. I mean, I, let it let it grow? Is that considered part of the chest? It certainly is. Remember, okay. I had my my stomach was a part of the waxing, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, I've been like I I, sh I shaved it once early, and then I'm like, wait, I don't know if this is kosher. So it's been growing out for the last <laughs> month or so. So there's there's some hair there too, and uh, yeah, it's it's not going to be a good day for me, that's for sure. Oh, that happy trail is going to get yanked straight out of your body. Yeah, well, I've been I've been cleaning up down there, so. Well, uh, just yeah, you you can you can below the waistline, you can keep it clean. Above the waistline, yeah. though, it needs to grow wild. It needs to be like a 1970s happy trail. Yeah. Well, the doctor asked me if I was sexually active, and I said, "Why? You trying to?" So I had to make sure that she was pleased when I was in there last week <laughs> you went back and visited the female doctor that you're <laughs> continually creeping out every time you go in you're making these very uh very awkward obvious advances that she's rejecting every yep. time or or is she rejecting them don't know mm. seems like she's flirting back or she's just do it doing her job and trying to be nice i can't tell is that how you justified the uh the, the finger going up the bum uh i didn't 
Oh, you're saying she did to me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was like, don't accuse me of that. There's no Deshaun Watson stuff going on here, all right? Either direction, just for the record. No, she's the one that massages your prostate in that uh, circumstance. Yeah, thankfully I've uh, been able to avoid that to this point in my life. Uh, Trey, the Cowboys actually signed somebody. Oh. Yep. It was a guy who had already reportedly signed with another team. That's linebacker Eric Kendricks, who was with the Chargers last year. A couple of days ago, it was announced that he was signing a one-year deal with the 49ers, and then I guess he changed his mind and apparently has signed with the Dallas Cowboys. So are you now back in on the Cowboys? Are you bought in on Jerry Jones saying that he is all in in 2024? Embarrassing admission time. I've heard the name Eric Kendricks before. I probably could have guessed that he played for the Chargers. I don't know much more than that. Was he an inside linebacker this yeah. last year? How good was he? So he spent most of his career in Minnesota. He was an all-pro one year with the Vikings. That's probably where you would remember him from. Yes, yes, you're right about that. Okay. And Mike Zimmer was Eric, his head Eric, coach. Eric Kendricks and not Lance Kendricks? Eric Kendricks. Okay. Yeah, Lance Kendricks is a person, as is Kendrick Lamar, as is some guy from The Temptations that Bucky brought up this morning. Nobody knew besides him. Um, yeah, so look, Ken he, Kendricks is an inside backer then, correct? He is, yeah. And okay. Mike Zimmer was his head coach in Minnesota. Obviously, Zim, the new D.C. in Dallas, so you've got that pre-existing relationship there. One-year deal. I don't know if we've seen the number yet, but it doesn't seem like it's going to be very much, so... Cowboys needed linebackers, Trey. I still think they need more linebackers, but uh, even at 32, Eric Kendricks not being the same athlete he was five years ago, this, this feels better than what the Cowboys had in that playoff loss to Green Bay. Yeah, look, it's a, a step in the right direction. I don't know what Van Der Esch's status is going to be for next season. You hope that he's able to come back. If so, you just boosted the depth at a spot in the field that was a major liability last year. So is it the splashiest of signings? No, not necessarily, but you're okay at some of those marquee positions right now. You need to uh, fill certain gaps, especially on the defensive side of the ball. You need to address things up the middle, up front. Expect them to look long and hard at defensive tackles early on in the draft and then inside linebackers too even with the kendrick signing yeah i agree and the linebacker edgerin cooper from texas a&m could be an option i think he's mm -hmm. the top linebacker in the draft according to most of the draft folk out there uh he could be in the running for that 24th overall pick but they got more they have to do uh, they still need an offensive lineman they still need a running back they still need a defensive tackle they still probably need a cornerback because Stephon Gilmore is a free agent. So uh, this can't be a one-and-done type of deal. It took the Cowboys longer than it took any other team to sign a player. It was like everybody else has signed four or five at least, and here the Cowboys finally signing their first. They're really serious about winning. They've, they've got some work to do, right? Well, Jerry did back off the all-in statement from several weeks ago. It only took him a week to do that, so... Uh, maybe they're uh, thinking about 2025, BK, and so they're not as worried about winning this next season, even though they are at a critical mass with both their head football coach and their franchise quarterback. Yeah, yeah, it's a great point. Both going into the final years of their current contracts. And uh, I think Dak will work out a long-term deal this offseason. So he might be here beyond this year, but obviously for McCarthy, he's got to have results or he will be kicked to the curb weird story involving Dak out of the DFW area and I have not read anything about that that is just a it's a bizarre headline that you hope is not true for Dak Prescott's sake but uh yeah I guess the uh, the legal system is going to have some uh things to say about that before it's all said and done yeah yeah that's uh every other team was signing players in free agency and the news coming from Dallas was that uh Dak Prescott filed an extortion lawsuit claiming that uh, some woman falsely accused him of sexual assault. It's like in January, but for an incident that happened in 2017. So he came out and or his attorney came out and released a pretty harsh statement, basically calling BS and saying, yeah, Dak's got no, no sympathy for people who actually do this, but also this is a joke and keep my name out your mouth. A la Will Smith, Chris Rock. That is the proper way to handle that if you are innocent and facing such malicious charges because the 
the accusation itself, is, if it is true, is heinous, and the person who's guilty should be uh, should be rung up and sent away for a long time. But if you make a false accusation like that, it's only slightly be below the despicable nature of the supposed crime itself. Yeah, I'm with you on that. All right, how about, uh, I can't remember if we touched on this yesterday, but A&M has a new athletics director. Did you see this? No. His name is Trev Alberts. What? He, yeah, that Trev Alberts. Okay. Yeah, Nebraska. He was a great player at Nebraska back in the day, a Butkus Award winner as a linebacker. And he's been AD at Nebraska for the last couple of years, and AM was able to poach him away from Lincoln to come down to College Station. And Nebraska people are pissed. The governor of the state released a statement basically saying that the leadership – of the university is horrible right now and that's the biggest reason why trev alberts decided to leave his alma mater to take the job in aguiland maybe that can help explain why the uh, football program hasn't done a better job of getting it going in the recent past and matt rule may very well be the guy i think he's much better suited to be successful as a college coach than an nfl coach but that's a huge blow if a guy is not only your athletics director, but also an alumnus there, and a proud alumnus too with that, considering some of the football accolades, wants no part of the politics behind the scenes. And by the way, going to A&M, which also has its own set of challenges with regards to some of those things, that is pretty damning for folks in Lincoln right now. Yeah, and Alberts apparently signed an extension four months ago oh in God. Lincoln. And the president, the university president, actually left a couple of months ago to take the job at Ohio State. And Nebraska still hasn't hired a university president yet. And apparently Trev Alberts was pissed about that. He was trying to get that thing rolling. And Nebraska leadership just kept dragging their feet. And I'm sure money was a huge part of this, too. Like, a has got a ton of money. We know that. So maybe that's part of it. But also, yeah, this is, uh, this is a big loss. I thought Matt Rule was a great hire. Now, you're right. Matt Rule can be the guy who turns it around, but Jordan brought this up earlier. feels like if Matt Rule has a lot of success, he's going to leave for a better job, right? Like, I know what Nebraska is historically, but there are easier places to win in 2024 than Lincoln, Nebraska. So if he does go like 8-4 and four or 9-3 and three or better this year, then I wouldn't be surprised if he goes somewhere else right away. Completely agreed with that. Matt Rule had no problem leaving Waco, even though he was starting to build a juggernaut with the Baylor Bears and bolting for the NFL. Yes, there was more money on the line, but it was also a status thing for him too. So yes, I could very easily see him leaving Lincoln for a better gig. If he does have Nebraska playing much up, uh, much more up to that uh, 1970s or 1990s standard than what we've become accustomed to over the last 15 plus years now. Yeah, I mean, he's bounced around a lot, obviously going from Temple to Baylor. That felt like a no-brainer. And, you know, guys want to try their hand at the NFL. So that also felt like a no-brainer. But I don't know, if Penn State opens up yeah. in a year's time if James Franklin can't get it done, if there's a job in the SEC that opens up. Like, I'm trying to think what that – Florida. Florida. Like Florida opens mm. up, right? Billy Napier, we talked about how hot his seat is. And yep. hell, I, I've gone on record, and I can't remember if you agreed with me, but I, I don't think Billy Napier is going to coach the game in Austin during next season. So he gets fired, and Matt Rule has a good year. Then, yeah, the Swamp people are going to be making a call, and I bet Matt Rule would take that gig in a heartbeat. Yeah, I thought when Billy Napier was hired by Florida, that was going to be a, a good a good fit for both, and I was way wrong about that up to this point. I tend to lean with you, and you were the first one that I heard say this, that he may not even be at that school anymore. Once they come to Austin, that's, that's probably where I am right now too because they've got a, a pretty unforgiving schedule up to that point. Oh, my God, yeah. They, they have like one easy game on their schedule, and then they have non-con games against Miami, Florida State and UCF. Like, Ouch. Are, are you kidding me? Uh, having to play one of those teams feels tough. Two of them would be very tough, and then three of them? Yeah. Yikes. So, yeah, I don't know what to expect from Trev Alberts in Aggieland. Uh, he was in Nebraska 2021 to 2024. I don't think he hired Scott Frost, but he did hire Matt Rule, and he fired Scott Frost. Um, he 
doesn't have to hire a football coach anytime soon because AM already did that. First order of business for Alberts could be to fire or hire, fire and hire a basketball coach because AM had a very disappointing year this year. And I don't know if they'll fire Buzz after this season, but if he doesn't figure it out next season, I think he's probably gone. So uh, it's a big deal. It's a big gig to be the AD at AM. You're also undercut a lot by the chancellor john sharp and some of the powers that be so it's yeah. not the easiest gig in the world but uh yeah we'll we'll see if it works but feels like a decent get for AM after a long search to find a replacement for ross bjork yeah taking the alumnus factor out of the equation i realize that's a big factor just like accounting for the Nebraska and A&M jobs. The A&M AD gig is a better gig than the Nebraska gig, right? Yeah, like just yeah, thinking think about so. the, the president leaving Nebraska for Ohio State, like that's not a lateral move. That is, uh, that is a positive move. That is a move upwards. Yeah, if anybody besides a former Nebraska player did this, I wouldn't bat an eye. It's like, ah, it's a, that's a no-brainer. But because you're know, talking about an All-American and one of the more beloved players in the history of that historic program, the fact that he is leaving, I think, yeah, that shows that Nebraska's athletic department is still not in a great spot right now. And they're coming up on three decades. Talk about the Cowboys, three decades of misery. That's that's what Nebraska is getting close to with a lot fewer reasons for optimism than what even the Dallas Cowboys fans have, have had. So there is that in the world of college sports. All right, before we get into where we at in society and hear uh, about Trey's night last night, Quick shout out to our friends at Altstat Beer, the best beer that you can find in the world. Man, there's so much on TV right now. I don't, I don't know how people are working with all the basketball and golf that's on, but uh, it's one of the best sports months of the year, which means you're going to need a great beer to accompany your sports watching all March long. Make that Altstat Beer. It's easy to find wherever you buy your beer all throughout the state. It's also popping up more and more at your favorite bars and restaurants. So if you're going to be hitting the town, maybe playing hooky from work, to watch the sports, uh, make sure you ask your bartenders for Altstat beer. I promise y'all, one sip, and you won't go back to the other beers you've been drinking in the past. It's Altstat beer, no impurities, no regrets. Trey, how you feeling about a big hat read today? Well, it won't be a read. It'll be off the top of my head, but BigHatSpirits.com is the website. They didn't create the cocktail in the can, but they did revolutionize it they did so with real alcohol things like tequila vodka mezcal depending on the drink real kombucha too that means it's got some positive digestive benefits but it's low in bs that means no added sugars they are non gmo free they are uh, no bpas 100 percent natural real spirits and great flavors like the uh the texas mule the blackberry smoke, the prickly pear paloma, the ranch water, the jalapeno ranch water, that margarita for you non-alcohol fans, that uh, margarita mocktail that Bucky talks about in the morning. You can actually go to BigHatSpirits.com. That's their website to check out more info. Also see all of the legends that they pay tribute to on their cans. Most importantly though, because you may be asking yourself right now, where can I get these Big Hat cocktails in a can? Well. At that website, BigHatSpirits.com, scroll down just past the top of the webpage. There is a map of Central Texas, a bunch of Big Hat icons. Click on the icon closest to where you are or where you live. That's where you can get those Big Hat Spirits, those cocktails in a can. Yes, indeed. All right, now a word from our great friends over at Pest Wranglers, Pest Wranglers, Pest Wranglers. Hey, it's Steve from Pest Wranglers, and I don't know of a single mosquito that owns a home with a backyard, but they sure like to hang out in your yard and make you miserable. Pest Wranglers can fix that for you. Our mosquito treatments are designed to kill adult mosquitoes as well as keep mosquito larvae from developing for up to three weeks. Use us all summer or just once before that big party. No contract, no hassles, no blood-sucking mosquitoes. Check out our reviews and see what others are saying about Pest Wranglers. Pest Wranglers, effective, reliable, affordable. Online at PestWranglers.com. Where are we at in society today? That's right. It is your daily look at stories that show we as a people are headed in the wrong direction. I have none of that today. I have a personal anecdote to share with you, BK, because yesterday was one of the craziest musical days of my life. Okay. Can, and can I ask before you start? Yeah. Whose statue are you sitting on right now? 
That guy's. Is that a guy or a horse's ass? Oh, <laughs> that's a horse's ass. What do you know? I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad the horsey is not needed to uh, use the bathroom while we've been sitting here, because those. Uh, those steel shit pellets would really hurt if they hit me on the top of the head. Yes, they would. Yeah, I was like, you pointed up, and I'm like, that that guy's got a tail. I don't, I don't know of any uh, historical figures who have tails. Yeah, but... there's the bum. There's the bum right there. All right. Thank you very much for that. Proceed. <laughs> oh yeah. So if I seem tired right now, it's because I am. Not just because of a week of craziness at South by Southwest, but Justine and I didn't get back home and into bed until after three o'clock this morning. Whoa! Yes, and this was the culmination of, like I said, one of the greatest musical days of my life. I didn't have any red carpet yesterday, so it was a nice to get that reprieve. I actually don't have any tomorrow either, and I don't have anything scheduled tomorrow other than doing shows, so really excited about that prospect. But yesterday I did have two interviews scheduled. The first was with John Oates, the uh, legendary or one half of the legendary Hall and Oates duo, so John Oates, and I got to speak with him for like 30 to 45 minutes in more of a uh, podcast format versus the quick nature of red carpets. That conversation went awesome. John Oates, who has a reputation as being a bit of a prickly dude, uh, I can respect that, I think, when it's all said and done, because I'm also a prickly dude, because prickly also means no BS, and he, he didn't BS me at all, and it was a really cool conversation. Can't wait to present that to the people through booksonpod.com and I'll probably try and figure out a way to play it on these airwaves too. You and I need to talk about this off the air, about how to, how to get some of these interviews on in a way that's not necessarily disrupting what we're doing from eight to five. Maybe it's just as simple as, as sharing them on the channel. But uh, the next interview that I got was with someone who's as big, if not bigger, in terms of the legendary musical status than John Oates. And that would be one Bootsy Collins. Whoa! Of Parliament Funkadelic. Played with James Brown at one point in time. I mean, he is his own man. He's looked at by a lot of people as the greatest bassist in the history of that instrument. And so I had the pleasure of sitting down with him for 10 to 15 minutes and talking about a new single that he's got coming out that he's actually premiering at the concert that he is taking part in at Lady Bird Lake tomorrow, Auditorium Shores, excuse me, I said Lady Bird Lake, Town Lake, Auditorium Shores next to Town Lake. And so that was really cool. Got to ask about him and George Clinton seeing an alien one time when they were driving at night from Detroit to Toronto. And it was just a mind-blowing conversation from a mind-blowing human being. How old is Bootsy Collins now? He is not young. Uh, John Oates is actually in his mid-70s. He looks and sounds and moves great for a guy who turns 76 next month. Mm. I feel like Bootsy is... they got to be around the same age, right? Yeah, I would guess around the same age. I was just about to say mid-70s for him, too. I don't know for sure. You may be able to look that up while I'm telling you about the trifecta of musical experiences yesterday because after <clears throat> I talked to these two legends... I get to go see a show with Justine later that night with somebody who is already an Austin legend. And before it's all said and done, I think we will have made a similar mark on the world of music because Gary Clark Jr. played at Emo's last night. He was essentially premiering all of the new stuff from the new album that he has coming out next month called JPEG Raw. And he did play a couple of older songs, but it was mostly new and it was badass. It was a fun time. We got there early enough to where we were some of the first in line when they finally opened the doors. And, as, and so as a result, we got to be front of the stage, which is how I like to watch any show, but, it's, but certainly somebody like Gary Clark Jr., who I've seen countless times over the years and uh, spots both close and far away from the stage. You wanna be up close and personal with that to see that magic happen. And uh, it was really cool. And not only was it cool because Gary put on a good show as he always does, but just before he started playing a song that has become one of his favorites to play over the years called Our Love off of the story for uh, uh, the uh, Sonny Boy Slim album, that would be his second official studio album. He was like just walking 
like across the front of the stage and like looking down at the people in the front row and he looks down at me and he and I make eye contact and he just goes, oh shit. And he like leans over and gives me five and then we do a dap too. And it was like recognition, like he didn't do that with anybody else. I'm like, you just saw that, right? That wasn't random. That was like Gary recognizing me. She's like, Justine is like, yes, yes. Gary definitely just recognized you. He didn't do that to anybody else. And then in the middle of the song, Our Love, which is my favorite song, by the way, after getting to see him play it at Red Rocks two years ago, because this, the album version, the studio version, doesn't do this song justice, because after it, he goes to the chorus a second time, he takes the guitar, and it's this beautiful love song. I mean, tears it to shreds. It is, uh, is jaw-dropping, mesmerizing, all of those intensifiers. Uh, in the middle of that song, he actually says something to, something to the effect of what's up Trey and like and, and that's right before he goes into the solo and so that was that was really fucking cool to uh, no to have way happen. he dapped you up and then he called you out in the middle of the song bro at the end of the show he's like saying thank you to everybody and he's still on microphone after he he presents the band and says who he is he looks down and points at me he says he says y'all gonna come hang out after the show he says that into the microphone I'm like yeah <laughs> I just I just kind of gave a shrug like yeah probably now that you say it and so the emos is clearing out. I don't know if you've ever been there before it's like this huge room yeah and it, it it clears out fairly quickly but like where they go like where the backstage area is is obviously uh, there's a lot of security and it's it's uh, guarded off and so I walk over there with Justine I'm like let's wait for the crowd to clear out we do and we walk over there I'm just laughing I'm like this is gonna sound like such bullshit me going up to the security guard who probably didn't see and say, hey, Gary just invited me backstage. I don't know if you saw or heard that, but I promise you it's true. So that's what I go say to the security guard. And he's like, he's like, oh, really? He's like, oh, wait, actually, yeah. He's like, I did hear him say that. Was that to you? I'm like, yes. He's like, all right, hang on just a second. So we wait there for like 10 minutes and at this point they're telling everybody to get out and they tell us they're like you guys go wait near the exit i'm like ah shit they're just about to kick us out i'm like whatever no big deal yeah well the security guard at this point he just like straight up walks off and so we walk back towards where the backstage area is and another security person comes up and says are you trey and i'm like yeah she's like all right the security guy told me to uh to look out for you and to try and help you out here she's like your story sounds like BS, but you're not, you don't seem like you're somebody who's trying to BS me right now. You don't seem like a stalker or anything. I'm like, I'm not. The story is absurd. I know. New Gary way back when. He, he literally, he pointed to me in the crowd and said, are y'all going to come hang out after the show? That's the only reason why I'm doing this right now. She's like, all right, I'll take you back there. So she takes us to the area where like the band and friends and family are hanging out and uh, get to uh, get to hang out with Gary and his friends and family. Got to catch up with Mr. Clark, who I hadn't seen in 20 or so years and talk with Eric Zapata, who is his guitarist, and then to the man himself. Got to catch up with Gary and hear how fatherhood is going and how he's feeling about the new album. It was uh, it was awesome, dude. And it was why, uh, unfortunately and fortunately, I am dragging ass today. And Justine is like, are we going to go? Are we going to go? I'm like, no, we're sticking around to the bitter fucking end. And that ended up ending at about 2.30 in the morning. So. No way. Y'all were back yeah. there till 2.30. Yeah, and it wasn't it wasn't like the stereotypical rock star like after show crazy party or anything. There was maybe a little bit of that going on, but it was like it was very mellow. It was literally mostly people visiting and sipping on beers, which is much more my pace, by the way. Like I was already exhausted heading into that. If I were to try and keep with that sort of pace, it would have been a major issue. But it was not that at all. It was very chill and uh, great to get to to see and catch up with Gary and congratulate him on all his successes. And uh, there's there's a possibility that there will be a, more of an official conversation happening in the future. So stay tuned for that one. That is sick. You did meth with Gary Clark Jr. backstage no, after his show no, last night. No, don't start those rumors. Whoa. Don't you start those rumors, Ricky Bobby. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Wow. That is yeah. that is badass, man. That's a and once so, in a lifetime experience right there. Exactly. And that's what I told Justine. She's like, I'm so tired right now. I'm like, yeah, they call these things one once in a lifetime for a reason though you'll have plenty of nights to get to sleep yep you you will never have another opportunity like this by the way speaking of music i'm going to be going from here in about 30 minutes to another red carpet where i may be getting to speak with john bon jovi 
Whoa! There's a documentary about him that's premiering at South by Shore. The uh, former owner of the Philadelphia Soul Arena Football League team. That's right. I'm going to ask him about uh, the likelihood that Arena Football makes a return in the near future. Is he known for something else besides that? Uh, I think he acted in a couple of things in the 80s and 90s. Huh. Yeah, I got then... the, the IMDb page. That's all I know. I can't think of anything else. Hmm. We bring on Zay and Jeff Barker today. Yeah, it looks a little hey, different hey. than Chip. What's going on, fellas? How we doing? Good. How are y'all doing? Doing good. Not, not as good oh, as Trey, who's at the Capitol right now, reliving January 6th, 2021. <laughs> <laughs> we want to come. We want to come. We want to come. Isn't that what I'm supposed to be chanting, BK, for you, you and all those other people losing your ability to watch porn? Yeah, apparently Pornhub no longer works in the state of Texas as of today. Which wow. means That's I'm about to no longer work in the state of Texas as of today. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I was trying to figure out when I was backstage the vibe that Trey's giving me right now. Yeah. Like, I don't know, college professor maybe? Ooh. Like, I, I thought maybe he was on the UT campus. I couldn't tell by those trees that it, that it was it was the capital, but... Yeah, no, it's Yo, it's got vibes for sure. Yo, Trey, the Steve Sarkeesian hairdo's on point today, man. <laughs> I see you. E emphasis on the point. I know it's a little bit too much. I'm gonna have to try and mess it up when we're done. <laughs> Dude, Trey, Trey has way more volume than Sark. Oof, yeah, but that's yeah, debatable. Sark is, I don't know. It's real tight. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It, it's yeah, real it's tight. Like an Egyptian pyramid. Yeah. <laughs> uh, more, more like an Armenian pyramid, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> true. Hey, very true. Yeah, that's that's my fault. That was insensitive of me. I think uh, I think Trey's got more hair than Sark. So whatever Sark has left, he literally pushes all of it to one spot, and Trey can keep the balance going. Yo, I haven't seen Sark's back of the dome. I saw a picture with him and Stephen A. Smith doing the South by interview, yep. and man, Sark's got that Monty Ginobili going crazy. Oh, oh really? <laughs> it's not yeah. that bad. Wow. I'm telling you, oh. I'm telling you, you don't see Sark from behind very often. The dude, yeah, yeah, it's it's all right, though. He, he's doing it. He's fine. He's, yeah. He's fine. He's still got some game. We, we could tell by L'Oreal. He's got some game. He knows what he's doing. Yeah. Shoot. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Sark and Jeff Barker have cracked the code. They cracked it. <laughs> they, they cracked the code. White dudes with sisters, that man. We gonna get into that, Jeff. Don't think, don't you can't hey. hide from it. We gonna get into that. I gotta hear the backstory. But that's I that's that's, that's how you know life. I have games, eh? Because I don't have money. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, I don't have Sark's yeah. bank account, so I gotta have something else. No, you yeah. gotta have something, baby. Yeah, we definitely gotta get into that. But BK Trey, appreciate you fellas. Great show as always. I'll be cool. See Love you guys. guys. Have a good show. Yes. We are in the building. No Chip Brown for another day. The guy takes off more than anybody I know. I have to give him crap about that because I haven't taken any days off, Barker. Your boy's been on his Cal Ripken shit on TSU. You know what I'm saying? Which it's coming, BK. Like it's coming this summer. I, I got some things planned out, but yeah, no you saving around. it up to just disappear for like the entire month of July. Yeah. I might have to pull one of those, but it, it's all right. It's, I'm not going to catch anybody off guard. I'm going to give people a heads up. I'm going to be very professional about it, Barker. You know what I'm saying? And like I've been saying, that is not Chip Brown. We got CBS Sports anchor and reporter Jeff Barker in the building. Also, TSU, just one of the guys, man. That's one of my favorite things about this program, you know, being on Texas Sports Unfiltered. It doesn't matter who I jump on with. There, there's going to be chemistry just because we got real pros around here. You know what I'm saying? So, like, you never have a – anxiety feeling coming into a show like I have in the past because I know anybody I work with who's a part of Texas Sports Unfiltered could hold their own weight and then some and you know you know you get it you've been in the business long enough like you know how that chemistry thing is just very important and I pride myself on putting out a good performance every day. Like that's one of the reasons why I got into the business, but to do it with people that you enjoy, that's very important to me. And 
yeah, TSU, we got that. No doubt. And uh, once BK reached out, I guess it was right before football season about maybe have me do a couple shows here. That That's one thing that I love too, is all the different perspectives. I mean, different guys that I've done shows with, even guys that aren't, you know, necessarily on weekly, but filling in, like I filled in with Joe Cook from inside Texas last week. We had Eric Henry in from 24 seven sports. I know, you know, Jeff Howe does a show. Um, love your, love your takes, Zay, especially your, your basketball acumen. I know we'll talk a lot about that today. So lo- love the perspective that you bring there on an, and on everything else as well. And uh, of course, getting to talk to Trey every week is always, always a treat and the different perspective that he brings. You know, we get a little bit on our old man rant sometimes, <laughs> uh, so, so maybe maybe you'll help balance me out a, a a little bit, and you'll help you know dial back the curmudgeon in me. Because Trey uh, and I, Trey and I, just enable each other on that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I know both of y'all do a great job, and I I got a little old soul in me. Like I have those moments to where like, damn, just listening to this new age of hip hop, especially with South by Southwest going on. I've been looking at different lineups and stuff, and I'm doing a lot of who. Huh? <laughs> what, 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 who is this? What what's going on? And it wasn't like that for me. And I'm like, damn, say you really are getting a little old. And I'm trying to embrace it. You know, man. You know what I mean? Like you talk about just old head radio. Like I I love old head radio. Like that's a big part of the reason why I fell in love with radio. Just the history and again, like you said, hearing different guys' perspectives. Like the shows where people are just arguing and shit like, okay, cool. That's nice for clicks and stuff. But if you ain't really talking about nothing, then it doesn't matter at the end of the day. You know what I'm saying? So again, I appreciate you jumping on, filling in for Chip today. And we're definitely going to get into it. But before Trey and BK got off, like I was saying, you have cracked the code, man. Again, Newlywed, you're still a newlywed in my opinion for a guy that's been two years in. Congratulations on that. It's a beautiful thing to find somebody that you absolutely love and can share the rest of your life with. Like, I, I get it. Like, I tell Chip and everybody that listens to me on Texas Sports Unfiltered, Zay loves love. I love some love. That's why, you know, when I hear some spiciness going on with different celebrities and different just sports icons and their love life, i.e., Tom Brady and Giselle. That stuff that 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 I, I get it. Like I, I I get those things. I love that talking stuff about that. Sad with those two, I know it's messy. If you love and love, it, you gotta hate to see that. I, exactly. You know, and I'm Team Tom, baby. Don't think that this is just masculine energy. I'm being sex. No, I'm Team Tom. If all the reports are true, which obviously probably some of them aren't. I'm I'm going with Tom. Jujitsu, you wrong, bro. You wrong, messing that up. <laughs> Hey, but I don't know what I don't know what he was what what he's working with or, or what. But I mean, to outgame Tom Brady and then no. get a you know, uh, arguably the uh, I mean I don't know about net worth of of supermodels and and popularity. So I may be speaking out of turn here, but pretty sure the most most popular, most successful, maybe the wealthiest supermodel ever, right? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean oh, that's not that's, like, that, that's a little out of my lane to be making big claims about that. But she uh, at least I'm top five right on that. She's at least top five. You know, in sports, we love doing the Mount Rushmore. She's Mount Rushmore when it comes to supermodels. Probably with Tyra Banks and a couple of others uh, in the 90s and stuff. They used to do all those Sports Illustrated swimsuits. I can't think of I'm sure y'all going to let us know on the hotline. Hit us up. But, yeah, I, it's whatever jujitsu's packing or doing. And that's the worst thing. Like, it's not like Tom could go fight the dude. You know, it's not like he could get his payback and put up the dukes or anything. Jiu-Jitsu, he probably knows some shit. I, I just say he probably knows some stuff, some Bruce Lee, Jackie Chan, you know, type Return of the Dragon stuff that John Tom ain't trying to mess with. Tom's not trying to see. And I, yeah. I get it. Tom, just let it go. You know, Tom's doing well himself. I think he's with another supermodel. So, I, you know, he was – flirting with Kim Kardashian right when the divorce hit. Like, Tom will be fine. But for the kids and, you know, all they went through and stuff, it seemed like she understood that Tom loved the game of football. Did he go a little bit too long? Maybe. But those last three years, he won a Super Bowl in those last three years. So what? I he was still playing like at a high 70. level. It's not like the dude's 70, you know. <laughs> I mean, come on. Like, you know, he didn't. It's not like so some dude that's 87 and it's like, all right, like hang up the CEO gig, man. You know, yeah, like spend yeah. some time. It's not like spend some time before, you know, 
you're on the end of your your life expectancy there. Like, dude, he's still in his forties. Come on. What what got my guy was him saying that he was going to retire, and then now in her mind, she, she's getting, thinking getting all the, the hopes po- up. Yeah, she's thinking all the positive things. Like, thank you, finally. Now we're going on vacation. She's planning, you know, doing all of these things, preparing herself for the next part of her life. And then Tom goes and pulls the rug from under and says, you know what? I want to go back. (laughs) I I want to go back to work. And this is not just like anybody that really separates and has that balance of work and football, your profession. And then just everyday life. Like Tom seems like those four months, maybe five, depending on how you get into the playoffs and how far you go, don't really talk to me. Don't plan nothing. Don't expect me at any bar mitzvahs, any family functionings. <laughs> don't expect me. Don't expect me to do nothing. Nothing. I got this film to crack. You know what I'm saying? I, I got to get right. I got to get my body right. These massages, I got to do, you know, just different treatment. Because, again, he's in his 40s, so he, that bounce back was different. But, yeah, that, those fights were probably, oof, they're probably Tyler Perry. And I'm not talking about the Kansas State point guard that killed Texas last night. I'm talking about Medea with his dramatic self. That that was probably that worthy type of arguments, what they were going through, because, Man, I, I thought that was it. I thought that was the celeb couple that was gonna, you know, was built to last. Distance. Built to last, man. But built when to you last, there was that report that one year in training camp about the vacation, and then I guess he like remember he took the leave for a minute, but then there was like a vacation that was supposed to happen. There was some report about that, and I think she, if you think about it in the most literal way possible, she must have been done when she was like, "You've won this many Super Bowls." <laughs> And you would rather go hang out with a bunch of sweaty dudes the entire month of August than go with me and the kids to w- Lord knows where those two are. What a you know secluded tropical island paradise they're going to. She was probably like, you know what? When you just write it all down and say it out loud, yeah, I might be done. I might be done after that. Yeah, yeah. And then just there's a way to go about it. Again, these are all just assumptions. These are all just rumors. You know, we don't even know jujitsu, how real that is. If she denies, denies. Jiu-Jitsu could come out and say something. I don't know. But I don't want to completely take Tom's word for it. I'm not that big of a D-bag. Like, yes, I'm Team Tom, but that's just because he's my guy. Like, I appreciate the work. You know what I'm saying? I appreciate the dedication. I appreciate him leaving New England because Bill Belichick, in a way, screwed them over and saying, you know what? I'm going to prove that I could do it without you, bro. Have you have you watched the Dynasty on Apple TV? I haven't yet. How I, is it? I just finished episode seven or episode seven or eight. I, well, I just finished the Aaron Hernandez one, and whoa! So they're that getting was, into everything, dude. They're they and they got everybody to talk. Now there's a lot of no comment or situation where you know Belichick sits up there, man, on whatever little like perch they had his ass on, and he was like. You know, doing this thing where like his chin's down, but he's also like like looking up at the same time. I'm just like, what are we doing? So there's a lot of like no comment or like uh no, I just watched Deflate Gate too. So I'm through episode eight. But then in Deflate Gate, they you know tell Tom, like, you know, do you wanna like comment on this at all? Which by the way, that that whole shit got blown way out of proportion. Yeah. Um, but there, yeah, there's a lot of no commenting, but also they did get a lot of guys to talk. I mean, Robert Kraft, man. He opens up big time. Like he he did not hold back at all. I mean, he's probably like, man, I've I've accomplished what I've accomplished. And, you know, what are they gonna do now? Take it away from us? I mean, he's not admitting to every little thing, but he if he was he was pretty open. I think I think anyone would enjoy that. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely got to check it out. Like, they have one of the most fascinating stories in all of sports. And, you know, say what you want about Belichick. I don't know if he'll ever get another gig, Barker. You know, just I I think his style isn't what's popping these days. And the other style's working. That's the big thing, too. Yeah, exactly. You know, the, the, the Mac Jones thing shouldn't have went how it went. Like Matt Jones, and I'm, I'm a little biased because, I, you know, Steve Sarkeesian, very highly of Mac Jones, and I'm still very highly of Steve Sarkeesian. And just hearing, we had uh, Glenn Stretch Smith on with us 
couple of weeks ago, former Dallas Cowboys assistant who's been working out with Matt Jones, and he's as shocked as any of us that that situation happened the way it did. And again, that goes to what I'm saying, like, are you, as Bill Belichick, are you, why are you can't deliver that message that you were delivering to Tom to Matt Jones? That that's unfair. Like I get it. There's a standard you have to have, but those guys aren't the same guy, you know? So you're going to have to go about it differently. And just kind of from what you've heard and the people that we've talked to and the people that you hear talking that are very credible in sports and talk Belichick, he is just so in his ways that this new generation of player, which you could say it's softer. I do think a part of it, some of these guys are soft. Some of these guys get pampered with just different things. Like they, they have it really good. And sometimes it goes to their head to where they think they could call the shots. And that's not always the case. But as Steve Sarkeesian says, you've got to be able to adapt. You know, that stupid analogy that he makes with the dinosaurs that he gets from Nick's <laughs> he, that he said it. He said it with Stephen A. Smith. I was watching that. I was like, oh, man, Chip would love this because we always give some shit. He loves that analogy. He it's loves true, that. though. It, yeah, it is. But, you know, I feel like a lot else went wrong with the dinosaurs anyway. The dinosaurs weren't coming up with a good enough NIL package to stay on this <laughs> earth, right? Yeah, they weren't planning the right That's what way. Right? Saying. Yeah, exactly. So, but but what he's trying to say, you got to be able to adapt to change. And the change happened. Brady era's over. Are you willing to adapt to whoever comes in? Like the Cam Newton thing, that was really weird. You knew that wasn't going to work. Like, come on. That's just. The writing on the wall. I love Cam Newton and what he did, but Cam Newton's the still the same guy that was fighting that seven on seven camps. Like going to where Bill Belichick is, how buttoned up they, you know, try to be in stuff. That's come on. That's just that's disaster. And then Mac Jones comes along. Like I'm not saying Mac Jones was great. Like he deserved a lot of the knock that he got, but. It should have been handled a lot differently. And, yeah, I, I can't see Belichick getting another gig again. Like, it, it'll be really hard for me to see that. I think he'll convince somebody in the next cycle or, you know, I, I don't think it would be two cycles from now, but I bet he convinces somebody in the next cycle. With how many of these jobs open every year, you know, he could pull, you know, in his own way, he could pull the whole Mike McCarthy where he gives the – uh BS line about how we watch every snap from every NFL. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. The fact that Jerry bought that was hilarious to me, but I think he'll get somebody on that and he won't have to fully sell them on, on I've totally evolved, but he could sell them on, Hey, you're away a clear mind. Like I had all these decades in a row of being the guy and just pedal to the metal, grinding it out. Here's what this, you know, selling them on, here's what this year's done for me and what it's opened my eyes to. And not that he would change his philosophy, but that he would amend it a little bit and, you know, selling them on that little bit of evolution. Maybe not to where, hey, he's going to become Sean McVay. Obviously, that's never going to be his style. But that a change of scenery, it, it could work somewhere else. I could see, I could see that happen. I'm trying to think of a place off the top of my head that might have, might have an opening, but, um, you know, I think somebody somebody will fall for that if he wants to coach. Right. And that that's the thing. Like, is he willing to give up being as stubborn as he is? But think of because think about all the pull that he had in New England from hiring guys like Matt Patricia to be like your offensive coordinator and stuff like that. Like, if I'm a GM, I'm over here saying, yo, dude, we're making decisions together. And you can't get pissed off and lose it if I don't allow you to hire your brother, you know, basically <laughs> like your son, you know, like you've got a lot of family people because you do things a certain way and you want that, you know, familiarity. But I, I that that was a huge issue. Like he had so much pull and I thought that he was just so stubborn and trying to prove everybody that, oh, I could do it without Tom. You know, it just. It didn't fit. And then crafting those guys, like, they're just like, hey, 
we can't keep doing this anymore. So we're going to politely push you out. And you're right. He does have a lot of pull. Like, again, the guy's a hell of a coach. Talking about Mount Rushmore with Giselle, when it comes to coaches, hey, you got to have Belichick up there. You, you have to. You have to put him up there. He deserves that, you know. But he will always have that asterisk of, well, what was he without Brady? From before Brady to after. Like, what that those records, not very good, you know. And you can probably say the same thing about Andy Reid when Patrick Mahomes. You know what I'm saying? Those McNabb days, yeah, he had some good seasons, but he underachieved a lot. So, and, and, you know, I, I I hope Belichick the best, but it's hard for me to see him going to an organization and then being like, okay, I'm going to let y'all do all these things because that pride's going to get in the way of them being like, hey, I've been there, done that. I know more than you. Look how many rings I got. Like, yeah, what, what, what can you say to that? And the asshole, that, the asshole's going to come out at some point. It's going to come out. It's going to come out. And you know what? He's not even that big of an asshole. Like, you see different clips of him with his smoking hot girlfriend or wife, whatever, and he's going to Halloween parties, Randy Moss's Halloween party and stuff. Like, he gets out and about. Like, it's not like he's a real closed-off guy. It's just once he puts that headset on and once he's in football mode and, you know, he goes to the podium and he talks with the media – that's where you're like, damn, this dude's a huge D bag. <laughs> it's just like, you know, you see the different comedy bits on him being like a Sith Lord, you know, going Star Wars on. Yeah, I caught you off guard there, then I'm Barker. I'm not a big Star Wars guy, but I'm, I'm, I'm not either. Yeah, he's going just like the villain with the hood, like Dark Vader type shit. Like, he just has that aura about him. And I don't know if everybody especially at this point, knowing all the stuff that you know, that, that that's a hard sell for me. And you're right. You, again, you're right. Like him saying, hey, just look at the resume. Like, especially with all the guys out there. Like that, the biggest shocker for me was the Atlanta spot. Like they hired my man, what, Raheem Morris? Mm -hmm. Come on now. Like, all right. I, over Belichick? You know, okay, that's interesting. Like, I don't know. Babe, Belichick and, and uh, Kirk, Kirk D. Cousins, that would have been fun. Yeah. That would have been an interesting combination between those two. <laughs> you like that move, Kirk Cousins? I do. Yeah, Trey and I, Trey and I kind of talked about it the other day when Monday when all that stuff was breaking. That was a wild just avalanche of – of news in the what one of my favorite terms in in nfl legal tampering period <laughs> just say that free agency started guys just start free agency two days earlier but yeah i i do like the move i'm i don't think it makes them a super bowl contender or anything like that but i think he could be a albeit very expensive bridge quarterback but he could be a bridge quarterback for them to you kind of get that that organizational culture back on track, get the winning back on track, you know, even if they're not going to the NFC championship game every year. But maybe you you get lucky with that skill talent they have around him in Atlanta with our guy Bijan, Kyle Pitts, Drake London. You know, I'm sure they'll sign a couple more guys. And maybe you say, hey, and I think they have pretty good defense too. And maybe you say, hey, you know, if he can get us two or three good years and then at some point buy us that patience to find the right quarterback in the draft and then develop him that way a little bit. Not not making the Aaron Rodgers Kirk Cousins comparison, but a little <laughs> bit like what, what Green Bay did with with Jordan Love, where now you're seeing him three or four years in after he sat forever coming into his own. I mean, he played really well at the end of the season. So maybe they're able to do that with Kirk Cousins and not totally tank to do it and still build that winning culture and that organizational culture that that you would want to see. Yeah, and that's so hard to do because guys are so impatient. Like, how, how do you tell a guy that's a first-round, second-round pick that, you know, sees himself as one of the starters on 32 teams in the National Football League, hey, you're going to have to wait your turn. You know, you're like, but I might be better than this guy. I haven't had a chance yet. Well, got to pay your dues, you know. Like, Jordan Love thing is so fascinating to me just from that standpoint. And 
you think about Kirk Cousins, like it kind of shows if you have a good marketing team behind you and you could be just a good person and a good locker room guy, like Kirk Cousins, as far as locker room guys go, elite, elite. You know what I'm saying? Like watching that quarterback documentary, just seeing how his everyday life was and just how, you know, his relationship with his teammates are. And you see the videos of him with Ice Style doing all this and stuff on the plane. And you're like, dude, this dude, Kirk Cousins, is the most corniest, lamest guy in the world. Yet, I want to be his baby. friend. Yeah. Like, I, I want to be his friend. I want to be his homie. Like, that's the type of guy he is. So when I see that contract but see his football resume, they don't. They don't make sense, but Kirk Cousins as a person, like just uplifting the locker room, letting everybody like know that, hey, Kurt, we got a chance. And he, he makes some big time throws like that loss in the playoffs a couple of years ago against New York. Like that ain't on him. That ain't on him. You know, it's just it's always going to stick with him by being a quarterback that hasn't got over the hump or hasn't went far in the postseason. But Kirk Cousins, I think with the right ball club, he could get it done. I, that, they're my pick to win the NFC South. Like, how, I how think, can I you think not? the updated odds are there basically even money. And I want to say the Bucks are probably right behind them at 2-1 to one or 3-1 to one maybe after they just re-signed Baker to, woo, to a <sighs> wild extension. Yo, three years, a hundred million up to up to 115 in incentives. That's say kind of the same thing. Barker locker room guy like ba Baker. People love Baker. He can rub us the wrong way by, you know, being Texas fans and stuff with how much he hates Texas as a sooner. But as an Austin kid, too, I mean, it's like, yeah, man, dude, you're, yeah, you know what I'm saying? you're an Austin kid. He probably never no come love home. Him. He probably never comes home. And if he does, it's straight to Lake Travis. He'll see family for a little bit, but he'll probably get the heebie-jeebies because he'll see too much burnt orange and get triggered and have to go back to wherever the hell he lives. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, that hurt. That still hurts my pride. That's, that's a great point, Mark, because I, I want to like Baker Mayfield so much, and I do. I do to a certain extent. Like, I know I could like him more, but his hate for Texas, like when he was on college game day with Herb Streak and Corso and Howard and those guys at the Cotton Bowl, and he was just so disrespectful, so disrespectful. And I'm like, oh, Baker, man, this hurts. And I want to see him do well. But, again, that contract, a little hefty. And Baker with a contract, now that he's paid, I think there's going to be a drop-off. I think there's going to be a drop off because they got a first place schedule now by winning the South last year. That schedule ain't no bitch. No. And hey, what you going to do now? Now you're not going to surprise anybody. You know what I'm saying? Now there's a ton of film of you in the Tampa Bay uniform of what you like to do with Mike Evans. And Baker's a gunslinger. We know that. But with Kirk Cousins coming to the NFC South, B. John Robinson, he needs way more looks. Like Arthur Smith, you deserve to get canned, man. You deserve to get canned. Like you, I, I, I understand saving guys, but B. John, he wasn't utilized enough at all. At all. Especially with his ability to catch the ball in the backfield or slide him out to a wide receiver spot, whether it's a slot or outside. Like he's that versatile. And Arthur Smith didn't use that. I hope that Raheem Morris gets it. And Kirk Cousins, I think he's the type of player that has that, you know, aura to where he could go up to coaches and be like, hey, Bijan has the mismatch. Let's get him the ball. <laughs> or unlike Desmond Ritter or my guy Taylor Heineke, when he sees that defense, he'll be able to change up the play call and be like, okay, Bijan has the mismatch. Whatever the hell that we were calling before, damn that. We're giving it to Bijan because Kirk Cousins has been in the league long enough to earn that trust. And what were they saving him for? That's what confused me the whole time. Like, I know Algier was a good back, especially in his rookie year. But what are you saving B. John Robinson for? You used the eighth overall pick on that guy. The third year in a row 
that you took a skill position player with your first round pick. I believe all of those were at least top 15, maybe even top 12 picks. So what in the world were they saving Bijan for? And especially with the way we've seen the running back market go, there's no reason to like, I mean, maybe if you're trying to save him a little bit over the course of a year, because you know, you're a team that's going to make a deep playoff run. That might make a little bit of sense. Or if he was hurt, but to my knowledge, Bijan was, was healthy the entire season and they were not a team that that could mess around and say, hey, like, well, we know, like, we're basically a lock to, you know, make the playoffs. Right. So, yeah, I don't really understand what they were doing saving him. That didn't make a ton of sense to me, especially when you use that pick on him. And what I was saying a second ago, with the way the running back market's gone, you need to use these guys and, you know, basically do what the Giants tried to do with Saquon, even though he couldn't stay healthy for, for some of those years. And just run, run the guy into the ground yeah. while he's on the rookie deal. I mean, it, you're not you're not paying him, you know, cheap money by any means on that rookie contract when it's a top ten pick, but it's going to be less than what you're going to pay him to sign the extension afterwards. That first contract when you take a running back early, that's what you want to get all the juice, squeeze all the juice that you can out of him. So hopefully they do that this year uh, for for Bijan and and hopefully he can prove too that that he's in that small caliber of running backs. Like, you know, we've seen it two with two running backs in this cycle with Josh Jacobs going to the Packers and then Saquon going to the Eagles. And then obviously Christian McCaffrey's in that next tier, basically by himself, Derek Henry, even I think is on a third contract now, but Jacobs and Saquon got second contracts. So hopefully Bijan's able to prove, I know it's only a second year, but you know, you want to, you know, you want to hope that the guy can, you know, go out there and prove that, that he's worthy of a, a running back, Cal, he's the caliber running back that can get that next contract. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Steve Sarkeesian's first year at the 40 Acres, that 2021 five and seven season, blah. Uh, that TCU game where B. John Robinson ran the ball like 30 something times. And I'll never forget uh, Gary Patterson after the game, which was on some real hating shit, but. Yeah. Gary's been around the block before. Gary's seen, you know, guys get a lot of carries and stuff. And that could – and Gary knew his defense. Like, that defense, they hit. Like, Gary's teams, they always hit. So, it wasn't like Bijan wasn't taking, you know, blows. And he ended up getting hurt later on that season, you know. And I, I think when you have somebody – that caliber and you're looking at the long haul because as you talk about that second contract such a big deal so running them to the ground like from a organization standpoint yes that makes sense but I think they really look at Bijan and they're like yo man we want to save you down the line because we know we're not good right now we're not even if we used you a lot we're not going far in the playoffs if we were to make it which they were right on that borderline but it's not worth it your rookie year and Arthur Smith, the hot seat that he was on, it's you don't if the, if the guys in the top telling you that, you can't really listen to that because you gotta win. You gotta do whatever it takes to win. And giving the ball to seven, that that's what especially this past season with Ritter and Heineke. Like, come on now. I and I love Taylor Heineke. That's one thing about me, Barker. I, I love Taylor Heineke. Like the Moxie. You remember when he took Brady and those guys in the playoffs to the end when he was with the commanders or the football team, whatever they were called at that moment? Like he took Brady in the playoffs to the end. And he has a lot of Moxie, just the skill level. I don't know. He's very ordinary. But that's what you have. So if you're on the hot seat and you know you're about to lose your job, you got to do whatever it takes to keep it and show the front office guys that they can have faith in you, that you know what you're doing. Like you, you can't, Arthur Smith, you don't have any time to look at the long haul. That's not, that's not where you're at. Raheem Morris, he does. He's given a little bit of grace because he just got the job. So I I expect Bijan to be used a lot more. Algier, he's solid. You know, Kyle Pitts. Give Kirk Cousins the number, dog. Give Kirk Cousins the number. Make that's the guy that's gonna be throwing you passes. Yeah, give it for a deal too. You don't even have to, you know, make a little bit of coin. I'm not saying that, but don't go over the top because you and Kirk Cousins need to be best friends. And Kirk. 
like I said earlier, the type of guy he is, he's going to go out of his way to gain a relationship because he's the new guy in and he wants everybody to be comfortable. Kurt's going to be hitting you up on those off days. Be like, hey, you want to go catch some passes? Like, Kurt Cousins is that type of guy, and they need that in Atlanta. Like, if you got rappers embracing you, which we know Atlanta's rap scene, like, it's <laughs> popping. You know, Magic City, it's popping. Like, it's – and it takes a lot to earn those people's trust and really ride for you, especially somebody as square as Kurt Cousins can be. But Kurt has shown, okay, we, we might be able to have faith in this guy. This guy says all the right things, and, you know, playing when you're 40 ain't the same like it used to be. Kirk Cousins at the age he's at, he could play, you know, you say he's a bridge guy. He is, but he's not. Like that, there, there's a part of me of like, man, if you can you win a Super Bowl with him, if you can't win a Super Bowl with him, if you can't say yes to that question, then he's a bridge guy to me at that age. But it's like it's like Patrick Mahomes is Jordan. It's like, are you winning NBA finals when Jordan's around in the nineties? Okay, okay. Like, that's, you, how, that's how I look at it at this point. Okay, but can you? Okay, maybe a better way of putting it is, can you sniff it? Because you're not even in the same conference as him now. If you don't think you can sniff the Super Bowl with him, if you don't realistically think that can happen, I mean, obviously, I'm sure everybody in Atlanta has themselves convinced that you know they're putting their their jobs on the line, their livelihood on the line, their reputations in the league on the line by making every move that they make, especially a big one like that. So they've convinced themselves that they can do it. But from an unbiased standpoint, do you look at that team and say, hey, even with a couple more tweaks and improvements to the roster and some development of players, that they can sniff a Super Bowl? If the answer is no, then he's a bridge guy. Great points. If we're going like a four-year span, if, if – Kirk Cousins is given the next four years with how weak the NFC is based mostly off quarterback because all I see is Dak Prescott, who has the same – Is Kirk Cousins. Kirk Cousins. They have the same resume. The same resume, exactly. Which Down is to the fourth-round pick. Yeah. Jalen Hurts, I'm throwing him back in that category after this past year like, yo, bro. You might have to show me a little bit more. Like that year y'all got to the Super Bowl, everything looked good. But this past season, nah. Like you, you're, he gives off Russell Wilson vibes to where, man, are you fake? Or like the all the stuff, uh. like the all the, you know, the little quotes that he has, like the Instagram quotes and just the, the, the it's that, like, that hurts. Dude, I'm, you, I'm, a, I'm a big Jalen Hurts guy. That hurts. Okay. Me. Okay. So, so put me, put me in my place. I, 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 I need to know because he gives this past year was tough for me with him. Like this past year, it was just seeing how guys reacted to him. And AJ Brown, he could be a diva sometimes, but. Just that, and Sirianni's kind of a meathead, but just, I don't know. I see, when I see you in social media and stuff, modeling and stuff, and I'm like, you know, I'm a hater, Barker. I'm a hater, too. I'll be like, dog, you a little bit, you acting too pretty. You act, you acting too pretty. <laughs> say the say what's real. Like, talk, you know, I, it's just, he doesn't show much emotion. See, but I feel, like he was, I feel like he wasn't like that before. So maybe he's changing, but his reputation and what he's done in his career all the way back to college to this point, like I've, I've become a big fan. And I think a lot of people became a big fan with the way he handled it at Alabama. Sure. And to me, that was, that was genuine. That was a situation where you could have seen a guy throw out Instagram quotes and, you know, cryptic tweets, you know, LeBron style cryptic tweets and stuff like that. And not that he would have, not that, you know, you getting your ass benched at Bama puts you on the same level as, as LeBron, but same kind of thing where, you know, the hourglass emoji, stuff like that. He didn't do any of that, you know, put his head down, was a good teammate, was a good dude, said all the right things, then went and tore it up at Oklahoma, then goes into the NFL and is told that, you know, uh, second round pick, that was way too early to pick that guy. Like, you know, he's a project at best, you know, not an NFL quarterback, can't throw, struggles a little bit that first year and then gets way better as a passer and goes to a Super Bowl. So, Damn, actually, you know, that is kind of Russell Wilson y, all that stuff. Yeah, I'm saying, <laughs> I'm telling you. But I don't know. Maybe it's just the vibe that I get is just more genuine from Hertz than it is from Russ. But he could be on that Russ path to your point. And it's it's a good point because maybe we see him go down that path that, you know, I don't think Russ was like that early on. Or maybe there was just so much attention in Seattle on the Legion of Boom and 
all those guys and how good they were. They were the heart and soul of the team, the best players on the team, all the personalities that those dudes had, um, you know, together in one, one team, let alone one defense. And then he was just kind of, you know, the, for lack of a better phrase, the old cliche, he was just the game manager, just managing things and not screwing it up on the offensive side. So, you know, maybe Hertz is on a, on a little bit of a Jalen Hurt, uh, on a little bit of a uh, track to become, you know, Russell Wilson E. Because I don't think Wilson, you know, when he when he was with that that first his first wife, <laughs> like before he married, uh, we were talking about Tom marrying Giselle before he married a, a pop star, a superstar. You know, I don't I don't think he was really like that. So who knows? Maybe um, maybe Hertz is on that track. But I get genuine vibes to this point from him. Yeah, yeah, and you know. There's nothing like you mentioned Sierra. There's nothing like a fine ass got her shit together, got her own woman or got her own thing going on. Woman letting you know that you're the shit and telling you your worth. Cause I think that's, I think she pumps him up to where you could see the things that Marshawn Lynch, who's flat out crazy. Like let's, let's Marshawn Lynch is nuts. So you got to take his word with a grain of salt. But guys like Richard Sherman, they talk about just how just disingenuous he was and just how, like, dude, you can't answer our phone calls? Like, come on now. And you're right, Jalen Hurts, he's not even close to that point yet. But I see different things to where, it's like, dude, you're not even answering the question that's being asked. And, hey, to his credit, he doesn't bash any of his teammates. He doesn't embarrass anybody. He doesn't put out information – but what, he, he has that one quote about commitment that was like, uh, you know, he wasn't calling anybody out by name, but like that was the one thing he did last year. I was like, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of that. Like, a cri- really? I don't remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Stand by. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And you know, again, once you put on that Sooner uniform, you know, sometimes, <laughs> you know, once, once you get to Norman, you're just going to get some BS that you didn't expect to get. Like it's with all of them. You know what I'm saying? Blake Griffin's weird. Trey Young, Baker, Kyler Murray. I could go down the list. Joe Mixon, shit. Talk about the demons that he has. But yeah, so he, I got, I got the Hurts quote. Okay. He said, "quote I don't think we, I don't think we all were committed enough." Hurts said after the game. A few days later, the Eagles' 25 year old franchise quarterback was asked to clarify those comments. He insists that he was talking to himself as much as anyone. So that was after they lost to the Seahawks in like right around Christmas, December 19th. It looks like. So yeah, yeah, that, that was one where I'm like, okay, like, cause I, I draw a clear line on like the cryptic BS, man. Mm -hmm. Like don't do all that. Like all the Aaron Rodgers, like cryptic crap. And then complaining about the media and blaming it on everybody else. And you blame it on everybody else's reaction. Yet you still throw out stuff for low hanging fruit that, you know, people are going to take and for stuff that people are going to turn into fodder. And, you know, yeah, like, uh, like, you know, rumors about being a vice presidential candidate (laughs) and then a month, and then a month month before that going on the record with your face on, on camera saying everything that needs to be in this building that comes out of this building needs to be all about football. We need to get all that other stuff out of here. That's not about football. And then doing that. He's been anyway. So, I digress. I digress. No, no, that's a. Hey, I appreciate that. Like, I that's how we go all over the place on this show with me. So, is that I, that's I appreciate it. And to Aaron Rodgers, how bored has he been rehabbing? Like, that's he has been bored as hell. And now, vice president stuff, like the things that he says, man, which. Every time I see something about Aaron Rodgers, I just keep scrolling or just keep it moving. If it's yeah. not about football, no, and that's it's usually never about football. That's where I've gotten with it too. And and I don't I don't totally dislike the guy. Like I I really dislike and it annoys me the way that he acts. And again, I'll say it again, the cryptic BS, but all this stuff about he's just kind of hypocritical. And and you know what? Maybe I, maybe he'd be a great politician. Because of that. <laughs> yeah. but, but I don't have anything truly against the guy. I think some of his takes and the way he views the world is different than the way I view the world, but that's fine. We need people that view things differently within, you know, w- w- within reason, as long as it's not hurting other people. Um, but just go do something else. And yeah. like, I feel like football fans would 
would wish him well. Jets fans might be disappointed. It didn't work out, but like it just retire and go do something else. But all this stuff of like back and forth, flip flop, you know, and all the Jets guys and the former Packers can tell me, tell they're blue in the face, how much they like the guy, but they can't, they cannot be sitting there at home. Okay. With that, or in the facility when they're putting in all this work, they're putting in all these extra hours. A lot of these guys are just all about football. You know, some of them are, you know, not every guy in every locker room is going to be all about football, all about whatever, you know, the, the sport is and just about the right things. But the guys that are in there every day, putting in that work, that's gotta be exhausting after a while. It's exhausting as a fan who's never rooted for him specifically. Cause he's never played for a team I root for, but I've never like rooted against him. It's exhausting for me being completely unbiased and, you know, not connected to the situation at all. So for those guys, it's got to just be brutal after a while to hear this guy go on and on nonstop, tell us he's all about football. And then every other day, it's something non-football related coming up. Yeah. Yeah. McCall Harmon, his comments were very telling, you know, about what the Jets got going on. Cause... Yeah, and guess what? McCall Hardman already has more Super Bowls than Aaron does. Just like that. Just like that. Yeah. Dude went to Kansas City. He was like, man, this is refreshing. This mm -hmm. is different. This is nice. <laughs> oh, this is or, nice. I mean, Wait, they're a professional football team that just wants to win football games. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, not, not that they're not without their drama and their, you know, Taylor Swift sideshow, but they still kept the main thing, the main thing. Hey, again, I love love, Barker. That's love. They've proven <laughs> it to me. When I see him crying and kissing her, when the confetti's coming down and stuff, yo, Travis Kelsey, you win it, bro. When you're going across country to see her live and she's committed to, Going across country to see you play when she has shows the next day. That's love, man. That's you love. know what, Zay? What? I, be careful. I, I don't want to see you get hurt in all this. I Because you, I, you, I, you, I you, you love love, Zay. So if it doesn't work out, I don't want you to get your hopes up that this is going to be the one that works out. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. But back to our original point, NFC week. Like, Chips, Lions, they're right there. You know what I'm saying? Um, I think that San Francisco, they're going to be there for a while. After that, can you say the Cowboys? <laughs> I don't know if you can. You know, like that's – you can't really say the Buccaneers. The Eagles, mm, they're right back back there with the Cowboys, losing Fle uh, Fletcher Cox, excuse me, and uh, losing J Jason Kelsey. They're right back there again. You know, you're losing big time guys. So the NFC is still kind of up for grabs while the AFC, those guys are slugging it out. Like that's where all the top tier quarterbacks are. Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, Joe Burrow, you know, Josh Allen, the list goes on. Now Russell Wilson's over there. Tom, uh, excuse me, Aaron Rodgers. That's what we just mentioned. Like the AFC is nuts. So if you're in the NFC, you better go get it now. There's some prime opportunities there. And, yeah, we'll see what happens in 2024. Yeah, and even I, I can say this because Chip's on vacation and probably not listening, so I can say this about his Lions. Uh, you mentioned them as basically the second team behind San Francisco, which, I mean, obviously makes sense. They, you know, were one collapse away from, you know, getting to a Super Bowl. But um, I, I don't look at them and go, like, Okay, they're the like so if they if they're the second best team in the NFC, I don't look at them and immediately go like, oh my god, I don't want to play them in the playoffs. You know, yeah. they're a good team and I like what they're doing and I hope they get to a Super Bowl. I'd love to see Dan Campbell for an entire, you know, Super Bowl week of media obligations and the content that would come out of that and the funny <laughs> clips and memes and gifts that, that we would get from that. But at the end of the day, like I don't look at that team with Jared Goff at quarterback and think that they're just unbeatable or like, oh my gosh, like not even like how I would look at San Francisco. I wouldn't want to play San Francisco, but I, I look at the Lions and I say, I respect what they got going on. And I think they can be a factor for a while and yeah. maybe get, to, like I said, maybe get to a Super Bowl at some point and then you, you know, flip the coin when you get there. But if that's the second best team right now, and then there's really no clear team behind them, eh, I don't know. I would probably, put, I would probably put the Eagles as that third team that I would, that I would trust the most. And I'd probably put them over the Cowboys just from the standpoint of I've seen them do it. I've seen them yeah. win the NFC. I've seen them get to the Super Bowl. I've seen them almost win it. I've seen them almost beat Mahomes in the Super Bowl. 
And that's, as we saw last year with them, it's hard to just, you know, snap your finger and replicate that immediately. Uh, but, you know, I have more confidence in them getting back to that point than I do the Cowboys even getting there once in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. We'll see how this NFL draft shakes up and shakes up the NFL. Keep following free agency. I know, I know, y'all on the Coda text line bitching and stuff. Oh, you haven't talked basketball yet. They lost. Do y'all not understand that I, I'm trying to talk positivity right now? I definitely want to talk basketball. We got a two hour show here. Hold your horses. But Jeff and I have not worked together for a full show. I wanted to start it off with some positivity, start us off on a good foot. So that's why we haven't talked basketball yet. But here you go. We got to do it. That's part of the yeah. show. That's part of the gig. I was trying these to people want nine, They want nine hours of us breaking yeah. down that atrocity yeah. last night? Yeah, that bullshit last night. You being watched it? Points at half and then put – Allowing 49, they want us to talk about that, but sure. Well, okay, yeah, like, no, no, let's do want. it. Let's let's, let's talk. do it. Let's you might not it. like what you hear. Good grief, man. Last night, the Texas Longhorns lost in based what the second round, I guess, since they got a bye of the Big 12 tournament 78 to 74. They had a 10 point lead going into halftime 39 29. And then they allowed 49 points from Kansas State, who were led by not Medea, but Tyler Perry, 21 points, three for four from the three-point line, 10 for 10 from the free throw line. And Jeff, uh, more roller coaster shit with this Texas basketball team. I mean, you look back to last Saturday, the win over Oklahoma, and you're like, okay, this team, this is where we want them. Specifically, Tyrese Hunter. The dude has 30 points. The dude dominates the game. The dude looks like, yo, I'm ready for March. It's time to get going. It's time to go crazy. We're finding our stride at the right time. To then the next game put up a very suspect three points. No field goals made. 0 for 7. 0 for 3 from the three-point line. And 28 minutes. You know, Rodney Terry, dude, <sighs> It's frustrating because IT Horton finally has a good game. 14 points solid. He's knocking down shots. He's playing well. But you only play Kendall Weaver 10 minutes. Like, Kendall Weaver and IT Horton could play on the court at the same time. They're both guards, you know? If you see Tyrese Hunter, whether he had a good game the last game or not, if he's struggling, sit him to the side and put in Kendall Weaver and know that you're going to get at least something defensively, the same thing you're getting Tyrese from Tyrese Hunter, but you might see what he could do offensively by attacking the rim. And we never saw that last night. Like that's, that's why there's going to be question marks on Rodney Terry from here on out if he doesn't have a good March Madness run. You know, because sometimes the decision making through the game, I think he just gets lost on, OK, we've done well so far. Let's just keep doing the same thing. That's not realistic. If you're up by 10 at halftime, you got to be prepared that the opposing team is making adjustments to stop what you're doing well. To be down by 10, if you're a good coaching staff, you got to go just – I'm not giving anything new. This ain't rocket science. This is literally coaching one-on-one. -on -one. You got to figure out, uh, what are they doing to us? Okay, how do we stop that? We probably got to change something up. That's what Jerome Tang did. That's what he did. When he just kept attacking the horns, attacking them off the dribble, going at guys, going at Dylan Mitchell, Arthur Kaminga, somebody told him like, yo, or Kaluma, excuse me, Somebody told him. Played like Jonathan Kaminga. He played, played like John. I get those guys confused because they do have a similar game, similar build. But Kaluma, somebody must have told him, like, yo, this Dylan Mitchell guy, he can't really guard. He looks like he could guard. The athleticism, the wingspan, you know, the bounce, he looks like he could guard. He has all the intangibles to guard, but he really doesn't want to guard. Go at him and see what happens. That first four minutes, Arthur Kaluma took over. You know, if you're Rodney Terry, once you see that twice, you're out the game. Brock Cunningham, you're in. Just like that. We, we got to stop this. 
We, we got to stop this momentum that they're already going on to start the game. Because that first four minutes in the second half, that was the ball game right there. I, I have like three things from what you just said that I, I want to ask you about. I'll, I'll start with last night's game. Uh, just my thoughts on, on the game last night. And even I think the IT Horton game that you mentioned, finally getting 14 from him, it's sort of a microcosm of what this team struggled with throughout the season where all these pieces that they were trying to bring together. And I know it doesn't help when Dylan DeSue pretty much misses the entire non-conference slate and isn't fully healthy until, you know, you would say a couple games into conference play, which they struggled starting one and three in big 12 play, but they just haven't been able to consistently get these role players going like Ace Miss is, you know, he had his struggles at some points, but he's played, Ace Miss has played pretty big most of the season, especially saving them in some of those games when they almost lost to Louisville and Madison Square Garden, saved them against Cincinnati. Two of those losses, if, if the ball bounces a different way in those games, we're probably talking about a team right now that's watching the rest of college basketball, you know, championship conference championship weekend and saying, like, fingers crossed, here's what we're rooting for in, you know, seven different games on the TV. So Max has been solid. Dylan, since he's came back, has been awesome. All conference, obviously. But they haven't been able to get consistent play from Dylan Mitchell. They haven't been able to get consistent play from Caden Shedrick. I know some of that's injury related, and the dude just can't seem to stay healthy for a you know stretch of more than a couple games. Tyrese Hunter ha- <clears throat> hasn't been able to gel with this team perfectly well. He's had ups and downs throughout the entire year. And then IT Horton's a guy where I feel like they've just tried different things with him throughout the year to say, okay, we'll throw you in the starting lineup. And I don't know if they don't stick with it long enough or what, you know, if he's just a guy where if he doesn't get the shot down early, that he's going to struggle the rest of the game. Like that's just the way it is, but they haven't for whatever reason been able to really implement him into the game. And I don't know if he's, he's probably frustrated Rodney at times with, you know, maybe not playing the defense that he needs to play. So then Rodney's just, you know, auto auto eject from the game, but yeah. So to finally get 14 from him and then you don't get a very good Brock game. You don't get a very good Shedrick game. You get absolutely nothing from Tyrese to go from 30 to three the next game. 0 for seven from the floor is is just brutal. So it was sort of a, like I said, a microcosm of the big picture for this team all season where there's just no consistency. You know what you're going to get most nights from DeSue and Acemas. And even DeSue didn't play that well, getting in foul trouble early. But you can't count on these other guys in the supporting cast. And that's, that's been brutal for this team. But you mentioned Dylan Mitchell, and that's where I got to start. That is where I have to start, Zay, because he has driven me crazy this year. And maybe it's more so the conversation and the discussion around him. And I, I you you are welcome to put me in my place and say, you know, if, you, if you're not seeing it this way, you just don't know basketball. No, say, no, no, say, no, I, so I'm so <laughs> tired of hearing Fran Fraschilla talk about how much he's improved a guy that has, he's forgotten more basketball in the last three and a half minutes of his life than I'll ever know in my entire life. Like one of those guys, I have a ton of respect for Fran and other people who, whose basketball acumen I respect have talked nonstop about how much better he's gotten. What am I missing? Because I feel like he's been unplayable at times and he looked good last night. But he has been unplayable at times. And you mentioned that everyone talks about how great he is defensively and how much better he's gotten. But I loved what you said about when it really comes down to it, he doesn't want to guard. So what what am I missing on on this this discourse about Dylan Mitchell, you know, improving so much this year? Because I don't see it. And like he has improved, but the, that's the thing. He was so bad his freshman right. year. The improvement doesn't isn't what it's supposed to be, especially with like all the hype he had coming out of high school. You know, that that doesn't mesh either. Like if you're a top five player in the nation and you're coming in for your freshman year, the impact it has to it has to look different. Like I'm thinking about all of those freshmen that are now, you know, in the NBA like Anthony Black and, you know, Nick Smith who played with them, like those guys. And it's like those dudes, they got it immediately in the college level. So Dylan Mitchell, his game, it's always been relied on his athleticism. And when you play on a level where you're just more athletic than everybody, 
the little details, the fundamentals, you're not paying attention to those as much as you should because you don't have to. Like you're just so gifted that you're able to do things out of the ordinary. So now when you're put in the field of guys who are just as athletic as you or IQ level is way higher than yours, you're going to get exposed like we've seen a lot during his first two years at Texas. And, you know, Fran Frasilla, he's so biased because he's a former coach. So his relationship with all the coaches in the Big 12, like he, he can't find it in his heart to say anything bad about Zay, that. every every game, this guy makes a comment about how much better Dylan Mitchell's got. And if I had the money, I'd break my TV every time he says it. And <laughs> look, I – I, I love interviewing Dylan. Like we've had great conversations with Dylan when Texas a couple times a year, they'll make guys available for one-on-one -on -one interviews. He's a super bright guy. I, I feel like has a high basketball IQ. Um, again, very well liked on the team. Seems like an awesome teammate. Just seems like an all around great dude, a really bright guy, but I just don't feel like he's gotten better. And I don't know if that, I don't know what percentage of it falls on him, what percentage of it falls on the coaching staff for a lack of development. I, I don't know what it is, but, you know, great. So he's a he's a solid rebounder. Like, okay, are you drafting a guy on that because he can jump high and rebound, but he's, like, skinny and not exactly physically imposing? I mean, if he's not – if that's what his game is right now and he's not physically, physically imposing at the college level from a <clears throat> actual physicality, not just jumping higher and, you know, maybe – occasionally having a technically sound box out and grabbing seven, eight boards a night. Like, yeah. is that getting you drafted? Cause I've seen people say, Oh, well his game doesn't, you know, doesn't, it just doesn't translate right now to the, their style of play or what's going on at the college level. Oh yeah. So, and I don't watch a ton of NBA. Yeah. So he's just, he's just going to be better in the NBA. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I I'm not saying it's as, it's as physical as it was in the eighties, obviously in the NBA, but I think that's why his scoring fluctuates so much is, you know, he can have 14 like he did last night when, you know, I think of the play where in the first half where Ace Miss, you know, fed it to DeSue and then DeSue kind of drove and then they, they crashed help side and then down on the baseline, you know, which was a great cut, high basketball IQ move by, by D Mitch to run down there and get an easy dunk. But if he's not getting plays like that or a couple putbacks a game, yeah, he's going to have three points and seven rebounds. And I, I just, I don't, I don't get it with him. I don't know why it hasn't clicked. Yeah, I don't get it either. It has a little bit to do with everything from just the lack of development to, you know, his effort and work ethic. Like, is he watching film? Is he in the gym all the time working on the shots that he's going to see in the game? Because a lot of his points come off great passing and come off Max Aismas, you know, having so many eyes on him and double teams to where he just makes a good pass to a cutting Dylan Mitchell or a cutting Kendall Weaver. You know, he's not one of those guys that could go out and create their own shot, which that's very, again, all the attributes are there. So like, why aren't you working on your ball handling like crazy in the off season? Like you should be able with your speed, you should be able to blow by guys, but his handle isn't tight enough to have the confidence to do those things. Like he's had multiple times this year where he'll be dribbling. There'll be a lot of pressure on the horns trying to get the ball off the court and they'll give it to D Mitch and he'll dribble and go right across half court, which is a basketball no-no and pick up the ball and then be like, kind of like a deer in the headlights looking around on what he should do. And he turned it over a few times doing that exact same thing. And it's like, bro, you got to have a bag. If you want to get to the next level, like you're saying, and be successful, you got to have more than that. And, you know, BK, having him on the show yesterday, he made a great point about Greg Brown and how both of those guys are basically synonymous with one another in their development. Like Greg, I, he didn't have to leave. Like Dylan Mitchell was smart coming back. Greg Brown should have came back for a second year, but your coach gets fired and stuff. Like a lot goes into that. Do you want to come back to that? I, Chris Beard and Greg Brown wouldn't have worked. <laughs> that, that wouldn't have worked. You remember Greg Brown like going to the locker room pissed off when he got taken out the game and stuff like that? Like Greg Brown, he's gotten a lot better playing with the Texas Legends in the G League, his maturity and stuff. He's still so to young, too. Still so young. Yeah, I don't even know if he's over 22 yet. But 
that those things, him and Chris Beard, he wasn't trying to see no part of that. So he felt like, okay, let me test myself in the association and work my way up and see what happens there. But Greg Brown, you know, coming out of Vandergriff, you're playing against, I mean, I love this area, high school basketball, but Greg Brown, he was so far ahead of everyone else, you know. And there were things that he didn't have to rely on, like Dylan Mitchell. You you don't have to rely on the be fundamentally sound and watching film all the time and you know getting better and very specific things that are gonna help you in the next level because you're just six nine and have like almost a 40-inch vertical, you know, like that's just that's the difference. And until Dylan Mitchell really gets that, like he has to leave. This is one of the weakest drafts that you're gonna see. He he's gone. He is gone. He has to leave. But say he's not going to get picked. I, I think he's going to get picked. I think he's going to get drafted. I mean, I've looked at a couple of mock drafts, and he's not even in there. He's not even in the second round. Jeez. Like The so last they, one I saw was last week had him going, like, late first round. And that was uh, – who, who was that? Because, I mean, there's a million of them out there. Yeah, there was a million. I, I may have looked at a different yeah. one. But I feel yeah. like I looked at Gavoni's on ESPN, his most recent one, and I don't think – he did the full two round, and I don't think he had Mitchell in there. Wow. But while you while you while you look at that, I think yeah. Michael may have just summed up way more eloquently than I rambled about, you know, what I what I was trying to get at with, you know, over the course of this season, we've seen games like this where you just don't get enough from the supporting cast. Shedrick, Hunter, Cunningham, Weaver, 10 points combined from those guys. Like it that's I mean, we saw last night. Like we know that's not going to get it done in the tournament if it's not getting it done against K-State on a neutral site. Yeah. No. Yeah, it's unfortunate. You know, I I thought Rodney Terry could have done some different things yesterday. And yeah, there's this mock draft site that I'm looking at. It looks a little bootleg, but it has him going top 30 at the 20 spot, which I don't I don't know. I, I can't I see know. it. I can't see it. But they also got Reed Shepard going number one. Yeah, and they got me going oh. number two, I think. <laughs> and, you know, scrappy. Scrappy, you know, you know what my game was, a Scrappy three and no D guy. Three and no D? You like yep. Brock Cunningham just without the three ball? Yeah, and I mean, I, I would have that 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 aggression, but I don't know if I would have the balls to do some of the stuff that Brock does. Oh, no, he's absolutely unhinged, that dude. That dude, <laughs> that dude. <laughs> yeah, I – gosh, man, I wish this team would have went further. You know, Kansas State, let's not to mention, like, they're desperate. They know that they're not in right now. Like, I don't even know if they won today, they would be in against Iowa State. But they would get that 20th win, which would be huge for them. And the committee likes that 20 wins. That's why it was big for Texas. But, I I mean, if you're Rodney Terry, and the rest were horrible, I admit that. You know, Brett Yormark, we all know his dislike for the university and how petty he's been. And, you know, having to give that Big 12 championship trophy to Vic Schaefer and the Lady Horns the other <laughs> night, I'm sure he definitely didn't want to do that to this men's basketball team again, especially them winning it last year. Did you did but, you see him, like, overcompensating when he gave Vic the trophy? Like, and Vic obviously is going to handle it in a class manner, just like 99% of coaches would in that situation, just like Sark did when they got the Big 12 trophy. But, like, he was trying to do – uh, your mark was trying to go like over the top to him, like, you know, no, like I don't even know what he was saying, but you could tell it was like, probably, probably like, no, this is so well-deserved. We're so happy for you. <laughs> like yeah, it was just yeah, like yeah. this, like way too long of like a 10 second handshake or like passing of the trophy. Or I'll just be like, I was just like, come on, Brett, just, just hand it to him. Like, like now you're doing too much, man. I mean, yeah. you're going to get, you're going to get crushed either way because of what you said in Lubbock. So like, just hand the trophy, fake smile, and let's all move on. Yeah, just move on. Like embrace the hatred, embrace it. Like at this point, like we'll look, look salty because you know what it is. Going to bigger and better things, and we're gonna take up all the trophies we can before we leave. Like yeah, yeah, you about as well <laughs> embrace the hate and go to whatever campus like you did in Lubbock and talk shit. Like do what you gotta do, but yeah, that fake corny stuff. Nah, it's 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 over with. It's too late, Brett. It's too late, bro. And look, I hate being that guy, conspiracy theorist guy, but it's very odd to me that Texas football had the most penalties 
in the conference and the opposing teams they played that week always had the least amount. And then Texas basketball has the most fouls out of anybody in the league. You know, like what we saw last night, a lot of those weren't fouls. Like Dylan DeSue, the first one, okay, that little push off, okay, fine. When they were posting up, that's basketball. That's yeah. definitely basketball in March. And after you just called one on them, you can't call that again. That's that, that, that's that's foul. That's that's messed up. That's not that's not right at all. Because it wasn't like Dylan DeSue was doing anything crazy. He didn't throw an elbow. It, they're just battling. It's physical. You know, like this is March. Like it's it's a physical game. People that don't think basketball is physical, like they're naive. They're they're very naive. It's a physical game. So that situation, which Dylan DeSue, you're too valuable. That one where he dove on the floor to get his fourth, that was dumb. That was stupid. You, he can't do that. He has to know that anybody during any time of the season, if you dive on the floor for a loose ball and knock that man over, they're going to call the call on you. They can't. They're trying to protect these guys. You, the, the whole Bob Knight, Dean Smith, you better dive on the floor or you're going to be practicing the next day. We're going to be doing wind sprints. That era is over with. Wait, you what know? is so what what about it on that note? What a, where do you fall on hip checking a guy into the uh, upper deck in Lubbock? <laughs> that Brock deserved to get tossed. That was flagrant too. That was I flagrant tried too. really hard. I sat there. And I was off that night. Had a couple of drinks while I was watching it, so I was feeling good by that point in the game. And I tried to back him up for a hot minute. And I do. And you know what? My my wife was right there, as as any good woman does. She put me in my place, and she was like, "Yeah, that, that was cheap shit." I was like, All right, all right. That was that was cheap shit. You're right. Yeah, my man. When Brock, you could see Brock glance at him. Yes, glance yes. At that's a great that point. Field. That that was the biggest one. Brock saw it coming. My man didn't see it coming. My man was like, oh, we're just going after the ball. If we run into each other, then we're both going after the ball. No. Brock leaned with that left shoulder, full speed. Brock knew exactly what he was doing. And no, that that's, a, that's a great point about the eyes looking that way. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm I'm looking into it a little bit too much. But I feel like if they when they reviewed it, if they didn't have that on camera of him going like that before, then maybe they could – they could say, hey, it's definitely a flagrant, but it's not a flagrant too. He was looking straight ahead at the ball. But, yeah, when he makes that little glance and then essentially, you know, hip checks and lowers the shoulder, like, all right, man. It, it, I thought it was a bit of a reputation call the next game, but I yeah. don't know if that one was totally a reputation call. Well, now, Barker, you could argue that the reputation's not only going for Brock Cunningham, but for Texas as a team. Because that Kendall Weaver foul, come on, man. Yeah. Come on. He slipped. Like, these guys are going for the ball. Ain't no way that should be intentional where and Tyler there was Perry, like, it happened. that's basketball. Guys are going to get hurt at times. but it, it, It's a one-possession oh, game. He's trying to steal the ball. He's trying to steal the ball. He's going for the ball. Like, it's not this – it, it, it makes no sense why they would call that. That was such Bush League. And then, again, goes to my point. Conspiracy theory is like, are we serious? Are we are we serious? Are we seriously making that call and completely changing the game? Because the Horns, being down 10, like you go up 10 at halftime, and then you're at down 10 at one point. They were right there. And I don't get how Tyler Perry kept catching the ball. Like the dude shoots 90%. Like, come on. Hey, coaching staff. We're double teaming Tyler Perry. We don't have anybody on the ball. The fact, and hey, salute to Tyler Perry for being that crafty to get open, but ain't no way he should be able to touch the ball in those situations with the percentage that he shot from the line. Like, you got to let somebody else beat you. But sure enough, he gets it. That Kendall Weaver falls on top of him. They call it intentional. The guy goes 10 from 10 from the free throw line. He was good yesterday. He was good. As bad as Texas played in that second half, he hit two huge threes to and got that crowd, which it was a home game, got that crowd in Kansas City really hyped and excited and just foul after foul. I always say if a team makes more free throws than you shoot, which almost was the case for this game, the Horn shot like 24 and Kansas State made 23, you're in bad position. 
you're you're in a bad position because now that means you probably have foul trouble, and that means that team is the aggressor and getting points while the clock is stopped. Whether they're coming back or ahead, you never want to put guys on the line getting those free points. So yeah, as much as the rest were Bush League last night, the Horns that was a disappointing loss, and Rodney Terry. That's why there's still going to be question marks on his name. Like he is, hey, there's a lot of pressure going into this uh, uh, March Madness tournament. Like if they lose in the first round, you're on the hot seat for next year. Like I want to say, Chris Del Conte and crew are going to give you a little bit of grace, like at least two years in the SEC. But losing first round for a team that was projected to be top 20 coming in the season or was top 20 excuse me coming into the season that's not a good look that's not a good look at all well and and while the sec is still a pretty good basketball conference you're not going to get the benefit of the doubt with the committee that you've gotten the last few years i mean they didn't need it last year because they were you know good enough team to garner you know to garner a really good seed but this year they got the benefit they they got the benefit of the doubt being in the Big 12, going 9-9 nine and nine in the Big 12. And I think even 8-10 and 10 would have got them in with the way they played yesterday. If it was 8-10 and 10 in the regular season, it may have bumped them from, you know, the 8-9 to the 10 line. But I don't know if you're getting that if you go 500 in the SEC. I mean, I don't have the bracketology in front of me, but, you know, you're going to need some really good wins to go along with it, maybe some better wins than they have right now. Because, you know, even with this resume here, it's not like they have a win over, I guess the win over Kansas isn't, doesn't mean as much as it as it did in years past but like they don't have a win over houston i mean they don't have a win over the number one team in the country they don't have a win over iowa state so they definitely benefited from that that this year but i mean now that we you know we can well so zay I, you, you could also look at it this way I'll, I'll go the glass half full here for a minute you wanted to win that game i mean obviously you wanted to win that tournament but i don't think anyone thought texas was going to beat four straight big 12 teams and go back to back in that tournament this year so I guess the bright side of it now is it didn't really affect your seed at all. You were pretty much, you had a chance to play your way onto a seven, but I think to get into a seven seed, they were going to have to win two games. So losing that one game, I think still, I mean, from what I've seen, it still keeps them in that eight, nine range. So the bright side would be you get to come back, reset a little bit more time to rest to Sue, probably still not a hundred percent. Now you get to get all of these guys a hundred percent feel like an asshole saying this, but like it's one, one less chance that a guy like Caden Shedrick has to get banged up in a game that doesn't matter for the NCAA tournament that much uh, or any other guy for that matter. So we look at it now and go, they're pretty healthy going in. They're going to be an eight or a nine and you can look ahead, get healthy practice um, and, you know, start going forward into, into selection Sunday. I mean, is that, is that crazy to, to think that it's just that easy to turn the page for this team. Cause to me, to me, it is like, you can be frustrated about last night, but all right. Like doesn't really affect the big dance that much for this team this year. Yeah, I agree. You know, I look at Jerry Palm and uh, Joe Lenardi on their bracketology, CBS sports and ESPN. And one of them, Joe Lenardi has them in that same group of UConn. And then the other one, Jerry Palm has them in that same group as Purdue. So is there, is there oh, one, is there a, a, maybe one or two of the one seeds that you would most like to avoid? Um, Purdue. Purdue, just because Zach Eady. No the answer. Size. Yeah, the size killed Texas. Like you have oh, but, but Dylan Mitchell's so improved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Uh, now, yeah. See, hour two, I'm turning into an asshole. Hey, man, that's what we need. Hey, that, that's what we need here. You know what I'm saying? Yo. Rodney Terry, he hasn't shown me any confidence in big men, opposing big men, I mean. Like, you go back to the Kansas game, that was probably the best big they played this year, Hunter Dickerson. And um, he didn't double-team Hunter Dickerson really at all. You know, he just left Dylan DeSue and Caden Shedrick out there on an island. And Hunter Dickerson, one of the easiest 20 points you're going to get. And Dewan Harris, he got off too. Their whole start at five went over double digits. But yeah, think about Zach Eady. Like, are you going to double team that dude? Like, that's what you have to do. 
but you haven't shown that yet, which might be a plus. And I know I'm thinking ahead. You still got to win that first matchup. We don't know who that's going to be, but that you just never know with this team at all of what you're going to get. And that's the most frustrating part. And yeah, the rest is the biggest thing right now. Like everybody get off your feet, take a few days off, you know, enjoy selection Sunday. You've done enough to get in. You don't have to stress or worry about that. And See if you can make a run, you know, see if you can make a run. But Rodney Terry, hot seat. Hey, it, it might be coming. It might be coming sooner than a lot of people think. Like you see just Horn's Twitter. You got a lot of people who are along for the ride and get the process. And you got a lot of folks that are just with an elite eight appearance. They think Texas is now the biggest basketball program with the Dukes, the Carolinas, UCLA's, Kansas of the world. You know, like I just, we know how this fan base could be. And look, I I want Roddy Terry to succeed for show, but when I see things like I saw last night, like you should go zone against Baylor. If they're calling all these fouls on you because you're playing too tight and they're going at you one-on-one, the only real shooter that you have to worry about was Tyler Perry. So find where he is, play that matchup zone a little bit more, or play a normal zone, whatever. you got to do a lot of communication and slow the game down and give them a different look because they're killing you when you're in man-to-man. They're going at Max A. Smith. They're going at IT Horton. They're going at Dylan Mitchell, which makes guys like Dylan DeSue and Kendall Weaver will have to overhelp and then that will leave their guys open. Like, you can't keep helping. At some point, somebody's going to get open on a team that has good ball movement and good guards that could get to the rim and penetrate. So how do you negate that? Go zone. But you have to practice it. You have to work on it. And Ronnie Terry, he does that weird matchup zone where it'll show zone, but then they'll go straight into man. Like, the first person will cut, and then that guy will cut with them, and then they go into, like, a man-to-man defense, which – you don't have to do that. Like, you don't have to. That guy that cuts, there's somebody on that other side of where he's cutting that you could say, hey, take that man. Let's bump everything over and rotate so we're matched up again. So that guy who was playing on the top, let's say it's Tyrese Hunter, doesn't have to follow the guy that just passed it that's cutting because we're in a zone. You guard your own zone. Like, slow down the pace, slow down the tempo. And it seems like Rodney Terry, which, hey, feel for the game. Even Steve Sarkeesian, who just got paid handsomely, he has tough trouble having a feel for the game at times. Like, some of the best coaches, you got to, you know, each game is different. Some of the best coaches have difficulty. So I'm not just trying to kill RT, but he has shown a lot of times this year of, man, you should have tweaked this here. You should have tweaked this there. And it allowed those leads that you had, like against Baylor, even if Dylan DeSue does get hurt, you were up 14, bro. You got to win that game in Waco. You got to win that thing. You know, they're going to make adjustments. Scott Drew's a good coach. Jerome Tang came from Scott Drew, who's a good coach. You know, like – you got to be ready to adapt and make those adjustments. And I think sometimes RT just gets so fixated on trying to stay the course. And, okay, they're making their run, but we got to keep doing what we did well in the first half. But that's not the case if they changed what they're doing in the second half opposed to what they did in the first half. You dig? Yeah, no, for sure. And I think you, you mentioned the big picture a little bit for this program moving forward. Of course, the feel going into the offseason will vary depending on, you know, how many games they win in the tournament or if they go one and done, or, you know, if they're able to if they're able to make the second weekend and you're you're kind of feeling even if they lose in the Sweet 16, you're sort of feeling like you did last year, even though you're going to lose a Smith and to But this offseason, man, I mean, is going to be like, I mean, arguably the biggest of, of his entire career. I mean, you could say last year, but even last year excuse me, they were riding the momentum of that elite eight of the feel good story that, you know, Rodney and the Texas team had become that year post Chris Beard and the fallout with all that. So you were still riding all that. And then, you know, the, you know, what hit the fan pretty quick when you lose Ron Holland and AJ Johnson and those guys, but now this off season and the good news for him is losing all those guys. Hey, you got the portal. 
but he's really going to have to show his chops in the portal. And I know he went out and got Weaver and he's been a nice piece, went out and got Ace Miss, even just though it was a one year deal. He's going to have to go out and do that again. He's going to have to show that, hey, likely without the momentum of what they did in the Elite Eight and the national notoriety and all the feel good, feel good vibes that were out there, that he can build this team, that he can sell guys in the portal, say, hey, come here and be our next star. Because as great as a lot of people think Trey Johnson's going to be, and I know they have Nick Cody coming in too, that's, those are two really good recruits. I'm always hesitant to rely too much in an offseason on, oh, yeah, well, they got that freshman coming in. Because yeah. we've seen so many times that those guys come in and aren't immediately what you think they're going to be and don't always have the impact. I think with guards, it's a little bit easier for them to come in and immediately have that impact and and be a potential star type player, be a guy that averages 15 points a game. We'll see if Trey Johnson can, can be that for Texas. But this is Rodney Terry's chance right here to show that, hey, I'm not just a bridge guy after we mentioned bridge guy with Kirk Cousins. You know, wow. now in this sense, it's his chance to show I'm not just going to, you know, a bridge guy for two to three years after the crazy shit show, for lack of a better phrase, that was the fallout with Chris Beard. You know, for him to say, I'm the guy that could be here for 10 years. I'm the guy that could be here for 15, 20 years. And I can build this thing to last year in and year out and even elevate Texas to, to being really in that category of a team that is a second weekend team every year or a final four team every couple of years. Cause obviously Texas has never been a perennial final four team. I mean, they have what three appearances in the modern era and none since 2003 and it's been 21 years. So huge off season for him and just a big picture, long-term trajectory of the program because he's going to have his chance. He's going to have to do it and have his work cut out for him, but he's got the chance to put his stamp on the team and show that in in this modern college basketball landscape that he can build a team that can turn it around quick, but also continue that momentum and and be able to win year in and year out, and then also you know show that it's 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 sustained success that that he is that guy. So we'll we'll see. I'm I'm fascinated to see what he does in the off season and then and how it turns out into next season. Yeah, well said, my man. Well said. You know, Barker. I think people get confused the different sports here at the University of Texas, because everybody ties so much into football. So when you look at football and what they bring to the table with the brand and the resources, boosters, alums, tradition, it's not the same as basketball. So I get people all the time on Twitter hit me up and like, oh, man, Rodney Terry with the resources at Texas. How is he not getting guys and stuff? Yo, if you're a true hooper that's a big historian of the game and, like, brought up, like, playing basket- basketball from, you know, Mighty Might size when you're in Pampers and stuff, you're not looking at Texas as that big basketball brand. It has been at times, TJ Ford era, you know, but even then, like TJ didn't have the NBA career that you could see where, oh, TJ Ford, look what he did in the league. That makes me want to go to Texas. Durant, he was only here for six months. So he is Texas basketball, but it's still different. They lost in the round of 32. Exactly. So it's a swaggy P. Right. You know, like, my, to my point, Michael Jordan is Michael Jordan. A lot of these hoopers wanted to go to North Carolina because Jordan did it. You know what I'm saying? A lot of these hoopers wanted to go to the Georgetowns of the world because Pat Ewan did it. And John, you know, John Thompson, et cetera. Like Texas has never had – Rick Barnes doesn't have that aura about him. Rick Barnes is still trying to prove himself. You know what I'm saying? So if I'm one of these big time players, I'm going to look at the Dukes first because of their tradition and history with basketball. It's hard to be second fiddle. Like these guys are out. I'm a top five player in the world. It's crazy that you got Kevin Durant. It's crazy that you got TJ Ford, even Dylan Mitchell, like these top guys. That's still pretty crazy to me because they were getting recruited by Calipari and Kentucky's. Like Durant said, yo, I wanted to go to North Carolina, but if it wasn't for my mama, 
hey, I would have went there, but I went to Texas because my mom trusted Rick Barnes. I, it's so different. Like to think that it's just easy for Ronnie Terry. And yes, he definitely has advantages over, you know, old Miss of the world compared to Chris Beard or South Carolina and stuff. But yo, man, you gotta, you gotta do some work still. You got to really recruit and find these guys that fit your system that might not be those five-star big-time players. Like one of the best things that Kelvin Sampson does, he'll go and just get tough-ass dudes to develop them. Like those bigs that he has, they're around like 6'8". Jawan Roberts is like 6'7". 6'7", at best. He's the toughest son of a B you're going to find in the nation. Come on, like just just grimy dudes. I don't even know if he was even rated coming out of high school. You probably find find that. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Probably pretty difficult to find. Are you looking for those guys? You know, like Zirik Oyema, he means well, but he ain't it. He he ain't it. It's been a really tough transition for him because I thought that he was going to be something coming out of UTEP. Like that that was a miss. IT Horton, as much as you're playing them, Unless if he goes crazy in the tournament and help leads the horn to a sweet sweet 16, he was a bust too. You know, are you going to the Africas of the of the world like Scott Drew is? Like Scott Drew, his whole front court African. All those dudes, I can't pronounce none of those dudes' name. Top and then he gets, the, and then he gets the occasional one and done, like Jacoby Walter to just throw in there with him. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and it works. You know, it works. So I, you know, you got to go get guys overseas, maybe. You got Doge Balbay on the roster, on the coaching staff. You know, he has European roots, obviously. Like, you just got to, you got to really grind. It's not as easy as you think it is. Like, yes, if you grow up in Texas and you can look past that, hey, man, you're going to get attention here because we're Texas. But you ain't going to get football attention. Be aware of that. It's all football here. Basketball, second. And a lot of people would say baseball, second. So it depends on how good you are because this team will lose. This fan base will lose interest real quick. You know what I'm saying? Like a big reason why they built the mood, as nice as it is, they know the fan base got to shrink that thing. The drum, way too big. You saw too many empty seats. Zay, yeah, can you, can you imagine this thing. year's team playing in the mood or playing in the Irwin Center? <laughs> I mean, the, the crowds in there would have been the same crowds that we saw for a lot of the Shaka Smart era. And you make a great point about Samson and these other coaches finding guys that truly fit what they do. Now, some of them, in Samson's case, you know, in some ways, like they they can recruit to UH, they can get a guy occasionally, but more often than not, they're they're doing that and recruiting to a fit like that out of necessity and then developing it because they're not going to get every five-star guy. But I think you know, we don't need to make this a whole, uh, you know, Shaka smart conversation, but I think that's what really got Shaka was he came to Texas, saw the big brand, saw some of those resources that are there that you can tap into at times, even if they're not going to help you get, you know, as many guys, five-star guys as a Kentucky, Kansas, North Carolina, Duke might get, but you know, you'll get a Mo Bamba here and there. But I think he just got those guys because he was like, I'm at Texas and this guy kind of wants to come here and I got to recruit this guy. And if he wants to come here, I got to take this guy. But it didn't necessarily fit into what made him successful and to what made his past team successful. And I think that's why we're all of a sudden seeing him have the success he's having at Marquette. Now, you know, he hasn't made another Final Four run or anything like that at Marquette, but it, it could be coming. It, it could happen one of these years. And in a lot of ways, it's because he's – back to recruiting to that fit into that style, still recruiting really talented players, but getting them to play to the style that he wants and finding those guys that, that fit that style. So I think that's what ultimately is going to make Rodney Terry successful is if he can find a similar, you know, a a way to do that similarly here at Texas. Yeah. And this, this team can still make a run, you know, um... I've been pretty optimistic about them this year, but I'm starting to get a little scared about the, lack of consistency throughout the entire season. Yeah. You know, I try to be as optimistic as possible, you know, especially being a fan, but with this job, you want to stay as objective as you can. And, you know, 
you look at everything that's happened. Like you get Dylan DeSue back really late. Like that, that's a tough transition. Like that, no, that's no. difficult because your everybody's role changes. Like it, Dylan DeSue is your best player. I was saying that early. A lot of people were like, yo, was, this team, they don't look too good without DeSue. Is he going to be that big of a difference? And I was like, uh, yeah, that dude is when healthy, he might be the best player, not only on the team, but in the conference. And that's why he was first team all Big 12 this year. He proved that. Not having all of that time to build up into the Big 12. He didn't have much time. Like that LSU game, you were playing Big 12 games like basically right after that. So when you get thrown in the fire and you do as well as Dylan DeSue does, like that shows a lot to how good he is. But as a whole, as a squad, if somebody, if you're Max Acemas, you go from being the number one option to the number two, you know, Tyrese Hunter, you going from being the number two option to the number three, like that's, that's a huge change. And plus they got to figure out, okay, what does Dylan DeSue like? Does he like the ball at this spot on the block? Where does he like it in the pick and pop? Can he catch a lob? If I drive in the lane and throw a bounce pass, will he catch it? Or maybe I need to lob it up so he can have time to gather himself. Like you're figuring those things out on the fly. And in the Big 12, nonetheless. <laughs> like, that's like oh, okay, there's one thing to figure it out on the fly playing Gonzaga, those teams that they have to play in the WCC. You're in the Big 12, the toughest conference. Like, that's difficult. That's difficult on your roster. That's difficult on the coaching staff because you're trying to mix and match to see what fits perfectly. Meanwhile, guys are going through slumps. You don't know how good Kendall Weaver is. You have to see, figure out how good he is. You realize IT Hortons can't give you much but you have to keep him engaged just because you know you're going to need him during this time of the year. Like so much goes into coaching a successful basketball team and Texas, they've had a ton of adversity this year and they've overcame a lot. It's just, again, when you go to the elite eight the previous year, now that's the expectation year in and year out. Now, okay. They got to the elite eight last year. They're going to be able to get back this year. They're going to be able to bring in those same type of guys. They're going to find a Serge Barry Rice. They're going to find a Marcus Carr and a Timmy Allen. And those guys are going to come in and fit just like they did in 2023, which and is not realistic. All those guys you just mentioned, Carr, Allen, well, Jabari was only there for one year, but really Carr and Allen and that core, people forget that they didn't go to the Elite Eight back-to-back -back years. They didn't go to the Elite Eight their first year. I mean, they went, what, 10 and 8 in conference play that first year with Chris Beard and then lost in the second round to Purdue. So that was not, you know, that was not a team that was just like throw them out there, give them a jersey, and, you know, they're going to go 13 and 5 in the Big 12 and win the league and then make the Final Four, make the Elite Eight. Like, it wasn't like that with that team. So, you know, it's different. And I know people are doing a lot of the comparing of Chris Beard in his first season versus Rodney Terry now, and it's pretty similar. Although I don't know if that's totally an app comparison because of the circumstances, but I, you know, hopefully people, I, I've been on a few rants on here about just how ridiculous some of the the things being said about Rodney Terry were. Um, I mean, he deserved criticism at, at points this season. He deserves criticism for, for yesterday to an extent, but this is a sport where at the end of the day, you do enough to get your team to gel at the right time, peak at the right time and you're defined by the success that you have in the NCAA tournament. If they go to the Sweet 16, honestly, even if they win a game and they're respectable against whatever one seed they're matched up against in the second round, no one's going to be like, and then you know what? When I'm going through this whole season, I can't believe he lost to Kansas State in the opening game of the Big 12 tournament. Like People are just going to forget that. Honestly, kind of just like how we forgot that they won the Big 12 tournament last year. I don't know. Maybe I can only speak for myself on that. When I was going back to put my sports cast together last night, I was like, before our six o'clock show, I was like, oh, yeah, shit, they won this thing last year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because it didn't really uh, matter. Like, maybe it helped the seed a little bit because they won it. But, you know, if they go make another Elite Eight run, then if, you're going to have different examples of teams that make it as far as they did and how successful they were in their conference tournament. It's yeah. just it's just not not the biggest deal uh, like like anything else. 
whether it's us talking about the football team, the way that we do week in and week out and, and really day in and day out, 365 days a year, it all comes down to how it looks. And that's what we've talked about a bunch today is why we're critical of the performance yesterday was because of how it looked. Now there's another side of that too, of you, you tip the cap a little bit to, to Tyler Perry and Jerome Tang's a good head coach, but like they shot the lights out of the ball at the end of the day. And there were some ref issues in there too. So, you know, it's, it's a interesting spot an interesting sport because at the end of it, like I said, it's going to come down to how, how many games they win in March and when they lose, how it looks. Cause even last year when they lost, it didn't look great at the end, but in that Miami game, you had the weird foul on Brock that I think everyone and their mom can all agree was BS, was just a total box out. And yeah, they got cold, but then they still had the if Dylan DeSue stays healthy. Yeah. You no, know, so it's just all how things play out. And it's it's kind of captain obvious to say it, but that's not how everybody ends up acting when it's all said and done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I get it. I get it. Cooter says, Zay, that ain't it. Issue with fans like me is they play lights out one game, and three days later they couldn't beat Southwest Middle Tennessee State Technical Institute for the play. Whoa, whoa. Well, they've got a squad. I don't, I don't know if you've seen them this year. They have a squad over there. <laughs> Yo, Cooter, I, I get it. Like I, I agree with you. Like, I want consistency too. I don't know what exactly you're saying that ain't it to what I've said today, but – Yo, I, me and Barker, we've spoke the truth today on this team and how disappointing it is to see just how inconsistent they are game in and game out, right? When you see them thriving against teams like Oklahoma, you see them struggling yesterday versus a really good or really desperate, excuse me, desperate Kansas team that looks good at times, you know, but I... <clears throat> I don't know. We'll see. Selection Sunday. You got any – who's your favorite right now? If your bracket came out and you would have to – not looking at any of the matchups, obviously, because they're not out, but the team that you like that you see hoisting up the natty, who is that for you right now? I really like UConn, but it's so hard to go back-to-back. Yeah. I mean, in that in the, in the format of, you know, the chaos of March Madness, single elimination, you have to win six games to do it. It's It's tough to do. I, I really like them. I mean, I've got to see it from Purdue. Like they're, they're one of those teams where I'm, I would have every, and I have no reason this year to think that they're not going to make a deep run, but from putting them deep in my bracket quite a few years and being burned by that, I've got a little bit of scar tissue with them. Houston. Similarly, I know they made the sweet 16 last year, but I struggle a little bit with teams that just, Everything about their identity is defense. And I know they have shed, but like they had Sasser in years past and sometimes lacked for offense in the biggest moments. And, you know, you, you run up against the team that, that gets really hot and can crack the code on your defense a little bit. And I, I worry if they have the ability to, you know, get in a shootout with some of these teams. So yeah, I would say between the, of the one seeds, I probably trust UConn and Houston the most and then another sneaky team that I think will be about a three seed, Kentucky, playing really well right now. Yeah. Yeah, Kentucky, I like Rob Dillinger, and I like uh, I'm, Reed I'm Shepard. blanking on the, uh, the freshman's name, Shepard, right? Shepard, yeah, man. He could ball. Calipari, they could do some things. But, yeah, I agree. UConn, they just – Tristan Newton, what doesn't he do? I mean, he leads them in three statistical categories, points, rebounds, and assists. Like, that's a do-it-all player, and he was their point guard last year. When you're 6'6 and have vision like him and just great ball handling, they're tough. And Cam Spencer, and you got clinging down low. Like, the horn saw him. You know, you didn't have Dylan DeSue, but UConn, Dan Hurley, and those guys. Yeah, it's hard to win back to back. Last time we saw that was Billy Donovan and one of my favorite teams, Joe Kim Noah and Al Horford and Corey Brewer. That Florida Gators 06 07 squad. God, they were so good. But that's been a long time. Like, I was a teenager, man. Like, I was a teenager watching Cinemax porn, you know, at the crib. Like, that's. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like, that was a long time ago. Oh, I didn't know what that channel was. Yo, what is this? 
Oh my gosh, what's going on here? Hey, it was softcore. It was softcore. Hey, uh, softcore. Zay, uh, come on, got some class there. Tennessee, Tennessee is a projected one seed right now. On a scale of one to ten, your level of trust in Rick Barnes to take one seed Tennessee to the final four is what? Five. Okay. Five. Yeah. That's high for you, right? That that's high. I thought that was high. Yeah, but, but I mean Dal- Dalton Connect, I mean, having a guy having a guy like that where he can bail you out with instant offense is a must in the NCAA tournament. And this is probably the first time since Barnes has been at Tennessee where he's had a guy like that. Yeah, true. And I love his game, man. Like, he's a volume shooter. Sometimes, you know, to get 30 points, he might need 25 shots. But I want him shooting the ball, you know, the way that he could stretch the floor, the way that he uses his body. You know, he looks way bigger than 6'6". Like, he plays like he's 6'9", and he's way more athletic than people give him credit for. And you're right, Barnes, straight up, I might be going on a limb here. That's the third best player that Barnes has ever had after TJ and KD. Wow. Like, I, somebody go down the list. I don't Marcus? know who that person would be. I mean, I different, different. That team was PJ, T, uh, PJ Tucker's squad on that those LaMarcus teams, you know? Yeah, like PJ was the best player, even though Lamarcus had the most like upside on being a borderline Hall of Famer that he is now. I thought that PJ Tucker was the key to those squads that went far in the, the mid 2000s and stuff. But yeah, Rick Barnes, third best player that you've had, bro. You better do something with it, you know. And Sakai Ziegler. Muscovy, like they got good guards. It's just that Rick Barnes March vibe. Like those guys, they play so hard defensively all year long, which again, you have to play defense. That, and that's that's kind of what I'm saying about Houston too that worries me a little bit. Yeah. When so much of the identity is just we're going to hold everybody to 50. No one's going to score 60 on us. Yeah. Like that just worries me a little bit in the tournament. And we don't – with Houston specifically, going back to them, I mean, how much Jamal Shedd did you watch when he was in high school? Uh, quite a bit, quite a bit. Like, did you I ever? Remember. Did you ever anticipate this? No, no. I, I mean, just didn't. even just you know the offensive player that he's turned into. No, I didn't because one of my good buddies, Antoine Thompson, Stony Point head oh, yeah. coach. Yeah, which shout out to Antoine, great guy, hell of a year going to the state championship, getting runner up, losing to Plano East. But he coached Jamal Shedd when he was playing AAU. And Antoine, he's gonna promote his guys in like any way. So I would always see clips on Jamal Shedd and he Antoine always promote, like, hey, watch this guy. Like, this guy's going to be something special. And he wasn't getting recruited very much. But then, you like, you hear him dropping 50 against teams like Aikens and stuff like that, which I don't care who you play. I don't care the school. It's 50. 50 points is 50. Especially like, in a high school game with no shot clock. You're right. <laughs> yeah, no shot clock. 32 minutes total. Like, that's tough. So, the dude, you always saw the potential in him. And then you would hear, like, how in his AAU days, he would guard the center on the opposing team and hold his own and then some. Like, that's how you knew he just had that dog in him. And, yeah, Kelvin Sampson, he saw it early. I mean, I don't know if right out of high school he would have been a Big 12 caliber player because, remember, Houston didn't come from the Big 12. They were in the AAC. But – that dude, what he's done, the development, getting better every year. He wasn't a shooter like this a few years ago. You know, his ability to stretch the floor and knock down that outside shot, that's why I really believe in them. And I get what you're saying on the defense thing. Like, yeah, Marcus you know, Sasser and Quentin Grimes, like those two guys can really go. But I think the shooting with Sharp and Cryer and just Jamal Shedd, who's the best point guard in the nation to me. Like, I like Tyler Kolick, Tristan Newton. I, he's a point guard, but he's also 6'6". So, we gotta, you know, we got to draw the line somewhere. Like, what's really a point guard nowadays? Is Luka a point guard? You know what I'm saying? Is Steph Curry a point guard? He shoots the ball like a two. Like, are, you, are you being heightist right now? I'm just – there's this positionless – it's a positionless game. Jamal Shedd is an OG point guard. Going back to just – 
classic guys like Mateen Cleaves and the Bobby Hurleys and just some of the best point guards you saw hoist the national you, championship trophy. He's one of those. If you dropped me in no context, but like I knew a little bit about basketball and I didn't know where Shed was from, anything about his backstory, you showed me some game tape of him, I'd be like, oh, yeah, that's a New York City point guard. <laughs> yeah. Like the Hell attitude, yeah. the swagger, the way he plays, a little undersized, but – but plays big. Yeah, I, I I love his game, man. Every time I, I watched him, I was at both those games. And I just every time he did something, I was like, I can't Texas get a guy like this. Like, yeah. Especially it, it's even more frustrating when they come from Austin. And I get that you can't recruit them all. I do, especially in basketball. I get that. But when you're like, even a guy like Dylan DeSue didn't start his career here. KJ yeah. Adams is playing a huge role for Kansas. He's from Westlake. Now, yeah. I don't know all of KJ's, you know, I, I don't know, totally know how he grew up. I don't know if he was a diehard Longhorn, if like that was in his family or maybe it was more of a Baker situation. But for, you know, KJ Adams at Kansas, Jamal Shedd come, coming out of Maynard, now at UH. DeSue plays two years at Vanderbilt before Beard, you know, pulls him out of the portal and he plays three years here. You're just like, man. Yeah, and, and, hey. they, and this is no this is no no offense to Greg Brown because sometimes it's, that's the way it goes. Where almost what I said about Shaka too, you know, to come back to that, where it's like, oh, I feel like I have to recruit this guy, right? And we're like, lucky this guy. He's a five star from Vandegrift, and he wants to come here. And his dad and his uncle both have ties here and are big names. Like that's you can't it. not recruit that guy. That's so I, it. you know, I, I respectfully understand the, you know, things that maybe I don't want to say Shaka had going against him. Because you're like you're getting a five star prospect, but mm. but man, yeah, you look at those three other guys, and it's like, well, those dudes all ended up being way better college basketball players. Yeah, and KJ Adams just said, you know what, I want to go to a big time basketball school. I don't think he had any family ties. I think it was just, hey, what's going to be my best opportunity to win a national championship, which he's done, and maybe play a professional career in the association, Kansas. It's Kansas every time, like. I wish Texas could get there, but come on now. The dude, yeah. the creator of basketball is literally a Kansas alum, James Naismith. If like, I'm, come if on. I'm, if I'm coaching at Texas and, you know, KJ Adams comes to me and says, hey, coach, you know, I made my decision. It was between it was between you and Coach Self in Kansas, and I, I think I'm going to be a Jayhawk. I'm going to be disappointed. I'm going to shake his hand and be like, you know what? I understand. Best yeah. of luck. We yeah. wish we could have had you. You know, if yeah. you change hey, this, this is no tampering. But if you change your mind, hit the portal, and we got a spot for you. <laughs> yeah, you always got to say this is no tampering. Yeah, that's <laughs> no tampering. Okay, wait, hold on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna record this. I am not tampering. If you decide to leave Kansas, should something happen, we would love to have you here. Oh man, well, I am the not tampering. Words in sports, tampering. I am legal <laughs> tampering, just like the NFL. <laughs> oh man, I am, Mark, I am legal cheating. <laughs> Like, is there a bigger oxymoron than legal tampering than that phrase? Yeah. Like, one of the, my favorites is guys still getting money under the table now with NIL. Like, you're yeah. still hearing the word under the table. And I'm like, what? Why are we? What are we doing? This doesn't well, I also make... love how much we're hearing over the table. Oh, it's all yeah. over the table now. I'm like, but don't we just call that a legal business deal? Like, isn't that just a deal? <laughs> <laughs> over the table. Oh, man. Oh, man. We're wrapping it up today. Chip is out. Jeff Barker, CBS Austin, is with me today. It's been a blast. Got to shout out those sponsors. Relax the back. Top Gun Rental and Law Equipment. Big Hat Spirits. Cover 3. Ollie Pop. Apple Leasing. Woods. Air Conditioning and Plumbing. Bet US. Brain Vault. 7-Eleven. Syntex Tickets. Audiovisual consultation, shout out to Tom, Salt Traders, Coastal Cooking, All Stat Brewery, and Covert B Cave. We've been doing it for over a hundred years in the greater Austin area. The Covert crew, they will get you right. And look, I know a lot of people for spring break, man, you're going out of town, you're traveling. Look, don't let your car stop you from going to your I don't know, just destination of, I don't even know the word for it. Don't just, don't just let it, don't, don't be stopped by just a beat up vehicle. That shouldn't stop you from going to where you need to go. Enjoy that vacation. Enjoy life. You shouldn't be stressed. 
Covert Bee Cave will take care of you. They will provide you with a high quality selection of new and pre owned vehicles. Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram are the seven brands that they have. CovertBeeCave.com. You'll see all the latest specials and in inventory. Well, and you know, you don't have to just show up to the lot being surprised. Go online, check out what you want, find it. Nobody beats a covert deal. Not now, not ever. All right, Jeff. I got the right call segment this last two minutes. You should know me by now. I'm a really petty guy. You know, it, it's a gift and a curse. You know, I tell the people all the time, we need more haters in the world to a certain extent. We don't need the haters to where the environment's toxic, but we just, you know, we're, we're people keeping it real. We're keeping it real. You know, sometimes you need to be told, Jermaine Dupree, that those socks that you won in the Super Bowl, you shouldn't have worn them. That's okay. There's nothing to justify it now. I know you, you know, told us it was Louis V, whatever. Still, those socks, and eh, that was a miss, dog. So that just happens. But the right call today, I want to hear your thoughts on this. So Jalen Green, Houston Rockets guard, is all over social media right now because his new baby mama and girlfriend, current girlfriend, Drea Michelle is pregnant, and the problem is people don't like the age difference. Drea Michelle, 39, grown, seen the world, been through some stuff. Jalen Green, 22, young, still trying to figure things out. I don't even think he's gotten that second contract yet. Maybe he has. I don't know. But either way, people don't like it. People are using the word grooming which is very ridiculous because Jalen Green, you're a grown ass man. I remember when I was 22, I was trying to see what these Cougars were talking about. You know what I'm saying? Like I, the, we all were, that's all fantasy American pies, my joint Stifler's mom, all of them. I'm like that, <laughs> yo, as, <laughs> once I got them. You're, 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 talk, you're talking Cougars and, and not, not a recruiting visit to UH. Hey man, that's what I'm saying. Like, Hey, Purr on me if you want to, baby. That's what I'm about. So I can't not Jalen Green because old girl's fine. 39 years old, she's fine. She got her own. It's not like she's not successful. She's one of the basketball watch. She was on that show because she has another baby daddy who you're probably familiar with, Orlando Scandrick. You remember him, cornerback mm -hmm. Dallas Cowboys? Yes. That was her. That was her first big relationship with, which got her to that. Hollywood celebrity athlete wife status. So again, I, I have no problem with it. If you're Jalen Green, you know what you got yourself into, bro. Like you want you you wanted this. And again, as I've said a lot on this show today, and I will continue to say, I love love. So if he loves this woman. And she loves him, whether she's 39 or not. He's a grown man. She might like him young, obviously. Why are we hating on old Jalen Green? You know what I'm saying? Or her, or Drea Michelle. Like, she obviously has a type. That type makes a lot of money. That type's usually very athletic. Okay. Jalen Green could have backed off. He didn't have to. There's a whole bunch of women in this world that are single, that would probably love what Jalen Green brings to the table. But he chose her. And now they're having a child together? Come on, now. We wrong for thinking that this is some trap-type grooming situation. Especially when you got Leonardo DiCaprio doing the same type oh, of shit. You stole, you stole mine. I was, literally yeah. about to, I was literally about to say, we don't have a problem when Leo does it. Leo's my dude. We we celebrate Leo for that. Oh, she got too old for him, you know. And then next thing you know, hey, you know what? Maybe this will work out. Maybe it won't. Maybe Jalen Green will age out of a uh, old Drea system here, and maybe she'll be on to the next one. And and you know what? Hopefully, they can be great co-parents together. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, man. And then what's even worse? Because you know she's always had a fond for the athlete. Gilbert Arenas and Swaggy P, Nick Young, who kicked out the Longhorns in that round of 32 game back in the day with Kevin Durant and them, they go on a little podcast together or FaceTime each other to where it's put out, streamed it. I don't know what these kids do nowadays. They went on talking about 
former experiences with Dre and Michelle in the most uncut way possible, which is completely against the code. And Patrick Beverly and Devin Booker, they went out on social media and said, yo, Gilbert, Swaggy P, y'all two are wrong. Y'all two are wrong for putting her business out there and trying to embarrass like Jalen Green because, hey, okay, maybe she had a relationship with Gilbert Arenas, but we're adults, man. Keep that to yourself. There's certain things that you don't need to put out there for clicks and all that bait stuff. Gilbert Arenas was wrong for that. And Swaggy P, wrong for putting that woman's business out, knowing that that's Jalen Green's not just baby mama, but woman. Yeah, that's that's wrong in any situation. And then the circumstances now around that they're about to have a child together, that makes it even worse. <laughs> oh, they I mean, there's like I've, I've never been I've never been in the NBA, but I mean bro code's bro code. Bro code, that's it. That, that's what Devin Booker said. Devin Booker is like, yo, Swaggy P, Gilbert, y'all supposed to be the OGs. Y'all supposed to be y'all, y'all gee, y'all bro, it's bro code out here. Like you might not have a relationship. With Jalen Green, that's fine. You didn't play with him. You don't know anybody that knows him. That's fine. But that, that's man code. Don't disrespect another man's woman when you've been with her. I don't care what happened. Like, have enough pride and class to, okay, you were the past. You were the past for a reason. Keep that in the past. There's no need to embarrass anybody or say something out of, you know, out of pocket like they did. I was, man, that's cold-blooded. <laughs> that's cold. That's Bad cold blood right there. So, uh, shit, man. yeah, you hate to see that. Barker, what we got on the schedule coming up, man? What's the world world of CBS going on? Spurs in town this week. That's right. Yeah, we got a uh, got, got the Spurs in town for a game playing the NBA champion at the Moody Center tomorrow. So, looking forward to that. I'll be I'll be out there for that game. Uh, one of my favorite things, well, I act like it's happened a lot, but the Spurs were were here last year, and I've never really covered the NBA. I mean, all the markets that I've worked in have been, you know, big-time college markets. My first market was Jackson, Mississippi, so that was a lot of SEC. You know, so similar, not on the scale of a, a blue blood program like UT, but, you know, getting to cover the SEC and going to those different stadiums and all that, but getting to cover the NBA for a couple of days while they're here. I love the morning shoot-around, the access that they give you to that. So yeah. I'll be there tomorrow for the shoot around. They they don't open up the whole thing, but you get to watch the last five, 10 minutes of it. And then they make a couple guys available for interviews. And then just how much like access you get with the pro teams. Pop will, Pop will talk before the game. Wow. Tomorrow. And I think they do that for every game. So that's that's pretty cool. So I'll be uh yeah, I'll be covering that. And then obviously selection Sunday, big time. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, I excited to see where uh where both both teams end up. See if the UT women, depending on what happens with the rest of conference championship week, uh, or maybe if all that's already settled, see where they get, you know, one seed, two seed, probably a two seed. And then, like we said, probably an eight or nine seed for the men's team. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to um, Spurs in a second. But as far as the women go in their seeding, you don't think they could jump to a number one with Stanford losing the Pac-12 championship? I don't know what I saw yesterday when I last looked was that they were still a projected two. I think they're probably would be the top two, mm-hmm. okay. but, but maybe they would, you know, do them a solid. And I still saw they had USC as a one. Oh, so, wow. Hey, that, that elite eight matchup, a potential Juju Watkins, Madison Booker, elite eight matchup for a trip to the final four. That would actually be doing Texas a solid. If they're going to keep them as a two, putting them right there against SC um, I mean, from just a pure interest in media story standpoint, I'd like yeah. to see them, if they're going to be a two, be on the Caitlin Clark, Iowa side of the bracket Yo, for that, for that potential matchup. Yo, that potential Shea Hawley Garden Juju Watkins matchup, that's popcorn type shit. Like that, <laughs> that, that's for real. That's... Everybody better be buckled in, ready to check some out. You know, if you see that type of matchup, because Shea Holly ain't no punk. She's one of the best defenders that I've seen, men or women. And Juju Watkins, she'll give you fifty in the heartbeat. Yeah, so, but she'll give. See, but what I like about Madison Booker over Juju Watkins is Madison Booker will score efficiently and run the point in you know kind of the truest, more traditional way. I mean, she shoots a decent amount. 
Dude, Juju Watkins is getting 50 points on 900 shots. Yeah. Yeah, so, Juju has more. No, it'll be, yeah, it'll be fun to watch her go at Shea Holly and, and, you know, shoot 100 times a game. Yeah, Juju has more of a Kobe feel, while Madison Booker has more of a Durant feel on the efficiency and that mid-range game and stuff. But let's bring on the fellas. What's up? Hey, guys, how are y'all? Man? Whoa. Kevin Dunn, what up? I'm not doing as well as Trey. It looks like. What's going on, buddy? <laughs> are you in a boys? pedicab now, Trey? No, I'm sitting on a uh, city bench, as a matter of fact, right outside of Kruger's, the uh, longtime jeweler on Congress Avenue. Man. That, was, that, that and Scarborough's were the only places down there in the 80s, man. It's like yep. working down there. It was crazy, all, all the stuff now. Yeah, yeah, even some of the older buildings that have been different things in that time are starting to get torn down now, yep. which on the one hand is a little bit sad, but on the other hand, they were old-ass, decrepit buildings, so something new yeah. didn't happen to them. Agreed. Trey, South-, South by Southwest experience. Seems like you're getting the most of it, man. Hanging out with Gary Clark Jr. and stuff. You're stunting on us. Dude, that was surreal. To, to have to have him actually give me like individual love during the show and then into the microphone at the end of the show say, hey, you coming to hang out afterwards? I was just like, well, it's two in the morning and Justine and I could probably fall asleep right here over this railing, but yeah. Yeah, we will go hang out. Thanks for asking. Uh, uh, so yeah, no, South, South by is crazy, dude. There's there's some bad that always ends up happening in terms of disappointment or just fucked up shit. Like, my computer has been broken all week. That is a horrible thing for my day-to-day life. But uh, even with something like that, the, uh, the good far outweighs it in terms of the kick-ass conversations that have been had and just some of those random freaking moments. Like, Frank Oz. Do you guys know who Frank Oz is? Mm-hmm. Mm-mm. He was uh, one of the voices of the Muppets, I believe. He's done a bunch of voices over the years. I believe he was Yoda. And uh, now he does more in the way of like straight filmmaking. Well, I had tried to get him for an interview prior to this week getting going because he was taking part in a panel discussion with uh, Robert Smigel and Judd Apatow on how to direct comedies. I talked to a lot of comedians, there's a natural connection there, but no, it was always a possibility. It's actually the most likely possibility. Well, so he he ultimately did say no to me, but last weekend, um, as I was leaving a red carpet, I saw Frank and what must have been his grandson or something, and they were trying to get into the theater as guests of the filmmakers, but the uh, the hardcore security people at the Zach Theater, which look, they're just doing their job, are like, no, we can't let anybody else in right now. So I just walk up and I said, guys, this is Frank fucking Oz here. I realize he's not going to throw his name around, but y'all need to recognize this guy is brilliant. He has entertained you countless times over the years. Please let this man in to go to the bathroom. And they did. So, yeah. Uh, wow. It's like, yeah. So, uh, I, I got to give a, for Frank Oz, huh? <laughs> I got to I got to give a fist bump to Frank Oz and uh, help help him use the bathroom. Look, the guy's in his like 70s or 80s. He's got a uh, he's got a bladder that isn't quite as uh, doesn't hold it as well as some of us, you know? Yeah. I've never known his name when I pulled him up on Google. I know exactly who he no. is. Yeah, yeah, no, know. He's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's hard to rattle the credits off because he, he was he was a voice only for so long. But, yeah, he, he's a badass. Yeah. He is a badass. Just like a Robert Smigel, who everybody may not recognize, but like for Kevin and me, and as you guys, was long, for, you know, fans of longtime comedy, I mean, Robert, Robert Smigel is so responsible for the laughs that that uh, that were being created for me in the 1990s and beyond. Conan O'Brien, Saturday Night Live. So to get to talk about the art of comedy with him, to see him sort of anguished as this guy who uh, leans a certain way politically, so you can't take as many comedic chances necessarily, but he's also the guy who does Triumph the Insult comic dog. So, I mean, he's talking about just shitting on people with a, a, a dog <laughs> puppet on his hands. Yeah, that's my type of shit, man. Well, yeah. Barker, it's been real. Appreciate you, Trey, KD. Y'all have a great show. Y'all be cool. Yes, that was a blast. I'll see you guys later, boys. What up, dude? This is great on a park bench, dude. I wonder, do we have an over under for how many uh, people are going to come up to you and, and uh, ask for money? Um, so you know, we can set the over under on that and I'm only going to be on for an hour because I've got the Civil War red carpet to get to behind me just after four o'clock and this is the movie that I've wanted to uh, check out the most 
get to go to the IMAX for the first time at the Bob Bullock Museum after I cover the red carpet. I'm excited about that. But uh, so that I say all of that to tell you that in an hour, the over under that I'm going with is probably seven Hello. and a half. We're already at two. <coughs> we're already at two. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say if we're at nothing, I was going to set it at three and a half. So three and oh, we're, we're going to blow past that within the first 15 minutes of the show. Okay. Um, but they have to ask for money. They just can't just come up to you. It's got to be. Okay. The, the guy in the, the motorized wheelchair with the guitar strapped to its back did only ask me for a lighter. Now, I had okay, 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 I'll take that. Ask for anything. I hypoth. Okay, okay. Because I hypothesized that a lighter would have turned into, hey, you got a couple of bucks while you're at it? Right. Uh, is it is it too windy? Can you hear uh, too much yeah. wind right now? No, it's good. Okay. It's okay, uh, good. it's it's net sound, as they would say. There we go. It's like a windy day on the golf course. Yeah. Well, how's today been, man? You've been uh, covering a bunch of stuff. So first off, we we're gonna have to get into the story from last night. I this is amazing. Or two nights ago. Or is it last? No, it was last night. Wow, what a funny day that was. Uh, yeah, we can talk about that in a little bit. The day itself has been good so far. Um, trying to think what I covered early. Oh, I just covered the very first thing, which is the Bon Jovi documentary. And I uh, got to ask John Bon Jovi my one uh, dad joke question. So he, uh, he snuffed it out about halfway through, so credit to him for having the, uh, the wit to understand where I was going with it. Are you going to um, keep that one for the show, or are you going to uh, let us know what that is? Oh, if you want to know what it is, I'm happy to tell you right now. Yeah, bring it. The, que well, the question was, so let me let me set this up. I did not have a camera person today, so I'm out down here doing all this shit myself. And in the past when I've done that, like the UT student crew, there's usually several people hanging out because they're just they're trying to go through the experience of covering this shit. So yeah. I'll, I'll find a UT kid and I'll be like, hey, can I Venmo you uh, a little bit of money to run the camera? And they almost always say yes. And so... Uh, this girl was standing with the UT group and none of them got on the red carpet. I'm like, hey, will one of y'all please run this camera? It's a pain in the ass. I never get the shot right. And so she's like, yeah, I will. So she comes on, she starts like setting the camera up. I'm like, what would you ask these guys? Because I only have my one stupid question, dude. Like I'm, I'm a good enough interviewer at this point that I can, I can wing it for the most part, although sometimes I fail miserably at that too for whatever it's worth. But like, I have no problem winging it and asking something very general and then taking that initial answer and turning it into something else. Well, I asked her what she would ask and she had clearly put, I don't know, a month's worth of thought into the questions that she would ask John Bon Jovi and his band, talking about how important they were for her family and for her and how it's his bonding experience. I'm like, hold on a second. I'm like, would you like to do this interview? Like, I just need the audio. I don't necessarily need my voice it's on it. She's like, she's like, really? I'm like, yeah, I've, I'm like, I've had like, like dreams in terms of the types of people that I get to talk to and fuck with. Like that, that's been realized over and over again over the years. I'm like, yeah, I'll mess with the camera. I'll try and figure the camera thing out and you do that. So she got to do that. The one exception though was with Bon Jovi when they brought him over, they said one question for everybody. And so I jumped in as the camera guy with my one question. Yeah, I know how to be an assertive asshole when I need to. And uh, the question that I ask him is, so John, it's safe to say at this point that you're more than halfway there. Are you still living on a prayer? And so when I gave when I gave that pause, he just starts slapping me on the chest, and he's like, he starts shaking his head, and and, and when I, when I get it out, he gives like a little chuckle. He's like, yeah, I definitely am. So That's I, I gotta funny. I gotta give him credit on that because most of the time I, I completely catch people off guard with that random wacky stupidity. I love it. How how short is he? He was not as short as I thought he would be. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For whatever it's worth, John Oates yesterday, shorter than I thought he would be. I don't know if the mustache added, the mustache adds six inches. Oof, gotta be careful how you say that. But uh, yeah, no, I, John, John Oates is a little bit shorter than I thought. Not, not necessarily stereotyping the guy one way or the other, just saying that's the observation that I made. All right, all right. Got it. So, so Hall must be really small, because he looks smaller than the notes. Oh, if, really? From what I remember, at least, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think I've, other than album covers, I don't know if I've ever seen those guys stand side by side with one another. 
Yeah, and that's probably what I'm thinking about. So they could have been positioned differently, especially with the album covers back then. But, um, but how's your day been? Been good, just just plowing through. I mean, nothing, you know, nothing great, nothing bad. So just um, just working, man. Um, home now and got Houston was up on TCU sixteen nothing. TCU got their first bucket with ten twenty four to go in the first half. Jesus. And I'll tell you what, though, I mean, considering that it's 31-15 at the half, DCU, you know, Jamie Dixon's probably probably okay with that. So it's been pretty much even since they uh, scored their first points. Yeah, yeah, you're right. No, it, it has been. Um, then I've got the uh, the players <laughs> on, too, so. Um, how much golf Players championship? Watch? Who's? Uh, I, I don't watch a ton. Are you starting to get into golf now, which would probably benefit your job? I mean, I uh, know. Not playing, no. I mean, I, I'm going to a little bit. I'm, you know, I'm gonna make that move. I wanted to get my my hip and foot fixed first before yeah. I even go down that road. You know. Yeah, you want to talk about getting the hip right before you get into golf? That'll throw right. it out of whack real fast. And um, but I've been watching. I've been watching majors for I don't know, consistently for the last probably five to ten years. It's cool. Um, I mean, like really watching them and not just watching on on Sundays. So um Scheffler's an easy guy to root for, man. I, I I love speed. He could be a frustrating guy to watch, even though you're a fan, just because of how deliberate it's just agonizing at times. And that's weird. Golf's such a weird sport, man. It looked like speed was gonna be the next huge thing and just came out of the gates. Like a, it seems like a lot of people do came out of the gates fucking flying and then it just not bad, but he's not what he's not on the trajectory he was, which is like Hall of Fame. Well, I think it's a great thing to think about as we try to crown the next great whoever, whatever. And my favorite example, and I will fucking bring this shit up till the end of time, is how many Texas fans were calling Tom Herman the next Nick Saban. Yeah. And I'm like, hold your fucking horses, guys. Does this yeah. look like it could be a good hire? Yes. This guy's got a lot of growing that's going to have to happen on the job, too. Unfortunately, that did not happen. But golf seems to be more guilty of making that Tiger comparison than maybe any other sport with their grades. And I know that hockey tries to go there with Wayne Gretzky a little bit, and so there's only one MJ. I mean, it, you know, a guy's got to put a body of work together before he even gets considered to be in the same category as MJ. And in all cases, they do fall at least a little bit short. Kobe should we get into Alonzo Ball and Ben Simmons and that whole league, or just should we not even waste our time on that? Yeah, uh, I, I don't know. There, there's a certain histrionics in basketball that I, I don't take too seriously. But like golf, like they're very serious. Like, holy shit, this could be the next Tiger Woods or the next Jack Nicholas. And it's just like those guys do have that potential. It takes such an insane work ethic and mentality and killer instinct and not a word, but like assholeism to be able to accomplish that, which is why Tiger yeah. Woods was able to do so. Now, Jack was maybe a little bit more gracious as he was going through achieving his level of greatness, but he was also a colossal shit talker on the course too. If you anybody, hear anybody talk about playing with him back in the day, especially professionally, or uh, I'm assuming for money, I don't have any, any substantive evidence that he would play golf for money, but he is a golfer and he was really fucking good at it too. So I'm guessing he stole somebody's money from time to time. Um, and uh, yeah, Jordan Spieth is a great golfer, but I don't blame him for not being the next Tiger Woods because guess what he's gotten to do? He's gotten to enjoy the fruits of his labor a little bit more than Tiger Woods ever did during his heyday. Yeah, you're right about that. It's a really good point. And I also created a bunch of courses after that too. Um, a bunch so, of what? A bunch of courses. I mean, he you know he ended up making money with golf after that. Uh, Jack Nicklaus, you're saying, yeah. 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 Uh, well, actually, you know, a lot of those guys. So, yeah, watching that should be a uh, – it's not a great weekend for sports for me, but it's a pretty good college baseball weekend in the top 25. Texas should steamroll Washington. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I will end up watching some college basketball tournaments too. You said Texas should steamroll Washington. Is that who they play? Yeah, pretty sure they got Washington this week. Okay. So Washington, let me make sure. Um, no, they're, they're <clears throat> excuse me, they're, they're a schedule over the um, next week and a half, you know, next nine games is um, they should really, really do some damage, which I, yeah, I mean, 
it's not going to necessarily change anything. I was tell, talking with BK at his Washington, and they have Air Force Tuesday and Wednesday, um, that they are um, – they can maybe build some confidence, maybe try and just see what pieces they have in the back end to help out. Um, I, I'm never going to be bullish on this team because of the pitching, but, um, right. but they, they should, I mean, the, the real, real disconcerting thing would be is if they don't play well, or if they don't go nine and one, eight and two and, and pound some of these teams. Yeah. Such a catch twenty two, right? If they do, it's like ah, it's not that big of a deal, other than getting, keeping going in a general positive direction. But if they slip, which is bound to happen in baseball, it's the most unpredictable of the major sports, correct? Yeah. yeah. Because it is a game of inches, then yeah, you start to uh, start to head in the other direction. So hopefully, hopefully they take care of business like they need to, and at least win uh, two or three of these weekend series. Yeah, you can't guide the ball in baseball. You know, on offense, yeah, you you by definition guide it in football and basketball. Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about it like that before. Yeah, I mean that. It, you know, you can go over four and hit four fucking laser beams right at people, and you can go three for four and and three hits were weren't struck well. Yeah. Uh, what's on your mind today, man? Uh, Texas basketball suffering that first round defeat yesterday which i know it sucks and it's frustrating because you want to see as much positive momentum going into the tournament as possible for a team that has been quite streaky at times this year in part because they have such a hard time finding that third guy but the refs kind of fucking you in the process is a little bit frustrating but i look at this as a a small victory for texas believe it or not because dylan the needs to rest that knee and that body a little bit because if they're not going to get the healthiest version of him come next Thursday or Friday when they play that first round game it nothing else really matters all that much I guess a guard can get hot or the guards together Ace Miss and Tyrese Hunter can get hot not holding my breath on the ladder but if Dylan DeSue isn't totally right then uh, you uh, should get ready for a first round exit yeah I mean I, I can see them be- they're probably, you know, they may lose the first game, but they're probably going to win a game and lose a game. That's what they've done all year. And I, I, we we touched, we hit on that pretty early on in the season that this is just going to be, you know. I think that's a realistic ce- um, ceiling for them, making it to the round of 32. And if they make it to the Sweet 16, credit to them because not a lot of us expected that to happen. What do we got going on over there? Um... Oh, he's just trying to get a buddy's attention, so he decided to blow the siren, which startled people walking by. God, man, I, I had a dime for every time I heard that downtown. <laughs> Congress is crazy, though. I mean that. Like, I, I remember in the 80s <clears throat> going down it like on a Saturday, and it was just desolate. There was nothing there. Nothing there. Yeah. Um, so that is one of the cool things about Austin. I remember as a kid thinking, God, I wish we had a downtown, you know, um, and we, we have one now. I mean, some good and bad, but we have one. Downtown is interesting because Congress in the evenings is still somewhat sparse, depending on what's happening at the Paramount. But you don't have to go very far off of Congress in either direction to start finding shit. Right. So it is it is cool that uh, downtown goes in different directions, too, because like back when you and I were in college in the late 90s and early 2000s it was then what was called 6th street now it's called 36th and then the warehouse district and a little bit down west 6th street not a whole lot not nearly what it has become now but downtown in 2024 i mean shit dude if you're south of you're south of 7th there's something going on in either direction. If you go far enough east, you can get to that Red River District, which has become uh, quite douchey over the years. Sad to see it. it used to have a lot more character than it does now. So yeah, there are a, a bunch of different options for different types of people. And there are a lot of fucking tourists who choose to take advantage of it from, let's call it February through May or June, and then it picks, it, picks back up again in the fall, September through November. 
Yeah, I wish they would do all that stuff in the summer. Less people would come and, and we're all stuck inside anyway. It's true. Force but, everybody to, to labor through the heat. It, it would convince less people to move here. Right. And it, it, more that, because I am happy for the, for the businesses, you know, um, to, like we talked about with Padre yesterday. I mean, Austin's different than that. But I mean, it, they, a lot of these people that are working, I mean, this is a great time for them to, to make some money, you know, especially when it's slow, maybe other times. Yeah. <laughs> You're not buying that, are you? Uh, I mean, I, there's the city's weird, man, because there's there's good products and you talk to people talk to people that are offering like a good service in terms of food or they've got a really cool business and they just what what makes money and what does well versus what doesn't like it's still so unpredictable yeah that if we can find uh if we can find more ways to sucker people into the city when the rest of us aren't out and about nearly as much i'm all for that yeah so what do you got tonight Tonight the is civil, the Civil War. The bullet? Civil War, yeah. This uh, the the filmmaker's name is Alex Garland, who wrote and directed this. He is the guy who is re responsible for Ex Machina. He wrote Twenty Eight Days Later, which is a really cool zombie flick. I know you're not a big horror fan, and yeah. this is maybe a little bit gory for you, but it's a really this is a good version of horror. Most horror is laughable. It's like so cheesy, you just can't help but to laugh at the absurdity of it all. This one is actually well. Hell, there was a, a whole there was a whole genre built off that fact. The laughability of horrors. Yeah, I mean, where they started just doing spoofs on it, you know, and the Wayans brothers and all them. Scary movie, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. But uh, so anyhow, he wrote Twenty Eight Days Later, which is an awesome script directed Ex Machina, it's a cool movie, and a couple of other good ones too. Well, his new movie, Civil War, is about the U.S. going to civil war in the not too distant future. Yeah, that, As, that would be interesting. Yeah, he, he does, he, he did a really good job with Ex Machina, of just being a couple years ahead of the whole uh, AI robotics thing and the abilities for, uh, for computers to gain a sort of sentience and then uh, eventually gaining a control over humans, spoiler alert. So I'm curious to see what he does with Civil War because as you and I see and talk about regularly, uh, people are at serious odds with one another, at least at the extremes, and it uh, creates fractures amongst us all. Yep, no, it's way too divided, man. We need to uh, find some common ground. I think you and I try and do that. With Definitely with each other, but other people. Um, hey, couple, I, I, this is kind of, this is totally out of left field, but with your, with my dad's background in Chicago and your background in Chicago. Drink. Drink, drink. You said your Gatorade or water? Your Gatorade. Um, DePaul is hiring the former Ohio State coach. And. Um, Bad motto? No, 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 I know. No. As I said that, um, Holtman, you were probably already out by the time. <laughs> Why, yeah, I don't I know, know yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, uh, Theo Holtman. Okay. No, it's not, it's not Theo. <laughs> but I knew I, I, knew I, I could say Dude, I totally I could say believe anything. That. I did believe it, as a matter of fact. So, DePaul, certainly in the 70s, and then even in the 80s with us, like definitely in the 70s, DePaul was a great fucking basketball school man yeah and and it made sense i mean if the same way houston is really damn good at basketball and should be like you don't need that many guys and you were in such a loaded area you know all the chicago guys started taking off and going to other places is there like what's the thought on them there is that ever going to get back to do, doing anything because i like where it's at i like where DePaul's at as a school so it's near Wrigleyville, right? This is a tough one. Yeah, it's in Lakeview, so it's just south of Wrigleyville. This this is tough because DePaul, I don't know how much you can connect these two things, but DePaul, DePaul has become, I hate this word, dude, I know you do too, but a very woke place to be. Okay. And when your school starts going in that direction, it's a lot like somebody who used to be funny who starts become, becoming very much an ideologue. It's like you have a hard time being really funny after that. When you start to take that tilt, Stop paying you money for value athletics significantly less, exactly. Got it. And so it becomes less uh, less enjoyable place 
for people to be. Now you are still in Chicago proper, so the potential to turn it around there is significant. Maybe there are some people with DePaul behind the scenes that are like, think like you, like this is bullshit. We have a hotbed right here. Every year, some of the top players in the entire country are coming out and not just leaving Chicago, leaving the state of Illinois. No, they're going to fucking Duke. They're going yeah. to everywhere. Talked to Evan Turner last week. He was a Chicago guy. He came out the year Derrick Rose did. He ended up at Ohio State. Yeah, can you imagine if you just got those two guys if you're Illinois or, or DePaul? Yeah, fucking Derrick Rose went to Memphis that year. I know Memphis was <laughs> I know Memphis was playing the game, DePaul. Memphis was playing they the game. Were. You could have played the game too, and now you can legally. So the, the the potential is there, but I just wonder where the school's priorities are. And I love that comparison to Houston though. Because Houston's doing it right right now. That's a great call by you. Yeah. Yeah, Samson's done a hell of a job, man. And they've been smart, too. You know, the, easily the two best basketball programs in Texas are, are Houston and Baylor, and I would say have been for a little while. Um, and one thing they've both done is they get some grown-ass men in a boys' sport right now. Yeah. You know, or at least boys, the ones that do come to college and are kids that we used to would have seen develop physically develop and their game develop and like kevin durant i mean think about it. kevin durant got pushed around that year i mean he was phenomenal and yep. amazing and could score but they were physically he wasn't there yet which was totally understandable but both those programs do a good job of developing guys uh baylor i know has redshirted some guys yeah. and they obviously have good systems but man houston houston looks like grown-ass men playing defense yeah they do have that feel about them I mean, modern college basketball, they would get their ass kicked because they're not, they're not big enough. But, um, but for for what for college basketball now, like they're they're grown men, and, and you know, I, I hope they win it all. I'm sure Texas fans won't want to hear that, but you know, Houston should have won it in, in the '80s, one of those years. And I, you know, I usually, almost always in my life, root against Texas teams because it'll hurt Texas. But Texas has their own own shit to do basketball in terms of building a roster yeah texas basketball is not going to fall below that expectation because houston is winning championships right there's enough good players to go around and you're fucking texas you have the resources to compete it's just about getting the right pieces in place and that's one of the big questions with this team right now is can rodney terry be that guy yeah um i don't know um yeah so so what Talk about defense, um, and yeah, there were there was some. There was one one play in particular. I'm thinking there was a huge turnaround where Texas may have been up by one or down by one, and it looked to be a foul. And it was either I think it was Tyrese Hunter who was in the lane, and they didn't call it and called a foul on the other end. I think and one, and, and then and then a lot of that too is K State just shoot the shit out of it. Texas not playing good defense, man. So one thing you knew with Beard and I guess Barnes too is that they, they were they were gonna beat up. Yeah, Texas has some problems down low and they get to a point where they start trying to rotate too much and it just leaves wide open lanes for guys to drive to the bucket or to roll off of a pick and roll. And you'd like to think that, that Dylan Mitchell could be really good at stopping that. But speaking of guys who probably aren't strong enough yet, to be that much of a force at the college level, much less making that jump to the NBA. Dylan Mitchell, for all the athleticism, not only are there focus issues, but there's just basic strength issues too. Mm -hmm. um, well, I looked at that Rodgers thing a little bit that you talked about. That was, um, so now, now that, he's that, getting- that, that was a gimmick. We can all agree on that, right? Oh, I mean, it's not, it's not gonna happen, but he's getting questions now because, you know, media's, either taking it serious or don't want to report on stuff they probably should be reporting on um probably the latter yeah but so he was he was into the whole sandy hook conspiracy i don't know was he that's what i read i guess i guess he had comments about it so they were asking him about it but um yeah hey i did want to get to this story i sent it to you so this is crazy comes from new orleans and in the New Orleans Police Department headquarters. Apparently, they're claiming that rats got into confiscated marijuana um, 
and that I guess the whole place is infested with cockroaches and rats. That's what they say. So police superintendent and Kirkpatrick um, said, I want you to see the tray of all the roaches, major rodents on the floor, the cockroaches, the rats eating our marijuana. They're all high. I saw the audio too, man. I was slapping my ass off, dude. Are you, are you buying this shit at all? Fuck yeah, I am. Never change New Orleans. Never, ever change. Are you, well, what are you buying, though? Are you buying that the rats actually did this or that this is an excuse for shit that they took and either sold or, or, or did themselves? Oh, wow. Okay. It is New Orleans. It is New Orleans again, okay. getting back to your okay. point. Okay, maybe a little bit of both, yes. Yeah, never, probably a little bit of both. It never probably gave them a good excuse. Oh, yeah, exactly. They're like, holy shit. We yeah, can, we can, we can account for this now. There's rats in this room. Yeah. But it just came off, especially with New Orleans and, and that whole, I mean, New Orleans is like Chicago. You want to talk about two corrupt cities, man, at every fucking level. Oh, you God. know, like it Terrible. wouldn't shock me at all. What What are the most corrupt cities in this country? There's a good power ranking for you. Most corrupt cities in America. Hmm. Uh, Miami's on that list. Is she train count? Super no. fuck. <laughs> I didn't know if they're America yet. <laughs> they're a sister country. Um, let's see. San Francisco is on that list, obviously. San Francisco now, yeah. And, and the funny thing about San Francisco, it started, you know, that was a pretty tough town when it first started with the 49ers going oh, yeah. over there. And I mean, it was, you know, it was a little bit more rough and tumble. Clearly, that's changed a lot. But yeah, it would have to be, I mean, Chicago and New Orleans would be, you know, and obviously, it's impossible to not put New York on there. New York's on that list. Yeah, Miami's on the list. Yeah, the, the shame of San Francisco, and you know this because you know people from both, is like people from San Francisco, generally speaking, tend to be at least a little bit cooler than people who are from L.A. Oh, I totally agree with that. Yeah. I mean, I but my, my bar for L.A. is so damn low. I mean, it, even, it the, is. even the cool people in L.A. are people that – it's. We, we just don't like LA was never going to work for me. First time I got there, I thought I fucking hate this place. Um, yeah. And there's the surfing, yeah. there's food, there's stuff that you think I would like. You just stuck me in Manhattan Beach for a week. I'd be okay. But just, just what they value in life compared to what I value in life are polar opposite. Having visited LA a couple of times, I've always said that LA is best enjoyed on the peripherals. Don't go, don't go into the heart of that bullshit because you're just going to find yourself annoyed at best, if not something much worse. But yeah, San Francisco used to be a cool place, but it's the politicians. It's not the locals. It's the politicians that have fucked it up royally. Yeah, definitely right about that. You know, I was going to take the under, and I think I would have been right about that, man. Yeah, no, there, there yeah. hasn't been a single person since those first two, which was when all four of us were on, and one of them was a guy in a motorized wheelchair who wanted a lighter so that that was really it's only at one right now because he didn't have a chance to ask me that second question did he want to borrow the lighter or wanted you to give him a lighter he wanted me to help him light a uh, half smoked cigarette i wish i had a lighter yeah if i was, if I was near my car i would have gone and gotten it for him but i'm not so i didn't uh, Cowboys signed Eric Kendricks. Does that do anything for you? It, it feels like they've been very quiet outside of this um, in in free agency. It is a positive move for them because they need to shore up the middle of that defense, the middle front and center of that defense because the right. run defense was such a disaster last year and a big reason why they didn't fulfill those expectations, uh, Super Bowl run expectations. So, yeah, getting a guy that Mike Zimmer is familiar with is important. Is he on the backside of his career at this point? I think that's a fair question. Wasn't as productive with the Chargers as he was with the Vikings. Can his old coach help get him going again? They still need to put a lot of focus on the interior defensive front and then some of those inside linebackers in the upcoming draft next month, especially because they really didn't do more. They signed, they re-signed a deep snapper, let Tony Pollard go, and signs an interior linebacker who may or may not be over the hill. Yeah, and then they – did they acquire A.J. Dillon? I didn't see if that actually went through or not. Oh, I had not seen that just yet. Oh, boy, I don't know about him. I don't know. I liked A.J. Dillon a few years ago. I just wonder if he's, if he's, uh, if he's a little bit ground down now. 
even though he's a, a physical freak, of course, something something off with him last year. So that this may be the be beginning of end for for him, who obviously plays a position that uh, fizzles out pretty quickly. Apparently, he's uh, eyeing a deal with Cowboys, Giants, or the Colts. Um, Cowboys, Giants, or Colts. Okay. Yeah, but they're going to have to pick up a running back clearly, uh, either via free agency or in the draft um, or UDFA. And, you know, if I could bet it in Vegas right now, I would bet that I would go and I'd see what the odds were, obviously, but I'd bet that there's not a running back take until the third round. Wow. And that may be Jonathan Brooks, too, when one is taken. It, it definitely could be. Um, there, there are a couple guys that, that I'm – that I'm super fired up about in terms of where you could probably get them. But, you know, it, it's just, I just don't see, I just don't see, I can see Brooks going in the late second round, but they're going to be as devalued this year as, as they have been, you know, in a long time. And obviously it's been, it's been heading that direction. If Brooks had stayed healthy, he would have been the first running back taken, and it likely would have been in the second round. But because he's coming off that knee injury, he might be the first running back taken, and it's probably going to be the third round, which speaks to the point that you just made about this uh, this being a devalued running back class. Yeah, no, they. Um, I saw, I think it was Kuiper, saying that he felt like if Brooks would have stayed healthy, that he could have been a late first rounder, um, but definitely would have been a second rounder. Um, hmm. So I, I think there's going to be value there. I'm trying to think of who else I really like. Man, I I love Trey Benson, and he, he can catch the ball. He's got good explosion. Um, I like Corm. I'm not sure I would go there. Um, funny enough, Estime is is someone too uh, who people are probably higher on than I am, and I watched him a lot at Notre Dame. Yeah. Um, he's just a you know he's a bigger back. But he's one of those guys that um, I mean, I, I the board for me would be Brooks and Benson, and I may even put Benson ahead of Brooks. I think it depends on kind of what you're looking for, mm -hmm. and I like Jonathan a lot, and I think he's gonna be a good pro. But I think Benson could be really damn good. I'm trying to think of who else? Uh, what do you think Will Shipley's potential is? Apparently, we're at a four four, which isn't shocking. Four 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 uh, at his at his, at his combine, the Clemson combine. Um, I think it can be good. I mean, kind of a third down back, but I, I was never as high on Shipley as some people were. Yeah, it's funny because he was the one playmaker for that team last year, and teams were able to focus on him, so it was a little bit of an underwhelming season for him. But yeah. It was for that whole entire program. Marshawn Lloyd's going to be great value from USC late in this draft. Ray Davis could be. Um, the guy I really like is Jalen Wright. And people are kind of all over with him, but I don't. I think is it ESPN. I think ESPN likes him a little bit more than some of the other than like PFF. But I like Wright a lot. Wright is. I, I, it wouldn't shock me if it, like if Jalen Wright or Trey Benson are the first running backs. It's not going to shock. Me. I, and I think that'll be late second, early third round. But you never know. I mean, that's the beauty of this, man. People go on runs, and and it's it's cool once it happens, and all of a sudden. A lot of things can be thrown out the window. Yeah. I, I do I do think, you know, we, we've seen a lot of projections and it made sense for the Raiders to take Byron Murphy. I think that's probably out the window now. Why is that? Because they got Christian Wilkins. But that could open up mm -hmm. now Miami taking him five or six picks late. Um I'm I'm you know, I I think but you know that's a funny thing. Free agency is kind of the last thing that we have that really feels like bakes the cake. For, for people with information. Yeah, there's some pro day stuff maybe at the school, but this is where you know, you, this is where you've, you've got all the all the info you want on these guys, and you also know exactly what needs are for teams at this point. I still think that there's a chance Byron Murphy sneaks into the top 10. I don't know with whom, but I think there's a chance. Yeah. I, it, I wouldn't bet on it, but yeah, there, there's definitely a chance and a hell of a lot better chance than there was, um, you know, obviously five months ago. Hey, you asked me about receivers the other day yeah. and, we're, you know, guys that talk about value guys, like we're just talking about with, with, um, 
the running backs. Sure. A guy who's going to be available later in this draft and could be a day three guy, but could be a fourth rounder too. And is a guy that, that we, we recruited um, when I was at Morgan and just a great fucking kid, man. He, he was awesome. I don't, I don't think we ended up signing him. I think they were still working on that when I left. Um, but it's Jalen McMillan from Washington. Oh, yeah. So there's so much talk about Polk and obviously, number one, Adunze. Uh, Adunze but yeah. McMillan was a little injured this year. Otherwise, I think he'd be getting he'd be going higher. But all of his measurables are there. He's a great route runner. Uh, like I said, he's a really good young man. and But he can fucking play, man. And, and – Big time vert goes up and, and high points of football, but like I said, a very good route runner. That that was, I felt like all the Washington guys were pro route runners, you know, and with pro schemes too. Pro schemes and a pro arm throwing the ball. Yep. To the air. Man, that is that has been funny. You know, I have no idea where that guy goes, but I know you and I have talked about it. Talk about moving up to get someone. Someone's going to move up early, whether that's early in the second round to get him or whether that's late in the first. Someone's going to move up and make that move. It, it's just too valuable of a position, and he showed too much if the main thing is just to keep him upright. Yeah, it feels like teams are potentially going to reach for McCarthy and Penix at this point. I'll be fascinated to watch the trajectories of each of those guys with wherever they end up. Yeah, there's some talks, yeah, of, McCarthy I know and I... there's some talks of McCarthy being a top-five pick now. Yeah, I, I don't get it. Um, you know, these guys do this for a living, so um, I'm sure that they're seeing something that, that we don't. But Hold on do a second. Know. Hold on. Well, well, well. I was waiting for this, man. Yeah. It's, we actually it's been, haven't had that many. It's been pretty devoid of sirens for much of the week. Not, not bullshitting you either. Like, I haven't heard a ton of those, but for whatever reason, we just got two back-to-back. So where's that, where's that shut, where's that shut down from? I mean, last year I had to go to a couple of events, but I didn't go in like a lot of people didn't go into the office because it's such a pain in the ass. Oh yeah, no. This if this is if you are actually working this week, this is a pure week from a uh, work from home week. Although it is fun that you have little traffic to deal with getting in in the morning, and you can actually still get to your garage and whatnot. It's just a little bit chaotic when you step out for lunch or something. But uh, no, it's shut down from it's shut down on Congress directly in front of the Paramount. So from Seventh to Eighth Street, it's shut down, and it creates more for some of the bigger red carpets. The barrier that you see behind me, the white yellow barrier. There are people that'll line up and scream at the celebrities to uh, to wave to them and things like that. And then there's the then there's the, the caliber of human being, Kevin, that really goes to pathetic lengths to try and get autographs on posters or albums or cardboard kids, cutouts. Kids or are, kids are like adults. No, 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 no. Kids would be... Totally fine. Okay. Kids are okay. Okay. Full, full-fledged adults. And I'm just going to put this out there. I'm going to say it. And then if I somebody tries to force me to apologize later on, I'll defend this viewpoint. There are some colossal fucking losers out here begging people for violence. I mean, and it's like it's not just like screaming bloody mur like screaming their name at the top of your lungs, yeah. like you're like you're fucking drowning in a lake to try and get that person's attention. It's literally screaming it out loud like you're a fucking bird making a call on a tree when somebody gets out on the other side of a car that you don't even see. Cage! 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 Shut the fuck up. That's not even who you're trying to scream for, you loser. Get these autographs? I'm sure it's worth okay money. Is this really how you make a living? You feel good about yourself? Do you feel better about oh. yourself than somebody who writes parking tickets for a living? Because I hope you feel worse. You should feel worse. Here's, here's a question. Do you think they're do you think they're bigger losers if they're doing it for money? Because that I kind of get. Um, hey, if you're hard off, you know. Um, or if if they're like 42 and and they really want someone's autograph. Cool. Great question. 
Because I was a big, I was a big autograph guy as a kid, man. Um, big autograph guy, and then you know, like a lot of things. I don't know when I grew out of it, but well, like I, I probably a be, lot of shit. Thirteen, fourteen. So there are people that collect autographs that we know that are adults who I like a whole lot. So trust me when I say this to you individually. You're immune from this. But trying to decide between somebody who's getting autographs from other adults for a living versus somebody who's just doing it because they enjoy it is kind of like asking uh, who is worse, somebody who is a pedophile or somebody who just kidnaps and murders children. <laughs> You're feeling it today, man. We're going to get you on Congress, dude. Maybe, maybe a contact high. Well, it's a good thing you didn't exaggerate there, right? No. I love when people always say that. Be like, well, that's quite an exaggeration. Yeah, that, that's... That's was, the fucking point. Right. I'm not, not, not being real serious here. I, I, I'm saying things tongue-in-cheek. Yes, it's for effect. I'm doing it for entertainment value. I'm doing it to make you, you people laugh. All right, so, so give us the Gary Clark Jr. story. So I asked you yesterday, and I said, I know that, you know, I've, I've, I've seen Gary a couple times out with you, and Gary legitimately liked you. And I was like, you know, well, what's that, you know, how, how tight are y'all still? And I didn't know this happened. I didn't find out until, until the very beginning here. My response to you has always been, we run into one another randomly over time and it's not always me like going up and hassling him that's not my style by the way like i've seen him over the years and sometimes he slapped me on the shoulder i'm like holy shit, what's up and sometimes it's like us just like running into one another and catching up for a second but have you ever asked for his autograph <laughs> yes but i sold it for five hundred dollars <laughs> 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 Uh, but uh, so last night, Justine and I, we turn a, turned into a bit of a date night. Go grab dinner at Birdie's beforehand over on the east side. Cool little wine bar. Uh, really small menu, small plates, shared plates, a couple of entrees, this minute steak that was really good. Also this um, snapper that was solid. Said good Birdies? sweet potato croquettes. Yeah, it's a, it's a wine bar is how they advertise themselves with some, I'd say they do some uh, some french technique type stuff pretty well uh so that was really good that was our second time to eat there and then uh, afterwards we go to the show at emo's it's gary clark jr with a couple people opening before him and it is in promotion of his new album that's coming out next month well i like whether we're talking about gary clark or a comedy show or something else like i like to sit close to the stage i just like to be able to see the detail of what's happening to go along with whatever it is that you're listening to, if it's music or comedy or something like that. And so we get there early. We get there more than an hour early and end up pretty pretty close to the front of the line. And so when they finally let the line in at Emo's, we're, we're right there at the stage. We're right there where the barrier separates the space where photographers annoy people for the first couple of songs of the set. Um, and then it's the stage. And so the, the band is on the stage, obviously. So we waited out get through the first two acts, which were both really good. And then Gary and his band come on stage and they start things off and they do really well. And about four or five songs in, he's just like walking the very front of the stage, just looking people at the front of the stage. And we're pretty close to dead center. And so he walks from one side and he's getting to the middle. He and I just lock eyes and he goes, oh, he's like, oh shit. And he's like leans over and like gives me a five and then like a fist bump. So, so, I'm so like, is this right. in between songs or when he was starting? This is like the band is kind of like doing a like a really light jam, and he's just like walking around, checking out the crowd, like pumping cool. people up. And so he gives the the slap and the bump, and then he starts into one of the few older songs that he played last night, which is called "Our Love." It's a beautiful song in studio, but what he does with it live now is it's just this beautiful love song and. Uh, after he gets through the chorus a second time, he takes to the guitar, and it's probably the best guitar work that he's doing within any individual song right now. Well, and so yeah, that's, that's a song. big, that's a big fucking statement. dude. I'm, I, I've seen it twice now, and I, I would have, uh, if I were to talk with him about it and ask him about it, I bet he would back it up too. But um, he, uh, so, so they start playing that song, and then he 
at one point he like shouts out, great seeing everybody out there, some familiar faces out there tonight. What's up, Trey? Great seeing some new faces too. And so he like says my name like in the middle of what is my favorite Gary Clark song. And then he yeah, goes, it was Justine like, flooded. Tear, tears into it. She was like, I can't. She was like, I can't. That's my man. Happening. That's my man. She's like, I can't believe what's happening right now. I, I, <laughs> I hate. I hate. I hate telling this story. Except I'm still so on cloud nine from all of this. Yeah, dude, don't hate. So like, cool. you know, people that you know, if you have stories to tell, and the other person, the you know, the the, the receiver, um, thinks you're being braggadocious, like fucking grow up or go create some stories for your own asshole. That's a fair point. And this is like a once in a lifetime thing too, which is why I'm All right, that's still, enough. Still, so, still so unbelievable. But uh, he gets to the end of the show and at the end of the show, they don't do an encore or anything because this show, the doors opened at 9.30, which we thought the show started at 9.30. So me and Justine, two fucking old timers who are normally in bed asleep by 10 or 11 o'clock at the absolute latest. You said 9.30? 9.30 is when the doors open. First band goes on at 10. This Second is band pathetic, goes, but I, I've gone to sleep at 9 30 three times this week. Yeah. Second band goes on at 11. Gary and them don't go on until like just after 12 o'clock. And they end up ending at 1 30. They don't even do an encore or anything. So at the end of the last song, he's like intro introducing the band. And he's like, and I'm Gary Clark Jr. Thank y'all so much for coming out. And with the mic still on, he looks at me. He's like, y'all going to come hang out afterwards? And I'm like, I just like put my hands up. I'm like, yeah, probably am if you're if you're putting the invite out there. So uh, so the crowd starts to clear out as they walk off stage. And I'm like, I'm laughing with Justine. She's like, are we, are we gonna try and go back there? Like I could tell she's tired. I'm like, look, I know you're tired right now. I appreciate you being a gamer here. Like, yeah, we're not. This this is not. This is uh, something once in a lifetime. This doesn't fucking happen. So yeah. Gary's a cool fucking dude. I want to go chat with him for a few minutes. I'm like, the prob guy, I'm like, the problem is, is that he says this as he's walking off stage. There's like a barrier to get to the backstage part and fucking security. I'm like, I'm going to walk up to these security people and I'm going to tell them this story. And they're going to be like, yeah, fucking right. Asshole. Yeah. Get out of here. Yeah. So I walk up to the security guy. I'm like, look, this is going to sound like bullshit. I understand that straight away. So if you're going to send me on my way, so be it. I'm like, Gary just like, Gary and I know one another, and he just invited me backstage at the end of the show. And he looked at me suspiciously for a second. He's like, "Oh yeah, I actually did hear that." And I saw him, I saw him kind of messing with you during the show too. He's like, "All right, hold on a second. So it's like 10 or 15 minutes. The place is completely cleared out. They make us go sit, stand someplace like far away from the uh, the backstage entrance at a certain point. And then the security guard who was helping me initially just walks off and leaves. So I'm like, "Fuck it, we're gonna go." We're gonna go over to that door and try this one more time before we go. And at that point, somebody else intercepts me and is like, hey, are you this person? I'm like, yeah. She's like, we can't get confirmation from Gary because they're all back in the, uh, back in the, uh, it's not really a green room, the greenhouse or whatever it is that they call it. So I'm just gonna walk you back there. We're gonna try and check with somebody. I'm like, all right, thanks. So we go back there and sure enough- Did you say just, greenhouse? Yeah, because it's not, it's not a room. It's like this, what used to be an office space, I'm guessing, but now it's kind of a quasi house setup where it's chill. It's got like couches and a little kitchenette area. Um, and so we end up going in there and getting to, to talk with Gary's dad and Eric Zapata, who's his lead guitarist, and Gary himself. I'd never introduced Justine to Gary before, even though we crossed paths briefly one time when she was with me. It was... Uh, it was fleeting because it was getting on a flight. So got to catch up with him and see how, how the family was doing and uh, just share some, some old memories and laughs. It was it was a fucking blast, dude. It was dude, a crazy that, end. That, that is awesome. It was a crazy end to what is a, a, just an unbelievable musical day for me, dude. I got to talk to John Oates for 45 minutes. That was a good conversation. Bootsy Collins, that crazy motherfucker for like 10 to 15 minutes. And then to end the night with not just a good concert, but uh, getting to catch up with uh, talking about David Anderson yesterday. Gary is one of the good ones. Yeah, he's one of those guys who is still he's, he's still this this humble dude all these years later. It's really really cool to get to catch up with them. That is a fantastic story. Um, Gary just continues to elevate in in my book, and um, I'm super happy for you, man. I mean that you know I, I can tell it's it's cool when when we get to see you 
be on cloud nine because you know it, it it takes a little and which i what i love about you you know you're not an easy lay um but but i can tell like you're beaming right now it's it's hard to experience awe as we get older in life but still it's just something you and i have talked about before kevin i feel like bk you and i have talked about it too it's important to still seek those things out but it becomes harder because you just become so much more accustomed to the world and not nearly as much surprise as you so i think that's one of like deep down that's one of the reasons why south by i like south by southwest is because of the unpredictable nature of things and just how just random and fucking surprising and magical and sometimes frustrating shit is this time of year so now it's time to Maybe try and make that happen one once more with the uh, Civil War red carpet here in a few minutes. Yeah. Which side are you on, the Union or the Confederacy? So that's one of the questions that I have. Not Union or com Confederacy. I'm a. Uh, can I just go west? Because the <laughs> West was still inhabitable. You're a can big I, states' rights guy, I heard. <laughs> I am. Uh, I. That's a tricky one because I do think that uh, states having the ability to decide certain things themselves is important for regionality. Not crazy about the slavery bit though. I think the slavery bit was one that was uh, a little bit uh, a little bit difficult for a lot of the uh, states' rights states to uh, swallow long term. Mm. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna try. I don't know. Okay, can I can I move to the uh, to the uh, to the peninsula? Go down to the the Cabo Peninsula. All the civil war is going on is that a possibility yeah they got cabo bobs down there i'm sure yeah great burritos down there great burritos. trey are you gonna hang out for a minute so i can make one call sure if not bk can run some ads what time is 802 yeah i've got i've got a uh, i've got time 402 is what i meant i see 802 <laughs> on a counter if it's I, 802, I have no... none of us should be here right now I have no fucking clock right now dude doing this show on the phone it's a means to an end right now it is yeah. It's frustrating because there's like I am truly just talking. So I apologize if I've been more of a rambling mess than usual this week. But this is how I have to try and fucking do it. I don't get to look at stats or stories or anything. So it's all off the top of the head. Where is your phone? I mean, it's steady. Where do you have it set right now? Um, it is on the tripod that I normally use for the camera that I use for the shot at home. Okay. So yeah, I decided to stop holding this fucking thing in my hands, which was obviously not good, and just have it on a tripod on the ground. And I'm just sitting on a city bench here across the street from the Paramount. Got you. I don't even know what Civil War is. I've heard you reference it like three or four times this week. Is that a movie that's coming out? It is a movie coming out. You're not a movie guy, so you may not get these references. So Alex Garland is the writer and director he is the guy who wrote 28 Days Later. Are you, are you familiar with that one? No, but I know the city that he created near Dallas. 28 Days Later? No, Garland. Oh. Not the well same done. guy. Eh, averagely done, but I thanks. Feel, I, I feel like it's a real shame that you're going to die alone sans kids because you, you've got some really good dad jokes queued up most times. Hey, that's why you've got kids. I get to say them to yours, so thank you very much. Stay away from my kids. <laughs> hey, I don't have to stash now, okay? We're, <laughs> we're good until November. November I will. The other 11 months, fair game. Yeah, so the other movie that Alex Garland did more recently that people are probably more familiar with is Ex Machina. Have you seen that one? No, but I've heard of that, and I know what that one is. So for you and me as two people who are all over the humans versus robots bit, he came out with this movie back in, like, 2015 or 2016 that was about uh, an AI-powered robot gaining sentience, essentially, and realizing that a human was, was doing it wrong. And... Spoiler alert, eventually uh, one-up one upping the human, killing said human, and going out into the real world as a sentient AI-powered robot. So it's a really fucking cool flick, and I can't wait to see what he does with Civil War, because this is set in, like, not-too-distant future time. So what causes it? How are things split up? I don't know. We'll, uh, we'll find out these things soon enough, because I actually get to go to my first IMAX movie tonight as well. Yeah, I heard you mentioning that uh, with Kevin. That's pretty cool. I mean, I, I went to that theater like in middle school on a field trip from Dallas. 
Oh, that's really? Pro that's probably the last time I, I've been inside that museum, but definitely inside the theater of that museum. That's a badass field trip. Holy shit, we just went to the, uh, well, not just, we went to the Holocaust Museum and then Spaghetti Warehouse, which I felt like was a, not the best choice of lunches after you're going to the Holocaust Museum. Fucking place that serves a bunch of spaghetti. Yeah. Gross, guys. It's a weird bit there. All the but red yeah. sauce, too. I'm telling you, it was a straight, in retrospect, it was a very strange choice by them. But did y'all stay in, stay in Austin overnight? Yeah, I think we did. Yeah, okay. we took buses okay. from Dallas, and I think it was like over a weekend, maybe just a night over a weekend. And gotcha. It was Texas, it was seventh grade Texas history, so that was the bit, right? Going to the Bob Bullock Texas History Museum, doing that. And then I'm sure we did some other shit in Austin, but that was sort of the, the main part of the trip. And I, I don't even know what movie we saw. It was probably like a Texas history movie. It wasn't a real movie like you're going to see. So it, it wasn't too memorable, but it looks badass and everyone raves about it. So I've been told that for IMAX movies, you're supposed to sit in the back of the theater because the now, screen is essentially above you. So you're giant. leaning back. Yeah, it's giant. I mean, you never like I never want to sit at the front of the theater anyways, but yeah, yeah. it's a bigger screen that like goes lower. So it, it, it's even harder to see if you're at the front of this one. So yeah, it's as close to the back as you can. It's probably the, the right move, but everybody else knows to do that either. So good luck. Well, guys, I just uh, accidentally killed a ladybug. So I guess that's my cue to get out of here. Oh, man, never do that. Well, I was yeah. trying to I was trying to pick it up to show it to you guys, and it, I crushed it in my hands like yeah. Linian of mice and men. Congratulations! That would have been, that, <laughs> that, been that that would have been a fun trip for her, Trey. So you can show off the lady buggies, right? You know, imagine someone picking you up and fucking slinging you what would be a thousand feet up in the air. I had an mm -hmm. uncle that did that once. You probably yeah. had an uncle that did a lot of things that we don't need to hear about. He had abnormally small hands, I heard. <laughs> Uncle Berto? <laughs> oh, he's there with you? Oh, goodness uh, gracious. What's up, brother? Hey, I would like to start off our portion of today's program by congratulating you. Okay. Um, something big is about to happen in the world of sports, and it is something that you have long been a proponent of, right. and you've been pushing for this for a long time. So I'm really happy that uh, it's actually about to happen because this is going to be great for you. Okay. Um, the college football to, playoff. To, the I'm college football playoff. <laughs> nah, nah, the college football playoff is about to expand to 14 teams. Jesus Christ. Yeah, before it even expands to 12. They are uh, right, apparently. Well, hey, I'll start post game in November when the sport counts. <laughs> oh, man. Yep. It's uh, I just saw a headline from ESPN right before I popped on that said sources are very close to approving a 14 team college football playoff starting in 2026, which is basically next season. Well, not basically. It is next season. So looks like we're going to have one year of this 12 team playoff that I know you are super fond of before we add even more teams and then get to 14 starting in the 2025 season and 2026 CFP. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Just a, another another thing ripped for my soul and heart. And, you know, it'll make the terminal terminal uh, diagnosis a little easier to swallow. Um, <laughs> Jesus, man. You know, it, it, look, having politicians and all these grifters and criminals taught us shit over the years, dude, if you give them an inch, they'll take a fucking mile. They don't care about the betterment of the sport. Why not start at six and then go to eight and then keep it there for 20 years? Um, I, I just don't, you know, it was the last sport left that, that had some separation. And I just think we let too many, too many douchebags into the playoffs now in other sports. And I, 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 we should do this. We should go through the, 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 what the top 12 was, heading into the bowl season over the last 10 years. And you're going to pick out some teams. You're like, yep, they're competing for a national championship. Well, if they win all those games, they deserve it. I, I don't, I don't like teams that just get hot. It's what, you know, it just bothers me. 
So, and I told you this would happen, didn't I? I said if they expand, man, they're, 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 and you, I mean, not like it was brain science, but yeah, politicians, all these administrators, um, they they don't care about the betterment. They they care about money. Period. That's it. Greed is a hell of a drug, and they are being ridiculously greedy. And there was a way to show some greed without ruining the sport, and that was by doing what you're talking about, like slowly expanding. Everybody kind of knew expansion at some point was inevitable, but if that was the case, you didn't have to just jump this far in. You didn't have to be this greedy and this cocky and this money-hungry right off the bat. But uh, unfortunately, the powers that be, the politicians, the higher-ups that you talked about, they they weren't patient enough. They weren't willing to wait, and they care about their pocketbooks way more than they care about what the fans want. Yep. Um, look, college football is still going to be great on the field because the sport's as healthy as it has been. I mean, look, there are NIL things. There are there are certain things that – but it's not one of those sports where you go, oh, shit, our top 40 players are gone. You know, that kind of hurts. Um, so it, it's still going to be good, but it, it – you know – I think a lot of the uniqueness that we love about college football, because it is, it was a four month marathon, man. And there, you know, and I didn't like it when one game in September may knock you out, you know, which I saw that. So I was off down for the four. I was down for six. I was down for eight, but I knew that once, once these crackheads started partying that night, you know, they weren't stopping. Yeah. When, when does it end? I mean, that's the question. It'll go to 32. Yeah. So like part of me is like, okay, college football is basically copying the NFL with everything that it does now. And the NFL has 14 teams in its playoffs. Now the NFL might not be done. They just went from 12 to 14 like three years ago. So they could add a couple more, maybe a few more before it's all said and done. So I would love to be the optimist here and say, oh, it'll stop at 14 because it's just college football trying to copy what happens on Sundays. But then I'm like, eh, probably not. Okay, what about 16? That's what the FCS does. They've done it for years. It, I guess it works for them. I don't know how many people really care, but it seems like it works. They've had that model for a long time and whatever. Uh, do they stop there? Or like you said, does it get to 32? Are we going to have a first four in Dayton at some point for college football? Are we going to get to 64? I mean, when when does this thing actually end? I, I don't know. And the thing that I hate, it's what I hate. Um, you just you rarely see this with legislation unless it gets so bad that the public demands it, which is rare. Um, and even then they may not reverse course and you never see it in sports. The toothpaste never goes back in the tube. It's like what I talk about with any, you know, any great progressive movement, even a great one. Right. Like there has to be an end date. Otherwise, you got people who just make a living doing that, even though the problem may be solved or there's not a problem anymore. <clears throat> and it'll never go back. Like, there's no way they're going to do this. But you know what? Oh, well, they're out of point. There hmm. was a unique factor. And for the betterment of the sport, we think we're going to go back to eight. I, I'll give you my other nut if that happens. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a big deal. Because You, do you not... want it? Because it is in the will for you. Thank you very much. Well, yeah. I, I want the one that's already gone, so. Well, I, you're getting the lava lamp, too. Yeah, thank you very much. Does that come with one or both? No, the, the old one's in a lava lamp. Okay, I wasn't sure if you were going to crack open the lava lamp and put the, the current one that you still have in there, too, before I got it gifted. No, technically, it's with a couple ex-girlfriends. I think they still have it. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, what a pickup actually, line yeah, that is you gotta remember i was 18 not that that's that good of an excuse but at the time i thought thought and you know it'd be fun to do something with this like put it in the lava lamp and you know put it in yeah. something like that you know i'm sure would have gotten in my 20s and finally grown up and been like yeah eh, that's pretty lame but you, yeah you've got, you've got a girl over and she's like oh i like that lava lamp i've never seen one like that well Look down here and then look in there and tell me uh, if you see the resemblance. Why don't you take your pants off? Just to show you. Explaining the story. <laughs> it's better for the story. It's better for the story. That's it. That's all this is. We're not doing yeah. anything else down here. Don't oh. worry about that. So what do you think? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh my god. Well, Which, yeah, that's what well, you know. The, I think the basketball. Yeah. The, and, and I love how people will will twist numbers. You can twist any number you want and stat you want to prove almost anything you want. And and we see you know both sides do that of of any argument. But I heard basketball or people that were wanting to make money off this. So when I say basketball people, I don't mean people like you that watch basketball and care about the fucking sport. Um, and they said, well, I mean, percentage wise of all the major college and pro sports. Percentage wise, we let the least in when they were trying to expand from 68. It's yep. like, uh, oh, that's a cute argument. Really, really cute argument there. You know, yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, OK, yeah, you're, you're you're right about that one. Yep. I always bring up that stat like to play devil's advocate, but I'm on your side. It's ridiculous. I mean, you look at some of the teams in division one college basketball and you're like, just put yeah. them in a different division. What are we yes. doing here? Like uh, these teams like IUPUI, like Mississippi Delta Valley state. Like we don't need these, co these schools in the same league as Duke and Kansas and Carolina. Like that's ridiculous that they're on technically a level playing field now yeah. so it's yeah that's a huge problem with college basketball is that there's too many teams not that there's just too many teams in the tournament there's too many teams overall in yeah. that level it just doesn't make sense like may create another division or relegate some of those teams to actually give them a chance to be competitive versus just losing a shit ton of games every year i mean the argument against that is that those lower tier schools they get paid when they play the blue bloods and that money funds their university. So that's why they like it. That's why they do it. Once again, going back to money, it's all about money instead of actually thinking about what makes sense for the players, the coaches and the fans who really care the most about the sports. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, it's the people making the money and I'm sure that, you know, the whole football thing came about because these, these, uh, DBs who wear awful blazers and sports coats that, you know, lead up these bowls, which is, it's always been its own real shady, just feel to, to how all that money is, is shuffled around and, and everything that goes on there. But they're obviously losing money now because I am, I also can, we can be honest and say, yeah, there, there's a problem with, with bowl games, but some bowl games, but I'm willing to sacrifice bowl games that honestly didn't mean much back in the day either. You know, mm. there may be kind of that middle middle realm that that felt more important back then. Um, and obviously getting back to having your best players play, but there, there's ways you're making so much money. There are ways to incentivize, right? Those games. And, you know, once again, though, you'd have to take a little chunk off your uh, off your commission there. And, you know, they're not yeah. willing to do that, man. Well, this, you know, this is uh, the executives and the politicians in the sport getting back at the student athletes. Right. Like the student athletes are finally getting paid for the first time. And it's like, OK, you guys want to make money? Well, we're going to make more money now. Here's what yeah. you're going to have to do for us. So it's basically just sending a message to the players that, no, we're still in charge of this. Like, congrats. You guys have more power than you've ever had before. We lost. You won. The public's on your side, so you got your way. But we're still going to show you who's boss here, and we're still going to get the much bigger percentage of the pie in this whole thing. I mean, I'm, I'll be open-minded about it. And, of course, I'll still get around. I'll still – watch the sport and and I think love the sport on the field but yeah it, it just sucks when on the field you know there have been so many sports whether it's college hoops or MLB or college baseball for a long time in my life that you know they had issues on the field the NFL I mean people forget that the NFL 15 13 games when all of a sudden 108 yards on 30 carries was considered a that's pretty dynamic uh rushing game for who? For for that guy? Yeah. I mean, it, it 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 was boring, you know. And and so college football doesn't have that. There's not an on the field issue, you know. It's it's the greedy bastards above it that that get in the way, and they're they're getting in the way right now.
Yeah, my last thought on this, unless you've got more, I'm just I just scrolled through the ESPN article. I read the headline to start this conversation. You I mean, you knew I'd go nuts on it. <laughs> no, no, it's great. I mean, it's yeah, it'd be the perfect conversation for us to have. You know, it's like I just, right. I, I'm picturing you, me, and Rod talking about this. So you right. could, could get an hour about this this topic if we wanted to. We do. We do two days on it. You oh my me? god! Yeah, you ain't lying. But just scrolling through. Summer. It's like just money. I, I see so many dollar signs. I see the word financial used. I see the word incentive used. I see revenue. I see TV rights. I mean, half of this article is literally talking about money. It, it, like to our points, like this, this is what this whole thing is about. It's just greed. And all of these conferences just want more money. And the Big Ten and SEC know how much they've got going for them. They want the money. The other conferences are like, well, we want some of the money too. We don't need as much, but we want to hitch our wagon to those conferences for as long as we can so we could cash in on their value. And it's literally the entire article is about that. It's not about what it means for the sport. It's about what it means for people's wallets. Well, and I'll say this just to show that that um, trying to be as fair as I can about this. If they have 12, 14 teams, that means every year Notre Dame, the way they played the last 10 years, will probably get in. Uh, as someone who watches every minute they play, yeah, uh, a majority of those teams should not have been playing for a national championship. So, so here's yeah. uh, here's the screen share. This is last year's final CFP rankings. Of course, they don't release another one after the bowl games have been played. So this is... The last one, obviously, where Texas found out they were the three seed and in the college football playoff. So 14 teams. It wouldn't be one through 14 because you'd have a G5 team in there. So like Liberty was the highest rated G5. They would be in over Arizona. And maybe they're so couple- fucking stupid, by the way. Arizona uh, is I, I, I don't want to play Arizona the way they're playing last year at the end. No, they beat the brakes off of Oklahoma, who you know was ranked ahead of Arizona going into that Alamo Bowl. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you got, you got Penn state, you got Ole Miss in there. Like it's not, it's not awful teams, obviously, but it's, you don't know last last year. Actually, I remember when we talked about it last year was one of the good, good, good examples or, but also a rare one where there were some teams that I don't think they should, I don't think Ole Miss should be playing for a national championship. Um, but they, they were they were good teams and and or at least exciting to watch. But You're right. there, there are a lot of years, BK, if you go through it, where you're yep. like, holy shit, that team's going to play in a playoff? Here you go. Here's the year before. So yeah, right, last year uh, – oh, hold on. I think I, I think we have that. Playoffs? Don't talk about it. Playoffs? You kidding me? God, I love that, dude. Uh, there it is. Had to get Jim was- Mora in there. Moro is my favorite. I know a lot of people like Denny Green. A lot of people like Herm. Um, and they did some funny stuff. But Mora just because it, it felt so genuine too. Yeah, yeah. It was like, a little before my time. Like, like oh, he break down, dude. Yeah, I've seen so, not only that, but some of his the other great. Yeah, yeah, hilarious stuff. I wish Jim Mora Jr. had some of that to him. He's He's as dull as a doorknob at those he press really conferences. Is. <laughs> Quite annoying. But okay, so here's the year before. So this would have been, I guess, the 2023 CFP, the year Georgia beat TCU by a hundred. And yeah, you're right because last year, last year, like an 18 playoff would have made sense for the first time ever. It's like no, there are actually like eight teams that maybe could make a claim to be national championship good. But you go back two years ago and you look at the top 14. I mean, you got Oregon State. You got Utah. You got Kansas State. Yeah, dude. Like, come, you think Kansas State and Georgia were on the same level two seasons ago? Give me a break. Yeah, and was that Clemson team would have? That would have been DJ Ui Ungo, what? Right? Um. Yeah, I guess so. Like, oh, yeah. Clemson should not have been playing for a national. That team should have been playing for a national championship. No, that might have been Klubnik by the end of the year, though, right? Didn't DJ get hurt and then bench? Two years ago. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Because last year was Kate's first full year as a starter, but he got some starts two seasons ago. So, yeah. I mean, that, that team had no business being there. Tennessee at that point had already lost uh, the call girl at quarterback. So you would have had them in there. It's like, yeah, what are we doing? So for every 
for every year like last year where it's like, ah, oh, this might not be that bad. You've got a year like two years ago where it's like, Jesus, four might have been too much. Yeah. No, there, there are some years where I've been like, hey, I don't think we have four. DCU may have proven that. Um, but, yeah, obviously you probably would flip Alabama. So, you know, my biggest thing is, does it take away – all the great Saturdays or, or the, just the, that edge and that, that importance of those Saturdays to where I gotta be honest, when the Niners lost three in a row, I didn't feel good about it. I'm like, eh, all right, we can still go play in the Super Bowl. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, have to get, we have to get healthy and get our shit together, but it's like, I, I don't know if you should lose three games in a row and in that type of sport with, you know, the amount of games they play, which is not a lot compared to other sports and play for the whole fucking thing. Right. Right. Yeah. Like and look, the, I, there's just something weird about that to me. Sure. And I, I love the NFL and I, I get why leagues are trying to copy the NFL. It's the most popular and most profitable league in our country. But uh, you, you taught me about this years ago. We, we like separators. We yeah. like separators like college football. It's of course, it's still football, but we like the things that make it unique. We like, the things that make Saturdays different from Sundays. And the more we go, you see it on the field, but you also see it off the field now too. College football is turning into the NFL and we're still going to love it because it's football, but like it's not as good as the NFL because the players aren't as good. So do something to separate yourself, to make it a little bit different, to give people more of a reason to watch instead of just turning yourself into the minor leagues. Well put, man. I, I have really nothing more to add on that. So you, were, you, were you watching Houston TCU at all? Oh my God! I I I um I went to work out after it was sixteen to nothing. Okay. Yes. And TCU got their first bucket with ten twenty four left in the first half. That's amazing. Yeah, it was the under twelve timeout, and they hadn't scored a point yet. And I'm like, you know, it's funny. TCU beat Houston this year. They played one time. Yeah. And it was right at the start of conference. Houston lost two early Big 12 games, and people are like, I told you they weren't ready for this league. And then since then, they've been the best team in the nation. And, yeah, they they had revenge on their mind today for sure. Yeah, they yeah they, they will lock your ass down, man. It's actually, you know, Houston ended up winning 60-45, and it was 31-16 or 31-15 at the break. Um, so they actually made it closer than, than it felt like it was going to be. But um, – yeah, I mean, I hate you know, I hate to say this, but like I, I've really enjoyed outside of the school. It, let's just say there there were five guys on a court at a pickup game, right? Yeah. I've really enjoyed watching Houston and Baylor the last couple of years, just the way they play, and 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 I think they're really well fucking coached, and they they put those rosters together nicely too, especially in current college basketball, which is you think building a roster in college football is hard. I mean, it's you know. You, at least if you sign the five star in college football, you got him for three years. You know? Yeah, it's a great and, point. So I mean, you got to kiss his ass, and NIL's got to be part of that. So, but I think they've done a good job, and it, it's it's a likable team, man. Yeah, Houston will get one. I mean, it, it sure feels like they will. Now I know in the '80s people were saying that too, and it never happened. But um, that team is loaded. Kelvin Sampson's maybe the best developer of talent in the country right now. Wow. He, wow. He's, it's, it's that level. I mean, look, you can't say he's the best coach in college basketball right now. Cause he doesn't have that championship and you've got uh, still some big names in the sport, but you talk about, I mean, the recruiting has picked up at Houston in recent years, but you look at a lot of those guys on his team and it's, it's three and four stars, man. He's not bringing in McDonald's all Americans left and right. Uh, and you look at his big guys, they're six, 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 seven, six, eight, and yet they're more physical and they rebound better and they defend better than just about any team in the country. So he develops those talent, uh, those got those talents, but also he gets his guys to buy in. It, it's hard to get people to want to play defense in today's level of basketball. You turn yeah. on an NBA game and my point Oof. is proven for me. Uh, you, even in college basketball, where there's more defense played in college than the NBA, you still see a lot of lackluster defense at times. Houston, you do that around Coach Sampson, your ass will sit on the bench, and it's not for two minutes to prove a point. It's you won't play if you don't defend and you don't hustle and you don't rebound for that team. And everyone's bought in, and it's why, you know, for the third straight season, they are a legit national championship contender, and they might be the overall number one seed on Sunday. Yeah, I'll be curious if they finish this off, kind of, you know, where they go. Um, 
it, do, do they run in? I know, I know size is, is different now than it used to be. Um, Cause that would have been like laughably small in, in, in the eighties and nineties, but do they run into someone with size and, and do you think that gets them or do you think it's their free throw shooting and, and maybe offensively they they're just not hitting? Yeah, I, I don't know, man. I mean, what, what got them last year, because they lost to Miami, of course, right before Texas got right. boned by the refs against Miami. Yes. Uh, and, and it's, I mean, this is how the tournament works, right? Like if Houston played a best of seven, I, I don't know if they lose to anybody last year, but Miami just didn't miss. And even when you go up against a great defensive team, you know, good offense beats good defense. And if guys are just making their threes, even if you have hands in their face, like that will do you in. So that's almost what it takes to beat Houston. Like you just, you got to have some luck on your side. You got to get a few rolls to go your way and you just have to be hot shooting from the floor. So uh, yeah, I mean, they're better defensively than offensively, but I'm looking at Ken Palm right now. They're 11th in the country in offensive efficiency. So they're, they're not uh, a slouch on that side of the court no, at all. Not. And they've got guard play, like guard play wins in March. That's what I need. You, you got to have great teams, but you, if you don't have good guard play, you've got no shot. And Jamal Shad just won Big 12 Player of the Year. He's one of the smartest players in the country. Uh, Cryer's really good. Sharp's really good. And they've got bigs. I mean, I, I'm not sitting here guaranteeing you a Houston national title. Hell, I picked them to win my bracket two years in a row, and they've let me down. So now I got to figure out what the hell I'm going to do on Sunday. But that that group has uh, all of the makings of a legit national title team, and it's it's gonna pretty much you're gonna have to play your perfect game to uh, to find a way to knock those dudes out the way that they've been rolling since the turn of the year. So that's that's interesting that you picked them two years in a row. I'll be curious. Um, that's like the opposite. I I used to always laugh at people that that do this uh, for a living and and be like, well. You know, back in August, I picked the Steelers to win it all. So I'm sticking by that. Okay, well, things change. Like, I mean, you don't have to, like, I'm not, I'm not going to bury you. I'm not going to call you a flip flopper. And, you know, that's okay, you know, but you're the opposite of that now. It's like, fuck, you, I know you don't want to take him because you don't want to make it three years in a row, but everything you're saying right now sounds like you should take him. Yeah. Yeah. And like the last, last year, a lot of people were picking Houston and I also worked yeah. in Houston. So a lot of people down there were definitely picking the Cougs this year. Like if I don't pick Houston, it, it might be more of, well, I think everyone else is going to pick Houston in my bracket. So I got to pick somebody else so I can win one of those things. Like it's almost more strategery to try to win my bracket pool. Right. I, I feel like, I mean, Houston and UConn are going to be the two teams that everybody picks and I won't pick UConn because it's so hard to repeat. I know it's been done before, but it's been a long time. And people will say, oh, the Chiefs just – like, it, it can't happen. I'm not sitting here telling you it can't happen. But it, it's more likely in recent history that the defending champs will lose in the first weekend than they will even make it to the Final Four, let alone win a national championship. So I won't be picking UConn. It's just do I go Houston or do I go with somebody a little bit more off the beaten path this year when I'm filling out the sheet of integrity? Sheet of integrity. Yeah, I think there's only two teams in my lifetime, which could also be, yeah, right there. Um, that, uh, yeah, your lifetime too, but um, that have repeated in college basketball, right? Duke and Florida. Yeah. You and I'll be good, but. But then also that would have taken away one of Duke's. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It would have been either UNLV uh, going back to back and said it was Duke going back to back. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's tough. It can be done. I mean, UConn's incredible and Danny Hurley's done a great job because that, that group lost a good amount of talent too. And, and they look just as good. Hell last year they were a four seed in the tournament and won it all this year. They, they might be the number one overall seed. So they're even better now than they were at this time a season ago. Uh, but yeah, it's tough, really, really tough to do. So we'll see matchups matter. Obviously, it's it's a total crapshoot. I mean, I watch more college basketball than most Probably people. <laughs> and that's that's not a good thing. I, I need a life. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's it's tough. It's it's always a crapshoot. It's always random. So that's the beauty I, of it. I it is. I did love those years like with UNLV. I was I was on a heater from like 88 to 96, where I was uh, I was I was taking some money from some Merrill Lynch brokers, baby. Um and you know that was a huge amount of money for for a kid at that time. You know, you looked at it, I was like, oh my god, 
But I love the years where I would just go, and one of them was UNLV, and I got it wrong. I got it right the year before, where you just go straight. You can go straight to the box and say, "All right, I got my champion," um, and, yeah. or "I've got my three Final Four teams." You almost work inside out. Yeah, I've never done that. Is that that's what you used to do? You still do that? It, it, no, I don't, because because I, I just haven't had teams like that. I mean, like UNLV yeah. was like, well, UNLV is going to win the whole fucking so yeah let me start there yeah you um, know yeah and it was so matchup driven you know it's like well fuck they got morning in Matumbo, and i love this team and i feel like they're a sweet 16 team but you know they're six eight and six nine you know um so it, it was it was always matchup driven but i love some of those years i would start with and i've got my three final four teams i gotta find out this region and what i'm doing but I can work my way out from there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe I should try that this year. Kind of like that, that strategy. But like you said, it's not, there's no clear cut number one this year. I think, I think most people view the view there as a clear top three with Houston, UConn and Purdue. But a lot of people are scared to pick Purdue because they seemingly always flame out early in the tournament. So I think most people, once again, I, I think like, I don't know if it's 50% of brackets, that feels like a very high number, but God, most, most people out there will have Houston or UConn winning it all. I feel like a good, yeah, I, that's probably why I pick you watch obviously a ton more, but I, I've watched those, both those teams enough. And I think they're well coached. They're, they're, they're good fucking teams. Um, hey, I wanted to ask you, um, you mentioned Purdue. Purdue had a team with Big Dog, Quanzo Martin, was it Matt Waddell, or whatever, in the 90s that I thought was going to be a Final Four team. They lost in the Elite Eight. They were the best team in the Big Ten, a loaded Big Ten that year. Has Purdue has Purdue ever been to a Final Four? Yes. Like yes. 60s? I, I know they've never won it. I want to say that they've never been to a Final Four. Gene Cady never got to a Final Four. I may be mistaken with that, but That'd be that'd be one of the best basketball programs to never make a final four. Yeah. I mean, I think Matt Painter maybe they did like Texas in 43 and 47 or something. Yeah, Painter Painter's only been to one elite eight, too. Um, so it's not like he's gotten there a bunch and just oh that that's been the round that's gotten to him or something like that. Like, let's see, let me Google it real quick and see if okay, they've been to the final four twice. Twice. Okay, and one championship game. And one championship game, yeah, sixty nine, very nice, and eighty. Okay, so one of them was George King was the coach in sixty nine, and that. then yeah, Gene Cady. That was that was his first year, nineteen eighty. Wow, yeah, his okay. first year they made it to the final four, and that was that was it. Had a bunch of other tournament runs and tournament appearances, but boy, yeah, that's. That's wild because people talk about Purdue like they're some sort of blue blood type of program and they're not anything close to that. No, because you think that and and I mean, but I would say, at least in my mind, it feels like they're one of those programs because they have won, you know, that the fact they haven't won a national championship. Like, I mean, I think I think and I may be wrong about this. I think Purdue is a better all time basketball program than Texas and Texas has. In, in my lifetime, fucking shot up, dude. I mean, from the 30s to you could put them in the, you probably put them like at 19 or 18. It depends on your metrics. You can put them at 23 too, but whatever it is, they've gone up double digits. Yeah. In terms of all time rank as a program. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've heard you talk about this before. I think you have them around 20 or something all time, yeah. which, which feels fair. And, kills me because all i want texas to be is a basketball school but i know i know that'll never happen so but i mean if i'm telling you from really 90 on that they've improved that much yeah you know um you know we're gonna be around this earth for a little while so it's it's possible they they certainly have the right facility they certainly have funds you know people i was talking with a baseball guy this morning he was like well you know i think there's a, a especially the fact that it's even close that there are maybe more people that care about baseball. There are a lot of people that care about basketball. And by the way, there's a lot of us that care about all of it. Sure. I care, you know, I want the swimming program to be good. <laughs> um, you know, um, I mean, I've, be, seen you, I've seen you at the swim meets before you're out there. Well, that's a different thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
But uh, no, I, I used to go to them. I had buddies, but um, who were swimming. But I mean, I used, we used to go to them, um, and certainly we go to the NCAA's when they were when they were hosting them. So you know, I want obviously I want the basketball and baseball program to be good, and I think I think they both should be and can be. I, I don't I don't think it's a I don't think it's a binary decision. You know? Yeah, I always joke like, oh, we had to sacrifice basketball and baseball to get good at football again, and that's right. kind of what it feels like right now, sadly. But yeah, that's not, I mean, the 2000s when you had Augie and Mac and Rick doing their things and Texas was competing for national titles and all three of those sports at the same time. Like we, we know it's possible and it, it might've been harder then than now, like in some ways, no, but like just with the resources and the NIL and the portal and the stuff that Texas can really use that wasn't at our disposal 15, 20 years ago, like if, if they just get the right people in place, big if. We're still not sure if two of the three are the right people in place. And hell, I mean, it's one year with Sark. We feel good about it, but it's still just one year with him. Right. Like it's, it's, if we get the right people there, it, it can be done. It's been proven around these parts. So it, it can be. Can, can you imagine if you would have been in school from 02 to 05, how annoying your ass is going to be when you become an old man like me and uh, seemingly every day like you in terms of our takes? Well, your takes have always been old man. So. Uh, I, yeah, it's a compliment. Um, but now, now you're in your thirties. Now you're legitimately becoming one. That they're getting there. Um, but can you imagine them at 55? You know, when I was in school, yeah, yeah, yeah. You won two baseball championships, first football championship in 30 years, and the Final Four with TJ Ford. Yeah, Elite Eights. You were pissed off about. Yeah, uh, what'd you what'd you do? Oh, and oh two, you won it in baseball. Oh three, you finished third. Oh four, you finished second. Oh five, you won it. Yeah. Thanks, Dad. Yeah, yeah. Really feel sorry for you. Um, right. <laughs> what What were you? What were yours? Did you have any any run at all? No, no. I mean, I think uh, I had maybe one. One of Augie's teams had that miraculous College World Series run. I can't remember the one that lost to Vanderbilt. Is that, yeah, what you fifteen, thirteen. 14? I think I was still doing games. It may have been fourteen. Okay. Yeah that that was it. it. That it was, was hard weird. college baseball to watch with the bats in that field, man. Yeah. Oh my god. Like, the the ball was just not. You couldn't get out of the fucking infield. Like there was no explosion with it. It's terrible. That that was probably it. Like in terms of the big three men's sports. I mean, volleyball won a national title my freshman year. George Spieth was, you know, the same age as me. He was a freshman. Golf won the national title. Won it, yeah. Tennis won one. Like yeah, you know, the, the Olympic sports were doing their thing, but. No, I had I had Alamo Bowl win was like highlight of my football career. We somehow went two and two against OU, despite how shitty we were. Uh, somehow I, I got to see two wins against the Sooners. Was one of those the case McCoy where where Major was OC and went to the two tights, two or two fullbacks and yep, yeah, ran a bunch of fucking ISOs down their throat, and then and then threw over the top to Marcus and and I forgot who else. It made no sense. Yeah, you had a DJ uh, Johnson Davis. punt return in there too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 13 and 15 were the two I was at. So th those were cool. But now nah, in terms of postseason success, like, I mean, uh, uh, maybe the best basketball year was when we beat we beat Arizona State. Cameron Ridley had a buzzer beater against Arizona State. We were the seven that. and they were the 10. And we got blasted by Michigan two days later, like not even close. It was roundup weekend. I remember that. I was pissed drunk watching both of those games. Of course you were. It was it was awesome, you know. Yeah, hey, buzzer beater win in the tournament, sick. And then it was like, yeah, we're probably going to lose to Michigan, and we were just never competitive in that game. Which that could happen next week. Yeah, could, could win a first round game against a decent team, and then you play somebody really good, and then see you later. So, where do you think they're seated? I know things can change here, but I mean, their their cake is baked. So, um, do you see them being a ten, a nine, something around there? I think they'll be an eight. Okay. Um, I, I think they're more likely to be a seven than a 10 at this point, but okay. if I had to put money on it, it'd be an eight or a nine. And once again, I think eight is the eight is the most likely scenario right now. So, okay. uh, yeah, you're right. There's nothing they can do at this point. Even if they beat K state yesterday, I, I still would have said eight. Now, if they would have beat K state and then beat Iowa state tonight, then I would have said, all right, we might be talking seven. But I, I feel like the loss last night, even though it was frustrating and annoying and you're worried about this team going into the dance, just how good they are, 
uh, I don't think that's one that's going to affect their their seed line or anything. So it just uh, it is what it is. And now you got to hope the good Texas shows up because it's Jekyll and Hyde with this bunch. So you just hope uh, next Thursday or Friday, whenever they play in the round of 64, that that uh, they've got their good team ready to show up. Yeah. I don't know how confident I feel about it. No, I, I said it even before yesterday. It's like I, I the only thing that would surprise me in this tournament is if Texas made it to the Elite Eight or further. Right. Like a sweet 16 would not surprise. Am I gonna pick it on my bracket? No. But would it surprise me? No, I don't think it would. Especially if they get like Tennessee as the one seed in round two. Like uh, Rick Barnes right. team losing early. Nah, shit. That's not a surprise at all. And Texas has a good enough team to or at least they have good enough talent to run with a really, really good team, I think. But also, on the other end of the spectrum, if they lost to a nine seed by 10, would that surprise me? No. So I, it's just you don't know what you're going to get from this team, and and that's the most infuriating part ever. It's You just you have no faith. Like, going into yesterday, some people on TSU were like, ah, I feel like this team might have a shot to make it to the second weekend. And some fans, same thing. And then last night happens, and it's like, we're going to get our ass kicked in round one. So it's just whatever squad comes up to the arena that day, yeah, that's what you get. And I guess you can't throw a fit, whatever the stupid ass expression was. Yeah, and hopefully, hopefully Dylan gets a little time to uh, get as healthy as as he can. Um, you know, I wanted to ask you this: I saw that Stackhouse got fired at Vanderbilt, and Jawan yep. Howard. You mentioned Michigan earlier, kind of jogged my memory. Um, We've seen it in college football, too. I mean, clearly like Deshaun Foster. Now, he's been coaching, but that's a pretty pretty high ascension to be the head coach at UCLA. Dion had been coaching, but to get the Colorado job. We've seen it in college basketball a little bit. Guys that maybe don't have the time, but they've got the name. And clearly you think, all right, well, the guy knows basketball, but can he build the program? Do you think that, that that's maybe going to – with Howard had a couple good years, but you think that that maybe they're going to go the other direction and we're not going to see that as much. You know, it's funny and and this might be a conversation for another time, but every every once in a while, I think I saw it today too. Uh, you know, th there are Texas fans who bring up the idea of Royale Ivy being this this school's basketball coach. And nothing against Ivy, he was a great player here. He's had a nice career as an assistant coach in the NBA and as a G yep. League head coach and he's you know, he's paid his dues and I guess he's qualified to be a, a head coach at a college basketball program, but way more often than not in recent years, teams that have tried that, whether it's an alumnus or just anybody like, Oh, he played basketball in the NBA. Uh, he's coached in the NBA for a number of years. So he must be able to coach in college basketball. Look, I mean, Kenny Payne just got fired after two years at Louisville disastrous hire. Jerry Stackhouse made it a little bit longer at Vanderbilt. Didn't work out there. Penny Hardaway, not really working out at Memphis. Chris Mullen at St. John's, didn't work out there. Mike Woodson at, at IU right now. People are pissed that he is getting a fourth year. There's no reason he should be getting a fourth year. It's been a debacle there. So teams need to learn. Like There are a couple of examples of that working in college basketball history, but Patrick Ewing, another, oh my God, that should have started yeah. with that one. That's the worst of all of them. It doesn't work. 90% of the time, it does not work. So, you know, I, I have no interest in Royal Ivy, not because of him, but because, and once again, Ronnie Terry's not going anywhere, so it's probably stupid to even bring him up right now. But, like, I see Texas fans want to go down that road that a lot of those other schools, and obviously Vanderbilt did with a guy like Stack, and it just does not work. So, uh, yeah, I can't imagine Vanderbilt try something like that with uh, whoever the hell they bring in next. Yeah. I mean, hell we're even seeing college baseball do it with, I mean, I've had Texas fans throw out Tulo to me. Um, now Tulo's proven to be a damn good hitting coach. Building a program can be different. Um, he's great fucking hitting coach actually, which not all hitters are great hitting coaches, but um, I mean, Bert Hooten's an example. Bert Hooten's say arguably, I'll go ahead and stamp it. He's the best college baseball pitcher in the history of the sport. Mm. Uh, he was that fucking good. 35 and three, uh, minuscule ERA, 1.13 or 1.12, and was just like fucking, you know, 
out of control. He was a shitty pitching coach. Was a good one in minor league baseball. I think not a bad one even in the majors. Was not a good college base. Like sometimes it could just be age, you know, or yeah, or, or where they're at in their development. Man, it's like, man, you know, if you're 25 and you've already got stuff, I, I can work with mechanics, but like teaching an 18 year old, it, it just it doesn't work. Um, so kind of interesting. You got you got to be careful with that too because it's always weird firing a legend, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not fun. You want it to work. You obviously have that emotional sentimental pull with a guy like that, but you know, it's, you, you got to do what you got to do. And Jawan Howard's another one at Michigan like that. It's just not working. So it's, it's tough, man. And another thing like he had one good year, right? Yep. Yeah. But he's also had a couple off court things that, that don't look good. Right, exactly. It's on court, but not basketball, you know. Yep, you're right. You're right. So it's just it more often than not, once again, in, in recent years, when you hire an NBA guy with little to no college experience, it it's just it's been a failed experiment. So um yeah, I I don't know where Louisville or where Vanderbilt goes. I don't know where Louisville goes. You know, there's all sorts of rumors out there. Like I could see Chris Beard being in the mix for Louisville, even though Ole Miss is not having yeah. a great year. Some people think that, you know, Ole Miss gave Beard a chance, so he's going to be loyal to them. I say to hell with that. That guy has already shown he's not very loyal. He's going to take the best job he can get. And Louisville, you know, it's, it's a great program, and you can win there if you do things right. So he could be in the mix there. Uh, what I don't about know. Tom Crean? Is Tom Crean done? Yeah, I think so. I think he's in the booth, or he's an analyst now. Right, I've so. seen him. Yeah, so I I don't I don't think he's gonna get like he could get a mid tier job if he wanted to and uh, maybe Vanderbilt I don't even know if he could get Vanderbilt right now though wow. okay yeah yeah so he, he could be like mid major but I don't know if a power conference would give him a call. Where is Louisville in your pecking order of, of best jobs in the country? Is it a top five job? Is it a top ten job? Is it a, a top fifteen job? It's definitely not top five. Uh, I'd probably go top fifteen. Um, yeah, I haven't I haven't like ranked them in my head to know, but just like, I mean, Duke, Carolina, Kansas, Kentucky. Um, I mean those those right there. UConn, that's five yeah. right there that I think are all better gigs than than Louisville right now. Uh, maybe I'd I'd have a tougher time getting to ten, so they could be back into the top ten, but. I want to like I want to throw UCLA in there, but I don't I don't know if I can right now. UCLA's got dude, they've got financial issues, like and weird issues too. Um, they, there's something weird going on at UCLA. Some of the stuff I've heard from football players, you know, they're obviously real estate's so expensive there, but they're just not they're not as they'll be more flush with the Big Ten. But you know, I've seen Texas thrown in there as a top ten job, yeah. fully understanding Texas is nowhere near a top ten program all the time they're you know like we said that you could argue they're not top 20 very easily um i think they're probably top 25 but um it's about nowadays and money and and opportunities and i think it's nice that at texas you don't have the pressure you have in lawrence or lexington yeah it's a great point like if you ask me what's a better job right now texas or louisville i'd say texas yeah and i mean there's no comparison in terms of basketball history like no. Louisville's not that easy but uh, because of everything you talked about and the talent in the state of Texas, you can win a national championship just by recruiting your own state. Uh, yeah. You look and see some of the players Texas has whiffed on in the state of Texas. I mean, Jamal Shedd, we brought him up earlier. In, in their own backyard, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, guys like Jordan Murphy at Minnesota was a Big Ten player of the year one year. Carson Edwards at Purdue was a, a monster for them for a few seasons. Uh, I mean, just to name a few, like in recent years, there's all sorts of examples of guys in Texas that we just didn't recruit. Obviously, there are guys who Texas did recruit who ended up going elsewhere and being studs, too. But, uh, Jimmy Butler always killed me, man. Butler uh, wanted to come here so bad. And he has not forgotten about that either. No, he is not, dude. He hates Texas, and that will never change. I know. So funny. He, like, remembers Rick Barnes and that whole story like it was yesterday, man. That guy would have crawled on glass to come play here. And we told him no twice. We told him no out of high school and we told him no out of JUCO. I know. Yikes. Well, the good thing is, I mean, with the Barnes teams, we didn't need scores. <laughs> no, the offense was always on point. We had that taken care of, dude. 
Um, yeah, and God, I mean, it, I, we all could write a book about all the different guys. You know, Andre Ware's clearly never forgot about it. And yeah. I understand that to some degree. Like, you know, I, I I, mean, I think you should probably get to an age, especially if you had a really good career, if you want a Heisman, if you're Jimmy fucking Butler. It's like, dude, you know, you're well yeah. beyond that now. But, yeah, it sticks with them. I mean, how I was going back and forth with some people about Gavin Cash, who – I, I don't yeah. think I'd want playing first base, but you know, you, you're crazy if you didn't want him DHing here. Right, right. Yeah, he led. The, he had 26 homers, like 84 ribbies. He led the league in in homers, ribbies, and total bases, and at 327. I, I know our offense is not a problem, but like, just that's what I love when people go back and forth. It's like, well, you have to admit that. Nope, won't admit that. All right, well, discussion over. Right. Yeah. The coach, the coach can never be wrong. He could be the biggest David Pierce fan in the world, but he's going to get stuff wrong. He'll tell you he gets stuff wrong. Right. You should I'm be able to say. I'm not even blaming Pierce that much. Now, the story I heard, there may be mixed stories, is that if, if they just would have put him on the CWS roster, knowing that he was not going to help. I mean, because he was not, not, you know, he only had 23 ABs, but yeah. he was not going to be a part of that, but that he would have stayed. So I don't know how much truth is in that. I, I believe the people who told me that they're, they're, connected but um either way it's just frustrating because that happens a lot whether we didn't recruit him out of high school or if they end up transferring i mean vincent sinisi was a good example um talk about that oh three finishing third to to rice vincent sinisi was a damn good hitter and transferred from here and you know all of our coaches like augie definitely had you know people were like well, what's what's going not not at that point but when guys transferred before you'd want it here it's like, you know, what's going on? Why did what all the players hate them? So um all that all that's cured when you win. Yeah, that's all it takes, man. That is all it takes. Uh quick shout out to some sponsors. I don't know if Trey did any of these in our did one. not. Love the AV consultations. 512-255-8678. Our man Tom McKay. He's hooked both of us up with great TV setups in our places. He's hooked up thousands of Central Texans over the last 36 years that's right he's wow. been around for a long ass time he's the best he will give you the home tv setup that you've always wanted just give him a call 512-255-8678 or check him out online at avconsultations.com you and i were talking about dan the man covert yesterday love the covert family love covert auto group and of course covert b cave out there off of 71 three state-of-the-art dealerships featuring seven different brands if you're in the market for a newer pre-owned car truck or suv Look no further than any of the Covert family of dealerships, but definitely check out Covert Bee Cave. Shout out to all of our great sponsors. Of course, Altstad Beer, Pest Wrangler, 7-Eleven, Centex Tickets, Apple Leasing, Big Hat Cocktails, Longhorn Laundry, Relax the Back, Leaf Landscape Supply, Woods Comfort System. I mean, it's, it's crazy how many folks uh, have supported us. If you're watching on YouTube, we always put links to the websites of those companies in our description below. So, uh, look, we believe in these people. We believe in what they do. We believe in what they sell. We're customers of most of, the, most of these places ourselves. We think uh, y'all are going to love the work that they do, too. And we are grateful that they support Texas Sports Unfiltered. Yeah, big shout out to Apple. I actually sent someone there the other day. So Apple Leasing has been doing it forever. Get to AppleLeasing.com. Obviously, BK mentioned the YouTube links, or you can call them 512-346-9977. But they'll take care of you like all of our sponsors will. Oh, I wonder who's on the live chat today on AppleLeasing.com. Uh, remember I used to do that when I would do the ads? I would always uh, be like, all right, we got Lisa, you know, start to chat with her. I'm like, what am I doing? I'm doing doing the ad and I'm, I'm screwing up their business here. Yeah, that was great. And it was always a good looking stock photo that they used for whoever was on the chat that day. Hey, so hey, uh, Nothing wrong with that. No, everything's right with that, I would argue. <laughs> That's well hey, done. Tonight, I was talking about the tournament of uh, the history of ACC men's basketball, and yeah. it really focuses on the ACC tournament, which was what, which was the first big tournament. And even when when I first started watching college basketball in the early mid '80s, like that was the fucking tournament. You know, Big East basketball was phenomenal in the '80s, but they didn't have a tournament till. I mean, it was late. I mean, the Iverson Ray Allen back and forth was awesome. So they would have had it by then. But wow, I didn't realize. I didn't realize that. Um, yeah. No, I mean, there actually weren't as many tournaments. It didn't feel like, you know, um, as there are now, where everyone obviously a lot of the smaller ones did because that's how they would get in. 
But tonight on the ACC network, it's 388 if you have Spectrum. At 8.30, one-hour shows, they're doing uh, 1981 to 1983. I've already seen this, and it is phenomenal. Rob Sampson, um, go through, obviously, Jordan Worthy, Perkins. Oh, uh, oh no, it, it's it, – uh, they did a really good job. I know a couple of the people – um, who are still at ESPN, obviously Balvano and that whole uh, thing. And then right after at 9.30, 84 to 89. So that would be left to, left to Drizel, um, Bobby Crimmins, um, Krzyzewski when they're calling for his job, the Duke-Carolina rivalry gets going, like Danny Ferry. That was a really good one too. So if you guys – if you're maybe watching hoops, you may want to record it, but I definitely recommend at some point recording those and watching them and try and get, if you can, 90 to maybe 90 to 97. That one's fucking great too. Nice. It's just one like per era. Yeah. Yeah. I think they've got like maybe eight or nine episodes. So, okay. so some like, you know, that one's 81 to 83 because there's a lot to fill up. Then 90 to 97 is obviously more time. And then 84 to 89. So they 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 fit it where they got the important stuff in and will be probably what 40, 42 to 44 minutes. TRT, total running time. There it is. Uh, yeah, yeah. I explain acronyms. I'm not an asshole. Yeah, that's a good brief by you there. Appreciate that. It's well done. What do you got going tonight, man? Oh man. Um, I don't know. Some work stuff to catch up on, some sleep to catch up on, but probably watch the end of this golf and just watch yeah. some college hoops and might try our uh, spot Baldinucci Pizza out in Westlake. I might I might give that place a try. You keep telling me about how good it is. I might have to make the run up to B Caves to check it out. Man, I have just been crushing it, and it is um, it's great. It's my favorite pizza place in town. Um, you know, and uh, look, big shout out to Via um, and to, you know, Home Slice was the first one to come in, sure. but, but I'll, I'll take it over that. Via is probably closer. And and what Bufalina does is different. It's Neapolitan. They don't really have that there, which at least I didn't see it, but they've got so many options and it is, that's the best pizza I've had in Austin. High praise. High praise yeah. coming from you with the, your New York experience too. You know, pie, so. If this place was in New York City, I'd go there as often as I'm going now. And and I finally got over there. And it's one of those, the first bite you have is like, because I work near there. So it's just like, oh, I'm like, this is going to be twice a week. Probably, doctor probably won't love it. Although, you know, it's okay to cheat a little bit here and there. I know, yeah. I know. Yeah, that guy's sticking his finger up your ass. You can you can get back at him with some pizza every once Yeah, but I pay for that. That's That's true. Yeah, well, he does. He should take you to dinner first. Yeah. Something like that. And that can be your uh, request for where y'all go. The last time he goes, no, it's not, you know, we, we, we just did that a couple months ago. It's not time to check up. I go, please, can you? <laughs> yeah. Volunteer. You were just here last week. Ah, <laughs> I want to make sure everything's okay. All right. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I'm definitely watching golf. We've got Scotty is at four under. Okay. Um, McElroy had a pretty good day. I, I was, Everyone was talking about how shitty his irons have looked recently, and he had a pretty good day. He was, he's tied for seven under. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the leaderboard is filled with guys who played earlier. Well, it looks like the conditions have been good all day, but uh, a lot of low scores early in the day, and uh, good to hear that Scotty is is making a little bit of a run. But stacked field should be a fun tournament, and I'll be spending a lot of time on the couch watching sports because that's, that's what we do around here. Yeah. You got a prediction for Kansas State, Iowa State? Do we see Kansas State from the second half or the first half? Yeah, I think Iowa State's too good. And that's, dude, they they call that place Hilton South. It, it Like, you're like, oh, it's Kansas City. It's Kansas State. Of course, it'll be a per – no, there will be way more Iowa State fans there tonight. So, uh, yeah, K-State, I, I, I think their, uh, their tournament hopes get dashed tonight. I think they need this one. I think if they win tonight, they, they might actually be in the field of 68. Obviously, if they win this one and then beat – uh, the winner of Baylor, Cincinnati, more than likely Baylor, then I think they're a lock. But uh, this could be a win in your end type of situation for the Purple Cats. So if Iowa State doesn't match that level of desperation, Texas couldn't do it last night, then maybe K State finds a way. 
right. We'll uh, well, I'm not saying I know you, well, you don't have to roll. What am I saying? Um, yeah. KU. I mean, they, they, look with the Dickinson and then the hey. uh, and then the Tech kid colors is out, right? Yeah, they'll be back for the uh, for the real right. tournament, but they both missed last night. Uh, I I thought Kansas would lose. Hell, Kansas was a dog, but I didn't think it'd look like that. They're bad. That's okay. Football school. We're back, yeah, are they, baby. I, I, but that's what I love about Kansas. It's like they're bad. It's like yeah for. For y'all. Yeah, this is the worst year. Maybe the worst year Bill Self has ever had. It's either this one or uh, 2019 where they got blasted. They were a four seed and got blasted by the Auburn, who went to the Final Four and um, like screwed themselves out of a national championship by fouling Virginia uh, in the corner. And they were up two in the final seconds of that Final Four game. I don't know if you oh, remember that. Yeah, they fouled Kyle. It was, it was Kyle uh, Ty Jerome. And it was a questionable call. It was the right call. Just stupid ass play. And that was a great Auburn team. But yeah, this is one of Bill Self's worst teams that he's ever had. And it was a preseason number one. It wasn't supposed to be like this. It just, the chemistry has not been there. And I don't think they'll lose to like a 13 or 14 seed, but I, I'd be pretty surprised if they made it to the second weekend with just how much they've stumbled since the start of February. They're bad. Wow. I know. Wow. That's, that's not just like negative. Kansas fan BK either. That's like, nah, that's that's who they are. So you want to be playing your best basketball this time of year? Obviously, they are playing their worst, and it's and it's not even close. Yeah, so. I, I still I think so much of self as a coach that I never know what what he can pull out. By the way, uh, you see the uh, Cardinals are looks like trading for uh, Desmond Ritter. <sighs> God. I, I, I just don't believe in Desmond Ritter at all. I no, think. he sucks. I mean, he's a, he's, he's a third string quarterback, right? Yeah. I like, I, I don't trust him as a backup to come in there and win any games. So yeah, he's, he's a third stringer, I think. And they're probably, I mean, they let Colt go. So it's Kyler. I don't know if they have somebody else on the roster right now, but if if he's the backup plan, considering how injury prone Kyler can be, then that that's a bad bid. He is that, where, is, it, is that where Dobbs went? Yeah, he was there last year, but I think they moved him. Then he go to Minnesota for a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. He did that. That's where he went and actually put together some games, man. Yeah, he won a few games for them, and then just yeah, went back into Josh Dobbs after that. So, yeah, yeah. Woke up and realized, oh fuck, I'm Josh Dobbs. Yeah, I don't have any hair. He looks like uh, who's the uh, Charlie Villanueva? Charlie Villanueva, the good call, the the big from UConn, man. Yep, great player. Good long yeah. long NBA career. Never a star, but long NBA career. Kevin Garnett once called him a cancer patient because of his alopecia. Not great. Not great, KG. Not great. But a great show to you, KD. This was fun. This was fun. Always fun uh, chatting with you, BK, and um, I'm sure we'll talk over the weekend. Love you, brother. Love you, too. Thanks, for, right. uh, thanks for watching, y'all. Yeah, appreciate everybody. We'll be back to do it again tomorrow, starting at 8 a.m. with Bucky and BK. Of course, a full schedule from 8 to 5 right here on Texas Sports Unfiltered. Make sure you subscribe and download the free TSU app if you haven't yet. For KD and everybody on TSU, I am BK. We'll talk to y'all tomorrow. Y'all stay safe. Y'all stay healthy. Hook em. And hook them, y'all. Hook them on.